So the qu first question is, why study Heidegger? And uh, it's probably obvious to everybody that we should study Heidegger because he's the most important and influential philosopher in the 20th century. And, and uh, all the important continental philosophers uh, in the 20th century are indebted to a large extent to Heidegger. It, there's, it sort of divides up into two groups. The early Heidegger people, that is Being in Time, written in 1927, is the big influence on Sartre and Merleau-Ponty. They would not have been able to write their big books and carry on their sort of debate within existentialism and without all coming, spinning out of being in time. And then Heidegger went through a kind of change, in German the Kera, that is what he calls it, a kind of turnaround, and that turnaround is, produces late Heidegger, and that happens around somewhere between 1930 and 1933, there's a whole industry for dating the Kera and trying to figure out just what it is. But one thing is sure, by the time he's writing The Origin of the Work of Art, he's doing something entirely different than he was doing in Being in Time. I'll explain that before the end of the time. But the people, that late Heidegger influences all these familiar figures to you, uh, or some of them are familiar to you. Derrida couldn't have done what he did without Heidegger. Foucault, on his deathbed in his last interview, says that he owes everything to Heidegger. Uh, Bourdieu, who's too clever to admit it in print, told me that his first love in philosophy was Heidegger. Habermas was a thorough Heideggerian until 1957 when he discovered Heidegger's politics and turned against Heidegger, but Habermas comes out of Heidegger. So any, anybody important in continental philosophy is some kind of Heideggerian and some kind of anti-Heideggerian because they're all defining their position in opposition to something or other Heidegger said. That's one reason for studying Heidegger, that you couldn't understand anything in continental philosophy if you didn't. The other thing is, you could, we, it's very important for understanding who we are, what our culture has got itself into now, and what kind of human beings we are now. One of late Heidegger's big jobs that we'll be paying attention to is to try to figure out what is the uh, what are the essential features of modernity, and it has something to do with being a subject, uh, being autonomous, and technology, and the possibility of scientific research. He comes at it from lots of different angles, and but he's always asking sort of what is the what are the essential features of modernity. We will see that most when we read the... Do we read it? Well, let me see. Not in this course. Okay, we... Yes, we do. I thought I lost my mind. Okay, we, uh, the, when we read The Age of the World Picture, which is the clearest attempt to define modernity. By the way, I'm going to try to read this book, Basic Questions of Philosophy, because I read it and I thought it was extremely interesting and it might be very illuminating and fun to teach, to see Heidegger going back and trying to explain... The, the, what philosophy is, starting with the very beginning in the pre-Socratics. We'll see. That's the only book on the list that I don't know well already and know where it's going, but that'll be fun to find out. So what he's trying to do is find out what modernity is and then tell us what's wrong with it, find a position from which to criticize it, which is tricky because he can't say, well, the essence of human beings is such and such and and modernity is, doesn't fit it, but he's got to have some view about what human beings are, and, or else he can't say there's anything wrong with modernity, that, because uh, uh, that would be just another way human beings could understand themselves. So he's got to get a position, and he does have, from which to criticize it. And then he has weird, interesting suggestions of how to get beyond modernity. Modernity equals the Enlightenment, by the way, equals what gets started with Descartes, and how we came to think of ourselves as subjects dealing with a world of objects and, the, and uh, lots of other things too. But, we, but in any case, his three big proposals for how to find, get into another understanding is to think about things in terms of art, and that's in the origin of the work of art, to think about it in terms of things, and we're going to read the essays on things, and to think about it in terms of language. Those are all three ways out 
of the modern understanding of who we are. And what's important is it's not hard to find an alternative to the modern understanding of who we are. That's just that's called postmodern, and everybody's got some version of that. That's and Heidegger thinks that starts with Nietzsche, which I guess most people think. But Heidegger thinks that the Nietzschean postmodernism is is nihilism, is even worse than modernity, or maybe worse. I mean, it's worse and therefore better, because <coughs> well, because it shows more how unlivable modernity really was all along. And so Heidegger wants some alternative to modernity, to the Enlightenment, which is going to not be nihilistic. And we're going to have to find out a lot about what that means and how he tries to do it and whether it works or not. Now, that, that was just very general background about sort of why you might want to take the course. Now, unless has anybody got any comments about that? I mean, this isn't the sort of thing I expect you to have comments about. Well, if you do, that's fine. If you really have no background in philosophy at all, are you, like myself, are you, am I going to be able to handle this course, or is it really... Probably not, no. I'm afraid. What, what year are you, and what, to, what field? Junior, and I'm a business major. Uh, and you've never had a philosophy course? Yeah, I have, but it's been a while. You better come and talk to me, but I suspect there is so much taken for granted philosophy jargon and ways of thinking and posing problems that it won't work for you. Okay. I'm assuming, as I say on the syllabus, that you've had some advanced philosophy course, whether it was Nietzsche or Heidegger or uh, Foucault, what did I say? I, I made a list as best I could. He or Hegel. Uh, those are the courses that would prepare you for this. And uh, if you haven't had any of those, then... I don't think, you're welcome to audit, but I don't think you should take it. Uh, okay, now I'm going to talk about being in time, for, long, for the rest of the time, maybe, um, and try to tell you what it's, not all the things it's about, but what it, the part of it that's going to be relevant for this course. I'll tell you right off, the part of it that's not relevant for this course is what I think of as the existentialist part. Authenticity, death, guilt, what all this that comes in, what in, in division two of being in time. Uh, I'm only going to talk about division one of being in time because it's out of division one that the late the problems of late Heidegger come. He just drops the questions of the existentialist questions. He gives them to start and to worry about and uh, has his own different questions. So what's really important in being in time for Heidegger is the notion of world for later Heidegger. Now, so I have to try to explain what he means by world. And the, always when you're thinking about Heidegger, you've got to have some phenomenon in mind, because he does. And he, he's capable of being extremely abstract, but he's always got his feet on the ground, too, thinking about uh, hammering in, or uh, cabinet making or parties, the mood at, at parties, or how students... Uh, feel when they're, when they're staring at the blackboard and so forth. So one side of Heidegger's got some phenomenon, and the other side has got some very abstract way of dealing with it. He's sort of half peasant and half high-powered uh, academic. So uh, when you think of world, start by thinking of, we, of our ordinary notion that there's the theater world, the business world, and us, we're in the academic world, and we want to know what in the, what in the world that is. So. What are the common structural features of these worlds and of all sorts of other worlds uh, that, that we are familiar with? Um, well, Heidegger thinks that, that, that it, there are three basic features of any world. There's equipment for that world, business equipment and theater equipment and blackboards and stuff that we have equipment. And there is, that with that equipment, well, and all that equipment is interconnected, so that we, to do, in the academic world, you've got to have a combination of, of, of professors and uh, teaching assistants and librarians and students and deans and lights and blackboards and chalk and notebooks and all this together. You can't have just one piece of equipment for being in the academic world. So there's a totality of equipment, and we have, if you're in that world, to be in that world, you've got to have skills for dealing with that equipment. And that, that's the first thing. 
then there's, and for his example is he talks about hammers and how hammers are tied up with nails and with frames and with houses and so forth. Uh, then you need to have, there have to be goals in that world. I mean, you have to use the equipment uh, in the order to do something. So you use hammers in order to drive in nails and build bookcases and build the frames and build houses and so forth. And there's and you have goals in the theater and you have goals in business and you can figure out what they and what they would be. And goals in the academic world you know well, like passing exams and then graduating and then uh, so forth. Uh, and then the third thing is, besides equipment, besides goals, you need identities or roles that people can take on. They are interpretations of what it is to be them. So just to take my case, I take on the role professor. I interpret myself, I am a professor, that's my identity. And it's for the sake of, in Heidegger language, being a professor that I have goals like teach the course, meet it, uh, read, the, read the books, uh, explain things, grade papers, and, and then for that I use the equipment. So there it's the, at the sort of highest level there are people, there are in a world the, the ultimate roles or identities. In Heidegger language you could say the stand that people take on themselves. My stand on myself is being a professor. You're right now being students. And then on the basis of that, the goals, and then to satisfy the goals, the equipment. That is all goes together to make up. That's all organized into one totality, and that is the world. There's all these really sub-worlds I've been talking about. The theater world is a sub-world, and the academic world, and the business world, and the world of politics, and they're all part of this world, which is some broader bunch of equipment with a big range of roles and goals uh, and skills. And Heidegger's interested in None of these sub-worlds. He's not even interested in the big world. He's interested in what he calls the worldhood of the world, which is the structure of all, of any world. And I just gave you the worldhood of the world in one, in, in its, in a simple version when I told you about the equipment, the goals, and the identities. Now, what do you get when you've got a world? Then it really, that's when it really gets interesting. What you get is that in terms of a world, which is now our skills and practices for dealing with things and dealing with ourselves, that's what enables us to, in Heidegger language, encounter anything as anything. So in terms of my skills for using equipment, I can encounter this as equipment for holding up my paper and so forth. And you are encountering your pens and, uh, and so forth as equipment, as as for writing down lectures and so forth. So en entities show up as something or other in, this wor in a world. And so the one way they can show up is as equipment, and then they have a, wa a, a way of being which Heidegger calls available for, for a challenge. Yeah. I can't do it. Okay, I'll write it here. Okay, that's the equipment. Or we also have skills for just staring at things and noticing their properties or even more measuring their properties. We're able to do science, we're, but we're also able to just enjoy sunsets. Those aren't equipment in order to do something and achieve some goal. And we're capable of doing that too, which we could just say, uh, what? Perception. So we have this ability to perceive things. They are, pre they are a current. Now, Heidegger, I mean, if you're, but when you read Being in Time, this was called <coughs> Ready to Hand. I'm, I have my own way, one, way to translate them, but if I don't tell you the other way, you're going to get very confused. And this is Present at Hand. And we have skills for dealing with ourselves. This is done, right, Forrest? I can erase this.
and, and we have skills for dealing with ourselves, uh, which is something like this business of taking a stand on ourselves. Stand on who we are. And that way of being, th this is, is, Heidegger calls it Dasein. Dasein is the way of being whose being is an issue for him, he says. That's us. Dasein is people. So, well, it turns out then that the way we, our, our general practices for dealing with things and for dealing with ourselves enables us to encounter three kinds of being. <coughs> being available, being a current, and being there, which is literal translation of Dasein. Um, and another way to put this is, it makes everything intelligible to us, that we make sense of things as equipment, we make sense of things as, I'm tempted to write objects or things here, but I can't write either, <coughs> really, because those are sort of technical terms for Heidegger. That's equipment, what am I going to call this? Let's call it stuff. It's a new development. Okay. So I can <coughs> make sense of equipment. I can make sense of stuff that I stare at and measure. I can make sense of myself. They become intelligible insofar as there is a world. Insofar as, another way to put it, I have practices for dealing with things and finding them familiar in various ways. And all of, so, so now it turns out that world is what makes things intelligible to us. That is, remember, makes things make sense to us as equipment, as stuff, as me or other people. So that finally, world is what gives us what Heidegger calls an understanding of being. That's just another way of saying makes things intelligible. So it gives us an understanding of the being of equipment, which is just being available, the being of stuff, being a current, the being of Dasein, uh, all of that is made possible by this systematic organization of equipment, practices, and goals and roles. So in Being in Time, Heidegger defines being as that on the basis of which beings are already understood. That is what I've just called the intelligibility in, you can now add another word for the Searle people, the background practices, or the Wittgenstein people. The background practices are these skills for coping with things and people and so forth. On the basis of these skills, then we, things show up for us in various ways. And it's on the basis of that that stuff is I want to say, he wants to say already understood, <coughs> meaning that if you didn't already have skills for dealing with equipment, you couldn't make sense of things as equipment. If you didn't already have the ability to perceive and, and, and notice the properties of stuff, you couldn't make sense of the stuff. If you didn't have the capacity to take a stand on the kind of being you are and have an identity, then you couldn't make sense of who you were. So in the background is always this you, you can now say in the background is the world or in the background is the understanding of being. So I, they come very close to being the, same, to, to being the same thing. And another way to put it, there is, and maybe this is the common root of them as far as I can see, an understanding or an ability to cope with things that's in the background of all of our skills and all of our practices. Now that's all you need to know, I think, about being in time to go on from, from here into late Heidegger. Uh, it's going to turn out, and I'll say more about it, that, that, but maybe I should say it right now for once. World is going to be something very hard to study. It's going to be invisible because it is so, through, for three reasons, really. It's so pervasive that we can't, well, think of it this way. No, if I say it too soon... No, sorry. If I, if I didn't write it down now, there was a reason. If I try to explain it now, I'll have to explain something else and everything will get confused. I'll get there. Um, the main thing now is just to conclude that in being in time, Heidegger thought that he had 
told us the structure of the world in a lot more detail than I told you and mapped the structure of the world onto the structure of time. That's why it's called being in time, which you don't need to know. But the important thing is that he thought that he had found the cross-cultural, uh, ahistorical structure of worlds, any old world. The world in Bali, it's still got equipment, it's still got roles, it's still got uh, goals. The, the world of the ancient Homeric Greeks, no matter where, he, whatever world you please, Heidegger has given you a description of its structure and what it enables you to do. Namely, let objects show up as something and make sense of the various ways of being. That's, that's as far as early Heidegger got. And then Heidegger discovered something quite amazing. That there isn't just one general structure of world, but that worlds are very different. Different cultures have different understandings of being. There, and our culture has had several different understandings of being in the course of its history. What, would, what could that be like? Well, in the, and Heidegger has a distinction. I didn't write it down here, but it might be useful to have it. These are understandings of being. I'm not going to use that term anymore for this next day. This is early Heidegger. Understandings of being. That's how he talks about it. And there is only one. Well, it's just, there's only one. The understanding. <coughs> That's what he's looking at. Later, he's going to say, there's a plurality of, and now we need another place to put this, uh, truth, the truth of being. It's not that there's really any important difference in, the, in whether he calls it truth or understanding. I don't see any difference. But, there, but you need another word because the way this is set up, there's only one of them. And now he's discovered something else which we haven't explained yet, of which there's a lot of different ones. <coughs> So let's call those truths of being. It's a lot less natural or understandable to call it truth of being than to call it understanding of being. And maybe at first, I, for me anyway, for the first 20 years, I just thought of this as lots of understandings of being. But it's better probably to stick to his terminology. So what are these different truths of being? Well, you could say, and it'll, it turns out to be a very helpful thing to say, different cultures have different styles different styles of dealing with uh, stuff and dealing with equipment and dealing with themselves. <clears throat> uh, Clifford Geertz, who's a famous anthropologist, has a sentence which sort of fits this idea. I mean, he calls it an ethos. He says, a people's ethos is the tone, character, and quality of their life, its style. And as that's why I, I think that's, I mean, it's a natural thing to come across, to talk that way. And you can say that the practices are not only, this is my terminology, not only organized into a world, but then there's a higher level of organization that organizes them into a particular style. Just for jargon, I want to say, here, this is how the practices are organized. And over here, you need some other word. Let's say these are how the practices are coordinated once they're organized. So to take an example, driving practices are all organized by having to drive on the right or having to drive on the left and uh, the equipment and the turning signals and all of that. And that's enough to give you uh, the, the world of driving. But it's easy to see that driving also comes in different styles that the way the practices are, are, are coordinated in New York, where the people drive with an aggressive style, is very different than the way driving practices are coordinated in California, where in general people are extremely polite. And if you drive like I do, having learned in Boston, sort of making U-turns in the middle, of the, making circle, turning around completely in the middle of the street if you see a parking place on the other side and so forth. It, people are some, I think, I have the impression, are stunned. Uh, and uh, uh, unless they also learn to drive in New York or Boston or Paris or someplace where you do whatever you need to do to win, whatever you want to win. So, but if you have a different, and, and you can change uh, the organization, you can have, whether you drive on the right or whether you drive on the left, it doesn't make any difference. That, that's just 
the way the practice is organized different in England than here. But here it makes a big difference in how you change the style. That's why people from California can, can have accidents in Paris or Milan or New York. I mean, and notice that in the t that these two different styles, different sort of things show up. What shows up <coughs> for a taxi driver in New York is a chance to get ahead of everybody else before the next stoplight. And, and, and what looks to us, looks maybe to us like a gap in the traffic, looks to them like an opportunity to pull in ahead of somebody and, get, and, and, and win, win a one round and so forth. That's aggressive driving. And what, we'll, we'll, here what will show up for people are opportunities to obey the law, to be polite and let other people go in, fr go in front of them if they're, if they're trying to pull out of a side street and so forth. Different, different possibilities will show up. And another phrase I haven't used, different things will make sense to do. It'll make sense to rush to the next light and step on your brakes just because you got there for getting there first and being able to pull out first in New York. And here it makes sense to drive at the speed limit and uh, get to the next light when it's changing and so forth. Though that's just a simple example. I'm going to give you a much more complicated example now. But, uh, but there's a third thing. The style determines what shows up as anything, but it gives it new filling. I mean, it already showed up as equipment or stuff or Dasein, but now it shows up <coughs> as uh, you'll see various sorts of opportunities. I'll fill in the as a lot more as we talk. The style determines what it makes sense to do and another whole thing which I haven't talked about, which is extremely important, what's worthy or unworthy. So an aggressive style shows you that it's worthy to win and unworthy to be a wimp and let everybody get in front of you. And a, a, a polite, sort of nurturing, laid-back style shows you that it's worthy to obey the law and to facilitate the traffic and to help people who are lost and so forth. That this business of what's worthy and unworthy, which Kierkegaard calls qualitative distinctions, is going to be very relevant to nihilism. I mean, nihilism is, is a situation in which the distinction between the worthy and the unworthy disappears. And, uh, but we, that will be getting way ahead of the story. So now I'm going to give you, and those of you who had me in Heidegger in, being in time, I think I said this already, and I certainly do it in my commentary. <coughs> a while back somewhere, I discovered what strikes me as a beautiful example of two different styles and how these different styles enable different things to show up and different ways of behaving to make sense. And it's done with little babies. And that's important because what you want to be clear about, and I haven't said this yet, but I'm saying it now, is the style of the culture isn't in people's beliefs. It's not a belief system. It's not the rules they follow either. It's not in the jargon of the business. It's not represented in their minds at all. It's something that they get socialized into so early that it's in their bodies and in the discriminations that they make. And that's very important to Heidegger. That it, that, that's one way to get out of the subject-object way of thinking, out of what, say, you'll hear if you take Searle's Philosophy of Mind course, which I strongly recommend, just because it's exactly the view that Heidegger is trying to destroy. Uh, <laughs> and namely, that, that we are subjects with mental representations and things appear to us as something because we have certain... Uh, what Searle would call propositional representations in our mind. For Heidegger, it's something much more a, a pre-linguistic, pre-propositional, and embodied that we have when we take over uh, the style of a culture. So let me give you my example. It turns out that uh, sociologists studying Japanese and American child rearing have generally come to the view... Now, by the way, I don't, it doesn't matter at all whether this is right or not. You can think of it as a Martian thought experiment. We shouldn't get into a discussion of whether this is Western sociologists misunderstanding Japanese child-rearing and so forth. Uh, we, we can imagine two cultures. One of them you can think of as an aggressive culture. That's us. And one of them is a nurturing culture. That's this other culture, and supposedly the Japanese, and in which, the, in the nurturing culture, the mothers are trying to encourage their children to be calm, and they're soothing them, and they're singing to them, 
And uh, in the other culture, the mothers are trying to get their children to be as active and, and vocal as possible. One of my TAs early on when I, was, when I discovered this, said that he, and who was married to a Japanese woman, said that it, and I don't know whether this is true, but it's certainly interesting, that American mothers tend to put their babies in their cribs on their stomachs so they'll crawl around, and Japanese mothers tend to put their babies in their cribs on their back so that they lie happily looking at the things that are waving around over their heads. In any case, we, we supposedly get babies in the one case that are full of gesturing and vocalization, and the other case, babies that are more contented and uh, uh, ready to uh, sort of enjoy just being there. So, and, and in general, then, the mothers promote these two styles. Uh, one, of, one promotes, again, passivity, sensitivity to harmony in, in, in the actions and in the surroundings. And, of course, the babies take up these two styles <coughs> without having to have any thoughts in their minds at all because they're already doing it when they're tiny, tiny babies. And at one point I was worried about the question, but how do the babies know which gestures to pick up and, 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 and to get the style? How do they pick that up so early? How do they notice what's important? Well, the answer is, what is really interesting. Everything that the mothers do in that culture embodies the style of the culture that they were socialized into. They don't know they've got it, but they gesture with it, they, the tone of voice they have, the distance they stand from, uh, the, from the child, how they pick the child up, how they pick the child, put the child down, is all in the style of either aggressive or nurturing. So the babies couldn't miss it. And, they will, and, <coughs> and since babies are just little imitation machines, as far as I can tell, having seen them at close range, they will just pick it up <coughs> and, they, and they will start having Dasein in them because they will start having a stand on what it is to be a, a human being, which they will take up with, 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 as they get socialized. What constitutes an American baby is a certain pervasive style of behavior, and what constitutes a Japanese baby is a different pervasive style of behavior. And uh, once you've got the style, it perpetuates itself because what will, make se what will show up as interesting and what will make sense will be different for the two styles and, they, and, and will reinforce them in whichever direction they're going. So you can imagine now, just to finish this, that, that it will affect too sort of how things show up. And this is now uh, beyond any sociologist and probably beyond any fact, but you could imagine the Japanese, the, well, let's take the American baby, we know them better, like rattles. They like to make a lot of noise with the rattles and then throw the rattles so the parents have to go chase them and bring them back. And I can imagine that, that I wish it, I hope it may be even true, I know the Japanese babies would like to listen to the noise of rattles the way these rain sticks work that uh, the, uh, the Indians have that, that make this nice noise of the seeds in them are very soothing. You could use a rattle to be, to be soothed by the sound of it. And that would be, let's hope, the way it would work. Yeah, that would rattle would show up as a different sort of thing. And when you got older, then different sorts of objects would look attractive to you. So for the uh, American baby, let us suppose, grows up thinking that, th that things are there to satisfy their desires and then get out of the way once they've satisfied their desires. So for cups, a uh, styrofoam cup would be just great. It keeps the tea hot if you're drinking tea or coffee and it keep, when it's hot and it keeps it cool when it's cool and when you finish it, you just throw it away. That's a really terrific kind of a, uh, object to have for us. But uh, the Japanese would, if the story is right, prefer a teacup, which would be delicate and traditional and come down in the family and around which you could have a tea ceremony and it wouldn't keep the tea very hot very long and it would be a lot of bother to keep clean. You couldn't just throw it away and it uh, uh, would be you know, delicate and easy to break, but it would still be the best kind of object. So things because they would have the kind of skills and the kinds of uh, sensibility that would go with that. And, uh, when they, and so, of course, also for what it makes sense to do, when they grow up, then it looks like the Americans would uh, want to be striving, willful, satisfying their individual desires, and the Japanese would want to be uh, integrated, uh, socially uh, harmonious with their fellow 
uh, human beings and so forth. And that would in turn reflect in the kinds of, of politics and business in, in the Japanese supposedly in their business aim at cohesion, loyalty, and in politics at consensus. And of course American business is aggressive, laissez-faire, everybody wants to get as much as they can and express their own desires. And in, bi and in politics too, we think that politics amounts to everybody expressing their desires and then maximizing the number of desires that can be satisfied without creating uh, destructive instabilities in, in the process. So what have we got? We've got the claim then that here are two different styles, uh, two different truths of being, uh, and in them different kinds of things show up, different what ways of behaving make sense, and different, uh, and different things are worthy uh, and, uh, and unworthy. And that's, that's what I wanted you to see. I have to make a footnote. Heidegger thinks, and we'll come back to this, that in fact, we're the only culture that has a unified understanding of being. I've been pretending as if the Japanese culture does, and I don't really have any clear evidence that they don't, but Heidegger would, uh, I think, well, I do. It's the polytheism of them. I mean, we've got one God and one understanding. I think the Japanese have a lot of different gods and different local understandings. And maybe, maybe there's one overall understanding, but I, I don't know. But Heidegger claims that it's a peculiar fact about our culture that started in the 5th century BC that we got one unified understanding of being. You can think of, for instance, lots of cultures that didn't. Uh, my brother's wife is an Egyptologist, and she, just to show you what it would be like not to have a unified understanding of being, she said the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, had something like 12 different creation myths. They were all contradictory with each other, and they had no problem with that. Different ones were evoked on different occasions. There was a myth for harvest time and a myth for men and a myth for women and so forth. And the idea that there had to be one coherent story about how the universe got created just didn't occur to them, didn't bother them. But starting with the pre-Socratics in the fifth century, in our culture people started wondering what it was that everything had in common just insofar as it was. What was the general features, feature of everything? And then, uh, that, and once you've got that, Heidegger thinks, you will get a whole series of different total understandings of everything. And one way to see that other cultures don't have total understandings is they don't have what Heidegger calls history. Of course, they have a lot of events, a whole bunch of dynasties in Egypt, one after another, and they kept track of them. But for Heidegger, history is changing truths of being. And in our culture, we certainly have had a bunch of them. He only mentions three in the origin of the work of art. By the time he gets really far along, he thinks there have been seven of them. I'll tell you the three. I mean, it's obvious that there was something like the Greek world, the Christian world, and the modern world. And they had completely different understandings of being, or truths of being, different styles. Roughly Heidegger thinks, and we'll hear more about the Greek world in, in when we read the Basic Questions book, that, that they had a sense of being that everything uh, welled up and lingered for a while and then went away. Dick Rorty talks about how everything was whooshing up for the pre-Socratics. You can, I mean, certainly if you read Homer, the, the gods whoosh up and suddenly there was Athena and there she was for a while and then pop, she was gone again. And heroes whooshed up. Everybody, I mean, Ajax was perfectly normal for quite a while and then one day he went around and killed thousands of people. He went completely berserk and he was a superhero and then he went back to being normal again. This is the way things looked to the Greeks, apparently. And so people showed up as heroes or slaves and... Uh, things showed up as sort of wonderful and, 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 and sort of flashing out at you. And then the Christian world was very, very different. There were creatures. Everything was created by God. Things were full of meaning. People could only be, they couldn't be heroes. I mean, they couldn't be, yeah, they couldn't be heroes and villains or heroes and slaves anymore. You could only be saints or sinners. That's how people showed up. 
And, of course, you couldn't have been a saint or sinner in Homeric Greece. There was no place for that. I mean, if you turned your, the other cheek, that just meant that you were a hopeless loser, the slavish type that let everybody walk all over you. And you couldn't be a Homeric hero in Christian times because they were self-sufficient and proud and protected other people and people sang songs of them as if they were the, the best in the world. That would be pride to, be a, to take yourself to be that sort of hero and be glad about it. You'd be in the bottom of the inferno for that sort of thing. So it's a different world. And the modern world is different again. We're now subjects. And that means, among other things, that we think of ourselves... Oh, sorry, we could put in the, for the Christians... It was all a question of desires. Saints had pure desires and sinners had bad desires. This is a Foucault point. That Christianity defined us in terms of our desires. For the Greeks, it was in terms of our actions. And <clears throat> what the modern one is, you get defined in terms of your autonomy. How much you are lucid about... this. The, a modern subject, according to Kant who defined it best, is supposed to be lucid about its, what it's, the, the rules under which it's acting and give its rules to itself, not obey popes and monarchs, which is childish, but to be mature. To be mature is to be autonomous. So it, now the highest thing, the meaningful difference, remember, was heroes and slaves, was saints and sinners. For us, not quite us anymore, but because we're not we're postmodernish, but for up to, up to recently, the highest thing would have been either to be to be mature or immature. I mean, Freud thinks in terms of maturity, for instance. Uh, that's that's what you want to be. Not a saint, not a hero. You want to be a mature person who's lucid about their desires and their actions and takes responsibility for them because they've chosen the principles on which they act. Um, so. And the things are there to be ordered and controlled by us. Oh, by the way, the things in the Christian world were there to be uh, deciphered because they were full of meaning, because they were the book. Of, they were the creatures. They were God made them, and they were, and therefore, they could all be interpreted. Uh, the things aren't around anymore to be interpreted, or, nor admired like in Homer. Things are around to be ordered and controlled now. Again, what, 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 we'll get back to this. I keep saying now, because we're still sort of subjects and objects, and we still are sort of in the control business. Uh, and we're just passing, Heidegger would say, and a lot of people now would say, from one understanding of being to another, where we've got this, whatever it is, we might as we, the only name people have for it is postmodern. But I don't want to go into the details. Let's, we'll stick to the modern, so for the time being. And Heidegger didn't have any glimmer that there was anything beyond the modern when he wrote uh, The uh, Origin of the Work of Art. He only gun understood that there was something beyond subjects and objects, of sort of, when he read Nietzsche. So, okay, so now I should stop for a minute. I mean, by now somebody might have something to say. Uh, I don't want you all to be just hypnotized. Yeah, Liz. Um. I don't quite understand why the recognition of multiple truths of being, that is, multiple styles, should undermine the possibility of a single understanding uh, of being. It doesn't. I, I misspoke. I mean, I remember the moment when I did, but uh, I thought I would go back to fix it. No, it doesn't. I, mean, I don't think Heidegger ever needs to repudiate this. There's a lot of puzzlement of just how much he does repudiate being in time in some way, and he didn't finish it. But that was the authenticity, existentialist part of being in time. I don't think he ever goes back on the idea that there is a way of being of equipment and a way of being of stuff and a way of being of people. It's just that he thinks that what's interesting now is the particular style of the way of being of each of these things. And that's what we should be studying because then we can understand who we are and how we got this way and what to do about it. But you're right. I don't mean to say that Heidegger repudiated this picture. Yeah? Is it maybe not so much the, well, of course the equipment changes, but it, isn't it because the equipment changes and the skills to use the equipment change because of perception? Yes. Perception? Well, but perception... Isn't there there's something in, within all four of them, there's something changes that creates a change in the graph. It's like a problem with the 
Well, you may be, may be, but if it is, it's not perception, according to Heidegger, and I will agree with him. It's what I would call coping. I mean, it's, the sti- it's our way of dealing with things. That's his language. We deal with ourselves. We deal with equipment. We even deal with this stuff by staring at it and, and noting its properties. Scientists deal with this kind of stuff. And so, yes, there's always got to be this basic, uh, some way of dealing with things, and that changes. And then uh, that's what it is for the style to change. Uh, and perception is going to be derivative from that for Heidegger, because perception is going to depend on what you're going to pay attention to. It's going to depend on the style. And the style is going to be this more basic sort of physicality. Let me read you something. I was going to read it anyway at some point. I'll read it now. The, the person who has such a good feel for this, that's how I knew he was really a crypto Heideggerian, is Bourdieu. And in, in, I'm going to quote one thing from uh, Pierre Bourdieu. is a famous French sociologist. If you haven't heard of him, he'll be very unhappy. <laughs> because he's sort of running for main intellectual in France these days. Now that Derrida is sort of passé and Foucault is dead, (laughs) Bourdieu is probably the smartest and most interesting French intellectual. He's at the Collège de France. And here's... He doesn't write very well, so I will read slowly. (laughs) Principles embodied are... And he doesn't really mean principles. Let's say style, because you'll see why. Embodied are placed beyond the grasp of consciousness and cannot be touched by voluntary, deliberate transformation, cannot even be made explicit. Nothing seems more ineffable, more incommunicable, more inimitable, and more precious than the values given body, made body, by the transubstantiation achieved by the hidden persuasion of an implicit pedagogy. That's the Japanese example capable of instilling a whole cosmology, an ethics, a metaphysics, a political philosophy, through injunctions as insignificant as stand up straight and don't hold your knife in your left hand. Now, that's close. I want to say, and even the injunctions don't get to the bottom of it. Just the way the father stands, the son will imitate. And the way the mother stands, the daughter will imitate. And if the father stands in a proud, aggressive way and the mother stands in a meek, submissive way, the the gender roles are already being laid out and what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman in that culture are being laid out. And what people will perceive, to come back to your point, is going to already be influenced by this much more pervasive, embodied pedagogy that Bourdieu is so interested in, which um, Heidegger never talks about in those terms. Body never shows up in Heidegger. He doesn't know how to deal with the body. He says in a parenthesis in being in time that the body is a whole other problem and he's not going to deal with it. But he's quite clear that whatever he's talking about isn't in people's minds. And uh, so it's sort of in limbo, these practices that he's talking about. The, these ways of dealing, to use his language. And it, it's also the, the mood. I haven't talked about that. I should say a word. Cultures have... To, whole cultures have moods, Heidegger thinks. The Greeks, you will hear a lot about their mood of wonder in what we're going to read. And uh, the Christians had their own kind of pious <coughs> mood. And we've got... What have we got? Well, Heidegger thinks for the time we get to us, we've got a mood of erschrecken. How do you translate that for us? Terror. 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 Frightened. Frightened mood. Uh, <coughs> but, and that, the, the, so you want to put that in. It's not all just coping skills. It's also mood. But of course, mood is something too you learn. Babies learn to have either Japanese moods or American moods. Different cultures uh, accentuate different moods. And all of this is together in one... It may be a word for it Heidegger uses sometimes when he isn't talking about the understanding of being is that it's a basic familiarity. We we each one of us get this familiarity with the world as it's uh, laid out. He already has familiarity here. There he says, our familiarity is the way we find ourselves around, about, uh, find our way about in the world. And here, there would be different familiarity for each of these different styles. Okay, anybody else want to say anything? I mean, Liz is right to have asked that. There must be other things I've not missed. As far as when he talks about um, 
you know, Greece and the Christian culture. When he refers to them, does he just think that they had one kind of predominant characteristic, or does he think that there was any kind of change in the that went on? Good, good, good. He, he generally goes for the one predominant thing, because that's what interests him. He claims that there is one understanding of being, but he's, he's clear that there are what I call marginal practices. There are leftovers from other understandings of being, and there are ways of behaving that have never been taken up into the understanding of being. Foucault is good on that, that the, that the Greeks had this, uh, uh, what we would call sexuality, but they didn't have a notion of sexuality. They had a notion of aphrodisia, things that felt good, and that sort of fell outside of the law and outside of the general understanding of, of, of uh, what it is to be a human being. And <clears throat> it got pulled in by the Christians and called flesh and became a big deal. Um, but so, so different experiences can be just marginal and outside. And that's going to turn out to be very important. I make a lot more out of it than Heidegger does. Uh, it's going to turn out to have a lot to do with the question we're going to talk about next week, which is how understandings of being change. But if they were completely monolithic, I think one wouldn't, well, there would be two puzzles. We wouldn't know how the people inside of them could ever understand they had them at all. Well, let's scratch that. That's, that's misleading. Let me think of that. Uh, no, what we wouldn't be able to understand is how, given that we're in ours, for instance, we could ever understand the Greek one at all. If there weren't marginal practices left from the Greeks and the Christians in the modern world, and we wouldn't be able to understand them. And part of Heidegger's phenomenology when he's doing this kind of thing is to go and find practices that are still around, the which he can use to give you a feel for what it would have been to have a physis culture, physis being his name for this whooshing up kind of culture maybe athletics, maybe the, Olympic, uh, the, the Olympics are still moments when sort of heroes whoosh up. And so you can go back and, <clears throat> and try to, what would it be like if that was the most, uh, the kind of paradigm case of being in a culture and then you can try to reconstruct it? That's a very good question. But if you think that it's more pluralistic than, than that, then you're outside of Heidegger. Heidegger thinks there is one dominant one and the rest are all marginal. Yeah? So is Heidegger then working in some sort of platonic paradigm of tradition? No, because for the two reasons no, at least. I mean, one, I don't think there's any place for the marginal story in, in, in Plato. I mean, there would just be, nor even for the historical story. See, Plato's got this idea that there are these ideas, they're eternal, they're accessible to any human being who knows how to go get them, uh, which is a complicated training procedure. But uh, it's Heidegger's very, very far from Plato. In fact, he thinks that Plato... Well, I'll give you a little bit of a story here because there's a little bit of extra time. Okay, what Heidegger thinks is that the world... And I better give you a bunch of synonyms now. They're more than I give. He won't... He'll do, just mention the world in the origin of the work of art, all right. But he also calls it the open, and he also calls it a clearing, like a clearing in a field, which is an opening in which things show up. <coughs> now, it's, I've been telling you that the world or the open or the clearing or the understanding of being or the truth of being gives you this space in which things can show up. Now, in a certain way then, you, it, you, it creates the fact that, that anything shows up as anything. And it's the ground of the intelligibility of anything, remember. It's that on the basis of which anything is understood. But it's hidden. And now I have to tell you about that. And because it's hidden, I want to jump ahead of the story so I won't forget. <coughs> People will tend to overlook it. And philosophers, starting with Plato, will misdescribe the, 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 the way it works in such a way as to pass over and cover up the clearing. But let me do a move first. The, this stuff all withdraws. Let's talk about that for a minute. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> that means that the style, as he says in uh, the 
basic questions of philosophy book that you're going to read, that it's, the style is like the illumination in the room. That is, in turn, we see everything in terms of this illumination. It's the background that enables us to see things, but itself, it withdraws in Heidegger language. It has to be invisible for us to be able to see anything at all. If you could see the illumination in the room as sort of something, then you couldn't see anything else. I'm like filling the room with enough smoke and dust that you could see the illumination very clearly in a sense. You wouldn't see the chairs. So one way to think about what Plato did <clears throat> is to say, first he says that. He says that there's got to be a kind of an illumination in terms of which everything is intelligible. And that's, Heidegger would agree, that's the understanding of being. And then those of you who know Plato know that he made the next move. And moreover, there is an entity, the good, which is the source of that illumination in terms of which we see everything and in terms of which there is anything. How many know the myth of the cave and the sun story? Okay, you all good. That's good. I mean, <clears throat> half, Heidegger goes along with half of the sun story. There is something which makes everything that is visible, visible. And that's the light and that's a metaphor for something that makes everything that's intelligible intelligible and that's the background practices and the mood and the style but then Plato makes and, and now and that's hidden like the illumination in the room so when Plato starts to ask himself well how is it that everything gets to be intelligible uh, and how is it that it all gets created or grows as it's, it's in the myth of the, the sun story and the answer is, well, there must be a super being that is the ground of the intelligibility and in some way, later in Christianity more clearly, creates all this, everything that is. That's, that's to the understand what you think is that philosophy, Heidegger thinks that all philosophers from Plato on have sensed that there is something more than things and that there has to be some way to account for the fact that there is intelligibility and things are showing up as something. But then they have their candidate for, of some super thing. The good in Plato, the unmoved mover in Aristotle, the s substance in Spinoza, the transcendental uh, unity of apperception in Kant, uh, the, the... Well, in any case, and that Heidegger calls that ontotheology. That is, they find a beingest being in Heidegger taught in which then they explain everything. And that's what Plato is the first to do. And, it's, and now I want to keep re repeating, and it's a natural trap to fall into. Not inevitable, because if it were inevitable, Heidegger wouldn't be able to get out of it. If, it, if, if the clearing were so invisible, if this were so invisible that you just couldn't ever get any sense of it, that it was there, You'd be in re you, 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 and you saw that there was everything and it was intelligible, you'd be driven to some kind of philosophy story. But it isn't like that. But it is the case that the way the clearing is hard to get any grip on leads philosophers to give the wrong account of how things can make sense to people and why there is anything at all. And Plato is the first. That's what you started. Let me go on and then you can talk again. Because I, wanted, I sort of skipped over trying to do too many things at once. There are lots of ways that the world is invisible. It's invisible like the illumination in the room that has to withdraw so it can do its job. It's also the style is invisible because it's pretty much like the color of the illumination in the room. That is, it's so per pervasive that you don't see any counter class. I mean, if you're in the socialized into the middle of the, of the Middle Ages, it's so obvious that everything is creatures of God to be interpreted and so forth. That, and and the, the idea of even a counter class doesn't make any... You can't think of anything that isn't, so you don't see it. It's, it, it's so pervasive. It's like the water to the fish. You don't see, that's the second way it's invisible. And then the Bourdieu way of its being invisible is that it's too embodied. That is, it's there not in your beliefs, not in the principles you've got, not in your language, 
It's already there before you've got a mind and beliefs and principles and language. It's in the way you stand and the way you move and so and, and the way you uh, uh, what you pay attention to and so forth. And in that way, it's invisible. In Heidegger jargon, in from being in time, the understanding of being is the nearest and therefore the furthest away. And that's the the third one. It's so much a part of us, so close to us, so just us that we can't stand back and see it. And for that reason, I'm going to let the people talk in just a minute. So it's been missed by philosophers for 2,000 years, Heidegger says. Now, uh, you want to follow up on your question? Yeah, so is, like, is what Heidegger doing, is he building an economy strategy like, against representation? And how, but it's not really his business in this course. Being in time, division one, is all against the view that there is that we are primarily minds with representations and by way of those representations we encounter a world he <clears throat> and the way he does it is what I'm telling you is this kind of Deweyan Wittgensteinian pragmatist emphasis on our dealing and coping and not on our thinking and thinking becomes derivative there is a place for thinking if if the equipment breaks, you have to think about it. If you want to look at the stuff and, and look at its properties and make laws about it and do science, you can do that. But all of this thinking, and even using any particular piece of equipment, takes place already in a world that's familiar to us and has these general coping skills built into it. And that's what he wants, and in that sense, he wants to not deny representation, but relativize representation, give it a minor role in the story of how there is p us and worlds. Now, I had, somebody over here looked like they were about to say something. Um, yeah. I know this is counter to maybe delay the <coughs> but does he ever point out that there's a danger in giving a preeminence to language, or that language, because language has a tendency to almost categorize things? And Does how? Our meaning of being by any chance? Well, so? that's a funny question. It, I mean, it's got two answers that, that sort of oppose each other, I guess. Let me one. Or I mean, Heidegger doesn't pay any attention to language <coughs> for a long time. In early Heidegger, in being in time, he thinks that first there is equipment, and then we name some of the equipmental relations. That language is derivative, and that what's basic is the the equipment structure. And then he writes in the margin of being in time of his copy, no, language is not derivative. It's the very structure of the clearing. And then he realizes that, it, if, and this is the other side of it, if we didn't categorize things, to put it your way, which we'll do for the moment, we, there wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to see anything at all. But far from thinking that that stands in the way, you know, of seeing things as they really are, he thinks that is the way things really are. I mean, if you got rid of the categories, there'd be just nothing there. It would be like the worldview of an oyster. And uh, <laughs> therefore, uh, it's thanks to language that things show up as anything. And then we'll read, language gets promoted to a very special place in, if not uh, creating the styles, at least in preserving them and in bringing about new ones and so forth. And we'll talk about that. Uh, you want to say something? Uh, yeah. In relation to the Japanese safety and, and with uh, Verdot using the word embody, and you know, with Heidegger, we don't want to say subject, and we want to avoid this kind of thinking. He, does he avoid locating where these styles are? Mm. Are they being in the world? Is it mm. the, the interrelations? Where do we find these things? Mm. Like, how, how do That's good. That's good uh, to think about. It. For I mean, if it sounds too, well, individualistic, it's like Merleau-Ponty, it's to, to say the locus of the style is the embodied skills of each individual. And yet, that's sort of right. But why doesn't Heidegger want to say it? Because it's, it's, uh, it's because what seems to him basic is the the shared equipment and coping that each child, so to speak, comes into, which isn't so much... Uh, I'm trying to figure this out for myself. Certainly the equipment and stuff isn't in any particular body. But how about the style? 
Well, the style is in all the bodies, all right, but it's... I want to say something like unconscious. No, you it's certainly don't want to say unconscious. I, know, I want to, but okay. I know that yeah. I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and the reason you can't is, of course, that because it's not the sort of thing that can be conscious. I mean, all that goes into being a woman or, or, or feminine or masculine in our culture, for instance, is something of no, that's not all that something clear, but we're just not, it's unconscious. It's a whole way of moving and coping and so forth, and it's not in the business of being conscious or unconscious. That's why I want to follow Bourdieu. It's, it's in his language, word. habitus. You just said the word. What? Style of, rather than a style. You said of. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, I, but how am I going to make good of, good on that? Let me think. Any, you got any idea? I mean, I want to say some. You got to get the feel that I don't know how to put it very well, but I'll think about it before next time. That he thinks of it as the world of the of the mood and the equipment and the style is all there for each individual to come into and be raised into. And the bottom line is that it's all there. And to somehow try to ground it in, a bunch of individuals, all of whom have these styles in them, somehow their styles mesh, and that makes this bigger style. And then, and then it, it just is nothing he thinks would ever work, that kind of individualism. That where the style and the mood is, is so spread around that it won't make it, here, here's the best I can say, it won't make it more intelligible to try to derive it from each because if you really tried to think it through, how your style and your body and my style and my body and her style and her body adds up to the style of the culture, it, you wouldn't be able to work it out any more than you can work out the idea that the way we know that there are other minds is that I know that you know that I know that you know stuff. That doesn't work out. Now, um, let me think if I can say anything more about it. You said that Heidegger says it. Did you say that Heidegger doesn't call it the body? He doesn't care that? about the body, and he doesn't ground it in individuals. I've been doing that because it's easier to grasp. What happens, and I'll try to make more, say more about it next time if I can, is that he just drops talking about individuals, drops talking about Dasein uh, at all, uh, and ends up talking about the style of the culture as the ultimate sort of level of intelligibility and not trying to derive it or explain it in terms of any being. It would just be, it would be a kind of subjectivism, a kind of modernity, really, to try to ground the world or the open or the clearing in the habits and styles of, of the individuals. You, the, he wants to say the ultimate is the, the world with its equipment, its buildings, its mood, its style. As best I can do. But I want to make sure I finished. Okay, now I want to add, add one more question and we're ready to stop. Um, philosophers have got it wrong for 2,000 years. They've tried to ground this in something else. And we just saw how tempting it is for us moderns to ground it in us but he's grounding it in God, first tried to ground it in God, then Descartes and Kant and so forth tried to ground it in us. Uh, Heidegger is going along with somebody like Hegel in that respect. It's not groundable in any individual, any kind of entity. So, but now the question becomes, I want to leave you with this, but how could a culture see its own cultural style if it's invisible like the illumination, if it's pervasive like the water to the fish, and if it's, in, if it's in every detail of the culture, never mind the individual bodies, but it's all over in all tiny details of the micro practices, as Foucault might say, how does the culture ever get to see its own style? That's one question we've got to deal with. And the second question is, how does a style ever get started and get maintained? Well, that's what the origin of the work of art is about, both of those things. And that's why we're going to read it next. And now time is up. And, and but any last minute question? <coughs> Otherwise, yeah. So in terms of style and movement, so how does how where is what is the kind of discourse in this as far as these two things are concerned? He he says that he's describing the phenomena, just like you describe the mood at a party, for instance. Let me try that. You don't describe the mood of the party by describing each person's mood. 
there's a mood at the party, Heidegger was, says, and this is a nice example. I'm going to stop with this, but I want to tell you. There's a, there's a mood at the party. Anybody coming into the party gets that mood. And, uh, but the mood isn't going to be explainable in terms of the moods of each of the people at the party. And uh, the culture is a big version of that. His discourse is a, dis is a method for describing the overall style or mood that every individual will come into and get. But it's affected by the mood and style that Yes, and the discourse is itself within it. So how is it ever going to get, uh, get out of it? That's, the, the, uh, that's a good question. I'll get there. We will deal with that. Okay. Now, so I'm going to... Geertz wrote a very famous paper called Notes on the Balinese Cockfight, which is in this collection, The Interpretation of Cultures. He does what people call hermeneutic, that is, interpretive anthropology. He's the sort of leader and founder of that movement. And I'm going to read you some quotes. Because the Balinese cockfight turns out to be, in some very important ways, like what Heidegger means by a work of art, and in other very important ways not, and it will help us to see exactly what Heidegger is talking about. He, sa he says, an image, a fiction, a model, a metaphor, the cockfight is a means of expression. Its function is neither to assuage social <coughs> passions nor to heighten them, but in the medium of feathers, blood, crowds, and money to display them. So the first thing he sees is that there is this game, that the very important game that the Bal Balinese men play, and that something there is uh, displayed or shown. But it's not just shown. Let's read more. It is a meta-social commentary on the matter of assorting human beings into fixed hierarchical ranks and then organizing the major part of collected existence around that assortment. Its function, if you want to call it that, is interpretive. So it's not just displaying, it's interpreting. It is a Balinese reading, a Balinese experience, a story they tell themselves about themselves. I'm going to read more. Attending cockfights and participating them is them in them is for the Balinese a kind of sentimental education. That is, it educates their sentiments. While what he learns there, the Balinese man, and only men are in it, that's important for the, a difference between Heidegger and uh, what Geertz is talking about. What he learns there is what his culture's ethos and his private sensibility, or any way aspects of them, look like when spelled out externally in a collective text. And one more important point, it isn't just that the cockfight then copies something that's already there. It, in a certain sense, produces something. He says, quartets, still lights, and cockfights, notice the works of art that get in, mixed in with the cockfights, are not merely reflections of a pre-existing sensibility, analogically represented. They are positive agents in the creation and maintenance of such a sensibility. Well, if sensibility and ethos, remember, equal style, I read you a quote from Geertz last time saying that. So now we're to told that there, is, there are certain, I, let's call them objects, I don't know, events, objects, they're sort of rituals maybe, let's call it a ritual, it isn't exactly a ritual, but then there's certain something or others anyway that have the job of creating and maintaining something like the style. And... Note that such works aren't copies. They don't represent uh, something that's already there. But they don't create something ex nihilo either. They have some other kind of function. They, what we want to say is something like articulate or sharpen up or focus and hold up to people. Something which is already going on but it isn't going on as, as intensely as it's going to go on once it gets sharpened up and held up to the people. Geert says this, you know, uh, he says, it is this kind of bringing assorted experiences of everyday life to focus that the cockfight accomplishes and so creates what better than typical or universal could be called a paradigmatic human event. Well, paradigm is a terrific word for this. That's a fancy word for the glamorized I was using earlier. Something which is not just a typical case, but the best case. That's what an, it, it, a, a paradigm case is not, is, is, he sometimes uses the term exemplar. 
As you may know, it comes from grammar, where you get a paradigm is spelling out a verb, and you take the most regular, most typical verb for your paradigm. So, uh, so the, one of the ways to think of this then is that there have to be what we could call cultural paradigms that do this job of interpreting and articulating, focusing a culture. Now, another person who sees this is Charles Taylor. Uh, he, I won't read you his passages, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a very important paper of Charles Taylor called Interpretation in the Sciences of Man. Now, I don't think Gears got it from Heidegger. I don't, I don't have any evidence, but he, he seems to have figured it out on his own. Taylor may well have gotten it from Heidegger, although he doesn't say so. Taylor gives, he's good at phenomena, he talks about intersubjective meanings and he says the intersubjective meanings are shared ways of uh, responding to things. Uh, he gives an example, he says we all may have a certain understanding of feminine beauty but uh, it, and we respond to feminine beauty according to our uh, sensibility about it, but it may be totally unknown to everybody, but he says except to the people who make advertisements, who may have figured it out, are playing upon it, even though we don't know about it. But he, and that would be his intersubjective meanings, a very bad word, by the way. He, I, I'm surprised at him for taking that, because they're not subjective and therefore not intersubjective. They're not mental at all, if, if my story the sort of Bourdieu Merleau-Ponty story is right. They're in the habits and practices, but they're they're interpeople meanings anyway. And then he says, but there has to all there also have to be common meanings. Common meanings for him are examples that hold up to the people what they're up to. So he's from Quebec. So for the Quebecois, the the slogans about uh, free and independent Quebec and French is the national language, and so are, are common meanings that the Quebecois all accept as uh, expressions of their identity. I mean, of course, I would have said, let's follow through you know, on, on, the, on the feminine one, and think back to Marilyn Monroe. I mean, when you, it, it may have been unclear up to a point what the intersubjective meanings of feminine attraction were, but when she came along, she made it a common meaning. People, could, women could understand how they should be looking and behaving in the light of Marilyn Monroe, and men could understand sort of what form of, of uh, the feminine uh, uh, beauty attracted them in the light of Marilyn Monroe, and then it, this intersubjective meaning becomes a common meaning. Now, the person who's got this most figured out, and interestingly enough, though Taylor doesn't use the term paradigm, uh, the famous use of paradigm is in this. How many read the structure of scientific revolution of Kuhn? Not so many. It's the most read book of any academic book ever published. At least they sell the most out of that. I suppose that means people read it. It's very readable. I recommend you read it just for fun, for information, and for this course. It's fast. It's easy reading. It. Very easy reading. And he's got a totally Heideggerian feel for all these things, so he's never read a word of Heidegger. Every time I met him, I always said to him, read Heidegger, and he would say, yes, yes, and he did. He died recently. Okay, I'm going to read you a lot about Kuhn, of Kuhn, because what Kuhn says about paradigms is so helpful in understanding the role they play that Heidegger and Geertz and Taylor are all onto in various ways that, that it's just worth, worth hearing about it. Okay, paradigms for Kuhn. Kuhn is only interested in science. He's a historian of science. So we've had an anthropologist, we've had a philosopher, uh, Taylor, now we've got a historian, all seeing this from their own angles. He's discovered, and he's famous for this, that what he calls paradigms play a crucial role in science. He says, I'll give you pages in this, uh, page 43, close historical investigation of a given specialty at a given time 
discloses a set of recurrent and quasi-standard illustrations of various theories in their conceptual, observational, instrumental application. These are the community's paradigms. It's so interesting to me that Kuhn and Geertz should just come up with that word. Maybe Heidegger would have if he was writing in English. They, they are the community's paradigms revealed in its textbooks, lectures, and laboratory exercises. By studying them and by practicing with them, the members of the corresponding community learn their trade. That is, they pick up not only the intersubjective meanings, but the common meanings of, say, being a Newtonian scientist this way. Or on 175, he says, uh, he talks more about paradigm, and he discovers the difference between common meanings and uh, intersubjective meanings. He says, people have pointed out that in this book the term paradigm is used in two different senses. On the one hand, it stands for the entire collection of beliefs, values, techniques, and so on shared by the members of a given community. Are you getting used to this? That's the intersubjective meanings of Taylor. That's what being in time is about. Being in time has no understanding of works of art because it has no understanding of styles of culture. I said that last time. It's only got the sort of shared uh, activities, uh, what is it, beliefs, values, techniques, and you can add equipment and roles and so forth. Um, and, but now... That's, and, but now comes his version. On the other hand, it denotes some sort of element in the constellation, the concrete puzzle solutions, employed as models or examples, these are the, he's trying to find other words, can re, which can replace explicit rules as a basis for the re, solution of the remaining puzzles. Uh, the first sense of the term, call it sociological and so forth, and then but mainly, and paradigms, are these examples exemplary past achievements. Philosophically, this second sense of paradigm is the deeper of the two. That's very interesting. I mean, why is that the deeper of the two? Well, you ought to have this feeling because it focuses and stabilizes and makes shared and thereby gives sort of power to what is otherwise just a dispersed bunch of shared behavior. Um, so, now, I'm going to come back to Kuhn later, because he's, not, he's got lots of interesting things to say about paradigms that illustrate some of the obscurest things that Heidegger has to say about works of art. But I don't want to come back to him now. I want to go on. But I think this is... We're, going to, we're now plunging into the, to the Heidegger book, but before we do, it's a moment to stop and see if anybody has anything they want to say about this. Yeah. Maybe I can come talk to you in your office because I want to appeal to being in time again. Well, say something and I'll tell you whether we should talk about it. I wanted to see if, uh, if the, the, what the relationship between the style of culture and Das Mann and being in time would be. Because you were asking if it could be the style to be grounded in the habits. And that was one of the topics of the first papers is Das Mann grounded in the activities and habits of individuals. Okay, okay. I'll say this much for everybody. Das Mann is code in Heideggerian for the social norms, like uh, distance you have to stand from people and that you should eat with your uh, fork and not your knife and so forth. Well, the answer is something like, yeah, in, in the end, of course, the social norms embody the style, as Bourdieu mentions when he talks about how you stand and how you eat and how you talk and all that, is certainly part of the style. But Heidegger doesn't know that. He talks about it more on the level of just sort of any culture will have to have some rules about when to eat, what to eat, how to eat, and so forth. He doesn't see that the norms embody a style. So... So you're right, it's sort of implicit in being in time. He just hasn't got it yet. He hasn't got it. Why, why does he not see? The different, that the, the, the norms are, as I put it last time, coordinated in such a way as to open up a different sort of world in different cultures at different times. Yeah? Is he actually endorsing the phenomena as something that's, that's positive within culture, or is he just recognizing that it's functioning? He's endorsing it as positive because... I, have I said this yet? It seems to me I have, but I don't see why. 
Uh, maybe I have it. Uh, have I talked about meaningful dif- what I call meaningful differences? It seems to me I did, didn't I? Did I? Yeah, in what connection? Why? Oh, yeah, but I mean, not today, but I mean, last time. Did I? Yes, of course. That's it. I said, yes, when I was giving the Japanese baby as an example of style, remember I said the style lets things show up as something, and it lets people show up as something, and it has in it the meaningful differences. That is, what, what is worth doing and what is not. Distinctions of worthiness, I call them, qualitative distinctions. So Heidegger is saying, and we'll get to that in a minute, you're just jumping ahead, it's very important, he is not only describing it, he's endorsing it, it's a very positive function that a culture has got to have these, or it won't have distinctions of worthiness. That's where they are held up to people. Uh, yeah? Wouldn't you say there's sort of a dance between the culture and its individuals, and then the the culture affects the individuals and how they can show up, and the individuals, in turn, like Marilyn Monroe, affect what the culture is, and there's a sort of interplay. Absolutely. The work, to talk Heidegger jargon, the work of art needs the preservers. The preservers are all, in this case, the women who are imitating Marilyn Monroe, and the preservers need the work of art. They wouldn't have something to imitate if they didn't have the work of art. Yes, they, they go back and forth, and you need both of them. Uh, yeah? Heidegger is concentrating more on, like, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you call a balance talk by the work of art. You wouldn't. Now, like, he, now you might call it the, the Greek temple work of art. You would. But you know, there's something there's something about the Greek temple, when the builders of the Greek temple, they, they said that something is pre to the builders of the Greek temple of how the Greek temple should be. But I'm not sure if the balance, something was pre to the organizers of the talk by in order to reflect it. Ah, well, it's interesting what you're raising. There's so many interesting questions. If you thought that the builders of the Greek temple were important in some way and had some kind of plan, then you could say, well, it's been built according to that plan by these builders. But Heidegger wants to play that down. That's one reason he takes a Greek temple. I mean, we don't know who made them, and they sort of grew up by presumably the community, each one contributing their own skills. Somebody must have had some overall plan. But it's not not something that, that... plays a big role in Heidegger's understanding. When he talks about this, his funny way of talking is what, is, what makes the work of art is not the artist, but art, which means, in roughly, that what's really important is that whoever made the temple, they were responding to something that was going on in the culture, and that was what was important. So it isn't, you're on a, a track, but that's not the right piece of the track. I mean, that's not the important difference for, for Heidegger between the cockfight fight and the temple. Wouldn't, Holderlin wouldn't have written his own hymn, and his culture would have written his own hymn, right? It, in a way, Holderlin is... Uh, see, Holderlin is special. We don't want to get too far into this. He is an artist in a needy time, responding to the breakdown of a culture, so that the culture isn't simply calling him to uh, articulate its meaningful differences and its gods, because they're gone. So uh, I think once there's a breakdown, it's, it, even in being in time, that we, people use equipment transparently, and then something breaks down, the hammer of head comes off or something, then they have to become minds, so to speak. They have to think about it, notice it, decide what to do about it. And I think that, that you can't take a breakdown artist as the kind of artist he wants to talk about here. You have to take a, you can write a paper out this view and the special character of Herdelin, as remember the title you may know is that her, the, one of the essays on Herdelin is uh, what a thing a Dichterin Durstige Zeit, a, a, a poet in a, in a needy time uh, when the gods have fled and so forth. So, but let me go, let me follow up your question in one direction. Can anybody figure out yet, I would be surprised and almost upset, what is the crucial difference between the temple? in the top five. I doubt if it's clear yet. It's implicit in things. Yeah. Well, the cock fight is something that's alive and, and... That's a difference, but it's not the right kind of difference. I'm difference in function in the culture. There's something that the cock fight, that the temple does that the cock fight can't do. It makes a big difference. And Geertz doesn't see it very clearly. Mm-hmm. Though he sees it. He doesn't see that it's important. Heidegger thinks it's very important. Yeah. Okay, so the cock fight has a different use value than the 
that under that under that general description, yes. But what what difference? What's the important difference? They both uh, articulate. They both focus. They hold up to the people what they're up to. They give. They educate their sentiments, and they 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 they, they you know uh, what promote and, and and stabilize and the style. Those functions are all the same. But and I've covered up the difference the way I put it. Uh, yeah. Doesn't the temple have a certain amount kind of authority with it? Well, so does the cockfight. I mean, the big authority. I mean, the men have to do what the cockfight requires of them and, and so forth. Put it aside. I don't really want you to answer it now. And I'd be upset if you answered it yet. <laughs> Liz, do you want to say something? I was going to say something about norms a while ago. But okay. Then let's, let me go on. Um, okay, we're ready. And now you will get the answer to this. If you hear something, if you listen to this, what I'm going to read right in it is the answer to the question we just asked. It. We're ready to jump to Heidegger, <coughs> and we've already jumped to the Greek temple in a way. For Heidegger, the Greek temple is, so to speak, a paradigm paradigm. It's a very, very good example of a work of art doing what works of art do when they function in their very special way at their best. And he also likes to pick it because it's certainly not representational. You can't say, you might think that a tragedy is an imitation of an action or a representation of an action. Aristotle did. So much the worse for Aristotle, Heidegger would say, who in general likes Aristotle a lot, but his uh, play reviews are not Aristotle at his best. Uh, so, it, it, because the interesting thing about the temple is it's not a representation of anything, obviously. What could it be a representation of? So, the, and now he's going to go and describe it. He says about it, where is it? It's not a representation, of some, I think, right? It says portrays nothing. Where does he say that? It's bottom of 41. That's where I expect to find it. Yeah, okay, let's start there. A build, let's start at the bottom of 41. A building, a Greek temple, portrays nothing. It stands in the middle of the rocky valley. It encloses the figure of the god. The, the, the work of art and, 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 and being a god are pretty much the same. Think about why we call Marilyn Monroe a goddess. It's the same idea, which we'll get back to. Why are they gods or goddesses? Um, and it stands in the holy precinct, uh, the god does. By means of the temple, the god is present. And this, never mind that for a minute. <coughs> the god is an extension and delimitation of the holy precinct. That, never mind all that. Let's go. Here's the crucial part now. It is the temple work that first fits together and at the same time gathers around itself the unity of those paths and relations in which birth and death, disaster and blessing, victory and disgrace, endurance and decline, acquire the shape of destiny for human beings. The all-governing expanse of this open, relational context is the world of this historical people. That's the central passage in the, in the essay. That's the phenomenon that all of this is a kind of meditation on. And what do we hear? Well, that it, in a sense, focuses, that is, fits together everything that's going, that's going on, it unifies what? The meaningful differences. What, what, I mean, it, it describes, in effect, the way that birth and death are important. Not just that they're important, they're important in any culture. That what counts as disaster and blessing, what counts as victory and disgrace and so forth. And, and here comes the punch, let's see if you can see why this is important. The all-governing expanse of this open relational context is the world of this historical people. How did we just go beyond cockfights? Yeah? The world has the best in the yes, but, and, and, but that's the function of the other part of it. That's the result. Yeah? Yeah? Does the temple protect the world of the people? Yes, what? Does the temple protect the world of the people? Yes, but it's not the difference between the, that and the cockfight. Yeah? No, no, that, that, that's, the temple is there, but dead, Heidegger will say. He says it's nice to go and look at the temple, but it's not an artwork working anymore. No, I mean, this is so obvious, I think, that you just don't see it. But, but it, it's important to me, and it's important to Heidegger. Namely, it's in the all-governing expanse. It's the world. I mean, the thing about the cockfight is, and Geertz was hedging it, it's, he says it's, it's only for men. And he says some aspects of their sensibility. They don't have a unified understanding of being. There isn't any work of art for the, for the Balinese that holds up to them their unified style because they don't have a unified style. 
They don't have a work of art, and because they don't have a work of art, they don't have a unified style. Uh, and what, what the women presumably also have their ritual. I think it's weaving in, in Bali, but I'm not sure. It is in the Berber culture that uh, uh, Bourdieu talks a lot about. But in any case, they'll have their story. So there'll be two understandings of being, two understandings of what it is to be a human being and what sort of objects show up as value, uh, uh, as, and what are the meaningful differences. And uh, the interesting thing about the temple, and remember I said last time it only starts in our culture and it only starts in 500 BC, that there is something which expresses the style of the whole culture, that it has a unified understanding of being. That's what's special. Yeah? I guess the problem I'm having with that is, is that like some egalitarian fantasy that he has about Greek society? I mean, would a yeah. cultural anthropologist agree, yes, you know, this did incorporate women, did incorporate the whole society? Ah, interesting about women. Uh, yes, this Liz. There's also another question. Um, I was worrying about something like that. I mean, so the Greeks had slaves, right? Yeah. Now, does anybody who is sort of physically present in the area Right, count thereby as a, mem a member of the world. Well, I, I think these are good questions. Suppose we said that it even defines what counts as a bull and a cricket, he says at one point. I mean, apparently at this level of describing the understanding of being, remember, as something like whooshing up and lingering and going away and maybe having very clear outlines while it lingers. And I don't you have to sort of read Homer and Aeschylus and try to get a feel for it. It might well be that at that level of generality, he thinks it includes slaves and women too. I think he does. I think that's what it is about an understanding of being. Uh, they, uh, but then it becomes less clear why the cockfights don't include. Oh, it's, no, it's not. I mean, there, there it's a question of, of, of competition, of who's going to win and destroy the other one and so forth. It's too concrete. I mean, that's not about weaving. That's not about nurturing. I mean, it's as if there's an aggressive ritual and a nurturing ritual. And there will, could be all 100% aggressive cultures. We might be one. And there could be 100% nurturing cultures. The Japanese on the story I told you might be one. Uh, but Heidegger thinks, and when there is one, he doesn't think the Japanese are one, but I mean, when there is one, then there can be something that, that holds up that style. Now, I don't know whether he thinks, I'm back to you, I don't know what he thinks that the women, I think, and the slaves and the crickets and the bulls and everything shows up in this style. That could be wrong. It doesn't much matter, I think, whether it's wrong. I have to think about this. Because he certainly, because he, one, he knows that there could be things that fall outside it that be, and, and, and because there is a struggle to bring them in. We'll read about that. Um... Uh, but it is very important to him that the Greeks had a unified style. I wouldn't say one more thing. And that doesn't seem to be just a Heideggerian idea because, and I gather from talking to Paul Rabinow and people in anthropology, that, that it's generally agreed that the West is a peculiar kind of culture which is called a hot culture, which as opposed to a cold culture, a hot culture has a history where a history, of course, can't be just a bunch of events because there are plenty of cultures that have events. The Chinese had, what, about 3,000 years of events which they carefully kept track of and dynasties and so forth. A hot culture is one where the whole understanding of what it is to be, in Heidegger jargon, uh, or what reality changes every once in a while. And there have to have be at least some dominant general understanding of what it is to be in order for there to be history, we'll get back to history, where there can be changes of understanding of reality. Now, I think you could probably say that this dominant one might well exclude a lot of people. I'm not sure. As long as the people who matter agree that this is what matters, I think that's enough to get Heidegger history going. However, I think Heidegger does have a stronger claim because it's the understanding of being I think he thinks that anybody that counts as being at all is going to come under this style. And you're welcome to sort of think about that and criticize it and see whether people think about how people thought about the Greeks. I mean, it will have to be just the Athenians, for instance, or, or at least it isn't, he isn't claiming that the Spartans come under this understanding of being. It would have to be 
the people how many have had philosophy six from me I mean, not so many I mean the people that Aeschylus is speaking for in, 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 in when he writes his tragedy that Heidegger is referring to uh, Heidegger let me just read this for a minute at the bottom at the bottom of the next on page 43 you get another statement of this in the tragedy the middle of 42 in a tragedy nothing is staged or displayed theatrically that's where he's disagreeing with Aristotle but the battle of the new <coughs> gods against the old is being fought the linguistic work originating in the speech of the people doesn't refer to this battle it transforms the people saying so that now every living word fights the battle and puts up for decision and here come the meaningful differences again what is holy and unholy what is great what is small brave and cowardly what is lofty and flighty what master and what slave now when the Oresteia was performed all the Athenians were there the men and the women I don't know whether the slaves were there I have no idea uh, 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 but at least the women who generally were at home I were, were certainly there and the, it, was all, it was a story about the relation of men and women and of old gods and new gods and it was the story that the Athenians all told themselves and the amazing thing is at the end of the Oresteia the people from the audience join the actors in one scene in which they enact the formation of Athens I mean that's a work of art working and uh, that's what that I mean that's the best example that the Heidegger could have uh, did I have another hand yeah I was just curious it seems that the passage with the temple um, so far I just want to clarify it seems like for you um, your interpretation of Heidegger here that the, the work of art is going to articulate the relationship between the Right. And notice the Kuhnian paradigms don't either, just to take it out. They're only for scientists. Right, go ahead. Yeah. But when he starts talking and discussing I mean, when he gets into Earth, the world, and the temple, and some of the things that the temple shows, like the surf and the rocks, and um, it seems like he's appealing to, to other kinds of things that this is showing that goes beyond, like a factors that go beyond just for some somehow the context of the people. It's almost like a tension for me that I, I'm not sure if I'm misinterpreting it, but it's interesting to me there's this almost this a historical quality in it in the sense that he's talking about these objective so, features something that yeah. you know, a work of art will bring out that anybody as a human yeah. see no I don't I think that's wrong I'm going to try to explain why but I'm glad you're thinking of it that way but let me just say why that better not be right it's too metaphysical it's as I mean if he thinks that there is some I mean there's everything in when, when Heidegger's in this stage he's very much history oriented and, and nothing important falls outside the historical so he's going to have to say that even the earth and the colors and the sounds are, are going to be in the style of Greek earth and Greek colors and sounds and the temple is going to exactly tell you what a, what a Greek sound and color and earth and storm is like compared to a Christian one of course you don't hear it that way or compared to a Balinese one but that's the idea I think uh, yeah then how is the man go painting by a certain individual fit in here at all a complete loser the Van Gogh painting I said did you come in late or, or okay well, but you, that's wonderful that you should say that because I mean the, the Van Gogh painting is a terrible example that's why I skipped over it one it doesn't hold up to the people the general thing there of their style it only shows you the peasant world and the peasant style secondly it doesn't hold it up to the peasant because no the last people are going to see the Van Gogh painting of the peasant shoes are the peasants who wear those shoes third it hangs in a museum and he's quite clear that this has to be sort of performed in public if it's going to do its job so he shouldn't be talking about those shoes the only excuse for talking about the shoes is he says that it shows that the work of art can show you a world <coughs> that's the that it shows you the world of the peasant but it is not to use Heidegger jargon a case of a work of art working because when a work of art working it not only shows a world it it produces, maintains, stabilizes, articulates for the people their own world. So we're going to skip it. Uh, let me, shall I go on? You want to say something more, I think? Did you? Oh, no, okay. Let me go on for a while. You'll probably find plenty more to talk about in a minute. So there's the temple, and, and, uh, and how does it, it works by holding this up. I guess I have read what I want to read for you. Yeah, I'm going on to the next story. We've seen all the meaningful differences. Um, we, 
you can see that it really is articulating and stabilizing the world on 44. Well, no, you can't, but you can see how, you can see that it articulates and stabilizes the world, but you can see him talking about world. And if you start in the middle of 44, you can see it. To be a work means to set up a world. But what is it to be a world? And then, last time I tried to tell you what it was to be a world. He's going to tell you now in his own terms. He's going to build into the notion of world, of course, style now, so that it means more than it meant in being in time. But what he says about world is just wonderful. I'll read it. Wonderful to sort of give you a sense of why, what it is and why he thinks it's important. The, the world is not the mere collection of the countable or uncountable familiar and unfamiliar things that are just there. If you need a word for that, call it the universe. The universe is the totality of stuff, the totality of what there is. Uh, that's nothing for yet. I mean, nothing in the universe is going to show up as anything until there's a world. But neither is it an imagined framework added by our representation to the sum of given things. Okay, it's not a belief system. It's not a set of categories. It's not the kind of thing that Kant and cognitivists talk about either. We talked about all that last time. He's just saying what I said last time. The world worlds. Now that's interesting. Why does he say that? Because he can't say that the world is. Because it's thanks to the world that things get whatever kind of being they've got as created or as uh, fusis, that is, whooshing up, or as, or as objects. <coughs> the world uh, isn't created and it isn't an object and it isn't whooshing up. It's the understanding in the background that enables us to encounter everything as whatever, any of those things. It's more fundamental than... It, it, it determines various... Each world determines what some particular way of being. But you shouldn't think of the world as itself having a way of being. Uh, oh, something crossed my mind I wanted to say about that. Oh, nuts. Wait a minute. I don't know. It'll come back to me. Uh, now he's going to say something wrong in a minute, which I don't, which I just prepared you for. He shouldn't say that the world is. He should say the world worlds or something like that. I mean, it's got. To, he's got to have another word for it. The understanding of being or the or the truth of being is more basic than, in Heidegger language, the being of beings, namely to be a creature, to be a, to be an object, and so forth. So, and, and he, now he says, and is more fully in being. That is wrong, I think. I can't do anything about that. He said it. I looked it up in the German because sometimes he corrects mistakes in the German. He didn't fix it. I don't know what it means. There aren't degrees of being. And the world is not more fully in being than the tangible realm. What he really wants to say is, of course, something like the world is more important and more fundamental and a deeper kind of, has a deeper function than any particular beings. But it's a bad way to put it, that it's more fully in being. I can't... If anybody can, you know, explain why he should say it that way, I'll be glad to find out, but I can't. Uh, so, but it's certainly somehow... You can't say more real either, you see, because reality gets changed. Reality is createdness. Reality is object. I mean, the world determines what counts as reality. So you can't say the world is more real than anything. You've got to say... Ah, the world worlds, and that's more, I would say something like more basic than anything. Remember that, that being is, I mean, that, well, world is that on the basis of which anything gets understood uh, and shows up as anything. Yeah? I was just wondering if it might have something to do with the level of concealment of which is... I can't, I mean, that doesn't help me any. I mean, I just think it's just, you get what he's trying to say. He's trying to say the world is the most basic, the most important, more fundamental than, than any kind of entities at all, or even the general characteristic of the entities, namely their reality. It's, it, it's what defines what counts as reality. Yeah? Isn't that, isn't that getting into the definition of the Earth? No, not yet. No, no, no. Why, why would you think that? Well, because, because 
goes before everything, and it doesn't have its own being. We can't, we can't see it, we can't understand it. Right, right. Ah, ah, but it's not because, you see, they're very interesting, very interesting. The world withdraws, remember I said, because it's transparent, because it's generally in the background. Ah, that's what I wanted to talk about, was the background. I knew it would come back to me. But in a minute, so let me, don't let me forget it. Uh, but the way the, the earth withdraws, which is what you're thinking of, is different. Because he says the earth struggles with world. And if world were earth, that wouldn't make any sense. So we've got to figure, we'll get there. Uh, by the way, how many have had Searle when he talks about the background in any course? Well, then I should relate this to that. It's when I talked about how there are some kind of practices which are there and have to be in place before we can relate to anything. In Searle language, we couldn't have any intentionality. We couldn't be directed toward objects under aspects. We couldn't have action. There wouldn't be any us if it weren't for the background. And he even says about the background that it's something that we don't have a normal language for because we never have to deal with it. It's a, it, it's a, it has to be in place before we deal with things. Uh, that uh, we don't have a skill for dealing with the background. It's, it's our collection of skills for dealing with people and things. He's got a very Heideggerian feel for the background, its importance, and that it's invisible and withdraws, and that philosophers have always have never talked about it. Cyril talks about that and how it makes philosophers nervous when he brings it up. Uh, yeah? Are you familiar with a French philosopher by the name Michel Serres? Uh, well, I certainly know the name Michel Serres, but I've never read anything by him. In his uh, book, The Total of Knowledge, he talks about a place where things can, can, can be positive third, third time. Um, well, if they have it. No, well, don't, and they have it, so we, it won't help. Uh, that, but I have this common thing with Searle, so we can bring that out. It was after we gave seminars together on Heidegger that Searle came up with the background. I mean, it isn't as if it's, it's Heidegger, it's his own sort of version, but it, it's somehow related to that. Uh, it, anyway, so let's go on. Now, let's see here. Uh, okay, so, so the, we just read about the, the world. Um, Let's go on finishing this. The world is never an object that stands before us and can be seen. The world is the ever non-objective to which we are subject as long that is governed, as he puts it, it governs the paths of destiny. We're subject to it, remember, because world determines what it makes sense to do. In that sense, world governs what we do. I mean, we do what masculine and feminine people do in our culture. We can't do what masculine and feminine people do in the Bali culture. We can't, to take an extreme example, uh, commit Harry Carey. It's not something that makes sense for us to do. It makes sense in the Japanese, traditional Japanese world. Uh, so, so we're governed by the world setting out the paths of destiny, what it makes sense for people to do. and, and uh, it's, we are subject as long as the paths of birth and death, blessing and curse, keep us transported into being. Um, I think that I've written in here that, that, that in, if that's a translation of Dasein, Da hyphen Zein, which Heidegger writes when he wants to talk about, sometimes that's another name for the, the clearing or the open. Wherever those decisions of our history that relate to our way of be, our very being are made, are taken up, abandoned, or go unrecognized and are rediscovered by new inquiry, there the world worlds. So that's, we, that's clear. Uh, and I think, I mean, they're pretty amazingly clear. And what does the world do? Well, remember I said it's what it lets everything show up as anything. Heidegger puts this, uh, I just want to read this on 43, back to the temple. <coughs> the first paragraph on 43. The temple in its standing there first gives to things their look and to men their outlook on themselves. Remember that's why I said the style of the culture lets things show up as anything and lets us show up as anything. That's another way Heidegger puts it. <coughs> and now we're getting a little further. And the work of art shines. That's a new angle. We've had it in the background. But why, why does he say that it shines? Well, he does say that on 44. He talks here about its splendor and <coughs> about five lines down. Dignity and splendor are not properties beside and behind which the God who stands as something distinct 
but rather in the dignity and the splendor that the God, the God is present. I have to repeat where the God and the temple come together. In the reflected glory of this splendor, there glows, that is, there lightens itself what we call the world. Now, where is the God? Oh, on 43, he's prepared it for this, right before the stuff I read about the tragedy. Um, right after the temple, I should have just gone on, gives men their outlook on themselves. This view remains open as long as the work is a work, as long as the God has not fled from it. Remember that the, when the temple can lie or be around from another thousand years, but it's not a work of art anymore, in Heidegger talk, when it's not working. And it's not working when the Greek world is dead and there isn't that there is no world for it to, to articulate anymore. And then the God has fled from it. It's the same with the sculpture of the God and so forth. It's not a portrait. We're back to that again. It is the work that lets the God himself be present and thus is the God himself. So now we're ready to say, why, why does he think the work of art is a God? Well, I think it's very interesting why, why he says that. Because God is supposed to be what creates everything and makes it intelligible. Well, that's now gone over to the job of the temple. The temple lets anything be anything and makes us able to see it as anything. So the temple is like a non-metaphysical, non-ontotheological God. It's, it takes over the functions of the, 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 in Heidegger thinking, the temple was the original, so to speak, God. It's the metaphysicians and the Judeo-Christians who made the mistake of thinking that God was, had to be universal, eternal, outside the world to make, to ground intelligibility and make anything be anything. But Heidegger says, no, no, when it, at the beginning, when it, when it started, that there was some one thing that grounded all intelligibility and made anything be anything, it was the temple, not the good, as in Plato, or the creator God. So the temple and the God are pretty much the same thing. And the God shines, or the temple shines. Why does he say that? It took me a long time to figure that out. He says in the appendix that what we call beauty in the work of art is really the shining of it. Well, you can't th think that at night, you know, the Greek temple before there was uh, sun and lumière and tourists was lit up. That can't be what it means for it to shine. <coughs> well, what is it? Well, I gave you really my hint of it in Marilyn Monroe, who is a goddess. What does it mean for her to shine and be a star? Well, it means that we see things in the light of it. <coughs> if you hold on to that phrase, you can understand it. <coughs> the work of art of the god is what we are able to see ourselves and everything else in the light of. That is, by glamorizing in such a clear way that we can all see it and all see that we all see it. We can see ourselves and everybody else and everything else in terms of it. So we see everything in the light of it. Therefore, we say it shines. That's at least, as I think, after many years of worrying about why it shines, is the right answer to that. He talks about it again on page 64, just mentions the shining of truth. And I didn't look it up, but it does say beauty equals shining, doesn't he, in the, uh, in the appendix, or did I just make that up? I think he does. Are there two appendices? Yes, somewhere there's something about beauty and shining. In here. <coughs> Anybody find it? Maybe I made it up. I think he said that actually earlier. I'm he says that somewhere earlier? He first mentioned Alethea. Alethea, Alethea, he talks about... 36. Ah, okay. Let's try that. Can you talk about beauty? The being of the being turned into the steadiness of the shining. The name starts talking about beauty. The name Great. Of the be this. Ah, that's terrific. Uh, but does he say... Oh, yeah. Until the, yeah, the beauty of the beautiful. Right. Well, that's what I should be quoting. Let me write it down. It says the being of being comes into the steadiness of its shining. That's right. That's the quote I need. Full I'm gonna, the last uh, sentence of the full second paragraph. Yeah, I got it. I see that. But, but everybody else should see it. Yeah, the last sentence of the second paragraph. And then, then the nature of art would be the truth of being setting itself to work. Until now, had, had, art had presumably has to do with the beautiful and beauty uh, and not with truth. But in fact, what they're really talking about when they talk about beauty, it turns out, 
I'm now reading into it, is this shining. Maybe, I'm sure that's what I had in mind, and I don't know how I ever lost the crucial quote, but now we've got it back. Okay. So, it's as if you can, you ask how you can see the light in the room. Well, you can see the light in the room if there's some light bulb, so to speak, that's shining and uh, is such a kind of clear manifestation of the style, I'm trying to mix these sort of metaphors, that you can see it and then you can, then you can have a sense of what this background style is. That's the, the idea. And so it can be, I wrote down here now like a god, I'm just doing things in a different order, let me catch up with myself. I think I've read that. Right. But notice then, it's, I want to say, but it's not eternal, he's very clear, not outside the world. We should read that. At the bottom of four. I'm trying to show you how the work of art is like a god, but Heidegger's gods can die. Uh, it's not eternal. You don't have to be, to be a god for Heidegger, it's a mistake to think that gods have to be eternal and universal. Uh, that's just not, not their job description. At the bottom of 40, the Aegina sculptors in the Munich collection, Sophocles, Antigone, and the best edition are works, uh, are, as the works they are, torn out of their own native sphere. However high their quality and so forth, uh, placing them in a collection has withdrawn them from their world. That's, remember, that's what's wrong with the Van Gogh shoes, I keep wanting to say. But even when we make an effort to cancel or avoid such displacement, when we visit the temple in Testum, that's the one Heidegger visited. A beautiful temple. I have a picture of it in my office. I've visited it twice. You can really see, I mean, you can almost feel what it was like to have the gods present, but of course they're not present anymore, so that's kind of sentimental, and Heidegger agrees. When we visit the pe temple in Pestum at its own site or the Bamberg Cathedral, the world of the work that stands there has perished, uh, and then they cannot be undone. They, uh, and that's just part of what it is to be a work of art. To It's sort of like thesis, it occurs to me. A work of art comes around, lingers, and goes out of being. That's how things are. Uh, I, it, it belongs in the Fuchsus period that it, that it was discovered, I guess. So let's see now. Uh, one more way of putting it on page 61. He's very careful about this. In the bottom paragraph. By the way, truth is another name. We'll get back to truth, but I better say something about it right now. Heidegger, I better talk a lot about truth right now, because I can't talk about what I want to talk about unless I do. Uh, so, truth for, where's the Alethea passage now? I, I might as well read oh. it now. That's on 36. Yeah. So back to 36. Yeah, Boy, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff happens before the temple that I, yeah, okay, let's go back there. Uh, so, the Greeks talked about Alethea, unconcealing. We say truth, and so forth. Well, when you hear Heidegger talking about truth, you mustn't think of truth as correspondence, as we do now. He thinks that's a very derivative form of truth, where, you know, I say uh, there is a lectern on this table, and this is true if there is a lectern on this, if and only if there's a lectern on the table. Or I say there are 60 people in the room, and then we can count them and see if that's true or not, whether it corresponds. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And Heidegger thinks that that's certainly one of the ways we use the word truth. But he thinks that there's a more fundamental kind of truth, which is that there's a world at all. So that desks and lecterns and students can show up and be counted and correspond to something. Uh, it's like Kuhn saying that it isn't that uh, Newton and Aristotle claims are true when they correspond to reality, but what reality is for Aristotle and what reality is for uh, Newton is different, and before you have an understanding of reality, you can't make truth claims at all. You, it isn't as if uh, there were just states of affairs out there in the universe, and we made propositions that correspond to them. Uh, sort of Davidson and Heidegger agree that's not the right way to think about truth. But then Heidegger, unlike Davidson, and misleadingly, unfortunately, decides to call the, the open or the clearing or the world, which makes possible propositions that correspond, 
and makes possible ordinary truth. Truth, in, its de- in a deeper sense. And so he, and he says, look, the Greeks understood this. They had this word aletheia, which means unconcealing. Lethe is forgetting. It's the river, like the river Lethe. And aletha is a negative. So it's unforgetting. So he translates it unconcealing. And he says, and that means disclosing. So there has to be a world disclosed before there can be any true claim, any truth claim. And then Heidegger has this weird view in being in time already that if something is the condition of the possibility of something else, you can name the condition of the possibility with the same <coughs> name as what it's a possibility of. So if, if aletheia is the condition of the possibility of truth claims, disclosing, then you ought to be able to call disclosing truth too, because it's, well, because that's what I mean. That's, and that's very misleading and confusing. And now let me say one, two things. He regretted it for two reasons. I mean, aletheia is fine and disclosing is fine, but calling it truth is not a good idea because we've already got a use for the word truth. He regretted it, one, because it was confusing, and two, because he claimed that the Greeks didn't have a correspondence theory of truth at first. They only had truth is disclosing in Homer. And then some classicists made him eat his words and proved that showed that in Homer, truth already meant correspondence. So Heidegger sort of gulped and took it back and said, well, that's what they should have said. Uh, and so that is, they should have said the more primordial truth is aletheia. But we don't care about... We, I mean, we have to use his word because otherwise we won't be able to read. So whenever he says truth, like the truth of being, I wrote on the board, remember, like understanding of being, the truth of being is a name for... Uh, worlds or disclosing uh, uh, the, the, the opening that makes it possible to encounter anything. And now, why did I mean, I said all this because there was something I couldn't say until I got there. Uh, that did it. Well, thank you. Let's go to page 61 and find out. What? Oh, 36 is what I was just explaining, right? Well, I think so. Let me, but I'll read it. Maybe you're right. I should read it on 36 first. The Greeks called the unconcealedness of beings aletheia. We say truth, that is translating it, and think little enough in using the word. If there occurs in the work a disclosure of a particular being, disclosing what and how it is, then there is there an occurring, a happening of truth at work. So now it's going to be, he's going to say, that in a work of art, truth sets to work. That, and, and, uh, let, let, look, skip a little. The nature of art then would be this, the truth of being setting itself to work. That means, the, that's just another name for art opens up a world. Now, let's look at 61, because it was because I was there or somewhere around there that I got into this. Uh, yeah, okay, at the bottom of 61. I had to explain why he says truth does not exist it's about 15 lines from the bottom in and bo- in itself beforehand somewhere among the stars only later to descend among beings this is impossible for reason alone it is after all only the openness of beings that first affords the possibility of somewhere in a place filled by present beings clearing our openness and establishing the open belong together and so forth so In other words, you couldn't have any kind of truth of the normal sort if you didn't have this more basic kind of truth. But this more basic kind of truth doesn't exist in in Plato's heaven of true propositions or true states of affairs. It only exists insofar as there are human beings and practices and works of art and equipment and all of this which preserves and opens up, opens up and preserves a world. And then he comes back to about the same phrase, one, well, he's now going to tell you, but we're not going to get there today, various ways the truth establishes itself. He's going to generalize from a work of art to all those other sorts of entities and events that also focus a culture. But I, I guess I could jump to that, given that I have three more minutes. I think I will. Okay, so let's do it that way. At the top of 62... Uh, he, he says, truth establishes itself in the beings it has opened up, truth setting itself to work. And then he gives you a list. This is again this, um, a good place to end and, and 
go back to the beginning. This is now he's finally worked himself around in his art academy lecture to what he really wants to talk about, which isn't art at all. It's something much more basic. It's the various ways that worlds are opened up and stabilized. And so he gives you a list. Truth occurs in the act that founds a political state. That might be uh, Hitler, and I'm pro- it probably might well be what he had in mind, but it could, of course, also be the Constitution of the United States. It, doesn't necess- it, it, it isn't always a bad thing. Uh, still, another way in which truth comes to shine forth is the nearness of that which is not simply a being, but the being that is most of all. That means <coughs> a God. I take it that means perhaps Jesus. For instance, there's a, a God who is a work of, who is establishing a truth. Another way truth grounds itself is the essential sacrifice. I take that 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 means martyrs, but he doesn't say much about that. Uh, maybe Martin Luther King or Gandhi or something like that. People who show that something is worth dying for, uh, and namely some whole understanding of what it is to be. He's not. He, he's very brief about these things. Um, Still another way in which truth becomes is the thinker's questioning, which is the thinking of, of being, names being, and its question worthiness. That's interesting. So among the list of the ways truth sets itself to work, we get <coughs> philosophers, because philosophers name being. Parmenides and Heraclitus say thesis. And then Plato, well, never mind Plato, we better jump up to the medievals who say uh, uh, created stuff, ends creative in Latin, I think. And then Aristotle names the new world into being when he says subjects and, and objects. So thinkers, and Kant sort of nails that world when he articulates it as uh, autonomy and maturity, modernity. So thinkers have this important job of finding a language in which to focus, articulate, and stabilize understandings of being. And so now we've gone all the way from Geertz's glimmers about rituals to Heidegger's understanding about temples to Heidegger's generalization to all those entities that perform a certain function, namely to open up and, and stabilize a world. We, that's, we've got lots to talk about. Earth, for instance, which keeps coming up, right? What, what's that? What's for Tuesday? Finish reading the essay for Tuesday. We're going to do Earth and World and the end of the essay. Now, we were talking about truth setting itself into work. Remember? I think that's where we were. That's where I marked. That is, we had talked a lot about how the work of art, namely the Greek temple, which is a thing, and, and, there, and, a, and a work of art is a thing, and a thing which... Uh, focuses the practices, articulates the style, glamorizes it, holds it up to the people so they can see what they share, where they can see the meaningful differences in their lives, and they can act in the light of this work of art, which is shining by that means, this glamorized object in that is so... Uh, Splendid that you can you wish you were like that and you behave like that and I was talking I think at the end about Marilyn Monroe as in a certain way a work of art a kind and a, a work of art is like a god Heidegger says she's a goddess she's a star she shines and a certain part of the world namely the world of the erotic and feminine attractiveness is lit up. She's not a full work of art. I didn't say this last time, but I don't want to confuse you. Uh, Remember, though, there are these partial works of art, like the cockfight in Bali, like rituals, which light up a certain aspect of the culture, masculine masculine stuff in the case of the cockfight in Bali. Uh, And Marilyn Monroe lights up basically feminine stuff in our culture, so she wouldn't be uh, a whole work of art or a, or a god in the Heidegger sense. What she really is, is a god in the sense of a Homeric god. The Homeric gods light up what we could call subworlds, like the world of the men in Bali and the world of the women in Bali. Uh, and Heidegger gets around to that. And we will too, I hope. 
I'll try to bring it in when we get to the talk about the thing. He finally wrote about the Homeric gods late on, or talked about them, and it's published now in his lectures. And they are exactly like Marilyn Monroe. I mean, when Aphrodite comes on the scene, then she shines, and everything shows up as erotic. And uh, what's her name? Uh, Helen runs off with this attractive stranger. Paris and forgets her husband and children and so forth. And later she explains that she says, well, Aphrodite was there. And nobody blames her. Everybody sees, well, that's obviously what it made sense to do if you were in the light of Aphrodite. But uh, that, I just want to put that aside. You know, that, I don't want you to be misled. When a work of art sets up a world, it sets up a whole world uh, that for everybody in the culture. And that's what we were talking about. But I want to generalize now from the work of art which sets up a world to any being in the clearing that does that job. That's where we were last time. Uh, I just, on the middle of 44, just a sentence, slogan here, to be a work means to set up a world. Uh, that's the beginning of the first full paragraph on 44. That's what I've just been reviewing. That was the subject of last time's lecture. Now. But to be a work, really, if you keep really carefully the vocabulary Heidegger's using, even when he isn't careful, to be a, a, to be a work is just one way to set up a world. It's to be a thing that sets up a world, like a temple, a cathedral, or even a star, a human being, if there were a star that could manifest our whole cultural understanding of being. I don't think they are like that. I think they're more like Homeric gods and goddesses. But a, a thing setting up a world. But then, on 61, he recognizes, and it's very important, that there's something more general. There is all sorts of ways to disclose a world, open up a world. It doesn't have to be done by a thing. It doesn't have to be, in his funny language, which is sort of neat, an artwork working. It could be something else. Uh, and what is the general name for this something else? Well, his general name for it is truth establishing itself. Now, why in the world? This is the bottom of 61, the very bottom. But why in the world would he call it truth establishing itself? Well, remember the truth. We talked about this last time, too, but last time seems ages ago. Uh, is for him aletheia, which is unconcealedness, which is disclosing. Oh, and unconcealing and disclosing are the same idea. And so for truth to establish itself means that a world is opened up or disclosed, <laughs> and uh, there are many way ways you can do it. Remember that kind of truth. I didn't maybe say this clearly enough, so I'm going to say it again. That, what Heidegger sometimes calls in being in time primordial truth, which opens up a world, makes possible the ordinary kind of truth, which we have now got in our, which we now think of as truth in our tradition, namely correspondence. I mean, once you've got a world, then you can make true statements. I gave the example, I know there are 60 seats in the room, something like that. But, but that's possible because we've already opened up a world in which there are rooms and seats and counting and all sorts of practices that we all share. So, now, we're interested in other ways of opening up worlds, and he starts, he lists them on the top of 62. Well, let's start at the bottom. One essential way in which truth establishes itself is the beings it has, in the beings it has opened up, is truth setting itself into work. Now, I just explained that, just to, just to make sure that I'm getting across. What kind, what, what is that truth setting itself into work? Hmm? I mean, give, what's an example of truth setting itself into work? Talks about a political state. No, no, that's not. That's, who said that? That's exactly what it's not. Okay. Truth setting itself into work is a work of art. I mean, this is sort of technical terms. Truth sets itself into work when there's a thing that focuses the practices. Because there is, just remember the pun, it's an artwork. A political person is not an artwork. 
Uh, and, and neither is a goddess an artwork, I think, now that I think about it. A goddess is a goddess. We'll get to that. But uh, anyway, another way in which truth occurs is the act that founds a political state. See, so he's got this bigger, he's got this special case. Truth establishes itself by setting itself into work, and that's what he's been talking about up to now. Greek temples, cathedrals, and so forth. And he's doing it that way, remember, because he's giving this lecture at the Art Academy. But really, he's not focusing on artworks. He, he, well, he is, but he shouldn't be. He's really inter- what he's really interested in is something much more general. He's interested in any way that a being can open up and, and stabilize a clearing or a world. He even says that in a certain place, which I wasn't about to read, but now I've said it, I better find it. Might not be as easy as I thought. Oh, it is. It's on 61. About five lines down. The openness of this open, that is truth. The world, open, clearing, are all the, this, op- this disclosing, unconcealing. It's the same story. The openness of this open, that is truth, that is Aletheia, can be what it is, namely this openness, only if and as long as it establishes itself within its open. Hence, there must always be some being in this open, something, that is, in which the openness takes its stand and attains its constancy. Now, that's what he's explaining. And an artwork is one of them. But now, another way in which truth occurs is the act of found a political state. And I, I can't remember what I said last time already and what I didn't say. Did I give an example of that? Did I? Yeah? Frank, can you speak up a little? You can't hear me? Not very well. We've got some rapid coming in. Amazing. I'm never the first time in, the, in history that I couldn't be heard in a little room like this. Are, are you all you're having trouble hearing me back there? A well, some of you. Anyway, I can talk much louder. I will talk much <laughs> louder. Some people can't talk much louder. They somehow think, I think, when they talk loud that they're yelling. I think I am yelling, but I, I don't mind yelling. If that, if, that gets the, if that gets the word across, I will yell. Okay, if I start drifting off into my ordinary talk, just tell me, and I'll talk louder. Where's the noise coming from? Outside. Yeah. Huh. Okay, well, I will drown it out. Now, I forget, did I already give examples of, of political state? Did I mention the Constitution? No. Okay, good. I have this funny deja vu because I like to listen to the tapes of the previous time I gave the course because I like to find out what I did right and preserve it and what I did wrong and and not make that mistake again. And then I don't remember what I said this time and what I said two years ago. Okay, well, anyway, then a statesman would be one example. And uh, every once in a while I just have to remind you because I don't want to cover it up, but it's not what we're talking about. This is written in the early 30s. And the, the National Socialists are, to ha- are coming to power. And it may well, it would certainly be understood, and people held this against Heidegger, and rightly so, that this statesman who founds a state, who reorganizes the practices of the people and gives them a new style and a new identity, might well have been taken to be Hitler. And Heidegger, I'm afraid, might well have taken it to be Hitler. But it certainly needn't be a, a, a fascist state an, an act that founds a state, it wouldn't be a statesman, but it would be an act that founds a political state, would be the framing of the Constitution. Yeah? Um, is the Constitution itself a work? Um, interesting. I don't so know. You have the event and then you have the Yeah, thing. yeah, I wonder if that's a, a work. Uh, huh, my intuitions go both ways. It's certainly a thing. But it doesn't seem, and it shines so in a way. It creates an open, doesn't it? What? Doesn't it make, create an open? And so, oh, it certainly creates an open. She's asking sort of the technical term. It, surely you're, we're agreeing, let's for the moment anyway, that it's truth establishing itself. She wants to know if it's, a, if it's like an artwork, if it's a thing. Uh, Is it thingy enough? I don't think it's thingy enough. That's the Because you can reproduce it all over the place, whereas you, I don't think he thinks you can reproduce the Greek temple or the Bamberg Cathedral all over the place. Uh, I don't know. Well, it's a funny question. Yeah. Maybe a good paper topic. Yeah. It might be, it might be a thing the way. Oh, he talks about poetry. Towards the end, maybe. 
Does have to be a poem, though. Well, a poem is... The Constitution does set up the world. Yeah. A poem, if a poem is a thing, but a, yeah, and it is, it's an artwork for sure, then I suppose a Constitution... I, so you might argue that the words themselves are more important in poetry than in, like, the... the yes, it's, it's partly of that there. side of it that, that pu- puzzles me. Oh, okay. I, I don't know where the earth is. Uh, the earth it might be in the, the sounds. Yeah, the earth and poems is in the sounds. I'm going to come back to that. I, there is an earth of sorts in the Constitution, but it's not in the sounds. And that means, and it may be that that means that it's not a work of art. A work of art lives is onto something. Seems to have to be, he says, in the sounds or in the colors or in the uh, timbre, if it's, if it's music. Uh, he seems to think works of art need this kind of sensual, sensuous uh, incarnation. Uh, and, and, and the Constitution doesn't. Well, another thing that's sort of wrong with the Constitution, and sort of wrong, I've never said this any previous year, and now I'm su- suddenly off in a puzzle. I mean, a founding a political state has got to be taken in a very broad sense. We don't mean just the uh, political uh, arrangements. It's got to set up a whole style. <coughs> now, I suppose it could. And you might think the Constitution does. I don't know. But if it doesn't, if it isn't broad enough to, oh, to make it possible for things to show up as something to re- remember and, ways of, and, and, and give people ways of acting that make sense, things that it makes sense to do and not to do, and cover them all, I think, and give them the meaningful differences, I don't know. I don't know. The, the Constitution certainly does tell people what it makes sense to do and not to do. It gives them very important meaningful differences between free speech and not free speech and all the other uh, rights and possibilities and responsibilities. I don't know. Yeah. It, we treat it like a temple and it shines for us. It reflects yeah. back to ourselves. Well, that's, what, that's why it looks very much like truth establishing itself. We take it very seriously like something sacred. We think that it created us not only as a kind of political state, but as the American way of life or something like that. That's the clue. If you think the Constitution created the American way of life, let's suppose, then it's doing a real job of truth establishing itself. And uh, there are... There are lots of ways that people can do statesmanlike things that change the practices of everybody and open up a new world, uh, I think. This might be a place to put in a plug for a book. I, this morning I realized, I'm talking to somebody, who was I talking to about disclosing uh, new worlds? Okay, well, one possible way to get into this and get a feel for this, not that I require it, I'm not even sure I recommend it, but... Uh, I did write a book. I didn't really write it. I put my name on it. I let people put my name on it. I mean, there is, there was my most original TA named Charles Spinoza and my most successful graduate student, a guy named Fernando Flores, who now makes literally millions of dollars transforming companies from Cartesian companies to Heideggerian companies or fixing their <laughs> ontology. And they, with my, and both of them were PhDs of mine, so they put my name on it. We wrote a book called Disclosing New Worlds. And it's got, it's, it, you could say it's a generalization. Heidegger's got his four ways that you, the truth can establish itself. And we've got, I guess, three more. And, but, but it's got an introduction in which we try to explain world and style and the change of worlds and disclosing for readers, for the average reader. In the, it didn't work. The average reader apparently can't understand a thing. But you're not an average reader, and you, it might be helpful, so I put it on reserve. And, if you, and um, now let me go back to this. Uh, I'll come back to it for, in a minute. So there's that that founds a political state. Another way in which truth comes to shine forth is the nearness of that which is not simply a being, but the being that is most of all. Well, that's a funny way of describing God, or the good, or whatever it is, the, the substance in Spinoza, it's the ontotheological God, that is, it's that being which is the ground of all intelligibility at least, 
and in some sense produces and creates everything or constitutes it. If constitutes means gives meaning to everything, it constitutes it. If, if you want something stronger than constitute, if it actually makes, makes these things, then it creates or produces them. Anyway, he's talking about another kind of work of art, is, or sorry, another way truth establishes itself, is people get a view about a creator God, let's say, the Hebrews, and that focuses everything for them. So I saw a hand up. Liz, did you want to know? Um, well, I was worried that you were making it sound like um, Heider was committed to there really being the good or the substance. No, just the other way around, in fact. It seems like that uh, it's that what Heidegger's done is made the... the he's made the work of the, the... Let's call it the work of art because it's just to remind you of the last lecture. Remember I said the work of art in a way is the God because it creates things in the sense that there wouldn't be anything as anything if it weren't for it and there wouldn't be any intelligibility of anything if it weren't for it and now I never realized this before it's kind of neat he's taken in the big deal creator onto theological God and made it a so to speak sub case of an entity which is a focus for uh, an understanding of being of a people uh, is that, that you're looking worried yeah no it's just I think Of being that is most of all. I'm worried about what kind of being can that be if it's just. It's, I, well, uh, I know the code. Right. The being is being is the being in onto theology, which is the being that supposedly creates and explains all the other beings. But it's still a being. That's why all of onto theology, that is Christianity and Judaism, is a big metaphysical mistake. It is if you understand it in the way that we've come to understand it in our culture as the story about a kind of super being, that being that is most of all, that produces all the other beings. Heidegger thinks there's something more basic than that, namely the clearing, which lets anything be anything, and in a way equally basic with the clearing, the being in the clearing, in which the clearing takes a stand, and in fact, if there is any God, that's the kind of God it's going to have to be. Uh, so that, for instance, Heidegger would be much closer to thinking that Jesus was a god than, I mean, I mean that's, and in fact, I think the next god, the next one is Jesus, so let's go back here. Okay, still another way the truth grounds itself is the essential sacrifice. I'm not sure what that is, but the, but the crucifixion, as, uh, and, and I suppose the resurrection that goes with it, certainly creates a new culture and a new style and, and everybody goes around wearing these crucifixes and millions of people I guess there were millions and in the middle ages were there millions already? probably uh, uh, anyway uh, there's, there's another way the truth establishes itself and I think that also it can be generalized to all ways if there are others that martyrs can set up can demonstrate a whole new way of living and a whole new style and set up a new world I've been trying to think of any martyr who actually did it, uh, and I couldn't think of any one but, uh, but Jesus. Are there other cases in our culture of people who, in their death... You could call Socrates a martyr. Ah, Socrates. Interesting, interesting. Absolutely. Now, but now let's see. And does he set up something? Well, like kind of he kind of set up just the whole premise of... I mean, he makes kind of free inquiry spirituality for academic... Yeah, I, the question is whether he is enough to set up a whole culture. This gets me, we put this aside in an interesting way. Alexander Nahamas, who was here and gave the Sather lectures, what, two years ago, has written a book called Socratic Reflections, which is all the ways that the image of Socrates has influenced the way people think about themselves in our culture. But I don't think an, it's enough of something that everybody agrees on maybe to be a full-fledged work of art. It's one of these sort of sub-world things. Can we give it to Jesus, though, if we're not going to give it to Socrates? Oh, we can absolutely give it to Jesus because it doesn't have to be the, that everybody in the world uh, follows this person, but it has to be that the dominant understanding of what it's all about and what the meaningful differences are and what it makes sense to do <coughs> have to be established. And certainly for a while, not now probably, but for a long time, 
nobody would have doubted that Jesus was the exemplar, the paradigm. Kierkegaard calls him the paradigm, uh, just to connect it with what I said earlier. He is a super example of a cultural paradigm, and therefore, in Heidegger's thinking, he is a god, and uh, uh, whether he's still functioning or not is a difficult question. Yeah? Um, again, this is like my question about the... Um, uh, the what, must, what must be important here is the sacrifice itself. It's not just that there was some important guy who died in some important way, or just happened to die in an important way. It's that the sacrifice defines right. what makes... Good, what good, good. I wasn't clear enough about that. If you, then you, the crucifixion is supposed to show something about what it is to be a human being. That your what? That your body isn't important. That there are things worth dying for, but not worth killing for. Uh, that that all that t- in, it takes place in the in the Jesus story of when he gets crucified. He doesn't let the disciples fight for him. Uh, he's uh, willing to do it. And moreover, uh, what's important about him survives that sacrifice and it's the sacrifice is important because it shows that by in spite of giving up everything that people would have thought was crucially important he becomes even more crucially important something like that and that, it would be clearer if he hadn't done anything at all and then all of a sudden sacrificed himself in this way I mean that would be that would be a clear example of this that would be a clearer that example that of this kind of thing if, yeah. he, if his sacrifice had demonstrated fully the style of life of, yeah. of meekness receptivity, disembodiment, uh, and so forth. Yeah. Is that related to worthiness then? Well, yes, exactly. That would have showed you that meekness, doing the Father's bidding, willing to suffer, giving up your body, and uh, gaining eternal life thereby was what it was all about. That's the point. Yeah, I think that's exactly how it works. Okay, another way, let's see, you got the essential sacrifice, is the thinker's questioning, which is the, as the thinking of being names being and its question worthiness. That's a very interesting one. We don't really have time in this course to spend a lot of, t- uh, a lot of time following this up, but what is it hit, packed into that sentence is a whole different understanding of what philosophy is all about and why it's important than anything you will have ever had in any other course, including it wasn't even in being in time. It wasn't in Heidegger's mind yet. What a philosopher does, a thinker, a thinker is uh, Heidegger's name for, roughly for philosophers, except philosophers are... Uh, it's, uh, a thinker is a philosopher who does this special thing. And what is this special thing? By finding a new language in which to describe people and things, the philosopher focuses a new understanding of being. The clearest example, I think, is Descartes. Heidegger is sort of so ambivalent about Descartes because on the one hand he thinks Descartes is a disaster. The subject-object understanding of being is about as far as you can get from Heidegger's understanding of being. There isn't any clearing and there's no place for receptivity and and so forth. But never mind that. The important thing is, for uh, on the one hand, Descartes is a disaster, but on the other hand, Descartes is a fantastic uh, example of a thinker who focused a whole new understanding of being. We should just dwell on Descartes for a minute as the best example of a thinker. He didn't invent out of nowhere subjects and objects. There was uh, Luther had already said that, that every individual had a direct relation to God and he didn't need the mediation of the church and so forth. Gutenberg had printed the Bible and instead of being uh, circulated secretly, and uh, it, it, insofar as there was any vernacular translation of the Bible, it had to be circulated secretly. It was, to, it was a crime to be caught with your own copy of the Bible, oddly enough. It was like Sammy's dot in, in Russia but under the communists. Well, anyway, things had switched around and now everybody could have their own copy of the Bible in the vernacular and interpret it. So there was, things were beginning to turn toward individuals having their own uh, right and ability to make sense of things. And Descartes just pulled it all together. That and the importance of inner experience and of consciousness and so forth and gave it a name. We were subjects in a new sense of subject. Uh, now, 
I'm getting ahead of the story, but it seems like I better say this now because it's, I'm so near saying it. There seem to be two kinds of thinkers because it always seems to take two of them. Namely, Descartes got this idea, but Descartes was still had God in his story and, and uh, it was not clear at all that there was somehow that the individual subject was the absolute source of all meaning and intelligibility and had replaced God completely. But it took Kant to do that. I'm going to come back to this, but right now I want to say, say it for the first time and I will explain it a lot later. Descartes is a, is a thinker who is a reconfigurer. That is, he pulls a huge transformation on the culture. From receptive creatures, we become active subjects. But he needs an articulator. He needs somebody who, find, who puts it all together coherently and who finds the right language in which to say it. And that's Kant in, in Heidegger's picture. Kant finally says what it's all about in the Enlightenment is maturity. And maturity amounts to giving the law unto yourself, deciding for yourself what has authority and what makes sense. And that is to become autonomous. So this new word, autonomy, these words, autonomy and maturity, that lights up a whole new conception of things. Uh, uh, Kant says, uh, once upon a time when we were immature, we believed in the authority of the king and the pope. Now, it's up to us to decide the authority of the king and the pope. We, and that means, in fact, that they're not the authorities anymore. We're the authority, each individual. And that, that's the enlightenment. That transforms the culture in a very, very radical way. I say all this partly to illustrate what, why Heidegger's got this interesting view of thinkers. They are all involved in this business of finding new words. I mean, he thinks that the last great thinker is Nietzsche, and we aren't going to do it in this course, but if you read all of Heidegger Nietzsche works, you would find Heidegger trying to figure out, reading Nietzsche over and over for about ten years, what are the magic words in Nietzsche which are naming a new understanding of being into being, and what is it? And it finally turns out to be the technological understanding of being, which he gets clear in the essay we will read, the, the question concerning technology. But... Nietzsche turns out to be a reconfigurer because he's, he's understood that way ahead of everybody else. And of course he doesn't know that he understood it because but he, cause it's so pervasive and, and oh, no, well no, it's so marginal still. Well, I saw a hand up there. Uh, did I? Okay, uh, one more thing. I mean, in a way all of this was for a punchline that intrigues me so much. It isn't often we get the chance to defend Heidegger who was in a way an a terrible man. I mean, just a, a coward, a redneck, a, a nationalist, a, a Nazi it, it for a while. And, uh, but, and he also supposedly said that you can't do philosophy except in Greek and German. Uh -huh. And maybe he did say it, but he certainly couldn't have believed it because there's a place I can find the reference if anybody wants it. I, I, I think it's well, I, I have to look it up. I think it's the Parmenides lectures. Anyway, in his lectures he says that one of the greatest thinkers is Descartes, which of course he has to say, given his view about thinkers. And what did Descartes write in? Well, French and Latin. And he even says, and this is quite surprising, he says Descartes is a greater thinker than Kant. Now, I told you why. It took me a long time to figure out why. Well, that's because Descartes is a reconfigurer and Kant is an articulator. Mm -hmm. And Kant is sort of living off Descartes and on, and on, on his coattails getting, doing what he's doing. And he also says, and this is just funny, he says, and the easy way to tell is that Descartes wrote very short books and Kant wrote very long books. <laughs> and apparently reconfigurers write short books or no books at all, like Socrates if he was one and Jesus if he certainly was one and so forth. And then the articulators come along and they spell it out at great length. I think Heidegger is running for being a reconfigurer. He, after being in time, he only wrote very, very short <laughs> treatises. Uh, Age of the World Picture is one of the longest. Uh, okay, but this should give you a whole new way of thinking about thinkers and why it's worth studying these philosophers, what you're supposed to be listening for. 
and what it would be like to be a great thinker, which unlikely that any of us will ever be. Uh, so let's see now. Where are we? We've got all the lists. Okay. And he goes on to say, which understandably, that scientists don't count on as, as uh, these kind of uh, truth establishing itself. Not that he doesn't like science. He likes science a lot. Uh, but uh, scientists are already working out of an understanding of being that the philosophers are naming, he thinks. Yeah. Um, going back to the reference to Kuhn before, um, and so he says, oh, insofar as, philo- as the scientists are opening up any new understanding, they're doing philosophy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, would, um, I mean, you might map that on to normal science and, you know, paradigm shifting science. And that would sort of, so one way of reading his claim would be that um, paradigm shifting science is really philosophy. Very good. Um, I think that's right. That's good. So Galileo. Right. is a real well, reconfigurer. Einstein, and right? Einstein yeah. may be a real yeah. reconfigurer. And, and Newton... Uh, but then they don't count as scientists really anymore. Right. That, this right. is what he's... Maybe what he's saying here when he says, when and insofar as science passes beyond... Co- well, let's start here. I'll go back a little. By contrast, and I have written in parentheses, normal. <laughs> so I'm thinking like you are. Anyway, so we're thinking, normal science is science, according to Kuhn, that assumes a certain understanding of what there is and is trying to work out the details and fix the anomalies. So, by contrast, perhaps normal science is not an original happening of truth, but the cultivation of a domain of truth already opened specifically by apprehending and confirming that which shows itself to be possible and necessary correct within that field. When, and now this is what Liz is saying, when and insofar as science passes beyond correctness and goes on to a truth, which means that it establishes it, which means that it, estab- it arrives at the essential disclosure of what is as such its philosophy. And I think that means, I think, yes, I think he wants to take over Galileo and, 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 and Newton and Einstein for philosophy and Descartes, of course. Okay, now, I wanted to just stick in somewhere, and I could stick it in here as anywhere, that remember I said that in, in the first lecture, that what he didn't understand in being in time was, well, in being in time, he had a structure of the world. What he understood later was that there was a whole series. For one thing, that there was something called a world which was a unified style of a culture. And that there hadn't been all that many worlds. In fact, only one culture ever got the idea that there had to be a unified style, a single understanding of being. And then there was a series of worlds in that world, namely ours, the Western world, and there was the ancient world and the Christian world and the modern world, at least. And the first place where he, met, he realizes this and mentions it in print is right here on 77. Sort of, it goes with the idea that, that these worlds are opened up by artworks or thinkers. Uh, at the bottom of 76, It's a little funny to put here, but but I see, but I'll read it anyway. Four lines from the bottom. Always when that which is is a whole, we got used to that, that's the style of the whole understanding of being, demands as what is itself a grounding in openness, that is the need of being in the clearing, art attains its historical nature as foundation, that is, there gets to be a being in the clearing. now, he's limited it back to art again, which is strange, because he really means any way truth establishes itself there. This, because it's any way that the clearing gets founded. This foundation happened, and this is the part I want to read, in the West for the first time in Greece. What was in the future to be called being was set into work, setting the standard. So what's the story there? These are things he explains a lot in other places that I'm sort of folding in here to give you a feel for the whole picture. So the idea is that in 5th century B.C., Greece, something unique happened. Those people in Greece, in Athens, not all of them, not the Spartans, uh, the, the people in Athens and around there 
uh, began to ask themselves the question, what is it that everything has in common just insofar as it is? They were looking for some unity of the style of their culture because it was beginning to have some sort of unity. Now, it's a hard it's sort of chicken and egg question, which came first. I mean, the culture was obviously tending toward unity, and the thinkers, Parmenides and uh, uh, Heraclitus especially, but these people called pre-Socratics, were trying to find the words to name this unified understanding. And uh, they were talking about being. And they were thinking that being, for instance, Heidegger's favorite name, the one he thinks wins, so to speak, in 5th century, is being as physis, which is, I think, usually written this way. It gets translated nature, and the word physics comes from it. But Heidegger says it meant to them that what everything had in common was that it was welling up and lingering for a while and then going out of existence. And, or, or going away. And the paradigm examples, I think, were warriors who in the, in, in the, you see, you already in the Iliad, you have them doing this, but there's no understanding of being yet in the Iliad, that warriors, in, in Rorty terms, whoosh up and then do something great and kill thousands of people and then fade out again. And gods whoosh up and all of a sudden, wow, there's Athena there for a while and then she flies away and so forth. Things were apparently to them sort of surging up, grabbing people's attention and their actions and then fading out. And that was what they thought being was. And then it got transformed. Then I'm going to read the rest. The realm of beings thus opened up was then transformed into a being in the sense of God's creation. That's ha this happened in the Middle Ages, the Christian world. So the Greek world becomes the Christian world. This kind of being was again transformed at the beginning and in the course of the modern age, the modern world. Beings became objects that could be controlled and seen through by calculation. At each time, a new and essential world arose. And I, uh, you can read the next, but it gets harder to understand. At each time, the openness of what is had to be established in beings themselves by the fixing in place of truth in figure. That's another way of putting the same point. You establish and sort of focus and stabilize this new understanding. It's funny, he's sticking it to artworks, though he shouldn't be. Putting it in terms of putting it in a figure is an artwork term. And then he goes on, and each time there happens unconcealedness of what is. Unconcealedness sets itself into work, a setting which is accomplished by art. Well, I think, I mean, I think this, this is a, not an absolutely clearly focused text. He shouldn't be talking about art here. He should be talking about all the ways the truth establishes itself. Certainly it wasn't just art people who made the, the, the Greek, uh, the Greek, uh, the medieval and the modern world. I mean, we just said Descartes played a big role in it and Parmenides and Heraclitus played a big role in it and I'm sure Augustine and St. Thomas played a big role in the medieval world. Not that they did it alone either, but uh, whenever you see him talking about art, you can always ask yourself whether you can generalize it to any sort of being in the broadest sense that will hold up to people what they're doing and shine and establish a new way of looking at things. Okay? I and mean, people are very quiet. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, nobody wants to say anything? Uh, Liz, I have a question. I thought you would want to go on. I would, I would like a question. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Liz, um, you were talking about the um, why does it matter that um, there's a continuous sort of <coughs> evolution from Greece to the Middle Ages to modernity? If and then that is what, um, well, if each of those worlds is sort of individual and setting up a new world. Um, and sort of the contrast I'm thinking of is why doesn't, say, China count? Um, because there is at some point a unified understanding, a sort of Confucian understanding of being. Right? So I guess this is really a question about history rather than a question about worlds. Okay. Okay, well, we, I don't know enough about China to be sure. Let me say several things. One, it's me, not Heidegger, who says it only happened in the West. He just says it happened in the West. I added it only happened in the West.
but I'll take responsibility for it. And I suspect he believes that. I don't think he's, he's interested in anything else but the West. He's got enough, he's got his hands full. But uh, I, would, I bet that in China, there was always the Confucians and the Buddhists. And that there was, you think there was a time when everybody had well, their life goals? I would say to the extent that that was true there, it's a matter of degree, the difference in, say, Greece, right? I mean, why do you count just, why is it legitimate uh, to count just the Athenians and not uh, the Spartans? Uh, why is it legitimate uh, uh, to um, count just the Christians and not the Huns, right? They were interacting, they were, you know. It feels um, right to me, but now that's not good enough. Let me try. Right. Suppose, <laughs> I mean, again, I mean, maybe we'll have somebody here who knows the history of it. If, if there is a group, no matter how limited, that has its artists, its thinkers, its, uh, what else do we have, its statesmen, and, and its gods sort of all lined up together and doing some style that, every, that everybody within that group right. w- agrees on, that's enough to do it. Now, was there ever a, pl- a place in China and a time in China when the paintings... The, 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 the writers and all of these people agreed on uh, a, a, the style of life. From what I know. In okay, if there was, I took a turn, of course, once, but they didn't explain this to us. They didn't, <laughs> ask, they didn't ask these questions. They just told us all the dynasties. But let me think now. Uh, there's something funny going on because it's part of the Heidegger story, which we're jumping ahead, that this should generate history, that this should generate... Uh, a series of these. And that's what I'm, I'm confused about the relationship between establishing a world at a time and that then going on to somehow generate... Good. Let's, let's, let's take that as our question because I want to do Earth and World. Good. And this is about Earth and World and how the struggle between Earth and World sets up history. And I don't know how it's going to uh, <laughs> work out for China, but, uh, we'll, but it'll help. So I, I wonder if I'm going to skip a whole piece here because I want to be sure I get to Earth and World. Um, well, maybe I, I would like to do this in the order I want to do it in. I think I can get there. I'm having trouble. Uh, no, I'm going to jump to Earth and World. I can do the other thing later. Because uh, it's such a hard thing and so central and important. Okay. Uh, well, let's just say that, er- that works of art set up what Heidegger calls a primal conflict on page 55. I'm going to read you a bunch of mysterious quotes and then I'm going to try to show you what to do with them. And this, among other things, um, um, besides helping you with this book, I, it's a kind of model of what I would like you to do in the course. Uh, that is, you'll see. I have no point in telling you by, before I do it. Okay, so on 55, It's very mysterious, the first paragraph. Truth occurs precisely as itself in that the concealing denial as refusal provides its constant source to all clearing and yet as dissembling meets out to all clearing the indefeasible severity of error. This is just so abstract and hard to understand at this point. Concealing denial is intended to denote that opposition in the nature of truth which subsists between clearing or lighting and concealing. It is the opposition of the primal conflict the nature of truth is in itself the primal conflict, in which the open center is one within which what is stands and from which it sets itself back into itself. Well, there are lots of different conflicts, for one thing. There's a conflict, I think, in which you just struggle to light up the clearing against sort of the dim confusion and, and, uh, that, that, that uh, is already there, and you have to sort of fight to clear the clearing. But that's not the one that interests Heidegger. He he does say something about that in one paragraph, but I doubt if I can just open to that paragraph, where... uh, No, I I wasn't going to talk about it. He he talks about how there's a struggle and and the clearing wins out in this struggle. Does anybody recognize what I'm talking about? Well, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, What's important is some kind of struggle that takes place in the clearing, in the work of art. That's what the struggle between earth and world is about. Art sets up a world and brings forth the earth, he says. On page, and now I'm going to read you some more mysteri- <coughs> mysterious quotes. <coughs> On 46, 
the first full paragraph, halfway down, that into which the work sets itself back and which it causes to come forth in the setting back of itself we call the earth. Earth is that which com- comes forth and shelters. Earth, self-dependent, is effortless and untiring. Upon the earth and in it, historical man, and there's always this historical stuff in the background, which we'll come back to, grounds his dwelling in the world. In setting up a world, the work sets forth the earth. And that's the crucial thing to understand. Now, wh- what could that mean? Well, I'm going to give you just a few more quotes and then I'm going to try to tell you what it means. Uh, at the bottom of the big paragraph that goes on and on on 47, the earth is essentially self-secluded. To set forth the earth means to bring it into the open as self-secluded. All that is what important stuff to be decoded. Uh, and one more on 48. The second paragraph, the setting up of a world and the setting forth of earth are two essential features in the work being of the work. They belong together in the unity of the work being and so forth. Now, they're so unified, in fact, that they bring each other into existence, whatever they are, the earth and the world. That's the last quote I want to read before I try to explain it. Uh, On 49. Uh the first full paragraph. The opposition of world and earth is a strife. Striving is a mis... I don't even think it's a mistranslation. I think it's a misprint. Well, it recurs too often to be a misprint. It must be just a mistranslation. Wherever it says striving, it should be strife. The opposition of world and earth is a strife, but we would surely all... surely all too easily falsify its nature if we were to confound strife with discord and dispute. You see, it couldn't be striving. How would anybody confound striving with discourse and dispute? Strife is, is a negative thing and striving is a reaching toward. Yes, but you couldn't mix up a reaching toward with discourse and uh, discord and dispute. But he doesn't mean discord or dispute. No, but he thinks that you could easily confuse, he thinks, this, what he's talking about. It, it is a kind of struggle, not a striving. It's a struggle. I mean, you'll see more. I mean, it, the German says it is. I'll go I'll find the German next time if somebody reminds me. Uh, it's a strife we'll see. If we, were, we would be falsifying and if we confuse strife with discord and dispute and see it only as disorder and destruction see, all that wouldn't fit striving we could even imagine it as disorder and destruction in essential strife rather the opposites raise each other into the self-assertion of their nature that's the line I need now that's very important that says that only be- the earth sort of makes it the world makes it be that there is an earth and the, earth make, and, and the earth makes it be that there is a world. They bring each other into being. That's important because that's what makes it different than matter and form. Matter and form are metaphysical principles. Matter is just there from creation on or forever in the Greeks. And, uh, and form is always around and there's constantly sort of putting the form on the matter somehow. That's not the way it is for Heidegger. The, it's like for Heidegger, the more earth, the, the more world, the more earth, and the more earth, the more world. Now, what could that be like? Well, I'll give you a simple example, and then I'll try to give you a really interesting example. <clears throat> One of the ways he talks about it is that, that in poetry, the sound of the words is important for the poem producing the, the effect. I mean, think of a Greek tragedy. I mean, it, it's partly because the Oresteia is, I take it, I wish I knew Greek, has the song quality that it has, that it scared people out of their wits and babies were born prematurely and all that. I mean, it was certainly not just, it, not, not in the, just in the Lattimore translation, but in the real sung Greek. And so, the, now, what's the earth and the world quality? Well, the world part of it is, I mean, it's the, the understanding of what there is, the understanding of being that Aeschylus has, let's just talk about his poem, but that understanding of being requires that it be put in these sounds. And the earth part is that it won't work if you don't put it in these sounds. Now I'm going to try to get the struggle in here, only metaphorically so far. You could say that the, that the, that the poem resists paraphrase meaning that there's something about the way the poem works that is lost if you paraphrase it, that 
that you can't paraphrase it. The more you try, the more you appreciate. This is the, the they bring each other into existence. The more you try to paraphrase it, the more you appreciate how the sound and the rhythm of the words in the Greek is essential. It would be like trying to uh, capture the structure of the Greek temple, that's the, the world aspect, and then build it out of steel or lucite instead of rock. It wouldn't work. It resists that sort of paraphrase. Well, that's the, that's the only to, to give you a sort of feel for it. But now let's try to go into it more. Ah, but I forgot, by the way, what I'm supposed to be demonstrating. I, I blew it. I had a much more dramatic way of doing it. I mean, let me go back. Having told you that all these bizarre quotes that I just read about how they finally, the quote, they struggle, their struggle brings them into existence, so you can't think of it in terms of matter and form. Then I was going to say the following. Well, then what are you supposed to do to understand it? Well, my answer is, find the phenomenon. That's the moral for the course. It's, the, it's a phenomenology course in the simple sense that you get Heidegger, he has his eye on some phenomenon. There's some, something he's describing. And then he describes it in these strange words because it's very strange stuff he's describing. And he certainly doesn't want to use any metaphysical terms, which he will then lose what he's trying to describe. And your job and mine, and I'll sort of try to show you how I would do it here, but then your job in your papers and in your discussion sections is to try to fill in this jargon with the phenomenon. The bad way of reading Heidegger, which is done by many, many people who get together every year and call themselves the Heidegger Circle, is just to share this wonderful gibberish with each other, very piously mouthing these marvelous words and never trying to connect it up with anything. Uh, so, here we go. I think you can make sense of the earth by going back to Kuhn. Because there's Kuhn and he's got a sense better than anybody else of, of, of a paradigm and how it functions. Now, don't think of the paradigm now as doing something for the whole culture. Just think of how the paradigm functions in the world of the scientist. But the earth world story will occur right there if I do this right, and he, I think it does. Remember where we are. There is something called an exemplar or a paradigm. It plays a crucial role in establishing a scientific community. Everybody who does science does it in imitating the exemplar. They've learned in, say, in Newtonian science that the problems posed by Newton in the Principia and the way he goes about solving them and the arguments he gives for his solutions, that's what it is to do science. And they have lots of examples in their, uh, when they have courses and when they have exams and so forth. They learn to do things that way. They don't actually read Newton, but it all goes back to the Principia as the model, Kuhn would say. All agree that Newton has seen the problems, given exemplary solutions and so forth. And so when people, when the scientists imitate Newton, they know that they're doing good science. But now the question is, why not spell out explicitly the rules that make this good science? Then you wouldn't need the exemplar anymore. You could just say, to do this is what philosophers are always trying to do when they do scientific methodology. This is what Kuhn was trying to mess up with his book. They were always saying, ah, yes, the hypothetical deductive method. Well, here's the hypothetical deductive method. Now that I think of it, Descartes is one of the egregious uh, uh, sinners in this. I mean, writing the rules for, for understanding. I mean, he tried, and it was, you know, it was wonderful for him to try it, to write out the rules for how you do things. Break them down into elements, make sure that these are all exhaustive elements, reassemble them bit by bit. You read the, probably not, but anyway, the Discourse on Method has this in it too. But that doesn't capture what it is to do Newtonian science. In, in, in Kuhnian terms, you, it is not rationalizable. That means that you can imitate it, you can do it, but you can't say, you can't spell out in rules what you're doing. Here's what he says. I'm on 45. Uh, what various research programs have in common is, I mean, that are all in one science, in Newtonian, for instance, is not that they satisfy some explicit or fully discoverable <coughs> set of rules and assumptions that gives the tradition its character and its hold upon the scientific mind. 
Instead, they may relate by resemblance and by modeling to one or another part of the scientific corpus, which the community in question recognizes as its achievements. That the scientists do not ask or debate what makes a particular problem or solution legitimate tempts us to suppose that they intuitively know the answer. But it may only indicate that neither the questioner nor the answer is felt to be relevant in their research. Now the punchline. Paradigms may be prior to, more binding and more complete than any set of rules for research that could unequivocally be abstract, could be unequivocally abstracted from them. So the first thing is to say, you've got to have the, the work, the thing. It's more basic than any clear set of principles that you could abstract from it. You can't turn it into a belief system. You can't turn it into a bunch of rules. Uh, that is, uh, one more on page 11, the share, he asks, uh, why is the concrete scientific achievement, that's the paradigm, as a locus of professional commitment prior to the concepts, laws, theories, and points of view abstracted from it? In what sense is the shared paradigm a fundamental unit for the student of scientific development, a unit that cannot be reduced to logically atomic components which could function in its stead? Now, are you beginning to see what I'm getting at? What if, what you're, it's like paraphrasing a poem. To turn the scientific paradigm into a bunch of rules for how to do science, to try to write down what the necessary and sufficient conditions of a successful scientific research program or a, a theory or something is, is impossible. There is something that, is, that cannot be captured except in the actual example. Yeah. Are you saying that the concept of the whole is more than you could ever say about anything about its parts? No, 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 I mean, that's too general. I, that may or may not be true, but it would confuse things to say it here. No, I just want to say it's a special feature of paradigms right now that they can't be, to use Kuhnian language now, rationalized, which is a sort of generalization of what I earlier said, paraphrase. Now, and now we're going to get this resistance talk again. The paradigm resists being put into uh, any other terms. It resists, let's see, it can be shown and scientists can recognize when they are in, in accord with it, in tune with it, and when they're not in tune with it. They consider it a binding source of authority. That is, it, it, it is what they feel obliged to be in tune with. Uh, but it cannot be, and I'll read you one quote more, put in terms of a bunch of features. Those are the necessary and sufficient features that make it a paradigm. Uh, the practice of normal science depends on the ability acquired from exemplars, this is page 200, to group objects and situations into similarity sets, which are primitive in the sense that the grouping is done without an answer to the question, similar with respect to what? Now, you might think that when any things are similar, there ought to be features in terms of which they're similar. So if you're doing something that is in accord with the style of the work of art, you ought to be able to say what features it has that makes it in accord in the, with the work of art. But Heidegger wants to say, no, you cannot uh, uh, get the... Uh, when you, uh, now I'm going to have to talk Heidegger language. You can't get what he calls the earthy element part of it into the world part. Now I want to map these two things together. The world part is what's trying to get it clear. I've got a three C's. The world is clear, consistent, and complete. I'll explain why I say that in a minute. The earth is what resists it. And the more you try to make it clear, consistent, and complete, the more you see that you can't do it. And I'll come back to this in a minute. And it's a great good thing you can't do it. The struggle between earth and world is fruitful to talk Heidegger jargon. Yeah? So to understand Heidegger in terms of, I guess, phenomenology, it seems like it's like the paradigm, the thing in itself that represents itself. The paradigm is, like the but, but point between Earth and world. well, no, but but I see how hard this is. I've been thinking about it so long that it seems so simple to me now. But no, no, it's not like the thing in itself in any sense, like Kant or anything. No, where no, like in, in Husserl, like we're getting to the thing itself. Like there is, there's yeah. nothing behind this. 
That's right, that's true, but I don't think that's what's, that's not wrong. But what's important about it is, it, it, it is this exemplar, which, and Husserl hasn't any feel for special things, that's what I want to say. Not any old thing, we're not talking about a characteristic of tables, they don't set up a struggle between earth and world. Husserl has no feel for this. Husserl is world blind, if anybody ever was. A real <laughs> philosopher, a real Cartesian. I have to confess that Heidegger once said in a letter to Levitt that uh, he, he thought that Husserl, he, I shouldn't say this, but he says, in, I, in my seminar I trashed and burned Husserl's ideas again. I never thought he had any philosophical ability. I mean, I, I can see why he said that. But in any case, <laughs> I wrote my PhD thesis on Husserl, so I have a right to say this. Now, there are, there, are, there are phenomena that Heidegger sees in his phenomenology that are just undreamed of in Husserl's phenomenology. So now we're back. There are these special objects, paradigms, cases that set up communities, objects that everybody has to imitate because they have authority and yet you cannot explain their authority. You cannot put them into words and rules and so forth. They resist. That's the phrase you've got to hang on to. They resist this rationalization to talk about them. And the struggle to rationalize them only brings out more of their resistance. Now, I've got to explain fast. I take it it's, I'm not sure, five till, is that right? Okay, I can do it in five minutes. The best example I know, and I'm still trying to give you a feel for how to find examples. I'm sure you can do better than I can, but I've got to give you the best I can do. Anyway, take the Constitution. I put it in there earlier as a kind of sleeper because I needed it later. Uh, you can see the world aspect of the Constitution in the... And, well, you'll see that, of course, if the Constitution is so important that we're trying to... It has authority for us, and we're trying to get our, all of our activities and everything in tune with it and justify what we do by saying that it, it, it fits with it. We would like to get it clear, that is, get any no, 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 no ambiguous language. We'd like to get it consistent. We want it all to say this thing together, otherwise we won't know how to act if it tells us do this and don't do that, like have guns and don't have guns. Uh, so, or have abortions and don't have abortions. We can't stand that. So, and we want to make it complete. We want to make it apply, not only to guns, which it talks about, but to abortions, which it doesn't talk about, because it's supposed to tell us in every area of our uh, social and political life, anyway, uh, what we're supposed to do. So, so, we've got a whole thing. The Supreme Court is trying to make the Constitution clear, consistent, and complete, and yet, of course, you can't do it. Uh, it's never going to be paraphrasable into something like code law where every case is explicitly uh, defined and the law is all spelled out. I mean, it's part of the whole common law tradition that you're never going to be able to spell it all out but because it's this authority, you've got to try to spell it out. So what, what's the moral of this? Well, there's going to be the struggle between earth and world. The more you try to make it clear, consistent, and complete, the more you're going to discover that you can't do it. And now, and I want to say this is fruitful, and now I want to go back to Kuhn. Kuhn says it's great that you don't spell out in, uh, completely what the scientific paradigm requires in a bunch of rules, because it allows a much more flexible, say, much more flexible scientific community if they all can see themselves as uh, doing something similar to Newton without having to argue about exactly what features it has that makes it similar or doesn't make it similar. It's a positive, fruitful fact about the Constitution that it isn't settled once and for all, and in it, that's why it's able to apply to constantly new cases. Now, yeah. According to Kuhn, or according to you, great that the attempt to get clear fails, or is it great that there is an attempt? It's both. Well, it's you no. Know, it's one a, must it, yeah. Get clear, that's right. Yeah, one must you you fail. must attempt to get clear, and you will inevitably fail, and that's all of that is a, is is the way an art works. It, when there's a paradigm that has authority in a culture, it's bound to set up the demand for clear. Let me try to say it as clearly as I can. If there's an object or a person 
or a, a, a constitution uh, that has authority in a culture and everybody wants to live in terms of it and see everything in, ter- in the light of it, you will be bound to try to make it clear, consistent, and complete. That's the world pull. And it will resist this. Uh, and that's the earth pull. And that is valuable because that gives you endless resources for covering cases that, you ne- that never occurred before and harmonizing things that wouldn't be harmonized if you had to spell it all out in terms of rules. And I'll just say one more thing as the bell is ringing. And it sets up history. Let me say that. Because now let me skip to another ob- more obvious case. I mean, whatever the Bible is, it's certainly a kind of work of art. And people struggle, I mean, there are whole industries, Talmudic industry and so forth, of trying to make it clear, consistent, and complete and cover everything. And it doesn't. And the more you try, the more it resists. But now I have to add one more thing. It's easier to see in the New Testament. I mean, there is the God-man, and he's so important, but, and he has such authority. But there's no right answer to what the New Testament means. So you get one interpretation say the Catholic one or the, let's say the early Christian one then you get the medieval interpretation then and that's another way of trying to get it clear and complete and consistent but it doesn't then you get the Protestant Luther version and that tries to get it clear and complete and it doesn't but I, what I want to say is one of the ways that the struggle between earth and world is fruitful is that it creates history it's the demand to get it clear, complete, and consistent, and the impossibility of getting clear, complete, and consistent that leads people to a series of attempts. And that series of attempts is, very, uh, is a series of understandings of, of being, in the, if, they're, if the work of arts are important enough, or of science, if they're not that big. Okay, now, that's... that's let me see, I've got, I only read 77, because that's where I say the fruitful story is. If it is in a hurry, I'll read it. If not, I'll let you go. Uh, well, it just says art grounds history at the bottom, four lines from the bottom. I just tried to explain how the not only art, the truth setting itself to work, grounds real history, where real history means changing total understandings of what it means to be. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, finally, back to where we were. The, there's lots more to be said about this very interesting and obscure business of the struggle between Earth and world, which Heidegger never talks about after that, after this, in that way. But there's always got a, some kind of function that does the job of world and something that does the job of earth even though he doesn't use that language so it's important to get it straight okay uh, there I'm going to do first do it in the order he does it which means first I'm going to talk about the struggle between earth and world specifically in the work of art and then he says we can only understand why there's this struggle if we look at the nature of truth so you, then you get a bigger struggle which is the struggle that creates a clearing at all and we'll get to truth. I haven't misled you when I said I'm going to talk about truth today, but I'm not going to talk about truth first. So, back, we're on page 55. At least that's where I am going to start. And it's going to be all about this question of uh, how the the struggle between our art, uh, how artworks set up a struggle. And they set up a struggle by their very material. Uh, there's lots of ways that there's a primal conflict, he's saying at the bottom of 55, between the clearing and the concealing. And we're going to go back to that when we get to truth. But one of the ways in which truth happens is the work being of the work. Setting up a world and setting forth the earth, the work is the fighting of the battle in which the unconcealedness of beings as a whole, or truth, is one. Now, what does that mean? Well, I, I mean, it's not all that clear what it means, but I'll give you a whole story about what it means. It seems to be, in artworks, that the fact that they're made out of stuff 
is what makes the struggle between earth and world. Remember I said it in terms of poetry, that the poetry is made out of words and the sounds of words, and that the sound is very essential, and if you try to paraphrase the poem, you won't get the whole meaning of the poem. The meaning of the poem is intrinsically involved in two things you can't paraphrase. One, the sounds of the words, and two, that, that the poet has chosen le mot juste, I mean, not any old word. You can't go around with a dictionary and put in the, uh, what the thesaurus says is a, uh, what do you call it? A synonym. A synonym for, for the words and still have what the poem's doing. <coughs> so the fact that it's got this earth element that can't be made clear, can't be paraphrased, uh, as I called it last time in Kuhn terms, can't be rationalized, is necessary to preserve the meaning of the poem. And now he goes on and he, tell, he, he generalizes that to the, the anything that anything is made out of. So he talks about, on 46, uh, that in, in equipment, the material doesn't matter, he says. Those who know being in time know the whole story about how when you're hammering with a hammer, the hammer, if it's all going well, the hammer becomes just transparent to you. And uh, the more it disappears, the better the hammering. <coughs> Uh, but the, by contrast, I'm about ten lines down, the temple work in setting up a world doesn't cause the material to disappear, but rather causes it to come forth for the first time and to come into the open of the world's work. The rock comes to bear, tones sing, words speak, and so forth. It's interesting, by the way, I set it up so that we can figure out. I'm always surprised that he isn't talking about the, the sound of the words here. Just, but I've already, he, he talks about how somehow it's the naming power of the word which is the, the material side of it. That's odd. The only thing I can say is that's because of this, this Mojus business, finding the right word. I mean, there's, it's the non-synonym part, part, part of the word that that's, he must be thinking about there. Now, what happens then? Well, what happens is that there is a struggle between the getting clear and the material, it seems, on seven, I mean, on 47 he talks about. Yeah. The earth, I'm talking about the middle of the page now, the earth appears openly cleared as itself, only when it's perceived and preserved as that which by nature, which is by nature undisclosable, that which shrinks from every disclosure and keeps itself closed up. And the, at the end of that paragraph he says, to set forth the earth means to bring it into the open as self-secluded. And now I'm going to try to give you some examples again, try to give you some feel for what he could mean by that. One more general thing, the bottom of 48. He says, what relations does the setting up of the world and the setting forth of the earth exhibit in the work itself? And, and then he, he says that... Uh, the earth, well, I'll just read it. This is just kind of review. The world is the self-disclosing openness of the paths of the simple and essential decisions in the destiny of the historical people. Remember, I kept saying that you want to get clear uh, the, the work of art or, or even like the Constitution to remind you. It's got in it the meaningful differences. It's got in it what is uh, worthy and not worthy, what's uh, just and unjust and so forth. And for the historical people, their job is constantly to try to get that clear. The, and now we're going to talk about that in terms of the, the artwork. The earth is the spontaneous forthcoming of that which is self-secluded, sheltering and concealing. Um, and um, and they struggle together at, at the top of 49. The opening can't endure anything closed at the end of the top paragraph, and the earth doesn't want to be drawn completely out into the open. By the way, at this point, I want to say, it, I looked up the German for the next sentence. The opposing of world and earth is strife. The German word is strife. Strife, if any of you know German, just cannot mean striving. That's just complete. It's, I don't even think it's a mistake in translation. I think it's some copy editor made a mistake, because later, there's lots of talk about it strife and struggling and get, they get it the same word right but anyway it's certainly struggle so I haven't told you yet what that would look like well and now now comes my job <clears throat> remember I'll keep telling you this uh, go back to the phenomenon 
try to make up what it could possibly be that Heidegger has in mind when he talks in strange ways about earth and world and so forth. Okay, it looks like, and here's my story, what is dark and hidden on the one hand, and, and obscure and so forth, and on the other hand, what is out in the open and bright and uh, clear will be different from culture to culture and how you draw the line between them will be different from culture to culture. And the struggle for er between earth and world in the work of art is going to give you something like the pattern or gestalt or style of the culture. There's an amazing and far-fetched interpretation, but at least it's an interpretation. I, for years, I had no idea what this, call, what this thing called the risk, the, the, uh, the struggle outline. Uh, is. He says that it's the Gestalt and so forth. I'm going to skip the 63. But what in the world content can you give that? I'm trying. I'll, I'll show you where I am. Um, uh, see, in the middle of 63, he talks about this rift. That they're going to translate that as the rift design. Uh, there's no good way to translate it. I mean, that's what it means. That's fine. The, the, the word isn't going to help much. The conflict is not a rift rift as a mere cleft rift open. It's the intimacy of the two and they bring together, and let me just read that, the rift carries the opponents into the source of their unity. It is a basic design and outline that draws the basic features of the rise of the lighting of beings. See, so that's what I think is tied up with the style of the culture. What the lighting of beings and the open and the clearing and the style are all ways, remember, of describing that there is some way to think, well, ways things show up as, ways it makes sense to act and so forth. And he's talking about that again. The rift doesn't let the opponents break apart. It brings the opposition uh, into uh, measure and boundary into its own outline. And specifically, it, say he talks about it in terms of Gestalt on the next page. The strife that, that is brought into the rift and sets it back into the earth and, and, and thus fixed in place is figure, shape, Gestalt. Truth, so we talk about truth being fixed in place in figure. Now comes the attempt to find some uh, phenomena for that. Well, the, the story is that I'm going to tell you, if you can do better, I'm, I'm ready to listen and drop mine. My story is that in any given culture, the way the dark and the light, the hidden and the open, struggle is, go is going to look different and it's going to express a certain style. So they say, for, it, that it, for instance, that Greek temples are, are built to show a kind of tension in which the form seems to be struggling with the stone. And there are all kinds of interesting measurements to show that they don't use just straight lines, but the steps are curved and the pillars are you know, bowed out and so forth. That's the reading is supposed to be, that there's this struggle going on. Well, con contrast that with the Christian struggle. In cathedrals, there is a struggle between the rock and, uh, the, the walls, the dark rock, and the windows. And the windows gradually get bigger and bigger and win out more and more over the darkness. But what you get there is something like the darkness of matter and the light of spirituality are struggling. And that's very different than, than the Greek struggle. For one thing, it's perfectly clear which side you're supposed to be on, namely the side of the, of the light. And, but, and here's a really interesting, it's a, it's a far-fetched story. What would it be like for us? <clears throat> well, for one thing, what would a work of art be for us? It's not easy to figure out what a work of art would be for us uh, because uh, whatever it was, it would, it would have to... I mean, Heidegger thinks there isn't any sort of normal thing that's a work of art for us. Sometimes I think there couldn't be a work of art for us. But I think that... I mean, I was reading a man named Albert Borgman, who's a very interesting Heideggerian. And he goes... He doesn't talk about works of art, but he goes on and on about how it's so characteristic of our way of life, of our wanting to dominate everything and put it in order and get it under control that we impose the national highway system. And it's as if the national highway system, he says it's the biggest uh, thing that people have ever created, except for the Great Wall of China. It's the only other thing that you can see from the moon is the, is the, uh, the United States uh, interstate highway system. 
and the interstate highway system is struggling, presumably, to impose order on nature. And that's a different struggle, again, with a different gestalt and a different style. That, that, if I, so every epoch, the story is every epoch has its own way of understanding the struggle between, you can't even say, I tried to write it out here, you can't say the struggle between light and darkness, or the struggle between order and disorder, or the struggle between form and matter, because each of those is one way of doing it. You see what I mean? I mean, I can't find general terms for this struggle, and then I thought, oh, well, let's call it earth and world. Uh, we need some new general terms. Yeah? Um, I'm, it seems different, though, to, well, when we start talking about dark and disorder versus light and order, um, especially with the examples you've been giving, um, that sounds like a different set. It sounds like one of them is bad, is tending to be mm. bad, um, mm. and it's to be resisted, and has to be set mm. about the mm. about mm. cathedral, and one of them is good, and it's to be embraced. And that's a different kind of interaction, oh. um, in a way less complex one, than the earth and world one that we got. Good, yesterday. good, very good. I'm, I'm, I can take that over on my side, but only by a tricky move. That's a just perfectly sensible objection. The only example that you just didn't use against me was the Greek temple, because in the Greek temple it isn't as if yeah. the rock was bad and the, the, the form was good, right. but that they are equal and struggling and bringing themselves right. out into the open, just like Heidegger said true. they yeah. should. Well, it's one of Heidegger's species that, that we are losing our sense of earth in the West and the world is winning out. I told you you would consider this a strange move. But it's supposed to be that way. And does that mean that they become less works of the art as the earth disappears? Yes, they become less less good works of art. Less. Uh, how does he say it? I think they. Uh, no, that's, a, that's a neat question. Here, the, the answer is, as holding up to the people what they're doing. Of course, they're equally good works of art because uh, if it means that everybody should see in them what they want, well, the medieval certainly saw in them mad, dark matter being overcome by spiritual light. But if the work of art is supposed to show uh, how truth works when it works at its best, then they're losing track of it, because tr truth is always for him this kind of struggle to impose uh, this clarity, or whatever the right word is, on something that will never be able to be clear. We're losing the feeling, and that makes sense, in our culture, that there's anything mysterious, anything resistant, anything that we can't rationalize. So maybe it's all right that the works of art get more and more tilted in the direction of world. I think Heidegger does think that. Uh, okay, that's all pretty far out. If you don't like it and, and don't want to think about it, you don't have to do it. But uh, I thought I owed you some account of this weird talk about risk and another struggle on my part to find the phenomena. Yeah? Are you saying that there should be a balance test? Yeah, ideally they should be equal and struggle and each one bring the other one out more fully. Liz is absolutely right. Is, is that right. in the sense of striving? Then? No. No? No, with striving you have to strive for something. I see nice move in a way. I mean, <laughs> that's how you could turn struggle into striving. But it's, the word is, is strife and strife is struggle. And the and, and uh, striving suggests there's a goal, whereas there isn't really any goal. There's just this tension there. There, and the more they're in tension, the better. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, I'm not sure that striving is not a bad word for this. I mean, I remember <coughs> in the essay um, it talks about how there's a, how there's a lot of it's, it's an essential motion. It's not just there's just these two sides against each other. <coughs> striving captures the constant motion and struggle of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. It's not just one, one thing going against the other, one thing just opposed to the other. They're actually struggling. That's right. It's Each one is... I, think it's not that translation that's I see what you're both saying, and I think you're right. And a maintenance of balance is a goal. Uh, no, no, wait, one thing at a time. Now, I'm not convinced of that. Wait, let me say one thing to him. I think that he says the earth is trying to, the world is striving to surmount the earth, and the earth is striving to say, stay secluded, and that sets up a strife or a struggle. Now, I'll have to go back to the German and see where the striving is, but there's two different things going on. There is, each one has got a goal, or earth and world, and they're you know, opposed goals. And that sets up this struggle, which is clearly what he's talking about. What page was I on? 47 is what all that is. What, what, what? 47 Okay, 47. Uh, 
well, on 49, where, where he's talking about in the essential something, rather the opposites raise each other. I can see why... Uh, well, I now understand... Huh. Okay. I see for the first time, thanks to you guys, why you might trans... why you might want to say striving. I can't believe, can you, that strike... Does anybody know German could ever mean striving? Is that, does that make any sense to you, Forrest? I thought it was no, it totally <coughs> struggle with it. But I can see where he might want to translate it. I can, too. I can but see why you want, might want to call it striving. I think I have to make up from this. Uh, I don't think there's also polymorphs the Greek. Yeah. And uh, it might be a reference to Hesiod, because you know Hesiod distinguishes between two kinds of struggle. The bout struggle, in which the aim is to flatten, uh, to flatten out the adversary, and then uh, coming out of the struggle means winning, and that's clearly not what he wants. But Hesiod also has this good model of a strife, in which you only strive against the adversary in order to better the game itself. The model being sports. And so that's what he's talking so about. Exactly. So, so you have. A you, you strive in a way that preserves the struggle. Exactly. For example, like runners okay. who try to outdo each other, but in fact, the real okay. is the race itself. Well, we're all reaching an agreement yeah. that once you see how it works, yeah. you can even see why he translates it that way, but it's wrong as a translation. <laughs> but you can. But he's on to something. It's all right to say that there is two different... There is Each is striving to surmount the other. That's the first thing, earth and world. They could be said, and that's the point she keeps making, that they are also striving to preserve, and you're sort of to preserve each other in this, exactly. each one, not, not to win out over each other. And the result is a struggle. And Heidegger could talk about all of them. I've got to go back and look at the German. And there's no doubt about this. I looked at this German. Those are all strike. It's but all I'll strike. see what... what? It's, all, it's all It's strike. all strike, it's isn't all strike. it? I, and polemis means struggle. It doesn't yeah. mean striving. It's and he's stri- trying to do the Greek... Polymorphs, right? It, yeah, that's right. It's strikes, beach, uh, beach strike, and dash So okay. it's all Okay. Strike. Well, we... It's three different words. Okay. So, mm-hmm. but we can see why Hofstetter put in striving, which is nice. Yeah. I was just wondering if this was, um, <coughs> this was, this was a, a good example of, of strife, but this, this I'm borrowing from, from the anthropologist uh, reading of all the students, and what he's saying is that, uh, Early Anglo-American modernist writers such as Wallace Stevens concluded that the romantic notion of mysticism with which earlier literature of vested nature needed reconfiguration to satisfy epistemological correctness. And, uh, and I don't I don't I don't see it, but put it aside, because Wallace Stevens has a great sense of things singing. It seems to me it belongs later. I mean there's a poem of him by, about a jug on a hill. You may know it if you're a Wallace Stevens fan. And it, it's just as Heideggerian as could be, but not right now. I, mean, I, I don't think we're in the we're in the big field business of one big world trying to one big movement toward clarity and one big movement toward non-clarity, <coughs> struggling with each other uh, for the whole culture. It's always remember he says for a historical people and for and I could find if I had time that I don't want to go look sort of the whole thing. It's very important. I said last time that. The, 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 the work of art or any case of truth establishing itself is trying to set up an understanding of everything. That's why it's an understanding of being. It's the style of everything. And, and, and we'll come to the Van Gogh shoes and to uh, uh, talking about the jug that Heidegger does when we're not talking about the style of everything anymore. Uh, Heidegger does finally think that that's not the right. W- I mean, that's not wrong. It's just there's something else interesting going on that may be more uh, important to pay attention to. But that's up ahead. Let me go on now. Now comes the truth part. The way Heidegger does it, he says, well, to understand why there must be this struggle, we, which is so far well, the way he explains it, <coughs> just a struggle in the work between the material of the work and the, uh, I don't know what that is, the world. I, I, it's really, the more you try to find sort of some other way of saying it that, has, that keeps his generality, the more you fall back into earth and world. But anyway, the struggle between whatever and whatever that, that the work of art has, uh, you've got to find a bigger issue. So you, you've got to see, if you want to understand why that occurs, then you have to turn to the nature of truth. Now, I sort of rush through the nature of truth, as Liz pointed out rightly, 
And I did it because I uh, was thinking about, well, you know, be, being in time, you had it, but I think it's quite right that we should go over it carefully, and we will see it more in here. And if it turns out that what I say here makes all this perfectly clear, we can go over this very fast, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, truth to begin with, we got a, he says, truth as correspondence is how we understand truth. And that is, we understand truth as the correspondence of a representation with a state of affairs. And remember I said you could have a representation like the sentence, there are uh, 70 chairs in this room, and then you can count the chairs and find out whether it corresponds. Now, Heidegger talks, and he mentions that, because he, wa- he knows there is that kind of truth. Uh, and he talks about it on 51, and, and in, the second, in the third paragraph, second sentence, truth means today, and has long meant, the agreement or conformity of knowledge with fact. That's, I said, of, uh, I said the correspondence of propositions with states of affairs. This is more general. And so, uh, truth could be also, uh, you could remember something, and your memory could be true. There'd be a correspondence between a different kind of representation, namely your memory and some past uh, way things were. But it's always agreement, conformity, correspondence. That's how we think of truth. And that, he says, presupposes a more primordial kind of truth, which the Greeks understood and called aletheia. That's the top of 51. Uh, Truth means the nature of the true. We think this nature in recollecting the Greek word aletheia, the unconcealedness of beings. Remember I said, take aletheia part. Lise is the concealing part, the closed up, the forgotten. And a is the negative part. Now, I think I mentioned, but I'll just say it again. At first, Heidegger thought the Greeks really used aletheia as their exclusive word for truth, and he was very impressed by that. It turns out that's wrong. Uh, A classicist named Friedlander pointed out that even in Homer, there is already correspondence. When people people say what other people said was true, they mean it it corresponds, and when they say it's false, they mean it doesn't correspond to the facts. So Heidegger then says, well, the Greeks understood this in their practices and sensibilities or they wouldn't have had such a word for truth, even though the Greeks never spelled out and understood their own deep field for truth. In fact, that's unfortunate that they didn't because that let Plato come along and and understand truth as the correspondence of uh, something representation to state of affairs. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious if Heidegger um, can cite, say, an example in homework or in literature the sense of, of Aletheia, sort of, yeah, other it works. Or does it, go, does it go just to the very abstract thing of sort of... Uh, he does or try or it. Remind me to look. He tries it with concealedness, where uh, Odysseus is concealing mm-hmm, something. Mm-hmm. But I can't remember how he does it. But he does, he does try to show that they've got this feel. Uh, and... Um, okay, but I, I wish I could remember it right off, but I can't. So, let me get you where we are here. Uh, so, what is this aletheia? When, what's he un- what does he think the Greeks understood? The, well, it, 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 what we're looking for now is what could he think would be presupposed and make possible truth as we normally understand it, and namely correspondence of claims to this facts or propositions to states of affairs or representations to reality. It's all the same stuff. What, what, what would make that possible? And what could, he, what could he have in mind? Well, it's perfectly interesting and clear. He thinks, well, if there wasn't a clearing or a world in which things could show up as something, then people couldn't make truth claims about them as, uh, uh, and, 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 and get it right or wrong about them. I'll, I'll give you an example as soon as I read a general one, at the bottom, a general thing at the bottom of 51. How can, how can fact show, it, show itself if it cannot itself stand forth out of concealedness, if it does not itself stand in the unconcealed? 
A proposition is true by conforming to the unconcealed, to what is true. That is, what in, the, in his sense, that is something that has, uh, well, okay, well, boy, is that confusing. Huh? I think you should say, by corresponding to something in what is unconcealed, namely the world. Uh, he's, never mind, I mean, I don't want to go into that. Uh, I, 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 I'm happy to make it do it my way. I, I think he's got a lot of other notions of unconcealed, too. <coughs> he's got a notion about dissembling, and he's got the notion that things can hide behind other things, and we can be mistaken about them, and he wants to bring all that in, too, but I don't. Let me stick to my point. I'm sorry, I read that. Uh, but I mean, what, I, what I'm saying isn't wrong. It's, and in fact, it's the main point he wants to make. So, unless there's an open space in which things can show up as things, there can't be truth. Uh, and now, Heidegger claims this, um, and let's see if I have to read the middle paragraph. No, what, by the way, the middle paragraph of 51 is what I just said, that there's no reason to read it. The Greeks never s- explicitly thought about Aletheia, but uh, they, uh, it was very concealed from them, but they, un- un- they understood it. Well, let me give you examples of what he could, ha- what he could have in mind here. Uh, so, you can only say true or false things, say, about God's plan, or about his creation, or the meaning of, say, the apple as a symbol of temptation and so forth, in a world opened up in a Christian, with Christian practices and style, in which things show up as produced by a creator and to tell us things in the, in the, in the book of nature. And then you can argue about what they tell us and say true or false things about them. Yeah? Is that a counterexample of, of the possibility of a correspondence truth? The impossibility? Yeah, well, like, if, if there's no clearing for such a statement. Well, if there's no clearing, then... Uh, there would be no clearing. Well, would be, well let's, I mean, probably it'd be like the life of animals. For dogs, for instance, they, they wouldn't have a clearing. Yeah? I thought you also had, um, last month, something like, uh, you know, about the interior decorator and the... Um, the yeah, do I want to bring that in? Do I want anything? The, well, okay, the whole story about the picture on the wall is, is crooked. Right. Well, well, let's try it. I mean, if you could, let me, let me do mine first in terms of these worlds, which is what was on my mind this time. You could see the Christian would have their kinds of truth. And now, utterly different than the truth claims in science, now we go to a Kuhnian example. Scientific communities have practices, standards of evidence, standards of argument, and so forth. And then, in that community, you can make truth claims like the electron weighs such and such, or so many uh, milli, milli, milligrams, or whatever it weighs. Uh, and uh, there has to be in place all these agreed upon practices for measuring things, and for repeating experiments, and for checking out claims, in order to make that kind of truth claim. So again, in, in Kuhnian language, you have to have what he calls the disciplinary matrix, which are the practices, the equipment, the, the, the general way of coping with things, before you can uh, be in that, make true statements in that field. Foucault calls this the, uh, the business of being in the truth game. And hacking, Ian Hacking, you don't need to know this, but he talks about uh, the real thing is it's not being in the truth game, it's being in the truth-untruth game, which is right. I mean, th- you set up, uh, obviously, when, and when you set up one of these worlds and things show up as something, then there's uh, the way you can make true and false statements about them. Let's see, I'm going to do Liz's in a second. So, so correspondence requires disclosing. Okay. For instance, um, there in Heidegger, there's an example of somebody who points to a picture on the wall and says this picture is crooked. And the question is, in, in, and we, in, we, can, we can picture a bunch of practices in which that's perfectly right, in, and, and uh, it means that it's not parallel with the, the floor or the ceiling or both, and it's true, the picture on the wall is crooked. But you can picture for somebody else who has a little different because they don't have a different understanding of being, but it, that's why I was yeah. staying away from this example. But uh, in a kind of metaphorical sense, lives in a different world. 
say an interior decorator who set it up so that everything is our postmodern apartment so that everything is what we would normally call crooked but for them the picture is just right uh, and uh, that's because they're in a different world they're in a postmodern style and uh, th- again if, if it weren't for having some style either a good old solid Cartesian style where everything ought to be parallel to everything or a postmodern style where everything should be off from parallel, you couldn't be in the business of making simple truth claims like the picture is crooked or not. I like the example mainly because it isn't fancy claims like God's plan for us or science. It's supposed to be everyday claim that it's always only in a world opened up by a bunch of shared practices that you can make truth claims. That's, it's a pretty simple idea and it sounds fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But isn't that, isn't there a problem with that example? Because doesn't that also presuppose, in, in turn, its own correspondence theory? Because doesn't doesn't the crookedness have to correspond to the style in order to be the way it is? <coughs> no. Well, maybe. I, mean, I, I got it. Yes. It has to be in tune with the style or something. It, but correspond means something like. Uh, it's you, you state that it has certain characteristics and it either has those characteristics or doesn't. The, that you can't state the characteristics of the crooked picture and state the characteristics of the style and then say that the picture... But, but you're right that there's some other word you need and Heidegger loves this notion of being, in, being attuned to or, or being in sync with. You've got to be attuned to the postmodern way things show up before you can make this kind of claim. And therefore, there is something like correspondence in that, namely this attuned thing. But Heidegger wouldn't mind. Heidegger would say, okay, now we've got three things. We've got the style which opens up a world. We've got having to be attuned to that style, and you could get out of tune, and that would be... He even has words for this. What's it? The, 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 uh, I don't know if I can remember. The... Uh, the directive, a funny word. But uh, in his, in an essay on truth, he talks about that you have to conform to, to, the, to the directive. And the directive is something like, I think, the style. Uh, so there is this other thing, attuning or conforming. And then both of these would have to be in place before you could make a straight, simple claim and have it be true or false, namely, uh, the picture is crooked. He'd be he'd happy with that. Uh, yeah. Well, if I understand you right, I think Heidegger would repudiate this. I mean, you don't make true and false statements about a world. Let's just take the sort of uh, you. What you I mean, I'm trying to think of some example. I, I uh, if, if you mean you could say things like the Christians believe that it was all created by God, I suppose that's a true statement about their beliefs. But uh, a world, a style. How do you make true statements about it? It's not. It's not necessarily that. I mean. There's one way I, I read it is that basically um, correspondence statements or statements on propositions entail a context, and only that context context can make sense of those statements. But, um, only within that context can we make sense of the statements. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, that makes sense. But um, at the same time, it feels like I'm, I'm just wondering if someone were to, to probe further and say that say that um, basically what you're saying is that in order for anything like a, a proposition to be true or false or to make sense, we must have an agreed upon context in which those statements make sense. I'm wondering how much further you could take that and how interesting that becomes. What are the implications of a thought like that? Because at the surface it seems rather uninteresting and, and almost intuitive and it's something yeah, well that nobody I, would disagree to. It turns out to be hugely interesting only in philosophy where people have tended to forget it. Uh, I mean, then when somebody like Searle, how many have had Searle in the background, which is similar? When Searle comes in with his notion of the background and says you can't make a literal statement at all, except on a background well, oh, relative to which, the, you know, his example of whether a cat is on a mat, we could have done that. 
and you can't even say a cat, the cat is on the mat in, in this early example, except it, again some shared set of background practices. And in Wittgenstein, you get a lot about how there has to be agreement in, in practices. yes, in practices before you can make any truth claims at all. And that turns out, it turns out to be an incredibly strange and powerful thing to say in a philosophical tradition that seems to have thought, and well, did think, that they were just states of affairs, that was just one of the things that was real, and mental states or, prop, or, or, or statements, another thing that was really real, and their agreement or disagreement. They didn't think there was anything else going on. And now these people, Kuhn, Wittgenstein, uh, uh, what did you just name? Searle. Sure. Uh, Heidegger, each in their own way, say, oh, but there's something extremely interesting going on behind this. Okay, but... So basically, so basically it diffuses the uh, ability uh, to... Uh, it diffuses the, uh, the idea of a free-flowing fact of some sort that, that can move or become transliterated. In other words, yes. it allows for the context to change which would allow the whole correspondence. Right. There are no free-floating facts and there are no, and, and it also undermines the idea that there are uh, sort of uh, literal meanings in the mind that correspond to those facts just in a vacuum. Okay, good. Let, let me go on. Let's see now. What, okay, now things get, I mean, that was the easy part. <coughs> now we get to the double concealing that's involved in all this. Uh, so the, the correspondence theory requires the background practices. That doesn't seem yet like a big struggle story, but Aletheia is disclosing. That means, now we're going to turn to, and this isn't in Searle or Wittgenstein, I don't know about Kuhn, maybe in Kuhn, to the issue of opening up a world. I mean, it, it, it is, I mean, we said, well, the world has to be there, but that it has to be there because somehow it, it, it got done that there was a clearing. And so what does that mean? Well, then he's talking about that in very hard stuff on 54 and 55, which I'll try to explain. Um, he talks about in, in, in that there's some kind of denial going on, and in italics, the denial in the form of a double concealment belongs to the nature of truth as unconcealment. So now he's going to try to talk about, and this is really weird and hard, and I don't understand it very well, if truth is unconcealment, as the Aletheia says, if it's disclosure, then you ought to be able to say something about what it was, and it's a little like somebody over here who said, I want a counterexample uh, of uh, what it would be not to have a world. And I said, well, think about dogs, maybe, but we didn't follow it up. Well, what would it be like not to have a clearing, in wi- and then sort of make one? out of that. That's going to be the primal conflict. That's going to be the denial of the concealment. He goes on, truth in its nature is untruth. We put the matter this way to serve notice with possibly surprising trenchancy. The denial in the manner of concealment belongs to unconcealment is the clearing. That is, there's got to be something there that you open up or uh, make a unified bunch of practices in, I make into a unified bunch of practices so that things can show up as something. And so, and what is that? Well, he says that there's a, it's a primal conflict on 55 between the concealing sort of forces and the <coughs> unconcealing that's trying to open up the, the clearing. Uh, let's see, I have some quotes just to tell you where we are. I got lost for a second here. Yeah. Uh, the first paragraph on 55. Truth occurs precisely as itself in the concealing denial as refusal. Provide, sorry, truth occurs precisely as itself in that the concealing denial as refusal provides its constant source to all clearing, and yet as dissembling it meets out to all clearing the indefeasible severity of error. Well, but we, it's all about how there's got to be something there. And there's a whole t- bunch of candidates for what could be there. I'll mean, just read you one more thing and then I'm going to talk about them. Uh, there is, the, at the end of that paragraph, the nature of truth is the primal conflict which if that open center is where, in which that open center is one, within which what is stands, and so forth and so forth. 
Well, what is it there that you have to, that is a kind of, as he calls it later, a double refusal on 60? What, I mean, I'm trying to understand the double refusal, which is about five lines from the bottom of 60. In unconcealedness is truth, there occurs also the other on of the double refusal. Well, here are my guesses. Okay. <clears throat> there is something like the, what he calls in one place the dim confusion, which I think is one name for the, uh, the, the non-clearing that has to be uh, struggled against. And I, there sort of, the dim confusion language occurs at the top of 74, a renunciation of all the dim confusion in which what is veils and withdraws itself. Now, I think there are lots of candidates for dim complete confusion, and I'm not sure which is the one we want. Um, one is that there, you'd, you'd, at the beginning, when there was the fir- when the world had a world, he has the picture in another book. World devolves upon nature. He, he's really very sensible and matter of fact. He doesn't think that there were worlds all along. There were Homo sapiens around, and they were running around in groups and hunting and gathering and so forth. At some point, their practices got organized enough to have in them uh, at least equipment, and then they were ready for being in time, if anybody had been around to write it. And then they got so organized that they had a style and different worlds. Maybe that happens at the same time, but I doubt it. You know, you can have, just appears to me, equipment without language, but then comes this big jump supposedly, where you get very fancy equipment and probably the style story. Anyway, the dim confusion could be the level the before things got organized enough. And there was, but I don't know if there would be enough of a struggle there, so let me try again. I think the big struggle for Heidegger is the struggle against something like uh, the banal and familiar and ordinary, which makes it very hard to see anything new. And, the, and, opening up, and, and opening up a world and keeping it open has something like not letting everything become completely banalized. He talks about that someplace. Uh-oh, I didn't write down the page number. The struggle with the familiar and the ordinary. Hmm. I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking for it. I think it's right on those last pages. If I could find it in a hurry, I would tell you. It seems like a very different struggle, obviously. I don't claim they're the same. The struggle to open a clearing in the first place and the struggle to keep the clearing from becoming dim confusion again where everything is so taken for granted that... uh, Thing. And I do not like that. Things still would show up as something. I mean, it seems like on one hand you might have Jim confusion, on the other hand you're going to have something like orderly dogma or something, you know, meaningless. Yeah. Um, but it looks like then you can make food problems. Yeah. Yeah. And I, but what, I'm, I'm confused about this. Yeah. It's probably not Okay, I'm not sure it's going to help us, but I'm happy to have it. Thank you. I'll write it in here. Because uh, I wouldn't, I could better get out of it, but I mean, you have to, you have to look at it. Now where is it? Bottom 74. Art is the setting for the work. Uh, not only the creation of it, but every equally you know, preserving it. So the work is the actual effect. Uh, I don't see it yet. Yeah, there's a paragraph down the setting of the work of truth. Trust off the unfamiliar. What, but yes, but that's the, the unfamiliar. Wait, wait, where are you? Uh, uh, it might be the right place. The middle place. of 75. The middle of 75. Okay. Of the unfamiliar. Yeah, thrust up the inf- unfamiliar. Yeah, thrust down the ordinary. Okay, thrust down the ordinary. Okay, good. That's one of the conflicts. That's, that's another way of, of looking at it. I'll come back to that. I Don't think about that one right now. That's going to be... That's what happens, just let me tell you, when you open up a new world. There's that, I, you know, I see now. There's this struggle when you get a world at all out of the dim confusion. There's a struggle when the world has become completely banal and... You now disclose a new world. Then you struggle against that. Now, I think there's another struggle too, but I'm not sure that it's one of his, but I'm going to throw it in here because I think it would be a real struggle. If you, when, the wor- when you're tending to have one world, then you're going to struggle against all the sub-worlds. 
I was thinking of Christianity having to struggle against the witches, the astrologers, people who like friendship. Augustine had lots of bad things to say about friendship. Uh, because the, if you want the mainline practices of relating to God, and uh, then you don't want the witches' practices, and you don't want the astrologers, and, so, and, and friends get in the way if you love them too much, or loving God, Augustine thinks, and so forth. So another way, it seems to me, so there are going to be uh, three ways, I think, at least, where you've got where you've got something that is not open and disclosed, something closed in some way that you have to open up if you're going to have a world. There is the original dim confusion. You've got to get rid of it if you're going to have a world at all. There is the banal world that you're in that you're going to have to get rid of if you want to disclose a new world. And we'll come back to that. And there's all the sub-worlds that you're going to have to struggle against if you want to have one unified world. Yeah? Um, two questions. One is, when, if the um, understanding becomes banal, banal is it then still open to re-articulate that same understanding <coughs> in a way that will absolutely it to absolutely. Mind again? Well, so it's not that re-articulating or reconfiguring. There Very good. Options. How did you, did I say... I haven't said any about this yet. You're even using my language. What well, you said you were going to say Okay, okay. Yeah, well, um, we had a talk. Yeah. You're, getting ahead of, you're getting ahead of my story. Yeah, and go ahead. That's right. And then the other one was, um, do the subworlds, are those going to be count as marginal practices, or are those going to be sort of independent subworlds? Independent, because the marginal practices, you can take over in a certain way, I think. If you can't yes, take over the witches and astrologers into Christianity the way you could... I don't have to think about that. You're yeah, asking things sure. ahead of my story. Okay. Ask me again. But when I got there, yeah. I wanted to know how your interpretation maps on to his, uh, you know, he calls double, double consumer in part refusal and in part dissembling. How, how okay, the dissembling one is interesting. I should have said that. There are two big forms of untruth that are not simply non correspondent but one of them is in, inside the world. Inside the world is pretty much like, pretty much like ordinary untruth dissemblance. Things aren't what they seem to be. They get in the way of each other. People get sort of banal, superstitious ideas. That's all dissemblance. I mean, I think that's uninteresting because it takes place within a world. And, and he says concealment can be refusal or merely dissembling in the middle of 54. I'm explaining the merely. Now, refusal is the interesting one for him because that's where concealment fights with unconcealment on the level of the clearing. And that's what I've been trying to explain. Yeah? Uh, I have two questions. One, if, if the subworlds are struggling, do they ever disappear? How do you ever get a unified sense of being if, there, if there's a struggle with the subworlds? And the other point... Uh, wait, wait, let me say one other thing about that. I think that Heidegger does not make the mistake of thinking that you ever get a unified understanding of being in any of these early stages. There are always stuff that's left out that's either subworld or just marginal isn't made into any world at all, and it's important to him. There is always some dominant style, some dominant understanding of being. But if it weren't for... Uh, if, if it ever got so that everything was taken into one style, he would think that was very bad. Be, I mean, it would, the, the struggle would be over. Er, world would have triumphed over Earth. There wouldn't be any um, marginal practices. Not, not that the witches may be marginal practices, but friendship would be. There wouldn't be marginal practices. So people think of Heidegger as somehow having this total, totalizing picture. And he does think there is one dominant style in each epoch. But he doesn't think that the dominant style does or should win out Though he thinks that in our epoch, more than any other, the dominant style is winning out. And that's another way of saying the world is winning out over Earth and marginal practices are being eliminated and all kinds of things he thinks is very bad about the current situation. He's very much a pluralist up to a point. But pluralism within a very, within some central organized understanding. Yeah. I want to go on. You want, no, go ahead. Um, well, I wanted to ask, I don't know if this is um, whether it, we can say we have, there is an understanding of being insofar as there is a dominant 
sort of yes. way of Absolutely. doing it. And then you can't have a, ever have a totalizing understanding of meaning at the cost of like total statements. Right. You, there are two things to say. It, 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 that's what it is to have an understanding of being. I think. I mean, that's so obvious to me that I haven't said it enough. If it's an understanding of being, then it's about everything that is. That's what it is. That's why if, I mean, you can't have a sort of understanding. If you only have the understanding to say the being of the man, let's go back to Bali, was to be aggressive and the being of the women was to be nurturing, then you wouldn't really have an understanding of being in Bali because there wouldn't be anything that everything uh, had just insofar as it is. So you get, but in Christianity, everything is a creature. And in modernity, everything is either a subject or an object for a subject. Is, is that, you're looking worried about that? Yeah, no, I wasn't looking oh, Okay. Now, I want to skip something, which I might, might not come back to, since you don't know that I'm skipping it, it's not going to bother you. And go over here, because I want to talk about what the printer wouldn't let me talk about if I can do it. And, well, maybe, no, maybe the, the, I should take advantage of what the printer said on the se- on second thought. I'm going to put aside what's over here and do what's over here in front of me, and then I'll get to that if I get there. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about a whole other thing which we haven't talked about, uh, and that is uh, where, in the next thing Heidegger really wants to ask, and let me make sure I've done this one now. Okay, the, what, what, if you, let's talk now back to, about the work. He wants to know some, how does the work of art get created? The, the work of art now, back to the work, we, remember we took a detour. We, we, let, let me make clear. We supposedly were trying to explain why there was a struggle between earth and world. And we generalized it to say wherever there's truth, there's going to be a struggle between what tries to open up the clearing and what resists the opening up of the clearing. And that's supposed to explain why there's a struggle between earth and world in the work. Now, if you happen to say at this point, huh, I don't think that explains it. They just seem to be two different stories. You will be happy. I mean, mean, explains is a little strange. I mean, there's a kind of parallel between those two things. That Why should it follow from the fact that when you open up a clearing, you've got to struggle against a lot of dim confusion and banality and uh, other worlds, subworlds. Why should it follow from that that in the work of art, you ought to be, you ought to, there's a struggle set up between uh, something secluding and something uh, opening? Well, I can sort of see why he thinks so, because the work of art is opening up a world, so why not? But it's, I just think it's amusing that where I got to find it. He, where he says that he's supposedly done it. Hmm. He's asked this question, and now he's, he gives you the whole story about art. Okay, but I know it's, it's still part of this other one, and it's one of the things in the computer, but it's so much trouble to get it out of the computer. Uh, no, ah, here it is. It's the bottom of 55. It isn't. You're doing well, but it isn't in the text. I just want to say, he says, uh, Earth juts at the bottom. Earth juts through the world, and world grounds itself on the earth. Only so far as truth happens, as the fi- as the primal conflict between clearing and concealing. See, that's the answer to the question. Uh, and he writes in the margin in German, not an answer. That is. So, so he's aware that this is a quick move between the, 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 the two different kinds of concealing. The struggle between earth and world is a very specific struggle that the work of art sets up when it totalizes and, and out of the material that it's made of and so forth. But let me, let me go where I was going to go. The, he, the, one of the questions he asks all through this, and I sk- keep skipping it, and I feel bad because I think it will help you understand something if I, before I... If I put it in before I go to the final thing, which is how you start a new world, which is where Liz was going. And, and, uh, okay, the, 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 he asks the question, uh, well, where does uh, the, the work of art come from? Is the work of art created uh, and on, on 61? Or where does truth as the opening up of a world come from? It's, uh, it's part of the same question. He says, uh, 
61, the bottom paragraph. Truth happens only by establishing itself in the conflict and sphere opened up by truth itself. Well, we've just been talking about that. That is, truth as disclosing. Because truth that is disclosing is the opposition of clearing and concealing, there belongs to it what is there, what is here to be called establishing. That is, establishing worlds, setting them up and preserving them. The truth does not exist in itself beforehand somewhere among the stars to descend among beings. See, that would be onto theology. You know, God had the truth and then he created the world using it. Or This is impossible for the reason uh, alone that it is, after all, only the openness of beings that first affords the possibility of a somewhere, of a place filled by present beings. Um, so, so he's asking the question, uh, well, how does, where does truth come from then? And, he, and specifically then he gets to the issue, well, what is the origin of the work of art? which is the setting into, which is the, remember, a truth establishing itself. Sorry, oh boy, did I say that wrong. Uh, no, not terribly wrong. Oh, remember, the work of art is a special case of truth establishing itself. There are also statesmen and, and gods and uh, martyrs and so forth. But, so let's take the special case of truth establishing itself, namely in a work of art, and ask, where does, where does the work of art come from? Is it created by uh, creators, by people? And then he says, and I think it's important to see how radical he is here. He, it, it's no coincidence he's taken the temple. Or we don't even know who made it. He thinks that people making works of art are at best a kind of vehicle for what's really going on on 56. Hmm. It isn't where I think it is. Sorry about that. <coughs> I see at the bottom, I guess. He says the work of art is created. But, of course, he's not going to go along with that. So that's a funny quote. Uh, what I really want is uh, on 61. Let's see if that's right. Yeah, we did 61. Okay, let's try 71. Yeah, well, no, we're going to do the creator stuff, which is on 71. I want to get you on 71 to the place where he says in the top paragraph, and it is preservers too, the preserving of a work belongs to its createdness and so forth, but it is the work that makes the creators possible and that brings by its own nature the need of preservers. It, if art is the origin of the work, this means that art lets those who naturally belong together at work, the creator and the preserver, originate each in his own nature. What, however, is art that it's the, or, it's the origin? I think we have to talk about that for a minute because that's pretty strange. And let's just first give, as some people say, we want counterexamples of what he's, what he's not talking about. What he's against is obviously some kind of romantic view of the creator being a kind of genius who has new ideas and who brings them into the world. He's very much against that view. The middle of 40, he says, the work is to be released by the artist, by him, to its pure self-subsistence. It's precisely in great art, and only such art is under consideration, that the artist remains inconsequential as compared to the work, like a passageway that destroys itself in the creative process. Well, that's nice, in a way. What he wants to say is, it just as I called it, a vehicle. The artist is just responding to something that needs the artist to, to, to sort of uses the artist. And it's so he's against altogether a, a, a view of genius. This is on 76. All, this is a neat sentence. All creation, because it's a drawing up as a water from a spring. That's a German pun. Schaffen is creation. Schöpfen is drawing up. He wants to say that it isn't a shopping, it isn't a making, a producing. It's drawing something up that's already there. And it's even more a kind of interesting pun in his head. I think he thinks that what, how you draw it up is to become a vacuum. I think he thinks that the more empty the artist is, the less the artist has any agenda, any sort of childhood traumas he's trying to work out, any uh, whatever. The artist should be just the emptiest, most sensitive person to what's going on in the practices and what style change might be coming in and, and, and 
changing in the practices. And so he says, modern subjectivism immediately misinterprets creation, taking it as the self-sovereign subject's performance of genius. That's exactly what it's not like. It's like a vacuum that sucks into it what is in the uh, <coughs> spring, in, in, this, in this kind of spring. Let's see if I... Uh, a little further. Um, poetic projection comes from nothing in this respect, that it never takes its gift from the ordinary and traditional, naturally. But it never comes from nothing in that what is projected by it is the withheld location of a historical people. Well, now we have to understand where, where does it come from? That doesn't help much, the withheld location of the historical people. Well, at this point, I want to say that I'm going to read something in, that I'm going to give you the passages that support it. Because you want to ask the next question is, what is the artist sensitive to if he's a kind of open, receptive vacuum? Well, as I said, he's, he, and I didn't say it in these words, he's sensitive, I would say, to the marginal practice to things that go on in the culture which are not ordinary and mainline, and presumably not sub-worlds either, but just unimportant aspects, unnoticed aspects of what's going on, sort of anomalies, you might say, in the current world. And that is a kind of reservoir that this vacuum-like artist sucks up. On 60, he talks about it, it, truth is untruth insofar as there belongs to it the reservoir of the not yet uncovered, the ununcovered in the sense of concealment. Uh, now, that's interesting because <clears throat> that's another form of, 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 uncon of, of concealedness. Uh, it's another form of refusal. That is, there, there is something there that hasn't been brought out and is not going to be easily and normally brought out. Yeah. I was just going to ask, so, so the artist is kind of somebody who brings these anomalies back into focus, which allows the tension to occur again? He doesn't do, and he's going to I'll have to wait till next time, it, it turns out. One, because it's in the computer, and two, because time is running out. But I, well, I'll, I mean, roughly, I mean, I'll say it, because I can come back to it again. The artist... The, the greatest artist, which is the one who brings in a whole new world, does it by, this is the slogan, taking these marginal anomalous uh, practices and be hearing them and making them central and taking the central practices and putting them down and making them marginal. That leads to a reconfiguring in a new world. Uh, yeah? I was just curious if you um, have a few passages to um, where I, I might be able to look. Well, I'm giving them to you as best I can. I'm going to go on. It is? Okay, well, let me give you my list of this. The openness has got to be... <coughs> um, I don't think... But let me find the best because to go with that. So it's a receptivity, and we're still trying to get clear about how much we can find out about what it's receptive to. Um, and I think I've done as best I can there. Let's look on 62. Um, the, okay, let me read this, the beginning of that paragraph. The establishing of truth in the work is the bringing forth of a being such as never was before and never come again. The bringing forth places this being in the open in such a way that what is brought forth first clears the openness and so forth. So something is brought forth. Uh, creation is such a bringing forth. Now, as such a bringing, it is a re rather a receiving, incorporating of a relation to unconcealedness. Now, I put that together with the un on, the, well, on page 60, that what's at the bottom, the unconcealedness is some kind of reservoir. And then I think that that's the best case I can make for the fact that there is something there all along. Well, I'll read you one more important passage. I was going to read it next time, but I see you need to hear it now. Something has been preparing itself, so to speak, in the background. Uh... I don't know whether I can. Yes, here it is. Uh, 
You know, it's around page 76 somewhere, but so much goes on on page 76, so I don't know if I can jump ahead to it. It says something that's been preparing itself. Anybody got that? Paragraph the stone and grounding and second sentence. You got it? What page? 76. Does not exclude the rather includes the fact that the beginning prepares itself. Yes, where are you? It's middle of 76. Boy, you are good at this. Um, the beginning already contains its end. I found that, but I couldn't find the thing I was looking for. Second sentence. Ah, yeah, okay. The, the, the beginning prepares itself for the longest time and wholly inconspicuous. You have to try to figure out how to fill that in. How are you going to fill that in? I'll tell you what I'm going to do, just because it's a crazy thing to do, but I'm going to jump ahead and give you an example, the phenomena story again. What would it look like for a reconfigurer to take up marginal practices and make them central, and central practices and make them marginal? I'm just going to talk about it next time with all these obscure phrases, but let's have the phenomenon first. Jesus is my favorite perfect example. It's one, it's this, this time it's a God establishing truth. That's why he is a God, because he's a reconfigurer. And he is, he, and, and, but what's interesting is the following, that in the Hebrew understanding of, of being, and the law was crucial. I'm giving you a sort of Paulian story filtered through Heidegger. Uh, the law was crucial. What you actually did was what was important. If you look at the Ten Commandments, they tell you not to kill people, and they tell you not, um, not to... Uh, uh, commit adultery and so forth, and these are acts that you can do or you can fail to, and, or stop doing if you have a, if you have any willpower. And uh, you're not supposed to do them. If you do them, you're guilty. And that's that's one story. Now there, uh, Jesus comes along in the Sermon on the Mount and says something absolutely bizarre that he he uh, commits adultery who lusts after a woman in his heart and turns what you're guilty for, not in turn, not what you do, but what you desire. And, the, and, and now it becomes a whole question of you can't. Paul is all upset because Paul is condemned all the time because he can't help lusting after all the women that come by. It was all right under the law. He didn't, I mean, he didn't commit adultery. But under this new way of understanding the situation, he's guilty. And what, ne- what you need is not sort of to obey the law. What you need is to be pure. But you can't be pure by your own willpower. So now you need a savior. And everything gets changed around. But what I wonder, what I think is very interesting about this example is, at some point when I was doing this, some student said, ah, but there is one of the Ten Commandments that says you shouldn't uh, covet your neighbor's property. And coveting is a case of desiring, not a case of doing anything. And at first I thought, oh my God, and I looked up covet in Hebrew, hoping it, would, it meant something else, but it doesn't. It means what it says. But now I see that's perfect. If, the ten, if, if of the Ten Commandments, nine of them say there's something you shouldn't do, and one of them says there's something you shouldn't desire, that's a marginal practice. I mean, a 10% practice of a 90% law-abiding culture. And Jesus comes and takes this 10% and makes it 90%. And, and, and what happens to the law? Remember, he, he goes around healing on the Sabbath and they say, you can't do it, it's the Sabbath. And he says, I don't have to obey the law anymore. I fulfill the law. So the 10% get to be the main thing, what you desire. And obeying the law gets to be utterly marginal. And, not, and now what have you got? A whole new world in which people now understand themselves as desired beings. And their identity depends on what they desire, not on what they do. And things show up as temptations. And, and worthiness, unworthiness now becomes uh, the purity, impurity, saint and sinner uh, aligned, and not uh, uh, law-abiding or not law-abiding. And, the, and, and Jesus has reconfigured everything. You get a last word. So you would say that he opened up a moral space? No, well, he opened up a space, certainly a moral space, but it's almost too big to be moral because uh, what it makes sense to do changes, what it is to be a person changes. I even, I think, probably when you figure it out, what it is to be a thing changes, so I have to work at it. Uh, and the dimensions of worthiness certainly change. So anyway, you, what I'm going to do next time is finish talking about uh, the reconfiguring person and another kind of person who's an articulating person. Let me say one more thing and then you can go. This book is very confusing and I don't want you to be confused. Heidegger starts by talking about the temple 
The temple isn't a reconfigurer. The temple focuses what's there already in the world. And then he gets to the, at the end, which is the hard part I've been trying to explain, he gets to reconfigurers, which don't focus what's already there in the world, but bring a new world in. I'll sort these two out, give you passages, and then we'll turn back to truth in this thing next time. Now, okay. So, the, the translation on 177 of basic questions, uh, vacillating, is just wrong. <coughs> it's literally holding back, which is just a, almost a synonym of self-concealment. And my way of translating it has been, just it feels right to me, something like, because it's called a vacillating, hesitant refusal on page 178 and often. I think you, ca- you should cross out vacillating and hesitant. I can't imagine what they mean. And put reluctant refusal. And this reluctant is just the same as the earth. It's this business of, <coughs> of withdrawing and resisting uh, being brought out of unconcealment. And there's no... I mean, it makes, it makes one wonder about the translators. I don't know what they think he's talking about. What could be vacillating and what could be... Uh, what was the other word? Hesitating about the <coughs> the clearing. What's that? German? What's that? What's the German? Ah, I, I looked it up and wrote it down, but I think it, I think it's Suruk Halkin, but I'm no, I know I don't think it is. That would be too easy to see. That would be really hanging back. Yes. I have to look it up. Sorry, I, I looked it up and then I. It's not fair. No, oh, no. It's not fair. Mm. It's so good. Z O with an umlaut G E R E N D something like so good. Yeah, which is which does mean hesitating and does mean vacillating and a lot of other things too. Under one of which is holding back, which seems to me a lot more likely to be what Heidegger's meaning because it makes sense and fits with other things. Anyway, with that warning, well, there's one other thing <coughs> I should tell you to help you read this on page 172, mm-hmm. for instance. Even though you're not even supposed to read that. You, you see all over <coughs> and this, I just picked this one uh, leaping ahead into the essentialization of truth and then indication of the essentialization of truth you're bound to hear that as some kind of essentialism because essentialism is in the air and is a bad thing but when he says the essentialization of truth the German word is Wesung W-E-S-U-N-G <coughs> which is related to they, which is the word for essence. So you can see why they translate it that way. <coughs> but I was going to say this later in the lecture, but I can say it now as well. All this talk about essence, you've got to hear it constantly, differently than, if you, than what you normally think of as the word essence. Heidegger goes into how the essence isn't the abstract, isn't somehow this very general characteristic of everything that is a chair and would be the essence of chair. But <clears throat> the way Heidegger uses essence, it means how something works. So the essence of truth isn't the most general, abstract feature of truth or the characteristic of everything that's true uh, or the necessary and sufficient conditions for something being uh, counted as true. It's nothing like that. It's something like how truth works, or if you want a more detailed account of essence, <clears throat> and you've got this book that you need to buy, and you look at the first footnote to the question concerning technology, you find a whole lot of talk about essence, and what he says is, what essence means is the way in which something pursues its course. <clears throat> I think that's just not as good as how it works, but maybe the most filled out version of essence would be how it installs and perpetuates itself. So when you're talking about the essentialization of truth, it's about how truth works, how it comes to be, how it perpetuates itself, how it pursues its course, all of those strange ways of talking, but not (coughs) something that has nothing to do with essentialism and therefore misleading uh, word there. Okay, that's enough just to tell you things not to... I don't want to make life harder for you than necessary by the translator's way of doing things. Now, we're going to go back and talk about the, the <coughs> most important stuff going on in uh, 
of the origin of the works of art. And that is the way there that some being in the clearing establishes the truth in the clearing. And mainly, I want to distinguish a whole, I want to make a whole lot of distinctions that Heidegger doesn't make that I think are implicit in his examples and in what he's talking about. So first I want to make a big distinction between articulation and reconfiguration. I talked about this at the end last time. And I'm going to spell out what they are. I think Heidegger, in a very confusing and misleading way, starts out with examples of articulation, like the temple and the cathedral, and ends up (coughs) in a hurry, but very important, telling you about something quite different, uh, the, the reconfiguration. And the way you can see that it must be quite different is, by the end, he's talking about a leap, a shock, a new history beginning. <clears throat> and if you think the Greek temple and the medieval cathedral just aren't a leap and a shock and a new history beginning, they are something else. So, sorry, I keep drinking this because I will cough otherwise. Uh, better see me drinking all the time and coughing all the time. So, what, what they are that is, the Greek temple and the medieval cathedral, are, are a certain kind of articulation. I think there are two kinds of articulation to be distinguished. <coughs> so I'm sort of, if you sort of, sort of, if I wrote it on the board, I would want to say, so the big category is truth setting itself to work, and then the two big subcategories are articulation and reconfiguration. And under articulation now is subcategory one, <coughs> which, just for fun, we could call glamorizing. It it is taking the current style and making it shine, making such a a, a superly powerful and clear uh, exemplar of it that you can see everything in terms of that, in the light of that, and so forth. And that's where the Greek temple and the medieval cathedral come in. This is kind of review because we talked a lot about that early on in the book, in the article. So that's how Kant articulates Descartes. Descartes has this new way of seeing things that <clears throat> Kant puts it together and says to people, that's the Enlightenment. We're in the Enlightenment. This is what it means when we take over everything as subjects and that's who we are. We're the people in the Enlightenment. <clears throat> and Merleau Monroe glamorizes feminine practices and becomes a shining exemplar of what it is to be feminine in the culture. These are not all equally big. I mean, she's obviously not redefining the understanding of being in the culture. She's doing it on a small scale for the subworld of feminine erotic attraction. But in all of these, <coughs> something extraordinary comes to the surface and something ordinary is thrust down. Now, that's a little bit peculiar because that's also the basic <coughs> characteristic of reconfiguring, <coughs> and therefore it's confusing. But there, it means something different in these two cases. So first let me explain what I think it means when something extraordinary comes to the surface and the ordinary is thrust down in the case of articulating uh, that we've just been uh, talking about. When, well, yeah, okay. In, in all kinds of articulating this happens. It's on, in, on 66 he's talking about it. <coughs> he talks about how the, the more simple does the thrust come into the open that the work is in the middle of the page, and the more essentially is the extraordinary thrust to the surface and the long familiar thrust down. Now what is that? It, that means lots of different things and even different things under the two forms of articulation, and it means another thing under reconfiguring, I think. That's what makes it so hard to see how these are all different. So far, you can just think of Marilyn Monroe as making sort of extraordinary erotic beauty come to the surface and making every uh, most of the women look ordinary. The ordinary is is thrust down. And in all these shining things, when they shine, you look unhappy with this, very unhappy. Well, you have to tell me why in a minute, right away, really. But just me think. So I think when any of these things shine, then uh, what? Then sort of the banal ordinary begins to look 
Bengal and ordinary and is thrust down in the light of this powerful uh, example. You, you don't like well, that? Well, I thought that um, what we had said before was that uh, Marilyn Monroe uh, typified or brought out a certain kind of um, sense of style of feminine beauty. And one of the things it did was show men how to be attracted to other women, not just to Marilyn Monroe. Right, they right, all just right, right. But I don't mean that they they but stayed plain. I mean, they they look plain until they catch up with her is what I was thinking. I mean, mm-hmm. she gives them a new way of, of looking mm-hmm. and then they all limitate that as best they can in their own w- way, take up that style, and then men relate to them, each, not to her. But, okay, it, it, it makes them sound like they're sort of in the shadows until mm. they bring themselves into the light, rather mm. than that she's shining light on everybody. Oh, I see. Well, she's shining light on everybody, but then how do you, what, how does the Greek temple and cathedral, let's go back to them, um, make the extraordinary come to the surface and thrust down the ordinary? But this isn't what we were talking about this morning, obviously, yeah. which is a whole new, yeah. different thing. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure that one out. I guess I'm not Maybe totally convinced that this phrase applies to, to that. this kind of... Okay, um, well, internet. good. Well, one other possibility, and maybe Liz is right, is to say that they're not in the business of making the extraordinary come to the surface and thrusting down the ordinary. If not, and I don't know, I'll leave that open. You could think about it and discuss mm-hmm. it. But if they're not, what would that look like? Well, Liz has a good feel for the phenomena for uh, this one, and we talked about it this morning. And <clears throat> it's an, in any case where you've got a work of art, what happens is the, the, what the work of art lights up gets to be banal and rigid, like Christianity did, and probably Greek religion too, and, and, or, and, and the Hebrew religion certainly, and then the Hebrew prophets come along and call people back to their original covenant with God. Or Christianity gets to be all institutional and hierarchical in the Middle Ages, and then Luther comes along and says it's really about love and imitating Jesus. You've forgotten what it is. Now, this is a second kind of articulation. These are uh, the preservers. They, they renew the... Uh, the style, the understanding of being, which naturally runs down. And there, the extraordinary comes to the surface and the ordinary is thrust down in a way that lives likes. Right? Yeah. And okay. one of the other things is the earth sort of gets re... more. If, if things have been tilting more toward the worldly aspect, toward the clear and consistent and complete, then the earthly aspect gets paid more attention to the earth. Sort of good, down. good. Yes, if everything has become so worked out that everybody's got Christianity all done in, in completely hierarchical, detailed, casualty and so forth, and there's nothing, it's become clear, it's become coherent, it's stretched to cover every detail of medieval life, the earth is getting pretty well eclipsed, and then Luther comes along and says, no, no, you've forgotten what's, what's um, hidden and, and mysterious and awesome and extraordinary behind all this uh, world, and the earth comes back through. All of this is being talked about on page 66. Let me go on. Uh, and maybe the fact that it's all in one paragraph, well, it certainly means it's all about articulating. It's, but whether there are two kinds here... See, what, what puzzles me is you can't think of the Greek temple and the cathedral as in the business of preserving or con or Marilyn Monroe. They're in the business of, 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 of shining and glamorizing. And then there are these people, the prophets and Luther, and I had another example, the president of the United States, if he were a really good president, would get it, would speak on, say, the 4th of July, and he would make, and little Lincoln did it in the Gettysburg Address. The Gettysburg Address is a perfect example of, of, of somebody who renews an understanding of the Constitution and the American way of life and what the point of it is that, that people had forgotten. And then they hear the president, president's address or read it, then they feel a new clarity about their identity and how important it is and solidarity with the we that, that's been articulated. That's, that's certainly preserving. Now there's a paragraph about it, all here on 66, and I don't know how it all fits together, so I'll just read it. I, I started with that the, the, 
we thrust the long familiar gets thrust down and the extraordinary to the surface. Now Liz may be right, the long familiar sounds like this banalized, rigidified surface. So maybe this is all about the second kind of articulating, namely the preserving. But let's go on. That this multiple thrusting is nothing violent, but the more purely the work is itself transported into the openness of beings, and openness open by itself, the more simply does it transport us into this openness, at the same time transport us out of the realm of the ordinary. To submit to this displacement means to transform our custom ties to the world and earth, to restrain all doing and prizing, knowing and looking in order to stay within the truth that's happening in the work. Only the restraint of this staying lets what is created be the work that it is. This letting of the work be a work we call the preserving of the work. It is only such preserving that the work yields itself in its creativeness as actual, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so I think whatever it is, then my, my story is articulation is both glamorizing, and we've talked about that, and he did, and Heidegger talks a lot about that, and then it's preserving, and he talks about that, and he doesn't clearly distinguish them, but I think they have to be distinguished, and they're both fine. Yeah? Can you say why you don't think, why we can't consider the Greek temple and the cathedral as preserving? Well, if preserving, and this is your line, re- renews and recalls us to something which we already had clear that we're losing track of, they don't seem to do it, particularly the Greek temple. It doesn't point back to anything that was already clear. It, it got it clear. Well, let me put the question the other way then. Mm-hmm. Why do we consider um, the renewing mm-hmm. ones to be the preserving ones? It seems so obvious to me I'm stuck for a minute. Uh, it seems to me the preservers are the people who it's so obvious I don't say yet. Let me just say it over. I mean, there's something that the, that the, that the temple articulates and, and, and lights up. And it has to do that before there, there can be people who... Well, let, well, let's go to Jesus. Jesus, well, no, he's a reconfigure. That will yeah. complicate. Let's stick to the temple. The temple lights up and organizes a Greek style. Now, it looks to me like once that's done, then people can come around and preserve it by... Uh, constantly returning us to it and so forth. How we could say that it, it was preserving it before the, it had done it. Before there was a the danger it. of it right, not being Right, right, that's right. And before it had actually pulled the it together enough to be an it. Uh, yeah. So there's something specifically reactionary about preservers. Well, yeah, reactionary in a good sense. Right. Uh, conservative in a good sense. I mean, if in the sense that Lincoln was conservative and so forth. It is a very sort of it look, well, I mean, it's very, very bad to put it that way, though, because Heidegger says it looks revolutionary. In fact, he talks about it in basic problems, I was, I mean, and, and calls it revolutionary. And when you renew it, or say Martin Luther King, does another example, when you renew the idea of Christian love and justice for the black people, it looks practically like civil war. It's so revolutionary. And yet, it's, he clearly was saying, I'm recalling you to what is basic to your identity and the Constitution and Christianity, two of the defining things we've got. So, calling him, you could call him conservative and revolutionary both. I yeah. guess what it is, it's what you should all already know anyway. It's not It's part of your identity that you've lost touch with. He's going to, these people call you back in touch with what is already part of your identity and your style, only it's become dispersed, it's become banal, and so forth. In, in that sense, Trivial. it seems like your instance with Luther works particularly well because he never thought the breach would be permanent. Like, he always thought the breach would end he in was fixing the church. Good, good, right. And he, he never thought of himself as a reconfigurer, starting a new history, but fixing the church the way the prophets were trying to fix the, the Hebrews when they got off track. Right, uh, and and Luther himself, who knows what he would have done, but it's an interesting case. With Luther around, who should come along with Descartes, who did turn it into a case of reconfiguring and start a whole new understanding of the world where subjects replace God. I mean, it's something Luther certainly didn't have in mind. Uh, but, but Descartes didn't have that in mind either. No, right. okay, right, right. But Descartes had it a lot more in mind than Luther. was a more right, on the edge. Right, and Kant finally really articulated it. Which, which kind of articulation does Kant do? He's back, that's right, in the first bunch. 
He didn't say, return, I'll return you to the identity and understanding you had in Descartes. He said, I'm going to glamorize and make Descartes shine so much that you're all going to want to be enlightened people. Uh, okay, I saw another hand back here. Uh, didn't I? Yeah. I don't see why Temple, I mean, it might not function like Luther does, and like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you know, sort of flood in this, flood in the style once again, but it may glamorize it first, but can it become a preserver? I mean, isn't that why the Temple is there, so people can go, go back to the Temple and remind themselves of what the style is? I mean, otherwise you wouldn't have the Temple to get, I mean, like, you wouldn't need well, to go to the Temple. There, I think, let me try another angle here. I think he wants to distinguish creators and preservers. Creators are the people who make the temple or who, start, who, who set up a new state and so forth, uh, who pull it together. But, but the people who are, I mean, it's people who are preservers, not, not, not the Greek temple. Is that right? I mean, I'm, I, mean, I mean, yeah, it's people who are preservers. And the people who are preservers are not the people who built the Greek temple because those are called creators. Uh, where creators, remember, are, have got to be understood as receivers. And so, so there are the creator receivers, the ones who are so open to the practices and able to let the practices, it's all really on the side of the practices, cohere in this shining, exemplary way. And then there are other people called preservers, and they do something else, I think. They do this thing we're trying to describe re-articulate and renew. I mean, I think these distinctions are not very clear in here. That's the point. He's just sort of found a bunch of phenomena and he hasn't got them all untangled. But I'm untangling them. And if you think when I do it that I finally sort of go against anything he would want to hold, then tell me I'm wrong. And, or even if I go against the text. But if I'm just saying more than he ever said, that's all right. I'm, I'm articulating. Uh, so... Uh, <coughs> um, so then let's see now. Okay, so far? Well, then we make the big leap. Excuse the Heidegger expression here. We're going, that would only confuse you. Forget that. We're going on to reconfiguring. They do make a big leap, but that's not perhaps the moment to say so. Okay, now, the, in the reconfiguring, there also seems to be two. I now add living. <laughs> this isn't in my notes explicitly, but it's in my notes implicitly there seems to be the very special case of the beginning of the whole thing which sets up history in the first place. And that was the pre-Socratics and the Greek temple where for the first time anywhere in the galaxy as far as anybody knows, there was this, I this idea that there was a unified understanding of being that covered everything and had what could be organized into, into these, uh, what is it, all all covering path, all encompassing path, all, encompass all encompassing story. And so there's a kind of reconfiguring which sets up our historical world for the first time. And that's not, though, I think, the important one. For one thing, it only happens once. And I think Heidegger thinks reconfiguring happens several times. And the other one is setting up a new world. Whereas in his phrase, this isn't me, history begins again. So there's history begins, sub, and that's one subclass, and nothing special to be said about that. It just happens that way. But it isn't any different than when history begins again, I think, and Heidegger has lots to say about what happens when history begins again. Or better put it, or to put it, no, that's not the best way to put it. He has lots to say about a, a structure which happens both when history begins and of course happens again whenever history begins again. It's the same structure. It's the structure I'm calling reconfiguring. Now, there's a lot to be said about that. It, <coughs> it's, I, I need to explain a lot about how it is a shock and a leap and exactly how it works in, the, in its shocking, leaping sort of way. Uh, it founds a new world, he says on 75. And that could be either for the first time, or again, uh, where is this, on 75, uh, oh, sorry, in, in, I, I need to say one more thing and then I'll read it. By the way, things get so dense at the end there, that every, I mean, I don't know about you, but I suspect you too, practically, I got every sentence underlined and every <laughs> word circled, it, it's just amazing. And, and we're leaving out language, which further complicates it all, because we're going to come back to language. It's better to have one track. 
So what happens? A new world is founded. And that's the thing I wanted to stress. So if you look on 75, you see him saying in the top paragraph, never mind the art is poetry. Just take, let, let, it, let it be whatever it is. I mean, temples will do fine and statesmen will do fine. <coughs> There's no reason for us yet to make language privileged. And how he does that is so fast, I don't know how he does it at all. But in, so the, we get the founding of truth. And here we understand founding, this is the important, in a triple sense. Founding is bestowing, founding is grounding, and founding is beginning. Look at that next sentence. Founding, however, is actual only in preserving. Oh, that's all right. Thus, to each mode of founding there corresponds a mode of preserving. I guess I like that. I and mean, this is very puzzling. What I would, what I would like to say is... Gee, it's complicated. Boy, that's a complicated new thing. When I read that this morning, thinking about it, I thought, great, you're going to get a story about founding, which is about reconfiguring, and, e and, and you're going to get that to any reconfiguring there corresponds a mode of preserving, and that's going to be about articulating. And that might still be right, I'm not sure. But if it is right, then we're going to have to find the same three aspects for preserving, which would be renewing, in my understanding, as we find starting, and I'm not sure you can, but I mean, and Liz is looking worried, aren't you? And, and, but if it isn't, then maybe he's right. The preserving is, the Greek temple is preserving, well, not the Greek temple, maybe, but the, whatever this stuff is. I don't think the Greek, the Greek temple, I think, is a, not a preserving thing, but I'm not sure. You know, here's a paper topic, figure out how he uses preservers in this essay, and then I'll steal from it. Okay, let me try without preserving first, because I think I do understand that. Uh, now, so we've got founding in mean, three dimensions. I don't know whether it dawned on you or not, but these three dimensions are the past, present, and future, and it helps to hold on to that. And it helps to figure out which is which. And it's a little hard to figure out which is which, because everything is so convoluted. But I think it's pretty clear that bestowing is the present, grounding is the past, and beginning is the future. And I want to say something about each of them and read you passages where that's going on. So, to begin with, you've got to do something. You've got to, you're going to make central... And, and this is all my reading of it about the marginal practices. I'm going to get to why I think it's all right to talk about marginal practices in a minute, but first I have to just talk about it. You're going to make central, taken for granted, marginal things... Oh, sorry, I'm just mis misreading. You make what is now central and taken for granted marginal, and you bring in something new. I'm going to, I don't have to use the word marginal practices yet. I don't want to. I think that is marginal practices. But all we say so far is you make something central, you make something new central, and you take, you, you put aside what's taken, been taken for granted. Yeah. How does that differ from trusting? down the ordinary and up the... Ah, well, I, I said you could use the same phrase for both. I realize that. You have to fill it in differently, it seems to me. If you're going to talk about the articulators, which I think are the preservers, so I'm a little shaken up about that. But anyway, there is going to be a way in which, say, Luther <laughs> shut, uh, uh, puts down the ordinary, what has become banal, what has become all world, and the way the the uh, bestowing does because the, what the bestowing is going to do is not put it down by recalling you to what was already there as the original identity but by bringing in something altogether new okay good keep asking me this because it's very hard to keep this all clear so I'm on 75 the middle paragraph the setting into work of truth thrusts up the unfamiliar Another translation says awesome. Uh, I wonder, I don't know what the German is. Unheimlich, maybe. Uh, but in any case, the, the, you know, there, the, the translation is different, for better or for worse, in, in the one you're reading, for, in, in, in the uh, basic writings, than the one in here. And I don't have any strong feeling about which is better. Uh, but they, they're 
often different. I mean, it's illuminating. I was looking at the English and the German, and the, I'm mean, looking at the two Englishes, and they just say different things here. So it starts up the unfamiliar or awesome, and well, the, and extraordinary. That's probably the awesome part. So let's leave it the way it is here. Thrust up the unfamiliar and extraordinary, and at the same time, down thrust down the ordinary and what we believe to be such. The truth that discloses itself in the work can never be proved or derived from what went before. What went before is refuted in its exclusive reality by the work. I mean, that's, that's very important in this discussion with Liz. It's hard to say that Luther refutes Christianity. Uh, and he, he does refute, well, yeah, period, let's just, what, what work, what art founds can never, therefore never be compensated and made up by what is already present and available. Founding is an overthrow and endowing a bestowal. You see, that's where bestowal comes in. And that's one of the modes of founding. Can, yeah. Can you say why the word bestowal makes sense as a name for this? Not really. That's interesting. I have no feel for that whatsoever. Nobody brought the German? I wish I brought the German. I brought hmm? those words for extraordinary. Yeah. It's, it's uh, weird. It's um, yeah, white and white. Okay, and, and do you know the word for bestow? No, I don't. Know. Huh. That's that's what Liz wants now. Uh, I don't know. I think I should go back and look. You have it with you, but I have the German. Oh, I'm great. Because because it's so unintuitive. <coughs> is any, it, what has it got in there? In the uh, has he got bestow in in? Sorry, I'm, I'm We, we, we were right near the end, you know, we're, say, two pages, what, one, two, three, four pages in from the, from the end. <clears throat> the, probably the paragraph before is the one to spot, the nature of art is poetry. Anybody else got basic writings? Yeah, you found it yet? It is bestowal. It is okay, never mind, Liz, you okay. found it. Okay, well, it certainly is, we'll, we'll hope that... Uh, uh, we can find something better. Horace will find something better. But in the meantime, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, so let me, but one thing is sure, the ordinary gets wiped out. He talks about that more on 72. About five lines down. In the midst of what is, art breaks open an open place. See, again, that does sound much more dramatic than Luther. And in, ho- in whose openness everything is other than usual. By virtue of the projected sketch set into the work of the unconcealedness of what is, which casts itself towards everything ordinary and hitherto existing becomes an unbeing. Let's, I mean, there you've got it. I mean, you can't think that this is the same as the articulator. None of these people we talked about would take what was all that was hitherto existing and make it an unbeing. Jesus does, maybe. But remember my example at the end, when you say obeying the Sabbath, obeying the law, uh, keeping the Ten Commandments, all of that doesn't matter. When you say that, you really make everything that's been up to now an unbeing. You say, well, it still happens, but it's not important. It doesn't have. Any, it's not essential to our identity at all. Yes, what do you find for it? Well, it's you do a fuse or overflowing, which is understandable. But then there's only one other German word, not two two words. So hmm. Schenkung, which would be a gift. Gift, an overflowing gift. Well, that, no, 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 it's not an adjective. It's uh, it's a gift and a gift. It's an overflowing and a gift. Is that any better than a bestowing? For bestowing? Yeah, that's for bestowing. I like, yeah, for bestowing. A yeah. gift. I like a gift. Well, a giving. Yeah. A giving. Because it's shameful. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It doesn't help much, but... It's more of a feel. Yeah, uh, it's a better feel. Okay, and so the ordinary is wiped out. That is very extreme. The... And as I say, the Hebrew example is a good one. The law becomes irrelevant. That's pretty extreme. So, for instance, just again, I have you have this phenomenon. Don't forget it from last time. That the, we're now in the middle of reconfiguring. Jesus is a terrific reconfigurer, and now we're seeing why in detail. He's making the law irrelevant. It was once a crucial question of avoiding guilt. That's what Paul said it was all about. Now it turns out there's no way to avoid guilt. It's all about forgiveness and love. And uh, everything has been really radically switched around. Uh, and, that's, and that's the one dimension of it, the present. Uh, the present, I mean, that's what happens. Now how does it happen? Well, it takes up something from the past. That's the next, that's the grounding part. It, it has to somehow, where, where does it come from, this new thing? 
that is, has put down everything that's ordinary and made it into an unbeing. Well, that's where I have to say marginal practices. I mean, something is... Now I'm going to try to argue for that. There's got to be something around which were possibilities not taken seriously as essential and crucial to who we are and what our identity is, to think of the Hebrews, but still possibilities that uh, the, this uh, reconfigurer can latch on to or he'll be completely unintelligible. Yeah? Well, so, for in this, you are saying, right, that he might be totally unintelligible, mm-hmm. but he does use this word leap. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm really interested in your pinning down where you can get the notion of marginal practices when Heidegger is continuously saying that the familiar, the ordinary, mm-hmm. are totally put down. In fact, mm-hmm. he says, stop, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we're mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. mm-hmm. no longer. Mm-hmm. And then you have this leap. Mm-hmm. So where are the texts okay. which would indicate that there might okay. be something, anything left? Okay. okay, I've got a story, of course, about the leap. But, he, but, but Forrest is right. Whatever story I tell, it's got to do justice to the fact that this is a leap and it's unmediated. I'm sure you would have said that next. Unmediated. There's no transition there. Uh, now, how can we have that and yet hold on to the idea, which I th- I want to hold on to, and I'll try to convince you of, that it's not just out of nowhere that he starts doing something new. I mean, you. I don't think a reconfigurer can march in, say, Jesus, and start speak, preaching Buddhism, uh, because he would really be, in my understanding of it, just strictly unintelligible. You wouldn't connect up with anything. Now, I used to worry about this, and now I'm sort of locked into my solution after years. My solution to this is, there will be trivial things in the practices that aren't even worth, you know, putting down and turning into a non-being, because people are not paying any attention to them one way or the other. These trivial, which I'm calling marginal possibilities, are not like the ordinary, banal, which is, uh, which is being put down, all right, they're not even ordinary and banal. They're really just marginal and trivial. Those are what he's going to have to draw on, I think. That's all he's got to draw on. I'm trying to convince you that he's drawing on something here. Remember I said in the Jesus example, there is some sense that you, about desire, that you shouldn't covet your neighbor's uh, property, stuff, whatever, and... But you don't find them worrying much about that. You don't find them saying, good grief, I coveted this and I couldn't help it and I was trying to obey the law and here's this thing that I keep thinking about what a, what a great uh, car my neighbor has. Uh, it doesn't seem to bother people. But it's enough to hook on to when, when Jesus decides that he can, and when he can say you commit adultery when you lust after somebody in your heart. He's, he's obviously drawing on their sense that there is such a thing as bad desires. So let me try now to give you as much as I can evidence for this. But let me, I guess I should address Horace right away anyway, though I was going to, to save it. I mean, what, but he's asking, why, how could this be an unmediated leap? Because it looks like if there was, it was unmediated in a leap, there'd have to be nothing going across this leap and this nothing mediating it. And I'm saying there is the marginal practices. Well, when I hear leap <coughs> and unmediated, I think of a gestalt switch, a revolution in which uh, something, a a leap from the wings to center stage is a phrase that Nietzsche uses at one point. Something which was in the wings, just trivial and unnoticed, now becomes the most important thing in the culture. And what was the most important thing in the culture now becomes trivial. That's a big enough leap, it seems to me, and unmediated enough to do the job that, that we want here. I don't think, I mean, if, if he means anything stronger, then I, I, I don't get it. Because, I mean, anything stronger than that, it seems to me, would make him too unintelligible. He's pretty unintelligible. So take Jesus. He's, people don't understand what he's up to. He tells all these parables. Uh, they they re- repeat the parables and they follow him because he's charismatic. But he doesn't understand very well what he's up to. How many seen the Scorsese movie, The Last Temptation? You should if you get a chance, because one of the fascinating things about the movie, two fascinating things about the movie, you see the really loony marginal practices around, not the desiring ones, which I'm stressing, but the forest out ones, namely the Essenes, they're waiting for the end of the world out in the wilderness, fasting, and lost to the... I mean, they're no longer part of the Hebrew culture. They're, not, they're out in, in, in nowhere. 
And well, anyway, but you see that one that there are these weird possibilities that the Messiah is about to come, and you see Jesus not knowing what he's going to say next. Whenever he opens his mouth, he looks as surprised as everybody else at what comes out, because he's it's pretty unintelligible. But on the other hand, it seems to me it's intelligible enough, one, that people don't think he's just completely crazy, and secondly, it can be articulated by Paul, who goes around with a great deal of effort and full time, making it intelligible. Yeah? Uh, an, an example of, of this word. Um, how about the notion of loving your enemy, which is one of the big, big deals? Now, I want to say, I do not understand that that is a marginal practice in any sense in the Hebrews. Mm. Um, I think or, that's right. But that's the leap that I'm talking about. Okay. Because we know what it means to be an enemy, and we know what it means to love, but it's not a marginal practice that we love the enemy, and yet it's intelligent. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's. I mean, it, I bet it wasn't intelligible right off any more than God's being crucified oh, were intelligible no, no, right off. No, intelligible in the sense that it's not something that we cannot make some sort of evaluation or judgment about. I.e., for the Greeks, this is utter nonsense to be sure. So they could make sense of it. It's just nonsense. It's intelligible, but not something any right-minded person would go about doing. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that's not a marginal practice that's brought forth. It is clearly a total leap. Something utterly, completely different than anyone had thought about ever is, before, is, and yet it's intelligent. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something, and I'm gonna let all of you talk about it. I wanted to say something like, but it's interesting. Somehow there is a difference between how the Greeks would hear it, which is absolutely unintelligible somehow, and the way the Hebrews got it, which was, well, yeah, we never. I mean, that isn't how we think of thought about it at all. We we love to kill our enemies, but yeah, we can yeah. we can see that. Uh, so, I, and, 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 but I don't know how, so there are degrees of unmediatedness and unintelligibility. Let, let other people say something about it. Yeah. Forgiveness is accepted in the, for the Hebrews, so it just seems like taking forgiveness to the extreme. Mm-hmm. Well, is forgiveness accepted as part of the, mostly you're not supposed to do bad things and need to be forgiven, and when you do bad things, you're supposed to, I suppose, uh, what's the word, um, when you restitution or something I, that's not quite the word expiation or something uh, just forgiveness out of the goodness and yeah. well that's another weird Jesus idea <coughs> <coughs> but maybe you're right there's enough forgiveness in there somewhere that he could connect with it uh, boy everybody has something to say now you want to say something yeah uh, I think Jesus Jesus did uh, love his enemies during his life but it wasn't that might have been his martial practice. While he was doing that during his life, that, was, that might have been a martial practice. But once he was crucified and resurrected, I think that was when, that's like a proprietary event to like open up this new world. But before then, it was martial practice, at least within Jesus and his disciples, to love his enemies. So no, but that's not the question Forrest is asking. Was it, a, was it a practice already in the margin of the Hebrews that they could latch on to? Well, wasn't ever the Hebrew before? They were all Hebrews before. But where did they get this? I mean, that's they the got, question. Well, they got it from Jesus. They got it from following Jesus during his life. And where did Jesus get it? Did he get it out of some aspect of the Hebrew he was before? That's that's what that's what Horace is asking. Yeah, and then the answer and and my story would have to be well, if you look around somewhere, you'll find it, or you'll find enough other stuff that that, that is there. Yeah, it is. One tag I might take is you have there is the love thy neighbor is a. Um, and gesture, that you have a responsibility to the neighbor. And then the enemy is sort of um, know, the further extension that's right. of the The subclass. Uh, that's how I was going to deal with it. But I was letting other people talk first. I would have said, yeah, love and forgiveness are certainly big things, and they're very new things, but they're not totally unheard of in the Hebrew story. And now you extend love and forgiveness even to your enemies, and even to your criminals. And that's certainly a big move, but maybe it's not a total change. Yeah? It seems important what you said that Jesus could just come out and start preaching Buddhism to the Hebrews because it would be such a radical, such a radical break. Yeah, that would be a real unmediated leap of, yeah. of, of the extremist sort. It's possible to have a completely unmediated changeover. Okay. Well, you've all got enough interesting things in the air. The forest was good to raise it because now at least you'll see why I picked the passages I'm about to read you in my attempt to say he knows that there is stuff around and it's going to be those marginal stuff that he's going to use when he reconfigures. The bottom of 60. 
He says, truth is untruth insofar as there belongs to it the reservoir of the not yet uncovered, the ununcovered, in the sense of concealment. Now, I don't know what is not yet uncovered and ununcovered, but there's a reservoir I want to stress. There's something on, out of which, <clears throat> which is not yet central, not part of the world of the Hebrews, which is still around to be tapped into, is my is the story. And what, what could, it, could it be that's a reservoir that's not part of the world of the Hebrews, and because uh, it's, it's earth, and yet it, it's something that can be uh, uh, what, just used. I mean, your reservoir is something used. And what, now I think those are, the, the reservoir is this collection of other possibilities. But who knows? I'm going to give you my attempt. On, on page 75... Okay, now I'm going to go about 10 lines from the bottom, or 12. In the, work, in the work, truth is thrown toward the coming preservers, that is, toward an historical group of men. That's nice. Those preservers are the kind I like. What is, what is thus cast forth is never an arbitrary demand. Now, we've got to get something. It's, it's a leap. It's unmediated, but it's not arbitrary. That's what we're trying to figure out. Genuine poetic projection is the open, and that's just reconfiguring for us, is the opening up of a disclosure of that into which human being as historical is already cast. Well, that's the, what is this already in there? I mean, if that, that seems there's something already there, which is a reservoir. This is the story I want to make. And that's the grounding part. That, and that's the earth part that you can use. And on, on 76... Uh, the end of the first full paragraph. Poetic projection comes from nothing in this respect, that it never takes its gift from the ordinary and traditional. Now, we all agree about that. That's the banal, that's the dominant, that's the taken for granted. But it never comes from nothing. I think this is very important. I mean, that with the Buddha story, it would come from nothing. But, when you, you're, but it never comes from nothing in that what is projected by it is only the withheld vocation of the historical being of man himself. Well, I don't know quite what that phrase means. I mean, maybe Forrest does. You, you, but I take it that that means that the, the Hebrews had this possibility in them. Their vocation was that they could be flipped into Christians. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, the possibility certainly has to be there and has to be intelligible somehow. Um, but, for example, on that, I'm sorry, Bert, I don't know where you are, but on that first passage I was trying to look up, there is no reservoir there in Germany. Ah, that let's word hear about it. Exist. It's the... It's the realm of the not yet. And he's simply poetically translating that as a reservoir. Well, I'm not sure that that bothers me all that much. So let's go back. 65 on 5 means the realm of the not yet, uh, if that means anything at all. I can see why he's... Uh, it's the. Uh, I thought it was... I wrote down it's the Herkunftsbereich. Is that the German? Yeah. Okay, I would have said that that's the... Uh, the Herkunft is something like the... Uh, the tradition or the, or the heritage it's well, the the, isn't that the word for heritage? Uh, Erba is heritage more like source, yeah. <coughs> so it's the sort of Erba is heritage yeah but it's the Herkunft is something the source of the not yet that the, un, <coughs> um, un, unre, the unrevealed hmm. so it's simply saying it's a possibility well how do we know that because it now is yeah but I mean good but I mean but it isn't coming out I mean He's willing to admit enough mediation as to say, if it now is, then it was already possible in, yeah. some, in some sense, not just empty, I presume. I mean, you wouldn't bother to say anything. I mean, if it was a complete leap out of nowhere, and it now is, it wouldn't be very illuminating to say, of course it was possible, since after all it now is. I think that's somehow what makes it possible. Yeah? I'm worried from the um, quotes <coughs> you just read, the okay. other extreme. I mean, okay. I don't think I believe this, but yeah. that... Um, it's never that that it's not an arbitrary demand that into which the human being in the historical past is already thrust um, and the withheld vocation of what the historical right. man already is. I'm right. worried that there's some kind of too much, yeah, Hegelian, too so too Hegelian, Hegelian, too much of a telos. Ah, uh, well, it is a bad way for him to put it. I, we'd have to look at that German. But I mean, what I would do with it in a hurry to fix it would be to say, once it's done, that's how it looks. I mean, once you've taken it, that, you know, that's sort of lo yeah. like the possibility story. Once yeah. you've taken, in my story, the marginal practices, I mean, th think of it this way. I mean, if, if it's a regestalting phenomenon, 
when you've got a, one of these puzzles where they, can you see the face of the cat in the trees and you can't and you can't and then all of a sudden you can regestalt the cat in the trees well then you have to think the cat has been in the trees all along you can't even go back and look at them without seeing it that way so I guess that's what I think happens you go back and you see that the whole point of being Hebrews was to lead up to being Christians it certainly didn't look that way until Jesus came along let, let me try one more 76 uh, now have I read that one already? No, yes, it doesn't come from nothing. I've done it. And the crucial passage, I say, is still in 76. <coughs> oh, yeah. Well, this is the passage that Forrest and I are arguing about. So let's read it. Bestowing and grounding have in themselves the unmediated character of what we call a beginning. Yet this unmediated character of the beginning, the peculiarity of a leap out of the unmediable, does not exclude but rather includes the fact that the beginning prepares itself for the longest time and wholly inconspicuously. How do you deal with that? That sound, that's my marginal practice story. I mean, something's been getting, getting, leading up to this leap and this unmediated thing. But as long as you don't read that in a curious way. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So Good. Okay. okay. But, no, I certainly don't. It's very on Hegel to say that, that in a completely unintelligible way, well, that's the wrong way to put it, that there's no reason why these marginal practices should become central, already there, that you can appeal to. It's a Kuhnian. Now we can make a Kuhnian point. You can't say to the Aristotelian, look, it's, you, you, it's a natural thing to go on and get to be Galileo and Copernicus. There, is, there are bits of stuff in Aristotle that you can use, perhaps. They talk a lot about his view about missiles and the problems he had with, with, with rocks that were catapulted and stuff but generally that was very marginal you can say that there was some basic problem in the Hebrews and a natural sort of solution and Jesus found it that's too that's not Kuhnian enough this has got to be a revolution it's got to be something that is not recognized that's another way to put it by the people who don't want it they don't have oh, this is a good way to put it it's not so Hegelian and rational that if you don't want it, uh, if the Hebrews don't want it, they're being irrational and stubborn about it. They, they, it's so different that, they, that they, you can't prove to them that they should become Christians. That would be mediation. That would be Hegel. Let me get this clearer. For Hegel, you see that the next stage solves the problems of the previous stage and grows out of the previous stage preserves the truth of the previous stage and dumps the error of the previous stage and no rational person could possibly stay in the previous stage once they see that. But surely we're not supposed to think that no rational person uh, who's a Hebrew, once they see what Jesus is up to, have to say, oh yes, that solves our problems and that's implicit in what we're doing and that's just the point of it. I see that now. Uh, that If they do see it, then they will say that. That's where we've been heading all along. That's what Matthew spends his time saying. But if they don't see it, they don't have to. They can say, this is just a crazy one. of The Essenes got loose and we aren't going to follow this at all. Yeah. The other problem you might run into with the marginal practices is that it gives the creator uh, too, much, uh, too much say, too much dignity, i.e. there is this person somehow in the culture who grabs a hold of these and uh, let them shine forth. Mm-hmm. as opposed to this notion of leap that if you were to say that somehow the creators, the yeah. one who is grabbed it right. by the practice, right. uh, that would work better too. But it strikes me that... Well, that's what I want to say, of course. He's receptive. That. Remember I said he's receptive to the practices and to the new unity that's being formed in the practices. Remember this distinction between Schaffen and Schöpfen. Schaffen is creating in the sense of producing and making something. Schöpfen is drawing something up as from a well. The, and I want to say the creator is a kind of vacuum and draws up from as a, as a well these mar- the, one, the marginal practices which are around. Yeah. But, there, but there has to be more than one way for them be drawn up. Right. Because otherwise you get Absolutely, you'd be back there with Hegel again. Right. There are lots of marginal practices and lots of ways that never get developed that you could have done it. You could have, I suppose, started a cult where they were all going to commit suicide to help the end of the world come along, for instance. And somebody could have come along and brought that as seen idea, um, pushed it. But, so there must be lots of, there were all kinds of prophets, of course. It's a good time preaching all kinds of crazy marginal things, presumably. And Jesus was just one more prophet 
preaching what looked like one more crazy marginal thing until his thing took off and shined and uh, got everybody, got a lot of people believing in it. Yeah? Again, this looks like a general notion where Hager says the end is always in the beginning. So you have this in, the integrity of the, of, the, of the whole thing there already in some sense. So, sure, those oh, possibilities oh. have to be there, but... Okay, well, wait, so that's a different thing, I think. The end is in the beginning, which you hear a lot about in, in basic questions, so we could talk about that, is once you've got a new reconfiguring, then I take it a lot is going to have to be, that will work itself out, and the people in it will, I mean, uh, how, it's not Hegelian, because I think it could have broken down earlier, or a new leap could have happened, but certain possibilities are there that now can be exploited given this new beginning. I mean, in a certain way, I think he thinks somehow Protestantism was made possible by as soon as Jesus came along. Not that it was necessary. He's very clear about that, or inevitable. But in that sense, the end is in the beginning, I think. But the, yeah. the end, for example, I think Heidegger would say already in the pre-Socratics uh, the, the possibility or even the mm-hmm. likelihood of something mm-hmm. of a sort of technology is already there. Okay, that's a different, a big deal, different story. We'll get to that with basic questions and with the technology ethic. So There's a certain way. Marginal practices, I think, could be understood that way for those possibilities are there. Well, I don't even, I don't know what to say about that yet because there's such a funny thing going on in basic questions. But I guess I should mention it while you have. Basic questions is about the beginning of a whole way of understanding things in the West, which goes through a lot of very radical changes, but which is something that nonetheless goes through all the changes, a very special thing. I mean, you, you see, what, what could that be? Namely, that there's a unified understanding of being. Once you've got a unified understanding of being, <clears throat> and once you've forgotten something crucial about it, which I am not going to talk about yet, the basic problems is about what the pre-Socratics knew that we don't know, and what the pre-Socratics don't know that Heidegger does know. And so it's very important that once you've got some amazing insight about this unity and an amazing lack of, a, or, a, or a not surprising, lack of a understanding of a certain fact about this unity, then this whole culture isn't necessarily going to follow. But you can see how one possibility would be that we end up here in technology. That's for later in the course. Let me, I'm really getting worried that I'm not even going to be able to finish this and I'm not going to come back to this, so let me go on. We've got Earth. <coughs> I just read this, what I think, what I hope is a crucial passage, though it caused all kinds of trouble. Um, this business, something prepares itself for the longest time and inconspicuously. And again, I, I, don't know, that, I take that for my marginal story. But let me go on to the beginning now, because we need the third one. What happens in the beginning? Well, that's the easiest one. And Forrest just moved us to that one. Something is now set up, a world, in which certain possibilities of development and of possible articulations are all in place. So, and it's projected. Well, let's look at, I'll read some passages. 76, (coughs) at the bottom. The beginning, the bottom paragraph, always contains the undisclosed abundance of the unfamiliar and extraordinary, which means that it contains strife with the familiar and the ordinary. Well, that's sure. (coughs) It sets up this new world, and that's going to put down the banal and taken for granted. Uh, So it's the instigation of a strife of truth, founding as a beginning. Remember, history is the struggle over what the new paradigm means. So there's going to be a struggle over what it would, what Jesus, what the essential point of Jesus' life was. Is it love? Is it that the the end of the world is near? Is it uh, that? we have no power of our own and so forth and there are all kinds of uh, threads in it and there's a struggle between the various branches that come out of Christianity as to what's essential but and it's the beginning of that history of 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 conflict of interpretations given over to the preservers here come the preservers again as one would expect those are the ones sort of fighting over how to re-articulate it (coughs) the work the, the third line in the last paragraph I've read this already. The work is thrown towards the coming preservers, that is, toward a historical group of men. <coughs> Good, it isn't a temple, you see. We're back to that again. And, um, and it makes on them not an arbitrary demand, 
and so forth. I read that, and th- those th- that's the future as these preservers struggle over it, and also as it struggles with being submerged into the ordinary, uh, and and the preservers have to keep it from that. And when all this happens, history starts over. This is on seventy-seven. The, the first little paragraph. Whenever R happens, that is, whenever there's a beginning, this is, I'm reading about beginnings, a thrust enters history. History either begins or starts over again. Those are the two, remember, two kinds of reconfiguring, according to me. Now, finally we get to the big pun that's been in the background. This is certainly considered by Heidegger to be an originating leap. And that's a pun on Ursprung. He had this pun in his back pocket all along. Now I'm going to spring on us. <coughs> the Ursprung is an originating leap. And it gets translated origin. The origin loses the joke. The, 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 or the origin is an Ursprung. It's an originating leap. It originates a new history. So now you read the title. The Ursprung of the Kunstwerk, of the work of art, means that the biggest, best work of art, when it's doing its most work of art thing, is originating a leap into a new history, or starting history, or starting a new history. And that's the punchline. This is on 75 also. I'll squinch in here. So much has happened. Where is that one? <coughs> hmm, I don't see that one. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, originating leap? What did I just read? Where would I just read? Where was I just reading? You're on 77. Okay, I don't know what... I think I made a mistake there. With, I mean, 77 is fine. And 78, let's look at that. <coughs> That's where he does the Ursprung primal leap. So let's start at the bottom here of 77. Art lets truth originate, spring, spring forth. Art, founding, preserving, and remember founding is the, uh, as I read it, these three functions when you start with reconfiguring, preserving, I, I'm back thinking of some parallel thing which we'd have to work out, that I don't know what it is exactly, is the spring that leaps to the truth of what is in the work. To originate means to leap and so forth. And I take leap there, <coughs> as I've already said, to be regestalting, unmediated, but from margin to center. Okay, now, <coughs> I've must spent much longer on that than I wanted to. I want to talk about two other things, unless people insist on... I think we've exhausted that one, at least exhausted is it, oh, too optimistic and, or pessimistic. <laughs> we've said enough about it. There are two more things I want to talk about in the last 15 minutes. He mentions that all of this has behind it a new kind of causality, which I just want to mention. Because it comes out every once in a while in what he says without ever getting very clearly thematized. Remember that the clearing, which is produced in one of these reconfigurings, a new clearing, holds sway, it gets translated sometimes, or governs everything that goes on but it governs it in a very peculiar and interesting way. I'll say it and then I'll read the nearest thing to the passage. I mean, it could govern it by some kind of determinism and then you wouldn't have your freedom, but it doesn't do that. It could govern it by putting ideas in people's heads so that they freely did this or that. That's not what it's about either. It's not about objective causality nor about subjective causality. It's about governing causality or clearing causality. And what is that? Well, remember, the clearing determines what it makes sense to do. And since you're free to choose among a whole range of things, but not just any old thing, from now on it will make sense, for instance, in modernity, to try to be as mature and get as much control of of objects as you can as a subject. It no longer will make sense to stand in the wonder of things welling up like the pre-Socratics it will no longer make sense when Christianity is really over, if it ever is, to uh, ask what God's vocation for you is. So, <clears throat> as the clearing changes, and when it totally changes, then a whole different range of things make sense. And we're caused in a certain way. It, we're governed by that. Even though we're not determined, because you can choose among the things that make sense. And even though it's not your willful choice, this, this set of alternatives, 
This set of alternatives constrains you as a subject making willful choices. So all of this is packed into in the middle of 72. <clears throat> the curious fact here is that the work in no way affects hitherto existing entities by causal connections. The working of the work does not consist in the taking effect of a cause. It lies in a change happening from out of the work of the unconcealedness and so forth. Well, that's this governing causality. He never wants to call it a cause. Call it governing. But when you do philosophy, this is related to basic problems because in basic problems, basic questions, he says philosophy doesn't do anything, doesn't make any better railroads or housing or do any science or, or solve any particular problems, doesn't do anything practical, doesn't have to do with praxis, which doesn't mean practices there, it means solving things and so forth. But nonetheless, it's the sovereign thing. That's because it's on to this higher form of causality, <coughs> namely... It's going, to un- it's going to understand what, uh, and if it's, if it's really, uh, if somebody's a real reconfigurer, they've got an immense amount of power, a much higher power than any of these powers that change things in the clearing. And <clears throat> if Heidegger, for instance, is a reconfigurer, which I think he thinks he is, when he's writing basic questions anyway, that would mean that he's got a way of looking at things which will just transform what it makes sense to do for everybody right out of the current technological way of thinking into some, or acting into some new way of acting. Uh, let's see. I said that this is on page five of basic questions. Let's see what is on page five. <clears throat> well, it's about the middle of the page. Philosophical reflection has an effect if it does only mediately by making available new aspects for all comportment. That's changing what it makes sense to do. And new principles for all decisions. That's also what it makes sense to do. And so I just wanted to explain that. Okay, one more thing. I've got ten more minutes. <clears throat> this, up to now, should have been relatively clear what I've been saying. I hope it is, because we're going to go into real obscurity from, from here on. Um, <laughs> there's, in the background, constantly never coming out very clearly. An, another Heidegger question, <clears throat> which is, how do art and truth work? I mean, he's, he's telling you sort of a lot about how they work. I mean, he just told you the structure of reconfiguring and the structure of articulating. But he wants to know something like, but why is articulating possible? Why is reconfiguring possible? What makes it happen? What are the articulators and the reconfigurers tuned into or attuned to that makes it happen? And he asked this question on 86 in this and, <clears throat> and refers you back to the first sentence. He says, art is considered, I'm in the middle now of 86, art is considered neither an area of cultural achievement nor an appearance of spirit. Oh, sorry, I was on the way to say something a minute ago that I didn't finish. Just back one notch. The reconfigure, of course, has an incredible amount of freedom. I was just on the verge of saying that. The reconfigure, because he can open up a whole new world, doesn't just have the choice between alternatives that, that, that make sense, but he, he has the freedom to, to found a new world in which whole different things make sense. That's the highest kind. I'm sorry about that. Right. Now let me go back to 86. <clears throat> Okay, it belongs, art is neither a cultural achievement nor an appearance of spirit. It belongs to this closure of appropriation by way of which the meaning of being can also be defined. Every once in a while the word appropriation comes along. Just out of nowhere, practically. And yet Heidegger thinks that that's his most important word. The word is their rightness. It seems to me something like this, a whole long story. Man and being each come into their own by relating to each other in this special way in which man creates and preserves understandings of being. And that happens, and this is the deepest thing that Heidegger sort of constantly sort of trying to get a grip on. That happens because the practices have a tendency to gather. If the practices didn't have a tendency to get clearer, to become total, all of this wouldn't work. When the artist is responding <clears throat> to something, 
what he's really finally responding to is the tendency of the practices to gather so as to bring everything out in its own most. Now, <clears throat> he says that even the beginning that he's asking this question, but he hasn't answered it. He certainly never talks about it very specifically. Where is that now? Where I just had on 86. On 86 he says um, that this is something that he started, that see the first sentences of the epilogue. Okay, so we go to the first sentence of the epilogue and it says <coughs> the foregoing reflections are concerned with the riddle of art. Remember, art is what makes the artist and what makes art possible and what makes the work of art possible is this thing called art. So what is art? Well, he doesn't know. He can't claim to solve the riddle. And the riddle is sort of what is it about the way the practices work that makes this whole story I, we've just been talking about, about happen. And as I say, it's something about his, in, his intuition that the practices tend to gather. I tried to think of an example of that, <clears throat> the, to bring things out into their own most. I can't do it with being, but I can think I can do it with the, what happens with the gays in San Francisco. There are these marginal practices. People are gay and they hide it and then they show it a bit. And then they get together and more and more they work out a lifestyle and they get new equipment and they get new identities and they get a new uh, an, 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 an understanding of what human beings are all about and what sexuality is all about. And all of this gets clearer and gets more organized and draws more people and more equipment and more uh, uh, functions of government and so forth into it. I think that Heidegger thinks that's the natural way practices tend to work. And <clears throat> that, that is what he's trying to get at, I think, with their rightness. When Liz heard this, she added, and then of course it can become too stylized and too, too many rules and too many uh, complications of, of signals and signs and stuff, and somebody can call you back, can call them back to what is more important and all these other, that is reconfigured, I mean, articulators can come along uh, of that lifestyle. But uh, basically, the, there, what something happens in which they all get pulled together. <coughs> so, and that's called eridinus. You, you find out about it every once in a while in basic um, uh, questions. And he writes it in the margin all over his works once he discovers this term, as if it really explains something. Uh, now, yeah? Just they, as things get clearer and clearer, mm -hmm. not only are they going to are they going to move further away from the sort of stuff, the earthy part, mm -hmm. but um, there are going to be things that's going to have to leave out, right? And there are going to be sort of conflicts that are going to come out. Um, good, good. And so there's, along with the increasing <coughs> sort of uh, consistency and coherence and all that, is going to be, are going to be contradictions are going right. to become clearer. Right, right. Good, good. Forces. And Liz is having a missing piece. If you really want to know, I mean, um, if you really want to try to figure out what he's, what's happening here, you'd have to, well, what is it the way pa practices gather that calls to articulators? And that's easy. They are, <coughs> articulators are called to make them come out in their own most when they've been buried in, in, in banality and the practices tend not only to organize <coughs> but to organize so as to bring things out at the best and they call articulators when they need them to help is the picture I think but then she wants to know what about reconfigurers what, how can the practices that are tending toward more and more organization more and more clarity and so forth, ever produce reconfiguring. Well, then you have to add a Kuhnian move, which is how I described it when Liz told it to me. The Kuhnian move is that this will produce anomalies. If you try to get everything clear and articulated and uh, gathered in a way that will bring out everything at its best, you'll produce problems. You'll produce contradictions. You'll produce, uh, in, 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 in Kuhnian terms, anomalies, things that just won't fit. And now what reconfiguring would look like <coughs> is you get a culture in which things are becoming problematic and don't fit together and there are marginal practices which if you made them central would be able to fit some of those things together. Then you get the kind of revolution that a reconfigurer makes. Is that how we think about it? Okay. 
<coughs> now, I got two minutes. Let me let me try something. I have got this great idea that Heidegger. See if I, if I can grab it from the next book. This will point you at an interesting issue. Um, maybe I can't do it, but I'll give me one minute. Let's see if I can do it. <coughs> Okay, yeah, there's a sense in which Heidegger is trying to be an articulator and a reconfigurer in basic questions. You can just use this as a possible way of transition. He keeps saying that he wants to renew our grasp of something the Greeks understood and we've lost the track of. Something more basic than correctness about truth. Something about the way everything is that makes truth possible. Roughly, that everything is uh, unconcealing and <clears throat> what that means. And in that sense, he definitely is always trying to play the role of recalling us to things that are important in our tradition, which still make a difference to us now, and to get them right would make a big difference to us now, and to retrieve them and so forth. <clears throat> but he also is playing the role of reconfiguring, because he wants to say there's something that's really important to us now that's always been in the background. And it's been was missed by the Greeks and is missed up to now. And this is really dramatic and not pretentious. And he says if we if we saw it, it would begin a new beginning. It would be a new history. So I can't help but think that he's running for a uh, reconfigurer. He's saying, look, we've got problems in our culture now, terrible problems. There's something I see that we've always missed that's been on the margin and it, it's important, it's crucially important. If I can tell it to you so that you see how important it is and start living as if it's important and preserving it, you will have a new history. You will have a new beginning. Everything will look different. And so it's pretty amazing that I think Heidegger is running for both these jobs. And thinkers can do that. So why shouldn't he be able to do it? And, uh, well, we'll stop with that. Okay, so now, well, I want to go quickly over questions left over from the origin of the work of art because we're going to come back to it anyway at the end when we get to language. But there are two things on my mind that I, uh, I, I'm interested in. One is correcting I, a mis an interesting deep mistake I've made and gotten away with for the last 20 years. I was called on it by a smart student in office hours uh, Friday. And then I also want to just use the origin of the work of art as a transition uh, to what we're going to do now in basic questions. Well, the mistake I made is a very subtle one and something that uh, the, the TAs and I talked about a lot, but I don't want to talk about it a lot here. But remember, I, I was giving an example of, of the world dimension. There's a struggle between earth and world. And I was saying, well, what is world? Well, world is the tendency, and, and Heidegger says, world is the tendency to bring things out in the open, and earth is the withdrawing, secluding, uh, resist, not withdrawing, resisting, secluding aspect or function that you get when you set up a whole, uh, when you're setting up a clearing. You get the struggle to bring things into the open and the resistance that that generates. And now, and I said the world function was the three C's, to get things clear, consistent, uh, and, uh, and complete. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, Somebody said to me, who was it said this? I mean, you get credit for it. Who's he? Is he here? Somebody said, what? Do they know you? Well, yeah, so he knows who came and said to me. That's a, a way of thinking about world that is really an enlightenment way. What you're doing is thinking about world in the modern style. In the modern style, we want to get it rationalized, as I said, using Kuhn's talk about scientific theory. We want to get it systematic. We want to get it all worked out. But that's just our way of thinking about what it is to get things out in the open. Uh, and I was illustrating in a way, <laughs> illustrating without realizing it, the point I was trying to make, that the struggle between earth and world sets up what the translator calls a rift design, and that that means that it, it, it sets up a different style or a different uh, way things come into the open in each, uh, and struggle in, in each epoch. And I said, yeah, in our epoch, I should have said, look at this, we struggle to get the Constitution uh, totally clear, coherent, and make it cover everything. 
That's not presumably what the medievals were trying to do with the Bible. And I, but I don't want to go into the details because we sank into a lot of discussion in, in, in when I tried to discuss it with my TAs. It, and it's not what the Greeks were doing. I'll say a word about what I think the Greeks were doing. They certainly weren't rationalizing everything. These are the, the pre-Socratic Greeks, not the Aristotelian ones. But even the Aristotelian ones weren't enlightened. But anyway, the, 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 the Ur Greeks, the pre-Socratic Greeks, they were presumably trying to sharpen up the style, to get it more in focus, to bring it out. That's what shining meant to them. That's what, that's what it was to bring things into the open for them. And that struggled with darkness, which was presumably the private passions of people. For that, I'm drawing on the Oresteia, which you, lots of you haven't read unless you had philosophy six with me or some other course where they taught it. But in the Oresteia, there's this struggle between the light and the dark, just bringing things into the open and letting them flourish and bringing them out. And there is the, the, the Furies, the powers of the underground and the dark, who, which, who rebel and resist this in the name of the family, nurturing, passion, uh, sex, privacy, all sorts of stuff that is not brought out into the open and, or doesn't, uh, doesn't flourish when it's brought out into the open. And so that would be a different way, different world function, struggling with a different earth function that gives you a different style. Uh, okay, so much for that. I, uh, I don't want to go into it more. If you find that you really understand what I just talked about and have more to contribute, it's a po possible paper topic. It's a weird one. Okay, well now, the, the other thing is to just make the transition. Remember that in the origin of the work of art, which is 1935, Heidegger's just getting the first glimmers of the idea that there is a history of understandings of being or a, or a history or, or a series of styles in the culture. He's making a transition which he once said, and I'll come back to this, between the transcendental hermeneutics of being in time and thinking being historically. That's a, a phrase from him. He says in one of the Nietzsche books that the, it, the turning in his thinking was going from transcendental hermeneutics and being in time to thinking being historically. And you can see it in here in two places, in, that is, in the origin of the work of art. And then we're going to go to basic questions where he's already very busy thinking all this stuff historically. But on 77, he, I think I may have read this, did I? Tell me, where he talks and he runs quickly through the Middle Ages and the modern and stuff. Mm -hmm. I did. Did I? I think so. So he just says, there, 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 in the beings opened up, we got, God, we got God's creation, and that happened in the Middle Ages, and then we got objects that, that were controlled through uh, calculation, and that's modernity. And uh, then, but what I didn't read was 81, where he does it in a different way, which is sort of interesting. Remember, the thinkers are the ones who uh, either articulate or reconfigure by finding new names for things. I said Kant or articulates Descartes. Descartes' name for what he was doing where there were, there were subjects, but by the time you get to Kant, there were autonomous subjects that were mature and so forth. So he runs in a quick way in 81 through some of the important names for the style or the being of beings. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, here he calls it being, the various names for being. And, and I may have not noticed this, so I'm going to just mention it. The, the middle of the middle paragraph, or the middle of the only paragraph on 81, being at that time, that's the time of Plato, it turns out, uh, made its uh, advent as eidos. We're going to hear a lot about that. The idea fits itself into morphe. That goes over to Aristotle in form. And then the sunalon, the, the unitary con a whole of morphe and pule, that's form and matter. That's Aristotle still. It's all a lot of Aristotle, namely the ergon, that's the work, that's still Aristotle, is in the manner of energia. All of that's Aristotle words. This mode of presence becomes the actualitas of the ens actu. That's, uh, I guess, medieval talk. The actualitas becomes 
reality. Uh, I don't know when that happens. Uh, that must be Renaissance, I guess. It's the only place left for it to happen. Who says it? I, who says it? I don't know. Uh, reality becomes objectivity. That's Descartes. No, you know what? I bet actualitas becomes reality in Descartes. Yes, I think so. Remember race cogitans, race extensa, I bet. And reality gets it, it really interpreted as objectivity by Kant. After all, that's the job of the transcendental unity of apperception to make there be objects. So, but I, we don't have to worry so much about the details. And objectivity becomes experience. That's his view of the extreme subjectivity of modernity. We'll hear more about that. But those <coughs> are some of the crucial names that thinkers have found that, now notice, you don't want to say create a new style, but you don't want to say copy a new style. You want to say articulate the style, that is, bring it into greater focus, make it shine more, give it, uh, uh, make the meaningful differences clearer, and so forth. Uh, those are also, of course, the words that uh, might reconfigure a whole new style. I take it that, uh, uh, well, really, uh, I mean, maybe we got it. Never mind. I mean, try to sort this out into articulation and reconfiguring would be too hard and not something even Heidegger was thinking. I'm ready to go on to basic questions, which is going to be the lectures for the, ne the next two weeks, probably. I thought that it was going to be easy. When I first read it, it's deceptively simple and re repetitious. I thought, how am I going to talk about this for two lectures? Now it seems to me, having thought about it more and talked about it with, uh, uh, with Forrest and, uh, and Liz, I wonder how I can do it in four. <coughs> anyway, let's, let's start. So these are the lectures he gave a year after. He wrote, uh, after he gave the order from the work of art lecture. And one way to think about the transition is to think about that the main thing he talked about in the origin of the work of art was the way an artwork, a thing, functioned to found a world, and so and and so forth. And he mentioned the statesmen and the thinkers and the gods who also did that job. But now he's focusing on the thinkers and and the first thinkers, namely the pre-Socratics and Plato and Aristotle, and how they did the job of, of beginning the understanding of being in the West. Did I name the pre-Socratics in there? If I didn't, I meant pre-Socratics, that is. And when I say pre-Socratics, uh, he always means Parmenides and Heraclitus. So we got how Parmenides, but he doesn't name them in here very often. I don't even remember <coughs> the ever name. But there's Parmenides and Heraclitus, Plato and Aristotle, <coughs> and he's going to focus on those thinkers and the understanding of being that, 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 that they forged and what was good and bad about it. And, and, and he's also going to, and this is another way you can say what's going on, and this is what I said last time, I think, that he doesn't explain enough about truth and, and aletheia and why he thinks aletheia that is the right name for truth and that the Greeks had something very important when they had that, that understanding and that truth is correctness is uh, a, a, our derivative form. That's going to get all spelled out, which was very quickly gone over in the origin of the work of art. So, and, and so what about, in the next lectures then, let me, I mean, maybe three, I'm going to assume three, but I bet it turns into four. So today we're going to talk about Heidegger's phenomenological way of proceeding. Well, first we're going to sort of, give, I'm going to give you a kind of overall view of what, what the distinctions are that you're going to have to keep in mind. And then we're going to talk about uh, the pre-Socratic and Platonic understanding of Aletheia. And then we're going to talk about uh, what went wrong with in Aristotle and about the basic mood of wonder. They, they don't necessarily belong together. They're just the next two things. And finally, we're going to talk about what Heidegger understands about truth as aletheia that the Greeks missed. Remember, the important thing to remember always if you go through this, and I'm going to say a lot more about it, is this, this very subtle but very ultimately very clear and important way that the Greeks got something right, which we've missed, but they missed something completely, 
with only Heidegger's doc. And if you can keep those keep those two things clear and keep and keep track, you're all set. And the way to keep track, the clue, and this is sort of for reading it, is that everything hinges on the tiniest thing. It hinges on an S. That is, whenever he's talking about beings and what we know about beings and what thinkers and philo- philosophers, he says, here, what philosophers tell us about beings, plural, it's always got to do with what the pre-Socratics and Plato and Aristotle were talking about. They were talking about beings and the, or, uh, the being of beings uh, all the time. When, there's, when it's about being without an S, then it's about what Heidegger was the truth of being. Uh, and so, you, but you, it's so, it goes by so fast and so subtle. It's, it's so obvious to him, I think. But, uh, for instance, on six, in section three, the first sentence, philosophy is the useless, though sovereign knowledge of the essence of beings. Well, you might have thought that he's telling you about his story. Uh, but, and because it sounds pretty important. And he wouldn't deny that he's also got the sovereign knowledge of the essence of beings, but he's standing on the shoulders of those philosophers who had that. He's got something even more. I don't know, something like the super sovereign knowledge of the truth of being. But uh, so, but as soon as you see that S, you know that everything in section three, or no, well, I don't know. No, I think there's a transition. You know that the first two paragraphs, anyway, of section three are about the, the old guy's philosophers. And then you're prepared to try to watch where does the switch come. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. At the bottom of page six and where he gets over to uh, his own view. But you've got to keep your eyes open. Um, so, in fact, maybe I should skip ahead instead of saying I'm going to do that later. Let's look at that right now. Uh, okay, so look at six. And we'll find out about philosophers. Uh, the philosophers... Well, I'm torn between this section. Which is the logical way to go? No, I will talk about it in a second. It just doesn't fit yet. Let me finish giving you the guide to reading and do it <coughs> step by step. I, I'm always tempted to try to say everything at once. Okay, the other important thing besides the S to, to hold on to is remember that essence doesn't mean essence. Uh, and otherwise, you're just lost reading it. I mean, it's not the, exactly the fault of the translator. The word is the German word Wesen, which is translated correctly by essence. But Heidegger tells you on page 30 that there is sort of the, 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 the contemporary philosophical, or for a long time philosophical, and sort of empty and uninteresting sense of essence, where the essence of something is the general, the characteristic that everything in that class has, or the necessary and sufficient conditions for being something. Like maybe, maybe the essence of chair is uh, a, a t- equipment for one person to sit on. Uh, and as, 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 anyway, you could try, philosophers do, to sharpen it up and find out exactly what is true of all chairs and only chairs. And of course, it never works. Uh, you, you would find something, I'm sure, that doesn't doesn't fit my definition. But, it, but the idea, anyway, is that essence, he says this in the middle of uh, that, the first full paragraph on 30. Perhaps, but he's saying this is wrong. Uh, he says, uh, but perhaps the essence of the true, truth is, itself is not grasped at all if we merely represent it in general, represent in general that which applies universally to everything true as such. That would be the essence of truth in the simplest minded way. Now comes his own view of essence. <clears throat> How should we translate it? His essence of the truth, or of the chair for that matter, I guess, and we got to buy everything. He's interested in the big thing. For him, the essence of X is either Forrest's way of translating it, which is closer to the German and than mine, and maybe the right way, I don't know. It, it, whatever, there's no right, whatever you find helpful. You could say <coughs> the essence of X is the coming into being of X. You have to say something like the way X comes into being. Where, where that's continuously... Continuously happening. happening, right. Not just the, the, 
what did we say that what the other one was not for us? Coming to be. Yeah, coming to be. Yeah, not coming to be, <coughs> which happens only once. <coughs> the coming into being, chairs aren't very good at that. But let's, let's take something like, I don't know, I'm trying to find something less than whole being big deal ontological. Being a professor. Being a professor? Is that what you say? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Yes, and coming into being a professor might be the day that you get the letter and you got tenure. That, that would, sorry, that would be coming to be a professor. Coming into being a professor is this constant thing you have to do. A lot of uh, coordinated activities with identities and, and equipment and so forth. And that's uh, the essence of professorhood. The other, and my phrase is, remember, the working of. <coughs> so how truth works or how being a professor works I think one is a lot more colloquial, mine. Uh, Horace is a lot closer to the German. In any case, you got to think something else than the word essence, or you'll just be lost. I mean, you have to read it. I still read it. Any time I'm reading Heidegger, I have to consciously say to myself, every time I see the word essence, I say how it works. But I could equally well say coming into being. You really ought to just cross out essence whenever it's doing this job and just write in whatever your favorite expression is that makes it meaningful to you. Yeah? Except for insofar as he's explaining how we get our understanding essence. That's um, right. So it's a double meaning. Right, I was going to say that. Of course, don't do it mechanically or dumbly like you just push the, on the computer a, a, a substitute <laughs> command, or you'll get <coughs> nonsense, as you always do when you try that. Uh, you, uh, but you've got to understand from the context when he's talking about <coughs> essence in his sense of essence, and he, and, or when he's just talking about it the way philosophers talk about it normally, right? And showing, sometimes he's showing the connection. Between the two. Well, we're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to get to where I'm going to get back to where I jumped ahead to, but am I in the right way? So I want to talk about uh, what Heidegger's doing. In the whole about, about, I think, five different things Heidegger's doing in this book, and it helps a lot, I think, me anyway, <coughs> to sort them out and lay them out. Uh, you, I would be tempted to say we're going to get at Heidegger's method, but Heidegger just says he hasn't got any method and he hates the talk of method. That's a Cartesian notion. That's some kind of procedure that you can follow uh, sort of mechanically to get the right answer. That's what the whole discourse on method of Descartes is about, and Heidegger would say that's the last thing he's doing. He says he's following a path. I wish I had a simple word for that. I can't even say Heidegger's way of proceeding, or can I? Or do you think that already gets me into Descartes' procedures? Uh, Heidegger's way of doing things, uh, <laughs> I guess, it's pretty strange. Heidegger's, Heidegger's path is just a little too Heideggerian for me. <laughs> anyway, whatever it is, the stuff Heidegger's doing. Here, let's start. Presume first, and we're going to do it with the, with the example of truth, because that's what this book is about. So, he proceeds like any kind of analytic philosopher, making correct statements about truth, defining it as correctness, telling you more how the assertion is related to the state of affairs and so forth. He's doing that uh, because he has to tell you sort of in, in terms of what philosophers are now talking about where he wants to start. Of course, that isn't what interests him at all. There are plenty of people doing that and doing it on and on. And uh, of trying to get a very clear uh, definition of truth uh, in, in, in a, where essence means sort of what, what is true of all true assertions and only true assertions. What's he trying to do? Well, he's asking, secondly, about something that more basic that makes truth as correspondent, which is the answer, to, or correctness, whatever you, let's call it correctness, which makes truth as correctness possible. And it turns out to be a taken-for-granted uh, background practices. Uh, it turns out to be, uh, in, in being in time, it just turns out to be the background practice, the form of life at the existing time. Uh, and then later it turns out there are a lot of different forms of life, so I've fallen into different styles, different understandings of being, each of which does the job of uh, making correspondence possible. Now, this second move 
is like a transcendental argument. Uh, and it, in Being in Time, he talks a lot about the, the conditions of the possibility of X. He's going to tell you the conditions of the possibility now of making true assertions. And that's why, why it's no surprise that he says, the sentence I already quoted, that, he, that being in time is transcendental hermeneutics, kind of interpretation, never mind the hermeneutic part. He was asking about the condition of the possibility of all sorts of things. You can tell that it's a transcendental sort of claim because it's a claim about for any, anywhere in the world where there are human beings, it's going to turn out to be the case that there has to be some kind of opening, we'll get back to that, in which beings can show up so that we can make true assertions about them. People make true assertions even in, in, in you know, prehistoric times and in Bali and so forth. So there, there's that sort of transcendental level. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> he gets to what he's interested in. Philosophers, which are these with philosophers is a little confusing and, and because I, he keeps changing his mind about what's going on. Uh, philosophers are, in this book, everybody from uh, the pre-Socratics to Heidegger. And Heidegger, it's not clear whether Heidegger wants to think of himself as a philosopher or not. I don't know he ever does. The quote I said he did wasn't really him, I decided. So, so that's what the philosophers are. Uh, what's confusing, and Heidegger thinks he's not a philosopher, he's a thinker. Unfortunately, I realized as I was preparing this clear comment, he calls these people, which he calls in here philosophers, thinkers in uh, The Origin of the Work of Art, because thinkers are the ones who come up with the names for the styles of being that set up the various epochs in the history of the West. So that means, just as long as you don't get confused, I mean, that's a transitional state to call them thinkers. He, he, after, he calls them, well, after he calls them thinkers in Origin of the Work of Art, he calls them philosophers here, he finally gets the real name he wants for them, he calls them metaphysicians. And metaphysics and metaphysicians is really the name for it. He says, you know, something I'm going to hand out in the reader, which you're going to get it soon. Uh, everybody from, he goes clear back to Anaximander, which is 700 BC, everybody from Anaximander through him, uh, to him, certainly including Husserl and so forth, are all metaphysicians. Uh, and just so you, I won't be mysterious, metaphysicians are always talking about the being of beings, and that, with an S. Uh, now, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? There are two ways to, to look at it. Uh, we'll come back to that too, but let's just say this. I mean, if you look at the, uh, at the people we call philosophers, let's just take one, Plato, and, and you consider them in what they thought they were doing, then they are philosophers or metaphysicians trying to name once and for all, this is the crucial thing, the truth about being, for everybody, everywhere, uh, and so forth. And therefore, but, but if you look, as, what's your first name? John says, at what they really do, of course, you, do, you see that they don't do that at all. They help focus the style of any particular, of a particular epoch, each thinker. Now, I, I believe, but I'm guessing, check this out, that later, after the origin of the work of art, Heidegger won't call them thinkers unless they know what they're doing. <laughs> and only Heidegger is a thinker, because only Heidegger knows what he's doing. And those guys are all going to be called philosophers and metaphysicians, because they haven't, I mean, they really don't get it. I mean, they, they're doing it, but they don't know it. But, but, it, but I can see why, it would, I mean, why one would be tempted to call them thinkers. And it's just a question, do you have any reason to think that he goes on calling them thinkers? Keep your eyes open, I will too. I have a hunch he decides keep thinking for himself. What do you think, Forrest? Yeah, I think he does. So he takes it over and gives them philosophy, gives them metaphysics. That's good enough. I mean, I, and he, he respects that a lot. And those are not insults, ever, from Heidegger. Uh, did I see a hand? 
Okay, all right, I won't stop there. Uh, <clears throat> so they they try to bring out the what I call the being of beings or the beingness of beings. Sometimes I get calls it that. Uh, they, they, they know, or they sense, that there's some very important <coughs> thing going, something going on, and uh, that it's more fundamental and sovereign and determines everything else, and they try to get it and name it. This is, he talks about this on page six, where I was. Now this is where I said I couldn't jump ahead. You can see why it was better to wait. We're now ready to see what philosophers are, and we just said, Philosophy is the useless, though sovereign knowledge of the essence of beings. And they are dealing with seeking, about halfway toward the end of the paragraph, they are seeking the most constant being in proximity to what conceals, oh, no, seeking is, that's their work, they're, they're doing philosophy. Uh, what else is seeking but the most constant being in proximity to what conceals itself? You know, that's the light in the room story again. That's what withdraws. That's what is so pervasive that you don't normally see it. Um, out of which each need comes to us and every and so forth. Never mind the fancy talk. Uh, and now, uh, and that style does not normally appear because of this withdrawing. I'm going to read that at the end of the paragraph. And what is more, about eight lines up, and what is more concealed than the ground of what is so uncanny, namely the be that beings are beings are rather than are not. Notice the S. People think Heidegger's big question is why are there beings rather than beings, uh, uh, rather than nothing. Sorry, but that's not Heidegger's question. That's meta that's the question for metaphysics. Uh, as soon as it's about beings, it can't be the the right Heidegger's question. But it's an interesting question. What withdraws from us more than the essence of being. Let's see now how we want to say that. What withdraws from us more than the essence of being. Which essence is that? The essence of that which in all the sense of being holds sway around us. Well, that's pretty much like the old, I mean, like the philosophy essence, because there the essence of being means the beingness of being, doesn't it? Because uh, what withdraws from us is the general characteristic of all beings. Gee, I don't know why he says it that way. Uh, let's try any uh, further. The essence of that which, in all the fabricated and disposed, disposed beings, holds sway around us and, uh, and bears on us, is the closest, but at the same time the most worn out, but, and therefore the most ungraspable. That's the style. That's the characteristic of everything, I think. And therefore the essence of being is not the way being works. <coughs> The, it's the most general thing about the way being is, I think. So that, don't, don't change essence there. Uh, it's not, not on my reading. Uh, but, and now, switch. At the end of that paragraph, we go to the next thing. Whatever you want to call these people. Uh, some, sometimes it's called thinking. Sometimes, clear up to the end, Heidegger calls it phenomenology. In a very late seminar, he says, phenomenology deals with what doesn't appear. Now, that could have been, this doesn't appear. But it's a much more fundamental doesn't appear, it turns out. And that's what he's gonna, we're going to talk about now. See, what I think about the withdrawing story is it's something that doesn't appear but can be made to appear. Because after all, these philosophers bring it out into the open and name it and let it shine. And in Being in Time, he talks about that what he wants to talk about what is uh, nearest and yet farthest away, that is, it's nearest because it, it pervades everything we are and do, namely our style. Farthest away because, like the illumination, we, we don't normally grasp it, but which can be brought near. He does say that, and after all, what else are these philosophers doing if they're not busy trying to name it, hold it up like a work of art, and but with words, make it shine, glamorize the style so we can see it? Uh, but there's something else that you can't even do that with. You can't sort of glamorize it so we can see it. And that's been, now we go deeper. We've gotten to what is either phenomenology, sometimes, and up to the end, or thinking, in when Heidegger decides that thinking is the name for what he's doing. So 
causes the very seeking as a goal means to anchor the beginning and the end of all reflection in the question of the truth, not of this or that being, or even of all beings. And now we're off in another, the yes is the signal. We're, we're dropping the S. We're going to, not even of all beings, but of being itself. By the way, I guess I should stop for a moment. I don't think it helps a bit to capitalize being. I better say this. I mean, that, that's another misleading thing besides, besides the way essence gets translated. There's nothing false about capitalizing being. Being sein in German is capitalized. But then so is, so is every word. Every noun is going to be capitalized. So you can't just go from there to making it capital. You pull in a little extra trick when you're translating it with a capital. Why not have, translate chair with a capital and you know, professor with a capital? They're all capital in German. So I think you shouldn't. I don't see any... If Heidegger meant that there was a, a super capital B on beings, he would have had it printed in bold or something, and he didn't. And if you do capitalize it, it makes it sound so much like a thing, as if it were God, as if it were some super thing. And, or like in Plotinus, or, 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 or like the, the good in, in, in the, the capital G. I don't know how that comes from. Where that happens in the Greek. I don't know in the Greek. But anyway... I, so I would say that we should be reading this lowercase b, and we're not talking about this or that being, or even all being, but being itself, but I don't think it needs to capital. The grandeur of man is measured according to what he seeks and according to the urgency with which he remains a seeker. Such questioning of the truth of being. Now, what is the truth of being? Well, <coughs> that's going to turn out to be the way being discloses, or being as disclosing. That is, the truth of being, I've said before, and I, I still believe this, I, mean, I think maybe Forrest and I get on this, I'm not sure, I would equate the truth of being with the clearing, with the world, roughly, anyway, with the open. Uh, and, and that's not the style. I mean, that's now behind the style. I mean, that's there. There are, we need a name for something that every style produces. Any old style produces a clearing in which things show up as something. They produce this open. And uh, that's not what Heidegger is going to say. Now, such questioning of the truth of being is the sovereign knowledge philosophy. Boy, you see, there's where I get very confused. But that, that is a place where he uses... Uh, uh, Liz, it looks like... I mean, I thought we could say he didn't use philosophy for his own stuff. But I think he's not talking about his own stuff because he's left beings behind. I mean, you have to sort of decoded with maybe... So, uh, so I think the sovereign knowledge here is his kind of thing. Here, questioning already counts as knowing, uh, no matter how essential and decisive it answer might be, the answer cannot be other than the penultimate step in a long series of steps of questioning founded in itself. Uh, see, I think, just so you'll know why this mysterious penultimate step, uh, when you get to the clearing, remember this? I said this last time, this mysterious refrain will keep coming up till the last book in the course where you get it head on in time and being. If you ask sort of what makes it possible for there to be clearings, then you get a further thing, and that's the arrivedness, this strange business of appropriating that here in, in, in the latest last Heidegger, it turns out that arrivedness is what gives being or gives the clearing and my version of that is uh, and it gets translated appropriating or anoning and I said last time but I don't know if it helps any it's something about the way the practices work such as they tend toward gathering they tend toward sharpening and bringing out meaningful differences and, and, and bringing in and, 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 and establishing a style and so forth that's that is the ultimate step, I think. <clears throat> so, okay, so anyway, so, so phenomenology brings you to the penultimate step and uh, then comes the mysterious, just to show you, uh, right after that, on page eight, in a footnote, as if he said, well, you know, Dreyfus needs evidence, and right, he's just come up to it, so we better give him some. The footnote says, the question of the essence of truth is the casting of one and only goal, and so and so and so, the with the truth of being seen in terms of the essence of the appropriating event. That's the invasion of the Aridens. What does it say? Okay, that's all. 
So there is always this, this sort of fun. I mean, there's always this sort of spooky thing in the background, even further in the background than any background that you've ever seen. And that's what he's talking about there. But that all comes under thinking. See, now I have a sort of a chart that I've tried to fill this all out. Yeah. So, I wonder if I need more space. Yeah, you've got, you got Horace's message, right? I'm going to erase it. Okay, now I'm going to have philosophy in this column. And that's what people like Plato do. And unfortunately, philosophy in this column, too, as you just saw, I can't help it. That's in this book. And that's not, that's not good news. But under this, I write metaphysics, which is what that's going to become when you get to the terminology. And over here, I claim it's going to become famous. And then you won't use philosophy at all anymore, I think. And what do you think? What do these people who do metaphysics, they think about the being of beings. And what do these people think about? They think about the truth of being. These people mean the title. <laughs> so far. So far, right. Us, now that we've taken this, we're taking this for it. And I mean, in my language, I guess I'll put brackets here, style, just so you related to what I was saying. And over here, I haven't really explained this very much well yet, but I'll just say that you, you must have a sense of it. I mean, when the metaphysicians talk about the style, they talk about it, obviously, as the way things are, now and forevermore and in the past and everywhere. When, when Descartes says that people are subjects and everything else is objects, he doesn't mean now, thank goodness, the Enlightenment. <coughs> we've become subjects and everything becomes objects because now we've discovered <coughs> how it was all along because he's a metaphysician. So when they talk about the style, they don't do what Heidegger does, talk about the style as a, a style, meaning that's just one of the ways that we can have everything showing up for us. <coughs> and then comes these other mysterious things we haven't talked about yet. The essence of truth, that's what these people talk about. And Heidegger talks about the truth of essence. I, I mean, when I read this weird phrase, which it doesn't do much for me except try my neuron, but when I try to make sense of this, I hear it something like uh, the truth about way, the way things work, or how things really work, or something like that. That's, that's what that's supposed to be. This is supposed to be uh, the essence of truth, whether well, it's going to turn out to be, for them, unconcealing. And that's <coughs> nice. And it's good that they discovered that. And uh, they know a lot more. And that's something about the way truth works. And then over here is the way truth really works. And then you get this deeper story. That isn't very illuminating. I, I find myself very, very hard to talk. But this is the right way to put it on the board. This is how I say it. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah. yeah. Heidegger's going to hear it one way. I mean, Heidegger thinks that they got it, remember, half right. <coughs> they understood, not to be secretive about it, and we'll get into more detail, things had to be uh, uh, had to be unconcealed, had to come into the open before we could make correct statements about it. That's what they understood. They, the Greeks. They, they the Greeks. Greeks. The Greeks. They understood it. A bit more and more metaphysicians missed it. Aristotle already missed it. Plato was just already got it a little bit off. But the, 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 the pre-Socratics had a good feel for this. Things had to come out into the open, and that was necessary before we could say correct things about them. But what they didn't get is that uh, there had to be something like a clearing before things could come out into the open. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know, did I write that? Yes, but I'm not going to write it here. You can write it here. My great slogan, I'm very pleased with this, is they had, well, I better write it so far. <laughs> they had coming into the open. That was what they thought I would say that was. And their word for this, that, that the, the style was pieces. That was the style of things whooshing up, welling up. Uh, what are them surging up? Those are the words that people use for this. And, and, and then when they sort of surged up, they came into the open. And then, of course, we could talk about that. But this is about how the open opens up. <coughs> or really, mm, mm, well, a little too. That's, this is a, they say, coming into the open, Heidegger says, well, we've got to sort of understand that there's an open to come into. And then finally, and this is this Erasmus thing, how the open opens up. So there's, this is the penultimate question. And this is the ultimate question. I think. Uh, but I haven't written that down. The, when you say the penultimate, the open, that's just the open as open in general. Right, right. The open, uh, this is the penultimate question, the open, but even, I mean, the open as open, they don't even have a sense of, I mean, they're interested in the coming into the open business. They don't even pay attention to the open that they come into. There's a particular open that they right. come into. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and then, and then the idea comes along and pays attention to the particular <coughs> open they come into. There are really three, aren't there? The open... Oh dear, the open as open. Of course, when you understand one of these, you understand the other, because when you understand what the open is, you understand how it's... But then, how the open opens up at all, that's Erignus, this strange bottom line. What I don't really understand about Erignus is why Heidegger thinks it's so important that he thinks it's just the... I mean, I think that's his word. As re, That's his word as... as reconfigurer and savior of humanity to have found this word. It's going to go on for him along with, with Eidos and, and uh, creation and Gegenstand and, and uh, that is uh, objects. There's going to be an aridness when, when, when the dust settles. But it's hard to get a feel for these things. But Heidegger would say, well, if it was easy to understand, it surely wouldn't have been the right word. So <laughs> this just shows how, how far ahead of me he is. You said, uh, you said there were three. The what? Openness, you said there were three. Parts. Oh, the open is open. How I the open think yeah, the open, open is open. Is, and then there's the open as open. And then how the open opens up. That's the ultimate question. And what I, the, the, by that I mean, I don't want any of this to be mysterious. That's this business of how the practices work so that there is such a thing as an open. Uh, and that's this thing, the last thing. And it's just hinted around, like in this footnote here, it becomes more and more important until by the end of the course, as I say, it turns out to be the behind everything. Yeah? Wait, I can't hear you. Maybe it's because it's, is there a noise out here? Oh, anyway, I'll just come up close. I have trouble hearing. Yeah? Oh, no, but I'm glad you asked. Ah, so. uh, well, I see why you say that. No, it's wrong, but it's interesting. Uh, but let me see now. Uh, 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 but, but it really is, you know, it's really quite interesting and quite wrong because the transcendental, <laughs> the transcendental move is way is being in time, and that's where you want to find the general characteristic of the clearing or the world, and you think that that's just something that everybody has everywhere, and it's still sort of metaphysical in a funny way. I mean, it's not metaphysical in that it's thinking about the being of beings. It's thinking about something called uh, the understanding of being, namely the clearing. But it's, it's like metaphysics in that it thinks there is just one clearing structure, and it's been that way, and there always will be a clearing structure, and there's nothing special about the history of the West except that the pre-Socratics were on to it, but they just were on to it. I mean, the other it was happening all over the world. They, the other people just didn't notice it. Now, that's transcendental because there it is. It's the condition, the clearing as it's described in being in time is the condition of the possibility of anything showing up as anything 
Are people showing up as anything? Well, oh, there's a great place in here where he does the being in time story. We just jump to it as soon as I finish uh, saying what I'm going to say to you. The reason this isn't transcendental <coughs> is you can understand the simple test is always ask yourself, is it true for everybody everywhere? And the answer is no. Uh, that there isn't one big open, except in the West after the pre-Socratic. And there isn't even a rightness everywhere. Well, you're looking very worried. And D, if there are two different meanings of how many things going on. Well, if a rightness means the tendency of the practice to order into one big world and to then produce something like a work of art that orders even more the, that world. And that, that's, remember there's this thing in, in, in the origin of the work of art which is called art, which is behind the creators and behind the artwork and draws them to do, do whatever they do. That isn't just the marginal practices, but that's the fact that the marginal practices want to gather, that the practices want to bring things out more and more in their, in their own, and totally, that's the picture he has now, I think. When he thinks they're rightness, he thinks this very special feature, this is my hunch after reading a lot of this stuff. He's a very special feature of the practices in the West that they're going to gather into one uh, style at a time and bring that style out as fully as possible. Then there becomes, you'll get this when we get to the language essay, he generalizes their writing. And it turns out it happens everywhere there is language because it turns out that there isn't just one style or one world but lots of worlds but lots of styles, all at the same time, not just a series of total worlds. I mean, think of it as polytheism. I mean, it, instead of having... I mean, what happens in the Aridinus picture he's got now is it's, it's a kind of monotheistic picture that is being... Uh, or Aridinus is calling human beings to come together with being and as... The style and the people each come into their own by, pull, by bringing each other more and more into focus. The preservers are the people acting in the style. And the style is the general way, coordination of all this behavior. And these bring each other each out into their own most, together and totally, something like that. And, and that's why she thinks it's uh, transcendental. But that it's exactly the reason it isn't transcendent. That is, it doesn't happen everywhere. It only happens in the West, in, in, and only since 500 B.C. And this is a kind of amazing thing that Heidegger thinks. It's like saying, well, look, it's like thinking, gee, God only, <coughs> only spoke to the Hebrews and, and so forth, and nobody else, and it's not a God for everybody else. It just happens that there's this super creator thing in our, in our history. I mean, as soon as you think it's for everybody, that we ought to sort of all get everybody into our horizons, teach them our style, we're in bad shape. I mean, we are in bad shape as technology sort of takes over everybody's culture and wipes out all the other worlds and all the other styles. Heidegger is not happy about that. Um, but uh, what we should, what he thinks now is, at this stage in his thinking, we should once more have a unified style. Well, I can find you the quote in a minute. But I mean, Heidegger is, what does Heidegger really hope for? He hopes that we will have a new clearing with a new style and that that clearing with its style will have the unique feature that the work of art will not only show forth a style, but it will show forth that it's a style. And then people will understand themselves as preservers. Instead of just being preservers, they'll understand themselves as preservers. They'll know that it only, only exists as long as they bring it out. And that will be the last and best God in the history of the West, and it will only be a God for the West, and the West will, so to speak, be saved thanks to Heidegger, if everybody understood Heidegger. Now, that's in here. Where, I don't remember where, though, where you see him sort of seeing this hoping that this will happen. Did I write it down? Wait, maybe I wrote it down. Uh -huh.
I did write it down, but why and where, I can't imagine. Hmm. Anybody remember? I mean, there's a moment when he talks about this. It's got to do with the Rydman's again. See, I mean, if, if there was such a thing as indexes in Heidegger's book, we could find it in her. Uh, it must be... Well, let me give a quick look, because it would be so nice to see how it's all going to end if it works, if, if, it went, if things go well. Uh, it's on the upper right hand side, I believe. Hmm, it might be here on thirty five. By the way, are you clear about why it's not transcendental? I mean, it's something just for us. But it's some very, very conditioned thing. But I see why you think it's transcendental, because it's the ultimate condition of the possibility of everything that goes on for us in the West. That's what you were on. But it's only in the West, and that's the big difference. Okay, I think on 35, when he's talking about the future. Okay. The one that starts below on um, 34 and goes up into the top of this Maybe. Time. That's what I'm thinking. Happening during history are not what is bygone was considered as such. Mm-hmm. Maybe. They're I'm primordial. Maybe. Always the future. So, but I'm, I'm looking to see about if, we, if he's running here for the future. I mean, I don't know yet. <coughs> not quite. Not quite. It's in this area. By the way, but I didn't find it, but I found something else. If you want to know the difference between the penultimate question and the ultimate question, uh, you, the ultimate business comes up again on page 44. I mean, where's the penultimate? I want to just mark it and say page 44. Okay, on page 7, you could write C, page 44. Because in the middle of page 44, he says, only one thing is clear. If all philosophical thought, look at that philosophical thought, and that's just how fluctuating his vocabulary is, must move unavoided, must more unavoidably move in this turning, the more it thinks originally. That is, the more it approaches what in philosophy is primordial and always thought and reflected upon. Then the turning, that is the thing where we're going to get really, get things right, uh, must belong essentially to the single focus of the philosophical reflection being as the appropriating event. And there, and so it's absolutely clear that philosophical is being used all over the place here. And uh, but that's and if you thought being is the appropriating event, and if that took over, and people all started acting <coughs> in the light of an understanding of style as style, then the culture would get a new god and everything would be saved. But I can't find it. Keep your eyes open, or maybe I read it someplace else. I was reading about three Heidegger things at once. Um, let's go back to where we are. Um, <clears throat> oh, well, may, maybe it's well, maybe it's going to be in this thing I'm going to have in the reader called The Way Back into the Ground of Metaphysics because Heidegger gets all this so much clearer in a piece that's only 14 pages long that I found, refound while I was reading around over the weekend that I decided that that is what you're going to read uh, next, not uh, the nihilism as the something determination of something. I've got to give you a new syllabus. I have changed my mind about this, that. Okay, let's go on. We're now ready for the transcendental question. I, I don't think he would like to call it that anymore, but I think it's okay to call it that. You start with truth as correctness, and you, get, you ask what makes it possible. That's what starts on... Yeah. Uh, I've written a mysterious note to myself. It could be anywhere. Uh, I didn't write down the page number. I guess it's, um, it's on page 18. Right. That's where I said I would show you how, for those who had being in time, 
where he's doing it and uh, making this first very general move about the theory. So all this is on 18. Uh, <coughs> and now I'm going to read the middle of the page. The, the stone is hard. Well, let, let us reflect. If our representations and assertions, for example, the statement the stone is hard is supposed to conform to the object, then this being must be accessible in advance <coughs> in order to present itself as a standard and so forth. In short, the being, in this case, the thing, must be out in the open. But, and then see, that's sort of an interestingly ambiguous. Out in the open, namely, come out and, and, and so that you can make true statements about it or come into the open. But for the, the, right now, it's, the, it's, it's not clear what he's doing yet. Even more, not only must the stone itself, in order to remain with our example, be out in the open, but so must the domain. And now that's the, the other open. It, one, is being out in the open is this one. <coughs> this one is this domain in which you can be out in the open. But being out in the open is in... Uh, where were we? So must the domain which the conformity with the thing has to traverse in order to read off it in the mode of representation what characterizes the being in it, its being thus and so. That is that is the open. That's the clearing. So, now, I'm ready. What I'm going to do today, is so many people came to office hours and, and, and other times and got, grabbed me to ask me, on the one hand, good questions, but on the other hand, questions that showed me that I had gone over this too fast and that I left so many loose ends that there were lots of questions. So, and I, learning by talking and giving answers to those people's questions, I think I can say more clearly and do a Heidegger kind of re recapitulation. It's fitting, I just realized, for this book to keep saying the same thing over and over and hopefully clearer and clearer. So first, I'm going to make comments on the difference between historiography and history. Uh, I thought I was just, I was very sort of quick about that. I just said, historiography tries to get the facts about the past and history is concerned with telling us something that's important to us now in the present. But now I would try to divide it up into a lot more subpoints. But, but first, it's true that historiography wants to get it right about the past for its own sake, and history is interested in what is alive and governing us now, to talk like Heidegger, which he says on 35, which is such an interesting idea. Um, the top of 35, the future is the beginning of all happening. Everything is enclosed within the beginning, even if what has already begun and what has already uh, become seem forthwith to have gone beyond their beginning. Yet the latter, apparently having become past, remains in power and abides. Everything futural encounters it. So as he says in Being in Time, the past goes ahead of us. And so if you're interested, when you do history, you're interested in what is still determining the clearing and what makes sense for us and uh, intelligibility for us and what will and what is already sketching out our future because that's the kind of thing that it makes sense for us to press into in, in the future. So it's, it's both restricting our future, that's one of the things it's doing and dangerously it, 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 it happens. It didn't have to be that way but that's how it is in the West. And, but it's also got resources in it that have never been exploited, which, gives, which could give us an even better future than we ever, than they ever, even better than the pre-Socratics. Um, so, and that's what, and history is interested in doing all that, finding out what's, what's happened and how it's governing us and what's good about it, that it's governing us and what's bad about it and so forth. Um, the, and Foucault said, and that's sort of an interesting phrase, the, the, the kind of the history he was doing was the history of the present. You can mean that's, that's a kind of one-liner for what Heidegger's doing. We, we're going to understand another one. My way of putting it would be we go back to the Greeks to understand their world as what set up our world. Uh, so that's, and that's what I already said. But I think there's two more things to say. Uh, it's interesting that it, when he talks about how historiography tries to make the past relevant by seeing how much it's like uh, the kind of 
things we have and kind of problems we have and ways of looking at it. I mean, you're used to that, I'm sure, in, in other courses and in books which try to say, oh, they, the, how, it's amazing how much the, the medievals were really just like us or the, the Greeks were just like us. And sometimes historians do it very consciously and sometimes they do something much worse. They don't even realize but they just treat them as like us. That is, they use our concepts, our understanding of being, to talk about what was going on in Greece or in, in medieval times as if there were such things. And I'll give you some examples of this. Um, Heidegger's talking about this on 47, complaining about it. <coughs> uh, well, let's see, 47 is an example already. Let me see. I don't know. I didn't mark it. Just a second. It's all around this business of reading back that way. Well, I, I, I'll give you examples, and one one of them, his example. But his example is nature on forty-seven. That they is that, and this is a very Kuhnian story. He says we just assume that Aristotle and, and Galileo and Einstein were all talking about the same nature and getting it righter and righter about it. So we can say, well, we know a lot more about nature than they knew about nature. But they had something entirely different. Uh, they let something entirely different showed up for them. This kind of thesis that nature was for them this welling up of things. And, uh, and, and nature and, and Aristotle, he doesn't talk about it here, was interested in how to have an a understanding that bridged common sense and theory in such a way that you could use the same basic concepts like form and matter for both. And he thought it was successful if he could. And now we have just given that up and done something else. I have, have a theory about nature which is utterly discontinuous with our ordinary experience of nature. And Heidegger isn't saying one is good and one is bad. He's just saying, don't think that uh, there's just one meaning for nature. And he's talking about that on 47 and 48. And, but there are, you can think of all kinds of examples. Foucault, who's always like applied Heidegger and very interesting, in his book, The History of Sexuality, says this sort of amazing and outrageous thing, that there was no sexuality until the 17th century, by which he means that we combined genitals and reproduction and uh, good, pleasant feelings that he calls aphrodisia and uh, uh, character because we think the sexuality was the key to people's character or at least Freud did. All of this into some natural kind which we think really causally explains a lot of what people do called sexuality. But it's just, it, there was no such thing for the Greeks. They had aphrodisia and they understood these separate things, but there was, and they didn't think there was one natural kind that explained uh, people's personalities. That's, that's and, and if you go back and ask yourself, and what was uh, Heide, uh, the Aristotle's view of sexuality, that's just a stupid question. It's a nonsense question. I'll, I'll give you one more example, something closer to the kind of things I talk about in my course. Yeah. I have a question about this notion of history. Uh, this, um, pursuing history, in this historical reflection that Heidegger talks about, is it intellectual history or uh, in, I, I want to differentiate it from Foucault's view, it is the history of everyday practice though. that means what is called knowledge uh, in the sense of political, that is another kind of knowledge, the knowledge of everyday practice. Who, Heidegger or Foucault? Oh, Foucault is talking about not history of intellectual history, not what Aristotle and Plato and Theosophists talk about. Right. For example, the notion of nature, truth, or like this. Yeah. Uh, I wonder that, can we really reach to this beginning? I, 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 want, I try to understand Heidegger, that he tries to teach us that we can understand the clearing of being through an intellectual history. I mean, reflecting on concepts and notions, the development of concepts, or the development of everyday practices of life. No, I mean, something is, that's a funny distinction. That's not right if we're talking about this. Heidegger isn't interested in intellectual history because he's only interested in very, very special concepts, namely 
the, our, the names they had for truth and for being and all the words associated with that. Uh, and those, and that's the first point. So it's a very peculiar kind of intellectual history uh, because it's so limited to these very basic words. Secondly, he, when he talks about them, he does it in terms of everyday practices. That's what's interesting. I mean, when he goes back to take an example, when he talks about thesis as this understanding of being which is the bringing forth kind, he talks about it in here, uh, helping something come forth, nurturing, which he thinks is the... Did I say thesis? I meant poesis. Correct me. I mean, thesis is things just welling up and we get it, we get out of the way or we get drawn in or whatever, but it's, it's the things that emerge. But the next stage in the, in, in the West, I've talked about this, was, is poesis. There's really sort of, he has these subtle stages sometimes. There's just coming forth, which is poesis, which is thesis. And then there's bringing, uh, there's, uh, Letting come forth. That's really the, the poesis, nurturing kind. And then there's bringing forth, or, uh, so, or something like that, which is more like production. And uh, then the word is techne, he says. But let me just, but when he's talking about helping come forth, the, that is the poesis kind, he talks about carpenters and how there are still carpenters who let the, the, the whatever's in the wood come out. When they make a chest, they don't just take the standard wood and hammer it together in the standard way to make the standard chest, but they're sensitive to what the possibilities in the wood are and what the interests of the family or the community are. That's the kind of architect or carpenter you you want to find, but they're hard to find. I have an architect who said, and, and can, uh, who's got a PhD doing Heidegger here. Uh, so he's a good kind of, he's terrific, Perk. I and mean, if you need any construction done by Heideggerian construction, <laughs> I'll give you his phone number. But um, what's important is this big fancy word, poesis, is going to be for Heidegger tied up with the most basic practices where, because it's going to be about how people behave all the time. And I, I think probably Foucault is the same. I, I, would, I don't want to talk about it, think about it, because you, most of you haven't read Foucault. But uh, I, enough to say, Heidegger, I don't even know if I put my finger on it completely, but it's not intellectual history. See, that's, that's historiography. That's trying, Heidegger would say, to get clear what these words mean uh, in terms of some kind of definitions that we can sort of make uh, on the basis of the combination of what they wrote down and what we believe, something like that. That's historiography. We want it. But Heidegger thinks we shouldn't be reading our intellectual, our concepts back into them, and we should try to find out what their words mean by trying to understand how they, uh, how they were attuned to things. There's in a, on page three, he has a lot of typical Heidegger words, which I never mentioned, but which is important. That he's interested in, the, I don't think I read this, did I? In the second paragraph, he wants to be, he wants to attune his questioning to the basic disposition. You're going to hear a lot more about that. That turns out to be wonder. And put it more, we will allow this basic disposition, uh, a first resonance. That's all very Heidegger talk. So we should get in tune with or resonate with a certain basic experience, but that experience is a word Heidegger would like, a certain mood, you could say almost, that they had, and so forth. So it's pretty different than anybody that Heidegger. Okay, now let's see. Uh, oh, I was going to give another example, but I will just say it fast because, yeah. anyway, another one would be love. You don't go back and ask sort of what romantic love was for the Hebrews and for the, the Greeks. You, you, if you're a Heideggerian, you wouldn't be interested in anything as ontic as romantic love, but if you were, you, and you would, you, and doing history instead of historiography, you'd want to know how we ever got the notion of romantic love and how the, <coughs> the troubadours put it together out of uh, things from the Bible and, and other poetic things, and Dante uh, uh, articulated it, or reconfigured it, I don't know which, and made it possible for people to have romantic love, but you, and so. Again, you don't go back and, as if this thing was just something that we all, that people always understood or, or that we just discovered that they, they had it, they just didn't have a name for it. They didn't even have it, the Heidegger would say, and rightly, I'm sure. Okay, let's see now. 
the, oh, I see the quote I wanted where he's saying they, it doesn't mean the same as we shouldn't assume that things have the same meaning for them as they do for us now is on 33 the top it's certainly possible to consider the past from the viewpoints and according to the standards of the living present That's, well, that would be the wrong way to think about it uh, and then skipping to, uh, to histori- historiography means an exploration of the past from the perspective of the present you see that's tricky because we're trying to say Heidegger's doing that and right? what's the difference so Heidegger says we want to understand the past from our perspective in order to get help from it and see how it's uh, uh, governing us that's the good way this other way, understanding the past and the perspective of the present, is to read our standards, our distinctions, and so forth, uh, back into the past. A little, a little, the four lines from the bottom, conversely, the standards may be taken from the present and applied expressly, and so forth. That's the bad way to... That, well, that's historiography. I think he thinks it's not bad. When he's careful, he'll say it's correct, it's just not true. That means if they get something right... Uh, if they don't, well, sometimes they get something right, well, not when they're trying to talk about sexuality or romantic love, but <clears throat> they get the way the concepts were used and, and right, but it's just correctness, it's not, doesn't reveal anything. I mean, yeah. he, he says, we, even we here in this, uh, you know, these lectures do historiography, but in order to do history. Right, so that's good. one He's, tool that Right, and that's important because he wants to say, and people criticize Foucault sometimes for not getting the history right. Well, Foucault's trying to get the history right. He spends lots of time in the, or spent a lot of time in the archives of the Bibliothèque Nationale reading these old books. And Heidegger certainly wants to get the history right. When he, I think I told you this, when he said that for Homer, Aletheia didn't mean correspondence ever. <coughs> it meant revealing. And then another philo- philologist, Friedlander, said, no, look, here are passages in Homer where he, Homer means, uh, uses Aletheia to mean correctness. Then Heidegger said, uh-oh, and took it back because historiogra- his historiography was just wrong. So, of course, you want to get that right. And then you want to do something yeah. else. And it's similarly, you want to show how it's founded in history the same way you want to show how truth is correspondent. So statements that are true that's right you couldn't even do historiography except from uh, if you already had a certain understanding of being and were operating out of that understanding of being good good okay now I wanted to make one more point which is sort of more me than Heidegger maybe but this keeps coming up and people ask me about it and I have clear views about it I don't know if Heidegger has clear views about it or not but I think you should keep your eyes open because I I hope he does um he then uh we can, there, we can do two things. One is easy. We can look at what we take for granted, for instance, truth as correctness, and trace it back to its beginning and do a kind of what Foucault calls the genealogy of it and make it seem strange and make it seem not obvious and, and wonder why it was obvious to Aristotle. That, that's easy and interesting. But the other thing we want to do is find out what their understanding of being was what different world they were in than ours. And that's, and, and for instance, discover how could you, that, that what they really thought was that everything was welling up, or what they really thought was that uh, everything was poesis. Well, the way I've been telling it, you can see the way I, I think Heidegger has to do it. If there was nothing left of the practice, of, of Fuse's practices, if we had no experiences of things, anything whooshing up, we wouldn't know what it would be like, what we're talking about. So what you have to find, and poesis, I gave you the example already with the carpenter. If we didn't have any example of what it was to let something come forth and to help something come forth, as the carpenter lets the the chest come forth from uh, wood, we wouldn't know what the word poesis meant. So you have to start with some now marginal practices, obviously. I don't know what our marginal thesis practices are. What, What... Moods. What? What about moods. I guess you're right. Moods, of course. Moods come over us, and we don't bring them forth, and we can't deal with. We can't make them stop, and we and oh, good, good. And so now the next move is, if you want to understand a Fusus culture, say, is to try to fit. Then you're sort of. Then you have to be kind of creative. You have to try to figure out what it would be like if moods were very important in the culture. 
and were sort of the paradigm case of what it was to be. And that everything else was understood like that. That's the mood. That's what only, I mean, there, there Heidegger, you just have to go with Heidegger and let him do his uh, special thing. And the same thing with poesis. I mean, first you have to, two things Heidegger has to do, I think. Discover some place in the culture where, our culture, where people are still letting things come forth. By the way, you'll hear a lot more about the uh, carpenter type thing when we read the question concerning technology, because Heidegger does the same story, but with respect to a chalice in there. And, uh, but, but anyway, you, you have to find the, the marginal practices and that's already a special talent and then you have to be able to think of what it would be like for a culture in which those marginal practices were central and paradigm and they saw them everywhere and were in Heidegger language very attuned to them and sensitive to them and resonated to them and uh, where the practices are important for us controlling, turning things into objects, getting them all ordered and organized, weren't important at all, they were just on the margin. You have to sort of, I never thought of putting it this way, sort of uh, unreconfigure, or I don't know how to even put it, you have to take back our reconfigurer, Descartes, and get back to their world as their reconfigurer set it up. That's what I think is interesting. Now, a Kuhnian uh, parallel is interesting again. I mean, as I keep saying, you've got to read Kuhn. Kuhn comes nearest to this when he tells you that when you do the history of science, there's an article about it. If, I could, if enough people are, tell me they're interested, I'll put it on the reserve. But Kuhn says, if you want to understand the science of Aristotle, the way you do it is, it's his book, what, Herman, Philip? Essential Tensions, it's called. And it's the introduction to Essential Tensions. But anyway, he says, if you want to understand the, the, the world of Aristotle, what you have to do is pay attention to the weird things he says that don't seem to make any sense, that are anomalies, not now the kind of anomalies scientists find, but the kind of anomalies that you're sensitive as a historian you could find. And he gives an example. Aristotle says, it gives among his list of, of, of motions, blushing. Now, it, why would anybody say that blushing is a form of motion? Well, Kuhn thinks it's, it's a clue that for Aristotle, the word that we normally translate motion really means something closer to change. And when you see that, you see a lot of the weird things that Aristotle says about, what, what, what is it, kinesis maybe? Uh, kinesis, I suppose. Uh, uh, aren't what we think they are, because they're not, a, or maybe an air No, kinesis, I suppose. But they're not what we mean by motion. Uh, so... So what you do is you discover, this is what Kuhn says, I'm, I'm telling you Kuhn, but it sounds certainly like this kind of retro, ah, I got a new phrase, it's retro reconfiguring. <laughs> okay, what this retro reconfiguring is, Kuhn says you find these places that seem completely weird, and then you think about them and you discover that they could turn out to be really central examples and the most intelligible, let alone, not the least intelligible, then you know that you're getting somewhere with understanding this other world. He's got another whole article for those that Volta seems to have drawn all the voltaic cells that he discovered wrong, got the positives and negatives wrong in some way, and he has diagrams of it. Now, why would Volta get it backwards? And it's a big, interesting puzzle. The time he's done, he's showing you that Volta's understanding of electricity was very different than ours, and they can't read ours back into them. So anyway, that's... And we're going to see it, maybe. I haven't reread. I'm just about to read for the third time in the hopes that I will now understand it and be able to lecture on it. The part on uh, these Grunt the Finnish Kaizen, these... Uh, what is, he, what is the translation? Basic dispositions? Basic dispositions. And it looks like he's going to show us that wonder is the Greek. I mean, my guess is going to be that we still experience wonder sometimes. But he's going to try to show us what it would be, but not very often. We've got all kinds of other emotions that are much more dominant for us than wonder, which he goes through a lot of them. Awe, respect. And, uh, and so forth. But anyway, he's going to try to get, a, get inside a culture in which wonder is the most dominant, the most important, the most pervasive, and most paradigm emotion, and take and so flip it, again, retro-reconfigure it, flip it from some margin in us to the center, and say, aha, now that's what it was like to be a Greek, uh, a, a, pre, a, a, 
pre up, up through Plato Greek. I mean, they've lost it by the time Aristotle comes along. Uh, okay, that's more on. I said I was going to go back over things. Good. I hope. Is that all right now? Because we're never going to go back to historiography and history again. I, I, only because we've got to go forward. Okay, now let's see. Uh, okay, then there's this whole story about the essence of the house. The, I mean, I don't think it's all that important to get for this book, or maybe even for this course, I'm not sure about that, to get clear what these weird things Heidegger's saying about the essence of the house. But it certainly is important for understanding Heidegger, and it gives you a kind of little insight into being in time and the phenomena that he's got, if, if we get it right. I was telling you something about it, but I think I can be clearer because I was quizzed for an hour by one of the students. Uh, remember I said there's a kind of familiarity you have with a house, Heidegger says, in, which, in terms of which you can find your way around in the house. And, and I said, and it's just like Wittgenstein who says you've got a, a kind of familiarity with the world and you could, that's how you find your way around in the world. Heidegger says exactly the same thing in being in time. The, what I didn't say clearly enough is that this familiarity isn't some model you have in the mind or a schema or a belief system or the rules for the house or, the, or the, something like that. It's nothing cognitive. It's nothing in the mind. I'm going to try to show you, I mean, what I discovered in this conversation was what a natural tendency one has to be a Cartesian and how Heidegger is trying to say something un-Cartesian. The familiarity with the house is not any beliefs you have. Now that means, for instance, that whatever familiarity gets you to be able to use the doorknob and go through the door and then walk down the corridor and go up the stairs is not the belief that to get out the door you turn the doorknob the, and the belief that there's a corridor outside and the belief that you get to the second floor by going up the stairs, there's no beliefs at all. That's the first thing. Well, then what is it? Well, the second guess would be, and I tried this, but it's too Cartesian in the end, but it would be a Merleau-Ponty-like move that says, no, it's not in the mind. It's something in the body. It's not expectations. It's anticipation. That is, let's use a Wittgenstein example. Wittgenstein says, uh, if you suddenly opened the door and found that there was a gaping hole out there, you would be starving. And you might say, I believe the floor was going to continue on the other side of the door. But of course, that's not a good phenomenological description. You didn't believe it at all. The next thing to say, well, I was just set to walk out that way. My, my body was all taking it for granted that there was a, a floor out there. That's much closer. But I think if you really start asking, yeah, but what does it mean to say that you've got this body set and that it's in your body, these anticipations? There's no phenomena you've got to go with it, I think Heidegger would say. Uh, sometimes you do, but usually what, all you can say is that uh, you're very startled when, it, it, when you find out, when you were just about to go out the door and you find this chasm. Yeah, please. Can you explain a little more what you mean by the distinction between expectations and Oh, oh, good, okay. Uh, by an expectation, I mean something mental. I mean, th these words don't have this strict meaning. We have to give it to them. I'm using John Searle's story that expectations are uh, intentional states and they've got conditions of satisfaction. That is, if you have an expectation, you've got to know what you expect. So before you, so you already know that you expect the floor to be there. Anticipation is a Dagfin Philistal term. I mean, he's a professor at Stanford that I've taken over which is like the Merleau-Ponty thing. It means that somehow I'm, I'm set to go out, I'm anticipating in my behavior uh, a floor. Uh, now, I think Heidegger wouldn't like that either. Oh, by the way, there's another version, just parenthetic. Oh, wait, I'll come back to it. I think Heidegger would just say, no, all you can say is that uh, generally you cope successfully with the house once you get familiar with it, which is, of course requires a lot of living in it and walking around in it and crawling around in it and whatever. Uh, once you do, you cope with it. But to say that you cope with it, and this is the tricky move, because something is present in your mind, namely a belief that causes you or enables you to do it. Or something is present in your body, namely a body set that enables you to do it. Or, I was going to throw in Searle because I mentioned it. Remember he says that those of you who heard him about the background, the background is in the brain. So finally, so are some things present in the brain that enables you to do it? Heidegger would say, if you just stick to the phenomena, he has a funny word for it. He would say, you just pervade the house. 
once you're familiar with the house, your sense of the house, so to speak, is all over the house and goes sort of ahead of you and enables you to cope with the house. It's not that he wants to sort of mystify anything. He just wants to say that this is a kind of basic phenomena and it doesn't help any to make up something else to explain it. That's all going on in this talk about the house, I think. Yeah. The concept of memory, would that be ah, okay. Well, it's not a memory because that's too intentional again. It isn't that you remember specifically that last time you went out, the, or the last thousand times you went out the door, there was a floor, and therefore you're surprised. It's true that if it weren't for past experiences, you wouldn't be surprised when you went out the door. But, and therefore, the, there's a sedimentation or something that passes with you. You're a, you're a being that doesn't just exist in the present, but is spread out in time, I would say. But to say, as Husserl said, but it's a memory that's present in you right now, that really explains that, that's just another one of these moves that we're used to in Descartes. We've got to find, since Descartes, something present in us as a subject, whatever we understand as a subject, a mind, a body, a brain, whatever, so that will explain, which is intelligible somehow in itself, and explains this house experience. And I think what Heidegger wants to say is there's a really interesting house experience here, and we can give it a name, which pervades the house or familiarity, but we can't find something else in terms of which to explain it. And memory is just another one. Uh, yes? Uh, the notion of the distance of house in Heidegger, uh, this is a little bit complicated. If we take the notion of distance as distance coming into being, then uh, I have a little bit of doubt regarding that. How can we really have a sense of Totality. Well, totality. he's not interested in the referential totality here, but if he were, I, mean, I don't know, I want to say that's a being in time question, but what, why it's called the, the essence of the house, remember, is because it's uh, a priori, that is, it, one, you've got to have it before you can experience any of the parts of the house, and you've got it always already, but of course you haven't got it always already, you didn't have it when you were a baby, but when you're a, a grown-up coping with the world, you cope with any particular aspect of the of something in terms of some general I don't think understanding is too intellectual maybe general familiarity that you have with that thing when, and that familiarity is your familiarity with remember the other important phrase with, with what it is these are the why it's called the essence of it so you know beforehand in some sense of no which is the special weird sense uh, what it is in this familiarity sense, uh, and he's going to make essence mean that, where essence means uh, w w this is not so much the coming into being as the maintaining itself aspect of it. The essence is uh, what, what has to be going on for you to be able to be coping with the house, besides your coping, and what has to already be there going on before you can cope. That's that's why this is an essence. Yeah. Um, are your memories of the house incorporated with your familiarity of it? Yes. You you've got memories and those are this intentional stuff and you can remember various times you've walked out the door. But it's not but that's been transformed. Incorporated would be a Merleau Ponty thing for Heidegger if it's taken up by Dasein as part of its world and but and they're no longer there as memories. I think that's clearly right. I mean, that once upon their time there were past experiences, and even there are memories. Sorry, I didn't think there aren't any memories. But this familiarity, this background coping ability, isn't something you can make up out of these memories. It's more basic than that, and, and for Heidegger, yeah. I was going to comment that memory doesn't have to be intentional. You can have things and experiences in the past that affect Okay, well, if you, if you mean by memory that the past, that you are bringing your past along with you to talk like Heidegger and have to, that's fine. As soon as you want to say that it's some kind of special traces in the 
brain or that is some special thing in, in, in Husserl that's something in inner time consciousness and stuff. You're saying more than you have a right to say, I would say. But of course there's a way that your past is... Notice it's this business like in the culture. The way the past comes along and runs ahead of the culture without having to be sort of written down or remembered in any explicit way. So your past experience in the house runs ahead of you. That's this a priori stuff and guides the way you deal with the house without you having to sort of record it in your memory. Yeah. So um, many of these are confused about it, but it seems as if it's pervading, is it going on in the brain? And it seems like you also want to say it's not going on in the not, I'm not getting it. No, no, no. It, I want to say it, something is going on in the brain, by the way. There's nothing supposed to be sort of. Uh, uh, that would be Cartesian if you thought that you know the brain didn't have anything physical in it and didn't didn't cause this in some way. Something's going on in the brain, which is the causal basis of this. I don't think Heidegger would mind. I'm not sure. At least I'm so perfectly happy with that. But but there's no way to map. And Wittgenstein is clear about this too. These events in the brain onto this other thing. There's some, some whole thing going on in the brain, which is a physical kind of thing. And then there is this pervading phenomena, and uh, only in this most general way, everything that's in the phenomenon in the world wouldn't happen if it weren't for the brain, is all you can say about it, I think. And Davidson also has this view. You can't map types of things in the, in the world of, the, of, the, of every day onto types of things in the brain, like these neurons firing this many times. But it is in Dasein of course, but Dasein isn't a kind of container in which there are... Dasein is a verb. It's in Daseining, as I say in the other course, in Daseining you are constantly uh, in, enacting your familiarity with the world, finding your way about in the world, on the basis of the familiarity, which is always coming out of the past and going ahead of you in the future. Uh, that's the picture. I, I don't want to spend any more time on it. It's just it's something that I do like from Heidegger, and he's doing it. But we don't need it all that much. What, what I do want to say something more about is Plato on the essence of the house. <clears throat> Let me just skim where I am, because I want to see that I've said what I wanted to say. Uh, we're, we're around page 56 now. We just talked about this. I've already talked about 56, so I wasn't going to read it again. But this is all about, all we're doing there is talking about that page. Uh, now, uh, let's see. This is talking about what is, in a funny way, cited in advance in terms of which we see every aspect of the thing, where cited doesn't mean anything like uh, seeing, it just means you are constantly taking account of it somehow. Uh, All on page 56. In a way, I want to say one more thing, just I don't know if it's any help, but just as I keep saying with the clearing withdraws and lets you only you'll deal with things in the clearing, this is like a little mini clearing for the house. I mean, your familiarity with the house is something you don't pay attention to, don't remember, don't think about, don't need to do any of that. In fact, that would only get in the way. It's just withdraws and then you are able to cope with the specific features of the house. Now, what happens with Plato? Well, he makes, uh, as Heidegger says at the bottom of um, 58, yes, he makes a disastrous but philosophical move, but it's not so clear at all why it's disastrous, because Heidegger does so much work to get inside of it and see how right it is. And... Uh, he's, and because and he, he ends up making Plato hold a view very similar to the one he held. Uh, I tried to get the difference sorted out on the bottom of 58 and the top of 59 before, but I don't think there is supposed to be any difference. I mean, when, when, when this thing that's cited in advance isn't supposed to be something that's seen in the normal sort of way, Heidegger has a term, umsicht, which is, has sight in it, which is his name 
for this background familiarity. And he thinks it's a funny, it's a kind of sight, but not the kind of sight that you observe anything, he says. And I think he thinks that Plato has this too. Uh, and he thinks that that's got to do with the essence. That's not yet the, 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 the wrong move. In fact, I'm not more and more... I'm more and more convinced that in this book he's trying to make Plato as right as he possibly can and he's got even further pro Heidegger things to say about Plato. In the end, there's something, as I said last time, about Plato wanting to get things too much present. The, the, but it, that doesn't get emphasized. Yes, John. Okay. Uh, well, well, I'm correct. Yeah, what did I write? Well, it's, I, how do you spell it? You, you know. U.M. Oh, I see what I did. Okay. You wrote in sight. <laughs> I see. Um, see, this is the around, and this is sight. It gets translated circumspection. Not that that helps. But that's literally what it says. Okay. Now, let me go on to what I discovered. Oh, John, go ahead. I will ask this question. So, last time you were trying to argue that, that his presentation of yeah I'll tell you what I think now this time I reread it there's something disastrously wrong all right about Plato he says that in so many words but you have to figure it out for yourselves too and we can talk about it and come to office hours and talk about it I mean I'm not sure there's anything wrong with Plato's a view about the ideas when Heidegger gets done explaining what an idea is. But what's wrong is that Plato makes this thing as I talked about last time, this move where he doesn't understand the clearing. Of, 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 or let's put it this way, he doesn't understand the clearing as the style or the, or the understanding of being that lets everything show up. He doesn't, because nobody in Greece understood that. All Plato seems to understand, but he gives him a lot of credit, is thesis, namely a certain way that things show up. We'll get to that. I mean, let, let, me, let me see, because I'm amazed. Maybe I'm hallucinating. This time through, I couldn't believe how much, how far he went in taking over Plato and giving a whole new reading of, ide of the ideas. And of course, something that is so against the way we've been taught it in all courses. Um, now, let's see what I want to say here. So the idea turns out to be something like, he says at the top of 61, the dominant look. And that sounds now wrong. And that's what I was talking about last time. And he says, uh, that, and this is the, the last paragraph where it sounds wrong. The the, Greek, the last paragraph on 61 of that section, that is. The reason the Greeks understand essence as, uh, as whatness is that they, in, in general, understand the being of being, uh, thesis, uh, is that what it is? Uzia. That's Uzia, yeah. isn't it? Uzia, as what is constant and in its constant is always present. And its present shows itself as self-showing, offers its look, in short, as look, as idea. Now, that sounds pretty wrong-headed. Only on the basis of this understanding of being as constant self-opening and self-showing presence, and that's thesis, all right, is the interpretation of the beingness of beings, hence of Uzia and idea possible. Well, that is a hard paragraph, and I don't think one can understand what it's all about until you get to productive seeing. So we have to go to productive seeing. And when you get to productive seeing, it looks like it's going to turn out to be okay to believe in the self-showing presence uh, as the uh, let me remember, remember what we're trying to find out is something that makes truth as correspondence possible and it turns out Plato's name for that is idea as essence because let me just give you the feel for this because even in the house story the once you have this general familiarity with the house, then you can say true things about it if you want to. The doorknobs are the way to get doors open, and on the other side of doors are floors and so forth. You can make all the correspondence claims you want, but always on the background, in the horizon of 
uh, this general familiarity with houses. So it turns out that the house story is giving you some kind of story about something which is more fundamental than correspondence. And the way he's setting up Plato's ideas, they do that. They explain, or, uh, well, he says they don't ground it. They, they show why. They show how correspondence is possible and how you can't ground correspondence in anything else. And yet, these ideas do something that makes it possible. And that something is truth, and that something is aletheia. And Plato gets more and more to look awfully much like what Heidegger wants. Remember what Heidegger wants is that the Greeks got it right about aletheia, but they didn't problematize it, reflect on it, understand the implications of their story about Aletheia. The, at the beginning of chapter 4 says, Aletheia, the title, Aletheia as experienced by the Greeks, though not interrogated by them. And remember, the, the most important thing I said last time, my real insight so far in learning this book, and I tell you, this is new, this book, and new to me. I mean, the basic idea, I'm sure, is that Aletheia as disclosing is the Greeks understood it as thesis, that is, as the way things come into uh, appearance they, and, and out of concealment, how they get, how they appear out of concealment, and that that was for the Greeks understood that that was the that they they took for granted that they didn't think about it, and on the basis of that they thought about correctness. Now, here's the important move. What they didn't understand was that thesis, namely coming out of concealment, is itself one name for the understanding of being. That is, it's the first of the names. It's the first understanding of being. Namely, that every... Remember, he says, he keeps saying, the being of beings, remember the S, is thesis. That thesis is the beingness of beings. Okay, now here's the thing you got to get clear. If, if you hear that as a kind of objective, that's not the right word, but I don't have a better one, a, 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 something that tells you about all beings everywhere, always, namely that they are welling up and uh, unconcealing and so forth, you already made a disastrous mistake. The Greeks didn't up to Plato, didn't make that disastrous mistake. They just didn't get it. They just, they just, I mean, they didn't think about it. They just, they just experienced Thusis as disclosing. Fine. As soon as, and, but if, and, and the right thing to do at that point would have been to see, uh, isn't it amazing? There are all kinds of ways that things can, can be, and, and we, of course, who would have ever been able to think it? Because they didn't even have a contrast class. But we think of beings as disclosing, as, as welling up. And that's one of the ways that you can do it. That's one of the styles. And of course, isn't it amazing? There could be other styles, namely creature, or object, and so forth. This is perhaps the most interesting style. We Greeks are pretty smart. But uh, it's just a style. All thesis names, let me say it in Heidegger jargon, is the being of being. And there will be other experiences of the being. Of, there can be and will be other experiences of the being of being named in other names by other reconfiguring thinkers. That would have been the right way to think about it. That's how Heidegger thinks about it. The, wait, the wrong way to think about it is the way Plato thinks about it, I think. Namely, this is how things are. This is the being of beings. All of them. They, they all are eidos. And whatever eidos means, and Heidegger goes out of his way to say it means something like welling up and disclosing. That's what it is to be, period. As soon as you think that, you're in metaphysics. You've lost the clearness. You've lost the fact that it's a style, one style among others, that things well up. And you, because, I'm trying to say it one more way, that that you experience things as unconcealing is only possible in a clearing. 
And the clearing is what I, is the really basic unconcealing that allows for various kinds of understandings of being. And that one is disastrously missed by Plato. And that sends our whole tradition into metaphysics. That's what I think is going on. Yeah. Could you say again what it is that the pre-Socratics got that we forgot? Okay, good. What the pre-Socratics got that we have lost is that the truth as correctness is made possible by and grounded in the fact that things are disclosed. Right? Okay. That's what they got. And it, it, but it was so obvious to, by the time he got to Aristotle, he didn't even know it anymore. But Plato understood it. They really understood that. That, that, that truth is correctness is grounded in the fact that things are show, welling up out of, unconce- out of concealment into unconcealment. What they didn't get, I, mean, I can say it always best in Heidegger's argument, is that that was just one way of thinking, uh, one way that one could have an understanding of being one way, one form of the being of beings, one story about beingness. And the interesting thing is there could have been in others, and what was more important, what, what they didn't get was that. And I keep wanting to say, and I, and I wish I had a better word than objective, but it's somehow thinking that that was the truth for all people, the, the truth, see all these words are taken over, but that they would gotten it right. No, that would be correct. I mean, I don't know how to say it, but they, they thought, well, this is how it is. Yes, yes. I mean, there's no way to say it. But they, they thought, well, that might be the best way. They thought, when they heard this is how it is, now let's go back. They thought they had something constant. Maybe that's where those bad words should be invoked. They thought they had discovered the being of being as something constant and always present. Maybe that's how to read that on 61. That is, they, you think that's right? I don't know, that they thought they discovered really how the being of beings was everywhere all the time? But I thought that was, I thought thinking of beings as always present was a particular way of thinking of how things always are. It seems like that's the particular um, understanding of beings, which every, and every, you know, and there are other particular Mm. understandings of beings, each of which Mm. thinks of itself as exclusive. Okay, that's what I said last time. And, 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 and I, well, but I'm glad you brought it up because I am now taking it back. But I'm maybe, but only, only very tentatively because I know that that's what Heidegger does think, that we are in the metaphysics of presence, that Plato is the big mistake of thinking of being as presence, and that every version of being that we've been through in this culture is some variation on presence. Uh, I'm not so sure that in this book, to my amazement, that's why it's like the, 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 the Prussians who thought that they had taken over the fort, this yes, wonderful right. story. I mean, I was so sure that this was uh, going to criticize Plato for the metaphysics of presence that I saw it all over. But the more you read it, the more it looks like. In this book, Plato hasn't made that mistake. That the, um, but I had a way of putting it. Okay, yes. That the real villain here is not whether it's present or not, in the in, in, in the sense of whether it's all clear in front of you or not. That that's something he later attributes to Plato as a big mistake. The question of the big mistake now is simply: Is it metaphysics or not? Did Plato think that this was really how it was all the time, everywhere? That's the disastrous mistake. And I made the other mistake, the other disastrous mistake. Um, but. Okay, so this is, I mean, this way of putting it makes it sound like Plato is um, precisely as bad off as every other metaphysician who's come along. That's right. Um, That's not right. worse and right. not better. Right. You know? But he's more disastrous than any he's because the he's the first. The first. Yeah. Because the pre-Socratics, they had a, they were, they did something wrong. Namely, they didn't think about this hard enough. That, what, 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 how was that phrase again that I was, that begins chapter four? They didn't interrogate, they didn't interrogate it. They just said, wow, this is how it is. But, yeah. Uh, he clearly doesn't think that's wrong. No, not he wrong. Okay. Oh, no, he no. They did something wrong. No, no, he says specifically not wrong. They, you could say that there's something they didn't do, and it has disastrous consequences. That's all well, you can Plato had disastrous consequences, not 
Well, no, well, now we might disagree, but I don't think it's a deep disagreement. It's because they didn't think it right and sort of do a preemptive strike against Plato, so to speak, that Plato could make the mistake he made. If they, had, if they hadn't failed to think about it, Plato couldn't have made the move he made. But Heidegger's very clear that it's not a failure. Okay, they didn't do it. If they had they done it, do okay, it. if they had done it, if they had interrogated it and got it clear the way Heidegger has, it would have been a preemptive strike. Plato couldn't have existed. Then Heidegger would have said they didn't do their job right if they had gotten it. Right. Well, no, I see. Well, in this funny way that because it turns out, out okay, that it, it, there's this w a weird story that, of course, <laughs> given the history of the West that we've got, they all had their destined job. And so to speak, the destined job of the pre-Socratics was not to think about this so that Plato would make this, quote, disastrous mistake. He does say it's a, it's a disastrous <laughs> mistake. Which starts our tradition, which is a terrific disastrous mistake, which leads up, if we're lucky, to Heidegger, who will fix it, and we'll all be better off than any human beings ever were. It's the structure of the fortunate fall from the Bible. I mean, the, the, if, would, did Adam and Eve make a mistake when they ate the fruit? Well, not exactly. We are going to be in paradise, thanks to them, because they made it, and then God fixed it, and now if we're all good Christians, we'll be better off than if we were in Eden, right? I mean, it's so, no? You don't think so? We'd be in paradise already. We wouldn't have to go back. Well, we'd be in a better, we're in a better paradise. It's, it is, well, it, if you believe in the fortunate fall. For Heidegger, this is a fortunate fall. Well, well, you yeah. also have to gain because of the contrast. If you're just stuck in Eden forever, you never realize how bad it could have been. But if you fall, and then you go to paradise, then, then you get the contrast. And we get it with Heidegger and falling to Plato. Maybe. I mean, I mean I, I'm not going to go so far, but I see what you're saying. I don't think Heidegger thinks that, to have a, that we should have suffered through technology and all the bad things that happened so that we could finally say, wow, thanks to Heidegger and destiny, we got out of it. I don't know. And I see a hand up over here. Yeah. yeah just a, that just sounds pretty good game. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. It's Hegelian, except that there's no. lots that's not Hegelian in it. Let's say, I mean, in Hegel, too, you've got to go through a lot of negative to come out with the really super positive. But in each stage in Hegel, you save the truth and you drop the mistakes. Heidegger's upside down Hegel. At each stage, you get worse. What about the destiny part? Well, the destiny part is the Hegel, Hegel part, right. Means it looks like by getting worse at each stage, you finally get, there are two big differences. One, these leaps aren't yeah. mediated. Yeah. Right. And secondly, you get, and that's why it's more Christian even than Hegel. You get better by getting worse mm -hmm. in a way that you don't, Hegel's so enlightened that he's lost that Christian insight that you can only, Dante's insight that you have to go to the bottom of the inferno before you can go to paradise. But Heidegger's got a feel for that, so that I think. Uh, we, I gotta go on. Uh, but, uh, this is, I, didn't, I mean, I do think this is the very important thing to be thinking about, but I want to show you where, how far, because I don't want to come back to this, how far he goes in making uh, Plato right. Uh, that is, making Plato the discoverer of half right, making him the discoverer of unconcealment as the, that which, quotes, grounds correctness. Okay, let me try to do it. Um, it starts when he says that it's a, a, that what play, that the idea is an exemplar <clears throat> on page 75. Uh, he talks about at the very middle the what of something, which is the essence, of course. What an individual being, a table is, its look, its form, its structure is not gleaned from already present at hand individual tables, but the reverse. These individual tables can be fabricated and be present at hand, ready-made, only if, insofar as they're produced following the exemplar of something like a table in general. Now, my clue is that if he's going to make the ideas like many works of art. And I think I can show that. I mean, remember the work of art is an exemplar that shows up to the whole culture what it's up to. And when it does, it does it by not copying anything, nor by inventing anything, but by focusing something that's already there and making it shine and making it clear and making it a paradigm. 
I believe that's what he's going to say the ideas do. I mean, I, I, I'm amazed. I mean, I, I, mean, I was so set to see something else, but now I'm completely stunned. And maybe I'll have to take this back. But on 76, he's talking about it. Uh, about 15 lines down. This bringing into view, this is Plato now, is a peculiar seeing. That's sure. This seeing does not see by staring at what is present at hand or otherwise and so forth, but instead is the seeing, as this seeing first brings before itself that which is to be seen. It is a seeing that draws something forth. And that's, that's the thesis story. Not a mere looking at, well, no, that's the poesis, sorry. That's poesis draws something forth, not a mere looking at what is standing about, waiting, and so forth. It is not a mere noticing of something unheeded. The seeing of the look that is called the idea is a seeing which draws forth, a seeing which in the very act of seeing compels what is seen before itself. And that all sounds a little bad in, if, you, if you know more late Heidegger, but I don't think it's meant to be bad here, but I'm not sure. Therefore, we call the seeing which first brings forth into visibility that which is to be seen and produces it before itself productive seeing. I mean, as, as I mean, I'm experimenting with the view, and so you'll be go along with me. The productive seeing is like the way that the artist creates the artwork, and what it because what the artist does is bring something forth, which is not a copy and not uh, an invention. He certainly keeps telling us that about the the essence on 83. Can I ask yeah. a question first before? Um, yeah. And you can put this off until later. Um, can you say a little bit about the, what the before itself means here? In this well, I think it just brings it out into itself. the open, is all okay. I understand. Okay. okay. Brings it out before itself and everybody else uh, what it is to be a chair or a house or anything. Okay, on page 83, uh, the, the first full paragraph. The essence, consequently, the essence and the determination of the essence do not admit any foundation of the kind that we find in the field of factual knowledge. The essence of something is not at all discovered like a fact. On the contrary, it must be brought forth, since it is not directly present in the sphere of immediate representing, can't be, and intending, to bring forth as a kind of making. And so there resides in all grasping and positing of the essence something creative. Well, that's getting <coughs> interesting. Sounding like the work of art, not representation, but it's not pure creation either. He's very, he talks about that on 77. Uh, somewhere. Let's see what I've got here. Uh, okay, the top paragraph. For the Greek, the essence is the positing of the essence within a, of the stand within a peculiar twilight. The essence is not manufactured, but it's also not simply encountered. Well, at least that's true of the work of art too. I mean, maybe I'm falling for some similarity that isn't important. Like a thing, or instead it is brought forth in a productive seeing, out of invisibility, into the visible, out of what is unthought, into what is henceforth to be thought. Well, he could say all that about the work of art. That's sure. And I'm, so I'm wondering. And then <clears throat> the next paragraph. Uh, then what about the foundation of the grasping of the essence? What is the actual focus, which is the focus of our question? If this grasping is a productive seeing, a bringing forth, it cannot conform itself to something already present in order to glean information. It's the productive seeing that brings forth the essence in the first place. <coughs> and uh, in productive seeing, conformity to something pre-given is not possible because the productive seeing first brings about the pre-givenness and all that sort of talk. The productive seeing, I'm skipping into the next paragraph, of the essence is not founded, but it is grounded. That is accomplished in such a way that it is that it's bringing itself upon the ground which it itself lays. That grounding talk, of course, also reminds you of the end of the origin of the work of art, and I wonder. So, and it's, uh, let's see now, it, it focuses a previous rough way of dealing with something, I think, and that's what I've been saying. That's what it seems to do, because it's something, what could it be? It does something with something that's already there. It doesn't invent anything, but it doesn't represent anything it's a, and it's a way of seeing which is adding something important. It's finding the paradigm case. And by finding the paradigm case, sort of lighting up and making most intelligible something that was going on in an obscure way already. That's my current gizmo. Uh, and it's like, and this is amazing, and I wish we'd talked already about language, because it's like original naming, it turns out, it says on 72. When he's asking this question about how could something both be a kind of 
agreement with something and yet the thing isn't there yet to agree with. He says at the end of the paragraph, perhaps genuine naming and saying constitute an original positing of the essence, although certainly not by means of agreement and convention, but through denominating speech which provides the standard. Well, I know what he's talking about there. And you can give funny examples, which I was going to wait till we got to the language part. I mean, if you decide, if, if you name what the people in Marin do as being laid back, then it isn't as if they're already laid back and you've just finally represented that. But it isn't as if you invented it whole cloth and nobody would go around and take it up and go around and say, yeah, that's what they are, laid back. But now you say it, they'll be more laid back because they understand what they are and they'll... They'll do like one of them did it from my house, call up and tell the kids to turn on the hot tub because they're coming home now, and, uh, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, I mean, they, they, and the same thing, I suppose, for swooning, which is another example like that. I mean, there, there weren't any swoons, but people didn't just invent them out of whole cloth. I mean, obviously, there was something people recognized and people were doing, but once they got clear about wh- who swooned and when, then a lot of women swooned in a lot of swoonable situations. So that's, that's the function of original naming. Something that, that you name catches on and becomes a way to talk about something. And then that something gets clearly in focus. And then you can make uh, cor- correct claims about it. You can say things like, uh, so-and-so always swoons at parties or 99% of the people in Marin are laid back, and all such, and because you, but you have to ground, of course, you can't make those correct statements until you have names swooning and laid back into existence. And insofar as then people go on swooning and being laid back and all that, then they're all like preservers. Uh, just as anybody who sort of acts within the light of the work of art helps preserve the work of art. And... Uh, and this is what he says at the bottom of 78. I'm trying to make sense of all these strange things. The knowledge of the essence must be accomplished anew by each one who is to share it. It must genuinely be co-accomplished. Mm-hmm. So everybody who names uh, laid back and who thinks they're laid back or that other people are laid back is helping sort of sharpen up and make this an exemplary thing. And uh, just like everybody who, I mean, Luther may be an articulator, but every Lutheran who goes to church on Sunday is part of the preserving business uh, of the work of art that Luther is, or is, oh, well, he's not a work of art, the articulation. So let me, I still have a few more minutes. It's, um, I may have to take all this back again, but at least I've got a view. And I was so, having a, such a hard time. It, it's, I'm, I'm demonstrating it, for better or for worse, the Kuhnian thing. Take the, take the sentences that are most weird and make, build your interpretation around them. And then, you're, then if you're lucky, you've got something right. Okay, on page 86. Here's where I say this is really like a work of art. And I, 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 the second paragraph. The grasping of the essence is a bringing forth, specifically in the Greek sense of bringing forth and fetching forth, whence from concealment wither into unconcealment in order to posit it as the unconcealed to see the essence in productive well let's stop with that I mean so now it turns out you're getting you should begin to get a a, a fees on I was I mean, your, your hair starts started starting to stand on end after all all of this discussion started with trying to understand what the word aletheia meant when it when it was applied to works of art back in the origin of the work of art Works of art are truth setting itself to work. And what is truth? Truth is unconcealing. And then we're going to go find out about correctness, and behind correctness we're going to get essence, and behind essence we're going to get ideas, and lo and behold, ideas are unconcealing. And the whole thing, I think, sort of goes full circle. That's what's happening here. So uh, to see the essence in productive seeing means to posit the unconcealedness of beings. Don't forget Something, something is not being understood by, by Plato and the essence people, and it's that little S that tells us so. But it's still, they've got it all right, except, of course, they don't see it as uh, itself a kind of, the, the, well, to put it very paradoxically, the thinking of the essence as unconcealing is itself has to be unconcealed. That's the step back that Heidegger's made. But otherwise, they're doing fine. So to posit the unconcealed 
of beings to posit being in their unconcealedness, to take them up into the naming word, by the way, notice that. Uh, in that way, establish them, notice that, establishing truth, and thereby let them stand in the visibility of an essential cognition. Wait, I'll read one more paragraph, then you can talk to us. The un, because here's the hair, you know, where, you're, where the shoe drops. The unconcealment is in Greek, uh, uh, to aletheis or something, and unconcealedness is aletheia. For ages, this has been translated as the so and so. Now, the truth of the grasping of essence is thought in the Greek manner, the unconcealedness of the whatness of beings, unconcealedness and so forth and so forth, is platonic eidos. It looks like he's just shown that eidos is sort of work of art writ small. I, what do you think, Liz? Well, um, it sounds, it's starting to sound so much like Heidegger, I can't hear Plato so much. Well, right? oh, absolutely. So, we, Plato um, just disappeared as far as I can see. So, but it, it's not me that's doing this. I mean, yeah, Heidegger's no, I agree, running over Plato agree. with a steamroller here. Um, yeah. It's the sort of capital letterness of the ideas that's disappeared. Um, and I guess one question I have about this. Um, well, the ideas are paradigms, of course. That's why they're capital Yeah, letters. but it's the heavy dutiness of, I mean, paradigms are, that much sounds more from a in a way. Sort okay, of, well, you know, paradigm, I mean, are you just saying he hasn't got Plato right, or are, what are you saying? Well, I've lost you. Uh, it seems like we haven't set up the, I don't, I, I, with that, with not being right about Plato, it sounds like we not have enough, we don't have enough disaster. Um, we don't have enough disaster coming. Oh, well, the disaster um, is very subtle. We'll have to so put him, think about that. Okay, so I want to ask about one word in the previous okay. paragraph, okay. which is positing the unconcealed ah. being. Unconcealed okay, being. whereas deposit beings in their unconcealedness. Wow, that's interesting. And positive is twice. And that sounds to me like that's exactly the kind of word that's... Bad, um, could be that, bad. That is double-edged and definitely has this worry... Let's look at the... It. That's this hypothesis, isn't it? That's the translation of the thesis in the hypothesis. Where the, but remember, wow, here's a trump card. Thesis is also applied to the origin of the work, in the origin of the work of art, to the setting up of the work. The work is positive. Only there it's translated thesis. If that's the same word that's translated thesis in the origin, then this is on my side. If it isn't, it's on your side. Yeah. No, no, the which, I, is what, which is what which is what essay yeah, yeah. tells that's, us. And then I get it. But, that, but no, but that's right. But that isn't it. No, you, you're right. You did. You got it, but you didn't get it. I think yeah, but because I want to say it's more than that. That <coughs> Plato is a thinker, and he does name a, an understanding of being when he says ideas. But more important, his understanding of ideas is a mini work of art, namely a paradigm in the light of which. We understand, uh, and beforehand, we understand the whatever it is. It's a paradigm of. So the house paradigm is a mini work of art because the, you, it's somehow a a sense of the m perfect work of how uh, how the, the 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 paradigm house in terms of which we find our way around in any house. He even says, let me just give you in the light of it. Just I don't know how important that is, but I did notice that when he's talking about how we relate to things in terms of the house. That was, I was beginning to be suspicious. It was, now I have to find it, wait a minute. Where was this early stuff, 50, 55? The bottom of 56, right. Only in the light of what is seen in advance and constantly, yet not explicitly observed, the house can we experience this door and so forth. Yeah. But, but doesn't the work being of the work fall out of this? You drop out, you mean disappear. Yeah, I mean. The work being, well. You mean who made it? Is that well, what you mean? Well, calling it an artwork, I, I mean, as an analogy, I can understand. Okay. It's really being serious. Yeah. No, okay. No, it has the structure of it, but it's not a thing, of the essence. To, but it's a paradigm, but it's a funny kind of paradigm. It's a, it's a kind of, to say it would be mental would be very bad, the retroactive bad reading. Uh, it's, but it's not a earthy thingy thing, but... It's as thingy as language. The idea that the end of the origin of the work of art uses language as an example, and this uses language as an example, seems to me to be the naming, and not just any old language, but the sort of the naming power of language to name things into being. That, that turned out to be, we haven't done it 
we, I'm getting ahead of the story, but I have to now, the basic way truth sets itself to work. And now it looks like Plato is on to the basic way, in many ways, truth sets itself to work every time we name a house or a swoon or, a, or anything. Now, uh, well, I have another minute and I saw another hand. Yes? He has a couple of other examples also, like the thinker, the person building a state, and so on. Um, okay. So we, we could sort of think about what is similar <coughs> and what is not similar. Okay. Well, this is so scaled down, and, and maybe that's what John is worrying about too. I mean, remember, the work of art sets up the style for the whole culture, and those thinkers and, and, and statesmen and artists do. All we've got here is that uh, somebody, or somehow, the, the language, uh, or, uh, or just, I don't know what, gets us able to uh, have paradigms of simple things like houses and swoons, and makes it possible for us thereby to encounter them, and uh, sharpens up their intelligibility, and it isn't the job of an artist or a thinker, because it's not a big deal job, like getting the style of the culture, and it isn't really anybody's job. In late, you know, Heidegger will say, you don't know maybe, but he says language speaks. I mean, in the end, it's going to be just uh, the way language works. And but Plato didn't think of it as linguistic, of course. That's a much, much later thing. In Plato, it's just the way I don't know things are that they are, are paradigms, and he calls them ideas, and they don't represent, and they don't invent and they tell you what something is prior to what you're encountering, making it possible for you to encounter any particular thing and make correct statements about it. And I don't mean to say, I mean, it's, it's only, and maybe that's what John is saying, a mini work of art in the sense that it is structurally isomorphic with it. But he's given, he's given ideas a similar but scaled down job, way scaled down, that he gave to truth setting itself to work. And he thinks that that's Plato's great discovery, that just as works of art were truth-setting itself to work on a big scale, undisclosing, Plato sees that every idea as a paradigm is truth-setting itself to work on a small scale. It's also a form of undisclosing. Un, uh, yeah, of disclosing, of disclosing. Uh, anyway, now you've got something to, ch uh, to challenge and to check against, and you can see whether you think this is right or not. Uh, I guess I should stop there. Uh, okay, good. Okay. <clears throat> so, we, let me go back to productive seeing for a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a kind, I mean, I, well, how we put this? It's certainly a kind of bringing forth, he says, on 76. Whenever I see bringing forth, I think of what he later will make clear, that that's, this notion of poesis that I use every once in a while. He's talking about it on 76 at the, th the fifth line. When we, speak, when we today speak of bringing forth, we think of the making or fabricating of an individual object. That's not what he's thinking about. But this is, that's too, remember I said, real bringing forth is what the old carpenters did. They didn't just make, bang together a, a chest. They let the wood bring it forth. We'll hear about this again. Uh, in, in very interesting in the, in the reader, in the Borgman part. He's found somebody to interview who is an old-fashioned carriage maker who really understands uh, poesis. Uh, the essence is brought forth, brought out from its previous obscurity and hiddenness. You see, that's the sort of form in the wood. Forth into what? Into the light. It's brought into view. And then you get here that this is a peculiar kind of seeing and it's not just a staring. It draws something forth. It doesn't just notice it, and uh, it puts it in front of you and makes it visible for you, and that's this air sehen uh, in German, this uh, way of letting something show up. Maybe that's what it really amounts to. It's because uh, it, uh, productive seeing isn't very illuminating <coughs> as a phrase or as a translation. Let's let's say that what he's talking about here is what lets or helps, I guess, not just lets, helps something show up for you. And what, how does it do that? Well, it produces an exemplar, and, and then you can see everything in the light of the exemplar, and his example is that you see 
uh, you can have an exemplary house, and then you see every, you know. And once you get this uh, sort of uh, exemplary paradigm house, then you can understand any particular house and any things in particular houses by seeing how they fit in and relate to the exemplary house. You see it in the light of it, as he puts it uh, back here. Uh, I, I already have a reference to this. Maybe I should just be patient and I will find it anyway. But I thought I would jump to it. Then I couldn't jump to it. It's Are you looking for the first in, house? In the light of. I'm, I'm looking for that phrase about the, where's the first house? Maybe it's back there. Maybe it's back there. Hmm, I'm wondering, do you see it there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's at the bottom of that page. When we enter a house and live in it, we constantly have house in sight, houseness. Uh, if this were not seen, we couldn't experience and enter the stairs and so forth. It doesn't actually... Like five lines from the bottom, I think. Oh yeah, okay, right. The essence is, is what something is, and we encounter what it is as that which we constantly have in sight. Where, no, where is in the light of? Only in the light of what is seen in advance and constantly, yet not explicitly observed. I've seen, I can't see that. One, two, three, four, five lines from the bottom. Of what? 56. Oh, no wonder I can't see it. I'm on 58. Okay, now I see it perfectly well. At the bottom of 56. Okay. And now, then I said, and this is where I wanted to both defend what I said and take back some, what I, uh, some misleading impression I seem to have left. I said it's like a mini work of art. And why did I say that? The house exemplar, the house idea. Why is it like a mini work of art? Well, it's the most perspicuous version of a house, paradigm house, and we act, that is, relate to other houses in the light of it, and that's, that all sounds exactly like the work of art. It shines and we relate to everything in the light of it, or the Kuhnian paradigm does, shines and everybody relates, does their science in the light of it. But, uh, and there, I even found new evidence for my view, which I want to state, because Liz challenged me in a very sensible way, particularly knowing more later Heidegger. She said, yeah, but this can't be like a work of art because the, he says about the idea on 77 that it's positive. And positive is a kind of code word in later, later Heidegger, later than this, for something that only moderns do. You'll see it in the, in the, origin of the, in the age of the world picture, where positing something means we willfully sort of give it a meaning. And it doesn't, and certainly that's not how the work of art is, because the work of art Liz was rightly thinking, is something that the creator is receptive to the meanings going on in the culture. He doesn't posit the work of art, one would think. But it turns out that, if you go back to the origin of the work of art, which I did, just to find out, he does use positing in a different way at this stage in his thinking. And the work of art is positive. On 61 of the origin of the work of art, he says, uh, I'll read a little, give you context. There must always be some being in the open, something that is in which the openness takes its stand and attains its constancy. In taking possession thus of the open, the openness holds open the open and sustains it. Setting and taking possession are everywhere drawn from the Greek sense of thesis, which means setting up in the unconcealed. Well, thesis in Greek, he translates as zetsen in German, not that this is important, except to get this straight, and and that gets translated as positive. So it turns out the creator posits the work of art, and therefore it's not surprising, and any sort of evidence for thinking of the uh, idea, the eidos, which Plato is saying that we this productive seeing, this is a kind of positive. So. It, 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 so the, it's the same word, zetsen, in, in, in both cases. And one more way that it's like a work of art, the, the idea, is it needs preservers. Remember, the work of art only works because people are in there uh, seeing things in that way and acting on the ways that it makes, acting in the ways that it makes sense to act, 
given the particular work of art. Well, you could see, of course, that th there'd be something similar. The house paradigm is sustained by the people who relate to the houses in the light of that paradigm. This is on the last paragraph of the section on 78. The knowledge of the essence, therefore, if it is to be shared, must itself be accomplished anew by the one who is to assume it. More precisely, it cannot be communicated in the sense of passing on of a proposition whose content is grasped without its foundation and its acquisition being accomplished again. The knowledge of the essence must be accomplished anew by each one who is to share it. Uh, it must genuinely be co-accomplished. That makes sense, because remember, you can't rationalize it. You can't state it in propositions. You can't pin it down and say, okay, this is what it is. You can only act in the name of it. The only thing you can do with a paradigm house is relate to houses in terms of it. You can't sort of, and remember this again for works of art, you can't summarize what it means and then get rid of the thing and then just use these rules or methods. It would be like have a house schema, cognitivist like, instead of it. There is, you can't replace the paradigm house with a house schema. And you can't replace the paradigm in Kuhn with a methodology. And therefore, you preserve it in acting in terms of it and seeing in terms of it. So far, those are all ways it's like a mini work of art. An idos is, the house thing is. But of course, and I, it was obvious to me, but I should have said it, there is very important ways, two very important ways, it's not like a work of art. Let's just see who, I mean, somebody say something. In what way would the Platonic idea, this sort of uh, paradigm you have, this kind of image of the, of the object in its most perspicuous, why isn't that like a work of art? Yeah. It has no it's what? It has no exactly. One point. It isn't a thing, which will mean importantly that it doesn't have any earth, which will mean that it's sort of all clear and all sort of uh, visible. But in general, it's just not a thing. And work of art is a thing, and it's made out of stuff, and it has earth. Okay, that's one of them. And what's the other? So obvious that you almost can't see it. What does a work of art do that the that the, the that the idea of a house can't do. That's important. That's important, but that's that's relative to the thing I'm trying to say. What does it do when it is working? Exactly. Good. You two have got it. So, you can't say, of course, that the image or the paradigm or the eidos of the house opens up a world. All it does is open up to this little mini, mini activity of dealing with houses. So in those two very important ways, it's not like a work of art. Um, and, okay. But the, both the other uh, idos and the work of art have the same way of being, which is physis. Both of them come forth, they emerge, and, uh, and, and thereby... Uh, I see, I'm, I, I'm seeing into something interesting that I hadn't realized. Hmm. They both preserve truth by disclosing. That's the thesis story is that uh, unconcealing takes place, to talk in this translation. Unconcealing takes place in the work of art, and unconcealing takes place when anything comes in to the world in, in this thesis sort of way, shows up. Thesis, remember, means emerging, showing up, uh, stabilizing, and so forth. They both have this coming in to the world and showing up. Um, um, but I see this deep difference, but I don't want to talk about it yet. What? Go ahead. Well, I don't know. Okay. Maybe but I need there's a way, I mean, don't all things, all beings? Yes. Yes, that's right. What's that's right. About no, no big deal. Right. They've all got this disclosing character because Thesis is 
the kind the, is the the understanding of being at, the, at this period in fifth century. So the works of art are understood in that way, and that and have that mode of being. And so are the ideas. Yes, I didn't mean that. But this so are everything. So are trees. So is everything. Yeah. Right. No, it's no big deal. This is right. They all come forth and emerge. But there's still something interesting and special that work of art and idos have in common in Athos's understanding being that not everything. Has well, yes, and let's talk about that. They both enable everything else to show up and emerge as something. The work of art enables everything to show up as uh, created or as uh, whatever. I mean, in this case, sort of a certain kind of circuit, or they enable everything else to show up as emerging. But because they focus the style of emerging, that is the work of art, temple. But even the house thing enables houses to show up as houses and doors to show up as doors and stairs to show up as stairs. So both of them are something like, not only do they show up, but they enable showing up. Is that what you have in mind? Right, yeah. Good. But then uh, why don't they set up little worlds? Uh-huh. Well, they, it's interesting. They do and they don't. And why is that? Uh, well, I mean, my clue is it's not a particular style of house that they are trying, that the house idea shows up. And what does that mean? It still lets things show up as doors and windows, and that lets things show up as something. Uh, but, uh, there's, see, there's two different as somethings in here. This has been around in the background for a while. I don't think I've ever said it. In being in time, which is what the house story is like. Uh, you let doors show up as doors, and uh, uh, stairs show up as stairs. It's, I'm just following Heidegger's example. But at this higher level, and that's what it does, but the work of art lets things show up as created, or lets things show up as objects, or lets things show up as bursting forth and emerging. And that, that as, the style as, is, not what, is what they don't do. Okay, and that's got to do with meaningful differences too, I think. I mean, whereas the style tells you the difference between saints and sinners, between mature and immature, between heroes and slaves, remember, it, it gives you uh, what it makes sense to do, and what it's bad to do. The, the, the house thing doesn't do that. It doesn't set up na guidelines for how people should live. And in that sense too, it's not a mini world. Okay, good. Yeah, of course. I just have a, a, a register a slight humor about the creator positing work of art. Uh, it's in that Zetson. And this notion that we have of setting the truth to work, that's the Zetson. But I don't think that's the same as positing the anyway. It's the same word as the it's positing okay. gets translated positing. You, are you disagreeing with the translation? Well, or I, you, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I, I don't have... It's always... Mind. Thesis but in Greek, he says, Heidegger. Yeah, you know, but the point is, translating this as positive. I mean, I think this is a bad thing. Now, if it's setting it to work, which is what he thinks that... that I think that's right. Yeah, I see then we saying. have to do something else with it, because... And I think he does may mean really positive in this case, in this one. Now, I think probably not, not even there is it really positive. In positive in the sense of placing before, in this strong sense of positive, we're not going to get till modernity. I th he says it's the same Greek word thesis, and he seems to think it has the same meaning. And the meaning is, I think it's good to say, setting to work of the house or of the work of art. Uh, he says that it's a thesis which, is li which gets related to hypothesis, which comes before... And remember, both the work of art and, and... Here's another similarity. Both the work and the house are a priori, but in the sense that they are full, but they come before all the stuff that they make show up. But then you're going to get to Hippocamenon, which is... That's right. Um, well, that's not good. well, I wonder. I was going to get to Hippocamenon. It's a hypothesis of what? Of the Hippocamenon, which underlies or grounds what goes on. We're getting the same sort of regress of ambiguity. But that's his substance. Again. Okay. Yeah, substance. It could be. But then, doesn't he think that Hippocamenon, I'd have to go back and look, 
had a non-Aristotelian meaning already as what underlies and grounds. Yeah, I'd have to look that up. Okay, so I don't okay. It did, well... But, but it, I wouldn't want to say that the Creator posits the truth of the work of art. No, I wouldn't no, either. okay. So okay, that's but, but that's the, the word. Just let's get clear. The same word, this, this Zedson, which gets translated positive, is, is what the, he says the Creator does this, Zedson. In, in the origin of the work of art. That's the thing. That's what I looked up in the German and was amazed to discover. So, and Zetson gets translated positive. So, I mean, I, I'll show you the, I'll you, tell you the page. You're going to ask for something greater positive. Yes, Zetson. I'll tell you the page. Which is it? 86. Of, of this. Yeah, but then I'll tell you about where it is in the German. Okay. 80, 86? Of what? Basically. Oh, no, oh, I want origin. He wants to know origin. about origin. I, Where it says the creator positive. Yeah, on page 61 of us, we hear about thesis. And in the German, on page 48 of Ursprung des Kunstwerks, we've got thesis, we've got setting and taking possession as setzen, which is the same word that gets in basic problems translated positive. That's what causes this problem. Okay, it's just, as I said, now this is Kinsberg Zetzen, not creator Pop or Zetzen. <coughs> well, now we have to look at the German. That's I mean, what I mean. Okay, I let's look at the Zetzen. Nobody has a German of Holzweg, we'll I'm sure. We'll look. We'll look. That would be, then I have to take back my taking back. Okay, <laughs> then we'll, we'll see. Uh, it would be nice. I hope Boris turns out to be right, because it makes me nervous that the same word and that's what Liz was saying. It shouldn't, he shouldn't say that the, the three things. He shouldn't equate the way the creator uh, sets into work a work of art, the way Plato sees our productive seeing, uh, enabling us to have these paradigms in which we then can make sense of every each thing, with the way mo in modernity the people have hypotheses and posit whole understandings of things out of their heads, so to speak. Those sound like very different activities. It would, it's a little unfortunate that he's only got one German word, it and maybe he doesn't. It also sounds bad that we have productive seeing, that we're producing this thing, as opposed to the, the thing itself, or the, 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 uh, the thing, uh, producing this for us. Yeah, well, it's supposed to well, it's supposed to be something that that's the uh, poesis component. It doesn't just emerge. If it weren't for the act, our oh, our activity, we wouldn't there wouldn't be these paradigms. And yet we things. don't produce it. Well, not out of our heads and not with our willpower, right? We bring it forth. That's right. We that's don't okay. produce it. Okay. No, we don't produce it. I see. So productive seeing is misleading. Oh, I think right. that's a terrible Yeah. Thing. Produce production. Just to be clear, I see why Forrest is worried about that. When you know the rules of the game, production is something that doesn't get understood till Aristotle. Aristotle is a big guy for production. Mm -hmm. And techne in Aristotle is the way you produce things. And pretty soon in Roman thinking, what you produce is just a finished work. I mean, here's p uh, the difference between the cabinet maker who lets gives the get, lets cut the the chest come forth out of the wood, and I said just sort of the the hat carpenter who just puts it together. But thinking of a different example, the, I think for the Romans, sort of the paradigm kind of thing is just a brick. I mean, you don't let the brick come forth out of the mud. You produce it. You put the form on the matter, and then there's a brick, and it just lies there, as Heidegger puts it, as a finished work. It, it's, and that's what production is, brick making. But so Forrest is right. The picture in Plato is of, of how these ideas are drawn forth by us is not a production, not bang. We put the form on the mud, and there's a brick. Good. Right. We agree. Yeah. I, that footnote, when they use the word productive seeing, is helpful. Um, I agree that production is a weighted word and it's bad, but they, they do mention that it's pro dupere from the Latin. Uh, lead out. Is to lead. Good. Pro is for, so to lead for. So Good. Think about it in those terms. It's okay. okay, and that's like producing a witness, as they say, yeah. where you don't sort of produce a witness the way you produce a chest or a brick. You, you somehow turn this person into a witness by the way you question them. There's 
Interesting, sociobiological. But, no, but not sociology Latin, on that. But what? going to Latin for five years is not the way to go. That's not what Isaiah means with that's a dash. True. It has okay. nothing to do with prosopis. Okay, as long as we're getting all this trying to straighten it out, <laughs> what is the German word for production? That uh, when when he says that Aristotle is oh, into production, because that would be important. I mean, we need a word there. Uh, I wonder what it is. We have well, to figure find out. It won't be Erzain, I grant you, and it and it won't help that in Latin production means. What's his German? I wonder. The German, well, not for production, but for Erzain yeah. means original seeing. Okay. That's what it means. Original seeing or originating seeing. Maybe. Could be, yeah, because that's the air is the U R the U R is the okay. original. Oh, good. Well, that's and not. And it's a dash. I mean, he specifically yeah. spells it with a dash, which okay. just takes it totally out of his dimension. Okay. Okay, well, try, look, look up two things to help remember this. We want to look at the setting into work, which is Zetson, and see if it looks different somehow in context than positing. Uh, and secondly, we want to know what his word is in German in for production in Aristotle. Uh, okay, where did you go on? Did you want to say something, John? Okay, then we're going to go on. Uh, let's see. Hmm, 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 hmm. So we get to the point, we were about here at the last lecture, where the Greeks uh, had this sense that aletheia, unconcealing, was the right name for truth. And this is all on 86 and 87. On 86, he says, at the last full paragraph, a being, and of course it's a being, you've got to always, in its beingness, is briefly and properly the unconcealedness of the being itself. I was, for a moment I thought maybe it was brief, but that just means in short, clearly. <laughs> I had a happy moment of hallucination there. Beings <laughs> determined... See, I... Well, you'll see in a minute why I would like that. Anyway, beings determined with respect to their unconcealedness are grasped with respect to their coming forth and emerging, their fusus, uh, that is, as idea, and so are grasped as nothing other than beings in their beingness. Okay, so the coming into unconcealedness of something is both the way we are able to encounter it, the way it shows up, it is what makes possible our being able to say correct things about it. So naturally we can think of this as so the most basic kind of truth. Truth is for the Greeks, then we're back to that, unconcealing. And unconcealing is what happens every time anything shows up. And the general characteristic of everything that is, is that it shows up. So Fusus turns out to be the name of everything, and it means unconcealing, and therefore it can be equated with aletheia, which means unconcealing. So, and with, and so truth and coming forth or showing up are, are, are together. And since the Greeks have understood everything as showing up, they can uh, equal, that, that equals unconcealing and, that, and they, that makes sense to them to use that word for truth. Uh, that, did I make that clear? Not really. I, I understand that better than I said it. Let me try again. Um, for a being to be true, well, well, let's. I guess we have to go the other way around, the way he does. Before you can make true statements about something, in the sense of corresponding, the thing has got to already be showing up, be in the open, be unconcealed. So the most basic kind of truth, oh, I'm going to have to explain that to you, I can see that. Heidegger's got a hidden premise in there, which I was trying to do an end run around, but I can't. Why would you want to call, we, I talked about this once, I think, the condition of the possibility of truth as correspondence or correctness, itself a kind of truth. Why should throwing, uh, showing up be truth? Well, he thinks that, that there is a basic sort of principle that what makes any... The condition of the possibility of X is primordial X. 
That means what makes truth as correctness possible is primordial truth. I mean, I think if you don't put that premise in there, you can't understand any of this. The Greeks who sensed that showing up made propositions and their correctness possible, they saw that that was, so to speak, the most basic kind of truth, the thing that made all truth in the, in the correspondence sense possible. And therefore, it seemed normal to them to describe, to describe the showing up of something as unconcealing and to use that word as the name for truth. That's the best I can do it. Can you do it better? You look like you no, maybe. Just a, just a little bit on the notion of the, the truth. What he's saying is the truth is not something we have, that we produce, or that we have in mind, that we get, we find. Mm-hmm. Rather, truth has to do with the being that shows up, that shows what it is. That is the truth of what it is. In its showing okay, up. Well, that is a help. That is a help. So I'm going to get that. So it shows when it shows up. It shows what it is. And that's the truth. So it, it, its unconcealedness is the truth about it. That's it. Is it showing the truth about itself? Right. I like we that. Don't, we don't do it, or we yeah. don't have it, okay. although we are a part okay. of it. And when it shows the I mean, that's better than my story. My story isn't wrong. It just seems too tortured and strange. Okay, so when something shows up, it shows the truth about itself. It shows what it is. And when it shows what it is, then we can make true statements about it. Those true statements are up to us. But we couldn't make true statements about it if it hadn't already shown itself as something. Uh, and th- it, and that's, that seems right. And that's, that's very close to being in time. Remember where, those of you who've read it, first you've got to, the, the truth is uh, making statements about something that correspond to Never mind. No. Pointing it out as it is. Pointing it out, I couldn't remember. Yes, pointing it out as it is is, is correspondence, the way I understand it. Pointing it out as it is wouldn't be possible if it didn't show up as it is. And that's what Forrest is saying. But I think this is a, a different truth from being in time where Dasein is in the truth. And the truth that it has is the interpretation that we give it, i.e., whether it's four hundred nights or nine shows up within our projects is what's well, well, don't even talk about it. Too many people don't know. Okay, I'm sorry, but at any rate... <laughs> right. No, no, I don't even... Let, <laughs> let me... If, if I'm not... If what I'm saying is crude, it's necessarily crude for this... It, it won't hurt anything. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to say anything? Uh, yes. Just a question. So, when something comes into the world before we recognize it, is its truth not already there before our recognition of it? And, and it's so in a way whether or not we recognize it, and then there's a sort of secondary truth, which is it showing up for us. No, I don't think, but I mean, I'll see what, what, what other people think. Showing up is for us. I mean, it, it, the idea that something could, uh, there'd be no us, but things are showing up anyway. A rose blooms out there, and there aren't any human beings yet. Uh, the rose isn't showing up. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, it's certainly the rose can bloom and do all its things without me, any of any of us happening to be anywhere near it. Absolutely. But, but if it weren't for there being a human world, then the, the notion of the rose showing up wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. It would just, there would just be a bunch of states of the universe following them one after another. But would given that we have an understanding of being, we can make sense of things happening outside of our... That's right. Uh, Once we have this notion of showing up, and that may be what you're getting at, then we can make the notion uh, we can have the notion of things showing up where nobody's around to see them showing up. But it wouldn't well, have a truth apart well, from it showing up. It has to have a truth. That's right, but it doesn't need up. any... Uh, it, it isn't as if if a rose shows up in the forest and nobody happens to see it, mm-hmm. that it didn't have any truth, it seems to me. Once we've got the whole notion that things come out into uh, openness and reveal, so to speak, what they are... But it's not showing up if it's not showing up. You mean there has to be somebody actually standing there? When I turn my back on the rose, its truth no, no, goes no, away? No, no, when you turn your back on it. Right. But if there were, if there if there were no were human beings. no one for whom it showed up, if there were no human beings for it to show up to, it couldn't show its oh, truth. Well, that's what Liz said. But we want to say, but that we don't want to make this mean that it, it, like, sort of, it, it would stop showing up as what it was if it happened that in the life of this particular rose, no human being ever passed that, that way. Okay, well, that's all we, were, that's all we wanted to say. Okay, and that's what was worrying you. Yes, we got it straight. 
Okay. So, I mean, on 86, we just read something and got that about Fusus, where at the bottom of the page, <coughs> Fusus emergence, there belongs to beings as such aletheia unconcealable. So we were just explaining how that all seemed to fit together to the Greeks. And then he says, at the bottom of 91, of course, ironically, but you've got it since Heidegger's not normally ironic, you, I got it any more than normally he's making jokes. I want to, you should, of course, be aware, and you probably are, that he's saying, well then, why? Then the Greeks must have had it all figured out about truth in Aletheia. We just, thanks to Forrest's help there, got it said very clearly that things show up as they are, and when they reveal or unconceal or disclose what they are, that's the basic kind of truth. And so the Greeks have got it all figured out, he says at the bottom of 91. The Greeks have already worked out exactly what we've been trying to take up as the more original and necessary task of future philosophical inquiry. There's nothing left for Heidegger to do, it turns out. The Greeks had it all. And then, of course, that's ironic. It turns out, and I've already hinted at this, they are right about beings. They got it right that beings have the general characteristic of fusis, which means showing up, and that is aletheia because that reveals what they are, and that makes saying true things about them possible. They got all that, but what they didn't understand was, it, 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 to put it as sort of clearly and bluntly as I can, how come there could be this understanding of beings as showing up? I mean, that is itself something that we they should be wondering about. After all, they don't know this, but for the Christians things aren't understood. All of them is showing up. For people in, in Egypt, presumably, they weren't understood as showing up. They have taken Fusus just for granted and gone on from there. But the interesting question is, how come there was a unified style of everything, namely Fusus, namely showing up, welling up, emerging, and all that. Well, how was that possible? What, what's, in, what is, what's entailed in that? That's what they should have interrogated, or not should have, I mean, they had enough to do, but that's what they left uninterrogated, and for very essential reasons, it turns out. They couldn't have done what they were doing if they had had that problem, too, he says. One thing at a time, and, one, and these two problems are sort of conjugate variables. You can't pay attention to the beings and their beingness, and at the same time pay attention to the clearing, which is making it possible for beings to show and have a certain, any kind of general style. So the clearing is making it possible for everything to show up as thesis, or the being of beings, to, to be thesis. That's a certain possible way, of, a style of a certain kind of world. And they're studying that, they're busy looking at the beings and, and with amazement and wonder and philosophical reflection, seeing that they're all showing up and revealing themselves, and that's terrific. But the question sort of, why are they all, why is any, why are all the beings doing anything at all, all of them? And why are all of the beings doing that, namely showing up? Those two questions, they can't even think about. They've got their hands full or their minds full. That's the next story. This is on 98. What they didn't get, I'm going to read this whole paragraph, what they got and what they didn't get. That's the big paragraph on 98. When the Greeks took up Aletheia as the ground of correctness, did they thereby posit this ground as ground and did they ground it as such? All this is, that is, did they understand what they were up to or, were, or not when they just... See, they didn't sit back and decide, so to speak, to name this aletheia, the, to, to, um, to say that thesis was the general characteristic of all beings and that is truth because beings are showing up as they are. That's just the way their language worked. They had some kind of sense of that, that they didn't uh, posit it. They didn't, they didn't think about it. They didn't... I mean, some jargon that may or may not be helpful, thematize it, notice it, in the jargon of this, interrogate it. Furthermore, assuming they grounded the unconcealedness of beings as the ground of correctness, is this ground itself, aletheia, in its essence, sufficiently determined in question? The answer is, of course, no. 
That's the job left for Heidegger. Did the Greeks ever interrogate Alethea as such? Did they deem the unconcealedness of beings as such worthy of questioning? Well, it isn't that they said, gee, it's trivial and not worthy of questioning. They just didn't think about it. The Greeks experienced the essence of truth as unconcealedness. Does that mean, without further ado, that for them this very unconcealedness was worthy of questioning? By no means. The Greeks once experienced the unconcealedness of being and took it up as truth, and on this ground they determined truth as correctness and posited this ground and grounded it, but they did not go further and explicitly interrogate unconcealedness itself. Alethea remained for them unquestioned. Their thinking did not penetrate further into Alethea as such, and they did not fathom it explicitly in its essence. Um, instead, they merely stood under the force of the emerging but still furled essence of truth as unconcealedness. Well, that settles, I mean, that sums that up pretty clearly. And now the interesting thing is that he hints, and we want to, I'll read you the hints until next lecture we can't go into the what they are, he says, he hints that this is disastrous. It's not a stupid mistake, for lots of reasons we'll hear more about, that they, they had their hands full, they did their job, but it was disastrous. He says at the bottom of 58, 10 lines up, nevertheless Plato provided an answer about, what it, about truth, uh, which became henceforth perhaps the most consequential, influential, and disastrous philosophical definition in Western thinking. And that's when he got to this idea of that the, the essence of things was this eidos, and this eidos was what you could see in advance, as it says at the top of 59, and then see everything else in terms of. Um, that was disastrous. Now, we don't know why yet. On 61, he says more about it. Uh, Something. Just to add one thing to it, yeah. it was disastrous, but it didn't have to be disastrous. No, that's right. There's no, I mean, it, it's, it's because, how will we put it? Uh, the way, I mean, I, I, I was going to get to this, but I don't know if it will be clear yet. The way things work, it was not something they should have been thinking about. They had their hands full thinking about beings. And there was nothing wrong with thinking about beings. And just thinking about beings and not thinking about Aletheia was not itself inevitably going to lead to bad things. But what it did was leave it open to Plato to begin to misunderstand it and uh, later people to even further misunderstand it. And in the end, uh, unconcealment disappears and, cor and, and uh, correspondence is all that's left. Otherwise we have Hegel. Right? What? Otherwise we have Hegel, but it was not yes. necessarily... Yes, we don't want Hegel, Hegel saying that this has to happen this yeah. way. Yeah. Right. He wants to avoid that. Okay, so on 61... I don't know if that's important. It's sort of important, but he, I made a big deal out of it. He doesn't, in this book, make a big deal out of it. That what, the, what Plato gave us was that the essence of something is the whatness of that thing. And that's the being of beings. And that, I'm reading this last paragraph before the B section. And the being of being turns out to be what is constantly and always present and shows itself and so forth. And only on the basis of this understanding of being as constant self-opening and showing presence as the interpretation of the beingness of beings and hence the interpretation of being as idea possible. Well, it's a funny story here. What, and he isn't explaining it very much, but I can say a little more about it. I mean, what is it that Plato's getting wrong? Uh, and then I'll try to say why he's getting it wrong is because they aren't in the business of, of thematizing or noticing the clearing, or he couldn't have made this mistake, or if you want to say mistake, I don't know what to say. Plato has given a certain spin to the ideas, making them, emphasizing that they are constant and purely and uh, eternally, though it doesn't say that, they are always present, and why does he do that? And what's wrong with that? Well, I'm going to skip and try to do it in a different order. Uh, to give you a feel for that. 
uh, somewhere I talk about that. I mean, I'll, let me try to give you a feel for what sort of twist on this is getting, causing a problem. And then we're going to go back and try to find out why Plato was not forced to make this mistake or this move. But uh, this move isn't blocked because they haven't thematized the clearing. So it's a possibility for, to be made and it's something that's natural to be made. Now let me try to sh tell you sort of what the move is and why it's natural that he made it and why it, it, he couldn't, I mean, okay, just like that. What is natural? That, that it's natural that he puts a, emphasizes presence and stability and... Uh, why is that natural? Okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you. In the, the phenomena will lead you to do it if something doesn't keep you from doing it. That's what I'm going to try to say. First, let me say in, 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 uh, what he's done when he's done it. Um, and by, by thinking about what it would have been like if we treated the work of art the way Trado, Plato treats the idos, because there is this similarity. What would it be like to put a big emphasis on the presence of... Uh, or constant and always present character of the work of art, what would you get wrong about the work of art? And he's going to get it wrong about the many works of art in the same way, I think. Well, what, 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 what would you miss about works of art if you thought that they were constant and always and fully uh, present to the people who lived in the light of them? Well, they would be missing, let me try, that works of art die. That's one of the things you'd be missing. Secondly, you'd be missing that works of art are not clear. They've got, they're not fully present. You've got earth in them, which is withdrawing and concealed. And so, works of art will naturally solicit conflicts of interpretation about what they mean. And all of that is getting lost in the Plato story. I'm going to tell it to you as it looks in houses in a second. Let me just catch up. Um, it would be as if the temple settled, the Greek temple settled once and for all. This is the, well, how Plato would have to think about it and would think about it and misses so much about it. it. It would be as if the Greek temple settled once and for all what it was to be a Greek, probably what it was to be a human being, so that anybody who wasn't like that would be an inferior, uh, inferior kind of human being, and it, and it wouldn't die, and there'd be no struggle of interpretation. And so, uh, now let's try it with the Eidos house. Uh, well, it would be as if this Eidos house, which we have to somehow have before all houses, settled for all time what a house is, once and for all, That's, uh, and always and constantly. Then what would that look like? Well, it, it would be as if uh, any other culture that had sort of tree houses and huts had inferior houses, because we know what a house really is, because we've got the paradigm house, and there couldn't be a struggle of interpretation among architects, say, whether you're going to build a house the way, uh, who's the guy, Le Corbusier, who thinks a house is a machine for living, and the more functional and cold and mechanical it is, the better it is and then Maybach comes along and builds the houses we see out of redwood is comfortable and is unlike a machine for a living and cozy more like a nest but you wouldn't have a struggle among architects as to what was a house if Plato was right because once you had the idea of a house it would be clear for all times what the best house was and every other house would be as near it as would try to be as similar to it as possible and so the Eidos would settle all debate once and for all. No surprises. It would be totally stable. Um, okay. Now, I said that's the... What, what, would go, what, what happens if you go in the Plato direction? And now the question is, well, why would Plato go in that direction? Uh, and then... The, then I'm going to skip something, but I want to mark it so I know that I've skipped it. Okay.
Okay, they were uh, the Greeks now were concerned with beings and not with the clearing, and that's the problem. I guess let me say it first, blurt it out in my terms. I mean, if you understood, I've said it once, but you got to keep saying it over and over. That fuses itself and Aletheia itself and the Eidos as some kind of variation on Thusis which Plato is proposing are all produced by the clearing that is there are a style that the practices get organized into thanks to the way they tend to gather and thanks to the help of the creator then you'd understand that this is not clear and it's not there for all time that there could be other styles that this style is covering up other possible styles that you can't get a cle- you can't get clear about a style as a, as a, in, in, and settle it once and for all you're going to have a conflict of interpretations you get all you'd understand all that if you understood that this that somehow the way the practices were organized in this place Greece at this time, 5th century B.C., were enabling things to show up with a particular style. Then you wouldn't make the Plato move. That's the idea. But since the Greeks were concerned with being and not with the clearing, everything they, 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 because they, they missed the clearing, it was possible. But first, now we're going to ask, the, the, and why did the Greeks miss the clearing? Were they just stupid? He asked at the top of 104. Why did the Greeks not make Aletheia as such a question, rather than, if we may say so, experience it as something obvious that is taking it for granted? Was this lack of inquiry a neglect? Did it stem from impotence with regard to original questioning? And the answer is supposed to be no, no. The Greeks were doing exactly what they could do and should do, uh, and, and it wasn't their job to think about the clearing. This is on page 118. Um, where it says three we contend that it was because the Greeks sustained their task that they did not inquire into Aletheia as such their task was the question what are beings as such the manner in which they asked i.e. answered this question must make evidence why this question occluded for them the question of Aletheia and why this occlusion was not a restriction of their questioning but its completion the sustaining of the first beginning and then and that's uh, uh, so they didn't ask how disclosing or thesis as a style was possible let me, the middle of 119 the Greeks inquired into beings and asked what they as such what they are as such and they answered unconcealedness but this answer is a philosophical one that means that they thought, I, if I understand that right that means the same as a metaphysical one that means they thought it was a permanent answer. They thought this is the answer. That's what beings are, Fusus. They didn't think, gee, that's the current style. This means it does not finish off the questioning. Uh, that is, a philosophical answer do, doesn't finish off the questioning because it is, it's only said so far, you know, this is the current understanding of being. Only it doesn't know that's what it said. Uh, it, so it thinks it's finished off the question, but it doesn't. It requires that the question be pursued and unfolded all the more, namely, sort of, what are beings? That's a funny way to put it, but that means, sort of, I take it, what is the basic kind of unconcealedness that makes it possible for anything to show up in any style? Yeah? I might want to try to put it a little bit differently. Good. The Greeks um, didn't act as if it were the answer or weren't the answer. They didn't even think there were answers. Mm-hmm. Plato is the one who thinks there are answers, mm-hmm. and he acts as if it, this is the answer. Oh, good, good. That's right. And the reason the Greeks didn't even ask, the, you know, ask, think it was the answer, is, and I was going to do this, and I skipped it, but I come and do it now. It's because something about style or the clearing itself leads them not even to to ask the question, "Is this the answer?" Your style is so obvious, so transparent and so unnoticed. I mean, it's both obvious and hidden because it's pervasive and obvious that you don't even know you've got a style. 
So you're not going to ask about where did this come from and so forth. The, the, the basic understanding of being that they had as species was just absolutely obvious and, and, and showed up for them all over and the idea that they should question it as uh, why do we have this style or what makes it possible that we have this style, that it even was a style is invisible to them. Is that yeah, what you're I, saying? I want to say they didn't even have a style knowing or thinking of it as a style or something. Okay, right. Only they couldn't even... That's, right. they, that's why this is the first beginning. Good. And they did their that's thing. Right. They can't have any, and that's very important what Forrest is saying. It's they're in a particularly peculiar situation. We at least can see something, namely that modernity's got a different style in the Middle Ages because we've got a counter class. We can see, well, we're certainly very totally and radically different. They had heroes and saints and we've got mature I mean, uh, saints and sinners and we've got mature and immature and then you go on and on. You'll never exhaust the difference, but you can at least see that there's a huge difference. But if you had no counterclass, if this was the first uh, total style, you wouldn't. It wouldn't be a style for the people in it, they, because they would be. They, it's just the way it is. Period. Yes. Do you want to say something more about this? You look. Didn't you have your hand up? Somebody back there. Oh, you. Okay. Well, I just want to think that this, this paragraph that you just read, and a lot of other times, when we come across the word philosophical, really seems to indicate philosophical is not metaphysical. It's something that is not the Oh, well, I thought this one indicated just that. I mean, philosophical, I mean, I mean let me just... But this answer is philosophical, and that means it does not finish off the question, but on the contrary, it requires that the question is pursued and unfolds all the more right. into its... Well, yes, question. right. Not There's something wrong with it. Phil, a philosophical answer, if you take it the way Heidegger takes it, is the opening for a deeper question. Right. But if you take it as the answer and not opening for a deeper question, then it's, uh, well, I see what you're saying. I'm only thinking. It's philosophical. That means, well, it doesn't, but it finished off the questioning for them. So it, we're not disagreeing. It's very interesting. Philosophers and metaphysicians say something which they think is, so to speak, the last word on the subject. That's the nature of philosophy and metaphysics. We, looking on it, see that they've left out something absolutely essential and they and that they have provided the grounds for further questioning. So now we, we're not disagreeing, we're looking at the same thing from two yeah, sides. Right. So what is it to be philosophical? Well, one thing might be to think you've got the answer and stop the questioning. And that's what I'm calling, let's call that metaphysical. The other thing to be philosophical is to say something which really raises a lot of new questions, only you don't know it. And that's the positive sense of philosophical. Yeah, good. Yeah. I'm upset by the idea that the um, the primordial Greeks didn't have a style. Oh, they did. Oh, I see. Well, now you're just disagreeing. I think about I mean, what we I see. They had. They had no shot at seeing that they had a style, whereas we have a shot okay. at it because okay. of the. But that doesn't seem okay. like it. Anyway, I think I I don't think there's any disagreement between you. Forrest is saying the Greeks couldn't have called what they had a style, okay, right? And you're saying that we can call what they had a style because we can see the counterclass. Because, because we're yeah. historical yeah. and they were the beginning. Yeah. We agree. But it is it would be very misleading to say that it wasn't a style. It's that for them it couldn't be couldn't be understood as a style. In seeing that it couldn't be understood as a style, we understand better why the Greeks didn't ask the question about it Good. later. And that's right. why it's important to see that. And right. why it's not a failing Right, why it's not a failing, right, right. But there's something I want to say too, and I'm going to say it right now, about the very phenomenology of a style. That even now, now that we've got counterexamples, I mean, we view the, the medievals as having a style and the moderns as having a style, but we, and I mean, we know how things are. We may not have a right word for it. I mean, Heidegger tries to find words for it. Let's say what we've got is a notion that, the, that physics and technology tell us how things really are and our job is to get as much sort of control or flexibility and these are subtleties that I'm not going to go into right now and uh, get as much of the world sort of under or ordered as we can and that's not our style that's finally getting it right we can't help thinking about it that way I think and then, so it's not just I mean, the first people are in worse shape as Forrest says because they've got no counterclass they 
couldn't get themselves out of this way of looking at it, that they've got it. They just got it. But we have to struggle against the phenomenology of style even now. Heidegger, the thinker, has to struggle to get us to see that what we've got is just one more, in his language, mode of revealing later. Uh, the, 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 uh, and I just wanted this sort of crazy example, but it always fascinates me, the phenomenology of style. Just take glasses, these glasses. All of a sudden, everybody's got these steely rim glasses, right? And doesn't it seem that finally we've got it right about glasses? Boy, those clunky plastic glasses they wore in the 50s, those big heavy glasses, that's not the thing. Glasses should be as invisible as possible so you can see people's eyes. Thank goodness we finally got it right. So everybody was going to go out and buy glasses like this. And we see, in a certain sense, well, that's the, the next style, and there have been a few in between, that I don't know about you, but I can't help feeling this is it. We got it right. We're going to do it this way from now on. And I can't imagine how there could be any better glasses than the ones I've got on. They got it just <laughs> right. And, and when the new ones come along, and these look foolish to me, the way the old heavy plastic glasses I had in the 50s and 60s now look embarrassing and foolish to me. You know what I mean, the big heavy dark rims and so forth. Uh, it would be a big surprise, and I can only do it from within the new one, which will finally look as if it's got it right. I mean, it's a funny feature of, of any total world defining something or other. I think it's more true of the one we're in because we labor under this notion of enlightenment progress. Uh, I, I suppose, but even the Christians read that, you know, the pagans didn't get it. We got it. The Greeks were lost. And Dante explains how nice they were and how hard they tried, but couldn't get any further than limbo. But uh, anyway, no, we call it progress. They called it paganism. I suppose another group might have called it stupidity. But everybody's got a story about how they aren't just another style. They've got it right. And that's a funny, funny feature of style. That if you're trying to read Heidegger, you've got to fight against it all the time. Now, I'm oh good, let me go, I'm doing this in such a funny order, but that's all right. Um, so the Greeks thought of physis as the basic characteristic of all beings. This is on 119. And about five lines down, the basic characteristic of standing out and standing over, emerging, self-representing, and standing there, rising above, and so forth and so forth. Then the bottom paragraph, the Greeks inquired into beings and asked what they are as such, and they answered unconcealedness. And, and oh, I just read that, and it's a philosophical answer. It both says something important, and it covers up something even more important, I think you could say. So, let's see where we are. Uh, and that's not... Um, I mean, another way to put it, I mean, the, the, the reason it's hard to see, well, there are two different points I'm trying to make. Even if you see your style, there are really three different points. I think I'll try to sort them out. The phenomenology of style is fascinating. One, it's invisible. I'm going to read you a passage. It's like the illumination in the room. You don't see it at all normally. You just see the objects as something or other showing up as something. Secondly, if you do see your style, you don't see it as a style. You see it as finally getting it right. That's what I just said. And third, even if you saw a style and saw it as a style, you couldn't spell out what it is you'd seen while you were in it. Uh, and you can see this, I mean, go back to the Marilyn Monroe example, because we have style of feminine beauty. Uh, in, a, in a certain way, it would be invisible at all, but then thanks to her it gets glamorized and you, rec you see it as a style, but you see it as sort of now we've got the really paradigm case of feminine beauty. But that doesn't mean that you can remember now rationalize it. It's got this earth side to it. You can't spell out what exactly it is that Marilyn Monroe style is, except by having Marilyn Monroe do it. So there are three ways phenomenologically where the style is goes from being invisible to ungraspable uh, and uh, so no wonder the Greeks missed it but they and the, and the most my favorite one is the bottom of 127 remember I keep talking about the illumination in the room finally Heidegger does that he says at the bottom now it has 
been shown finally that the question of the Greeks, the primordial question about beings as such, is of such a kind that it precludes an inquiry into Aletheia as such. For unconcealedness, and this is what I was talking about with Forrest, not that there's no counterclass now, that's the other thing we, I was talking about with Forrest, they're so busy worrying about beings that they aren't going to be thinking about the clearing in which beings show up at all. He says, for unconcealedness is the determination of beings that in general and in advance constitutes the field of view within which becomes possible the manifestation of the characters of beings we mentioned in the fulfillment of the question of beings. That is, that Aletheia and Fusis is taken for granted by them so that they can ask the question about beings I mean, there is a general characteristic about all beings. If there weren't, they couldn't ask the question about all beings. No other culture could. But they don't concentrate on the general characteristic, the the fact that there is this general characteristic as a kind of background. They concentrate on the beings and try to characterize their beingness. In order to bring into view what resides in a visual field, here's the thing, the visual, this is my illumination, the story. The visual field itself must precisely light up first, that is, be open, that's all that means, so that it might illuminate what resides within it, that is, so things can show up as something. However, it cannot and may not be seen explicitly. That's, if you saw the illumination in the room, you couldn't see the things in the room. Sure, the room has to light up, you've got to turn on the lights, and then we can see the things in it, and if you imagine the light having a certain color, like as the style, then you can see the things as having this color or that color, but you can't see it. The field of view, aletheia, must, in a certain sense, be overlooked. That's the structural sense in which it withdraws. So they had the task of looking at beings as a whole. That's what the next paragraph says. That's already a great move. No culture before and them looked at beings as a whole. They just worried about the, the let's take the Bali ones. They worried about the, the men and their kind of being and the women and their kind of being and the animals and their kind of being and the gods and their kind of being. They didn't worry about being as a whole. So the Greeks had a great new task. But what they couldn't worry about when they were there in the midst of being as a whole, thinking about beings as a whole, was the clearing that made them able to experience beings as a whole and as something. Okay, I think that's a very important thing to get clear. Let's see. Um, There's an interesting further point that if, if they had understood that they had a style and if they had set out to try to describe their style, it would have been very bad for them because when you try to describe your style and rationalize it, you banalize it. So, so there's my slogan is, sort of with, you can take Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe, the, the work of art glamorizes the style and everybody can see it. If they don't see it as a style, they see at least they see everything in terms of this glamorized object. But if you then try, say, in women's magazines to list what the thing she wears and does and how she acts that makes her so glamorous, then you will lead to this banalizing where everybody tries to look like Marilyn Monroe and there are millions sort of mock Marilyn Monroe's and instead of sort of uh, furthering the style it waters it down I think that's what he's saying on 120 the top paragraph to inquire into Aletheia to question Aletheia with itself within the circuit in the direction of primordial questioning would mean to debilitate the answer as well as the questioning that is they they were smart enough not to try to spell out the understanding of being they said it was Aletheia, they said it was Fusis, but they didn't ask more. 
For as strange as it may sound, the greatest debilitation of, a, debilitation of essential questioning does not consist in being drawn into something more original, but in being hardened into its own obviousness, petrified and degraded into a formula which may be passed from everyone to everyone. And in fact, the moment Alethea began to relinquish its primordial essence, that is, unconcealedness, in favor of the correctness it itself founds, in this decisive moment, this preparation takes place in Plato's thinking, the great philosophy of the Greeks comes to an end. Yeah? Yeah, I, I would suggest that that's exactly what Plato, who was very preoccupied with pre Socratics, was doing. He was trying to understand their science. That's what I think, too. And that's where it all went. That's, and that begins to banalize it. Yes. If, you could, if you could tell a story and spell out what idea and eidos was and its properties, namely presence and stability, and it's a system, Plato says, and all this stuff, then the, at that point, you're already. In, in danger of undermining the whole thing. It has to be, it has to work in this sort of background way, unthematized the style to work at its best. And that's how it was for the pre-Socratics. That's, yes? Can we, um, just, I mean, I'm thinking of this, Thomas is okay, to think of this in terms of earth and world mm -hmm. before. That sounds like the winning out of the worldly aspect over the earth. Good. That's what I, yes, that's right. That is what would it be for the world to win out, to spell it out, to make it clear, consistent, and complete, if that may be too enlightenment way to put it, to at least make, to say as much as you can about it. How does he put it? Uh, at least make it transparent. Make it transparent. Right. And make it clear. Plato was sort of twice, he was trying to make it clear that what you should do is make it clear. And that, in fact, the way things are at their best is clear. And clear is just all over the place in Plato. What I'm calling clear, Heidegger's calling present. You want to make it pure present. Remember, world equal present equal clear, and earth equal absent, withdrawn, absent is I was telling, not absent, withdrawn, withholding, refusing, unclear. And then when you get rid of it, all you get is sort of banal statements. Uh, I'm thinking of Terry Malick saying about his movies, if you try to explain what the thin red line is about, all you would be able to say were banalities. Because what the, the, and the, and he doesn't say this, but it's the mood, it's the style in the movie, not anything you could say about it, which is what's great about it. Okay, one more thing now. <clears throat> we're just about there. So the Greeks, for all these reasons we've been talking about, didn't and couldn't and shouldn't be asking about the clearing. Um, <clears throat> this is on 124, um, about the third sentence of the bottom full paragraph. It's now clear that this lack of questioning origi out, originated out of the necessity to present, to preserve, and to unfold once and for all beings in their beingness. Uh, and... And this couldn't be some kind of conscious choice, he says at the top of 125. This is interesting, too. It's related to the earth and clarity story from another angle. The, the last thing they could be doing is making a clear, conscious choice to present and preserve being in their beingness. Because anything important can't be a clear, conscious choice. I'm going to stop with this, but let me read this. For everything, the top of 125, for everything necessary that is supported by a known goal is already tainted in its unconditionality and purity. That means if you just choose some goal and try to explicitly achieve it, that's not what a really serious decision or well, action is like. The necessary in its greatest form always exists without the crutches of the why and the wherefore and without the support of the where to and the there to. Now, that all sounds pretty mysterious. I'm going to read you something equally mysterious, and then I'll tell you what it means. I skipped over this important and interesting moment in the origin of the work of art, where he's talking about the earth and why it's important and fruitful, when he says on 55, below the middle, every decision bases itself on something not mastered, something concealed and confusing, else it would never be a decision. You see, that's the same thought. Now, what does that mean? That means you've got to make real decisions out of what matters to you in a way that you can't get clear about and decide about that. Because it, you, 
you've got to make a decision out of something. If you, if you could get everything clear, here's the, here's the opposite. Suppose you could get everything clear and make decisions about your most basic way of acting. Then you would have no reason for choosing one way of acting rather than another. You'd have all these values or possibilities laid out in front of you. And you'd have to make an absurd choice. This is what Sartre gets to, because he thinks everything is clear. He's the, the disastrous end of this tradition, one of the disastrous <laughs> ends. And uh, if everything were laid out as clear, and if your decision was completely rational and explicit, it would be completely absurd. It's only on the basis of some mattering that you can't grasp the matter, the earth, that a decision can have seriousness for you. That something, it's one way to put it is, really serious decisions aren't decisions. Something grabs you as something you have to do. It's not something you decide and choose. And that's a general view Heidegger has. And if the earth is gone and you only have world, then all your decisions will become trivial and absurd because there won't be anything out of which you decide. Everything will be in front of you to choose between. And, and he says, of course, the Greeks were, were not choosing to do their Greek thing, but it was out of this deep distress and need. We have, we're going to get there next time. Out of this basic mood in which things desperately mattered to them in a way that they had to understand the being of all beings, that they did this, and thereby it was a real decision. <coughs> you want to say something? No, go ahead. You get the last um, word. So it seems like there are two, two things about the decision mattering. One is where the mattering comes from, and then the other is um, there needs to be un some unclarity in order for a decision to be need to be made, right? I mean, for there to be some sort of viable conflict. Um, if it's just rationally, I totally transparent, you can march down that. Okay, I see. Yes. If, if so, if it was obvious what you should do, in terms of some values you'd already obviously chosen, totally you just do it. So it can't be obvious. It's got to be so confusing. And if it were obvious on the basis of what you decided what to do, it then matter. it would be absurd and wouldn't matter. Yeah. So it's got to be doubly out of what's not clear. That's, and that's, again, the fruitful function of Earth. It's coming up here. Okay, we have to stop with that. We, we're ready to go on to... But let me just say, now, I got to just where I wanted to get. Now the question is, well, what is this mattering, unclear, deep problem that drove the Greeks to do this thing that nobody had ever done before, come up with the being of all... The total, think of the totality of beings and what they all show up as, or what they all are, Namely, that they all show up. Okay. Uh, so we, we come back every once in a while into this thing that he sort of leaves like a bomb in the background that we don't know what it means yet, that Plato ha on, on 58 has given an inf a consequential, influential, and disastrous philosophical definition in Western thinking. And it's I, cr I used to think it was something... Uh, about the constant presence of the ideas, it may well be, but in this essay he doesn't stress that at all. He, he stresses rather, and we'll see, that it wasn't so much what Plato said, but what the early people, uh, particularly the pre-Socratics and Plato, didn't say, didn't problematize, didn't interrogate, that got us off into the direction which leads to the bad things that are going on to us, happening to us now. Uh, he goes through a real quick story about that on page 61, <coughs> but I will just, but that's the constant present story, which I just said that we don't, I think, don't, he doesn't develop. So let's go in a different direction, in the direction that he does develop. First, but I do want to say, before we start telling us what, their, what they did right and, and what they left out and what we have to do, which is the three big subjects for today. To, you have to think a sort of head, ahead. He's leaving sort of hints along the way what the disaster is that we now got. Well, I take it that the symptoms of the disaster are that historiography has completely squeezed out history. We have no sense anymore 
of the kind of thing he's trying to tell us about, our changing style or our changing understanding of the being of being. All we have is facts about the past. We also have the problem that there's no new God, that that means nothing does the job of the work of art anymore that holds up meaningful differences to, to, to people. And all of this, he says, is because the truth as unconcealing got pushed out by a total concern for truth as correctness. I'll read you places where he says these things. This is, these are all things he sort of is constantly saying, but sort of always in the background. It's, okay, uh, the new God story is on page 80, and the historiography too. This is, the, this is sort of a funny slant on the disaster. We can therefore defend ourselves against the inundations of historiography. Today the child is rising higher and higher only by that we're jumping out of history, although we will gain dominion over historiography solely by winning back the power to take up historical being. The loss of this power is neither accidental nor an isolated process. Instead, it belongs together most intimately with the event in Western history which Herdelin was the first to suffer and genuinely experience in which Nietzsche expressed in his own way by pointing out that Western man has for the last two millennia been unable to fashion for himself a god. I mean, that's just a special case of the fact that we don't anymore have the sort of style or and relation to the style that enables poets and statesmen and so forth to make works of art. It's interesting, it just occurs to me, it occurred to me in reading it, but I might as well say it. It occurred to me in another place where it was even clearer. I think he's gone away already since the origin of the work of art where people think when he talked about a statesman that would start a whole new understanding of being and so forth that he might have had in mind Hitler. Well, by this point, which is only a year later, isn't this 36 or 37? 37, two years later. I mean, it's clear that he doesn't think any artist or thinker, or except maybe him, but, but certainly no statesman or anybody else has this ability to be a new work of art or be a new god or found a new understanding of being or a new understanding of the state. So that's, that's how bad things have become. At the at bottom of 80, he says, if there were, if once there were gods, we are now, they are, who are now in flight from man, as they have been for ages, then this self-refusal to gods must be a terrible occurrence, which surely sets in motion a singular event, which we can hardly risk naming. And then comes the passing of the last god. Uh, I don't know what that is. That, that's from this book, Funny Arrhythmus, which I'm still trying to get you a piece of. That's a book which is, comes out in 38, a big book, which is being translated and is going to come out in December. And I just write, I just wrote another email letter to say, can't you send me the page proofs and then I'll show my class, say, 30 pages of it, and then they'll all want to buy it, and uh, so forth. It would be fun to be able to get that, which is what's got to do. He has a whole section on the last stop, but we don't know what that is. But it's, uh, it's part of the disaster. And another place on 108. 81. What? They want to know what page you're Oh, I was talking about 81, top of 81. And now I'm on 108. And that's just an, about how historiography stands in the way of history. Historiography is a narcotic averting us from history. And all of this, and I said, is because correspondence of takes over. And if you believe that correspondence is just making true propositions about the facts, then you've lost the sense of the clearing, you've lost the sense of, the re of real history as the changing clearing, and you've lost the sense of uh, the possibility of a work of art that would focus the current clearing. All of this is gone when correspondence takes over, as he says at the bottom of 105. Because they did not raise the question of the essence of Aletheia, we'll come back to that, because for the Greeks Aletheia remained primordial and unquestioned, Therefore, the determination of truth as correctness, which, which was actually grounded upon it, namely Aletheia, could gain an ascendancy over Aletheia and thrust it aside and could by itself dominate the subsequent history of thought. That, that's why we're in such trouble. And one more way of putting it. I tell you all this mainly so you'll have in mind, because he keeps wanting you to have in mind, 
that there's some current problem that he's writing out of. That he's not keep saying just doing this out of curiosity or to show off or because he wants to write something new in philosophy, but that there's some real bad thing has happened to us, something disastrous, and that he's trying to help us understand it and eventually fix it. So I when it, there's another quick run through of all the disasters on page 122. This time, it turns out that because he doesn't put it quite this way, but, but he sort of he, we don't we are not anymore. We don't understand ourselves anymore as preservers because we don't understand any. We don't have any sense of the clearing. We don't have works of art. Therefore, we understand ourselves as rational animals. And that understanding ourselves as rational is just another way that this story of correctness occludes our being able to have any access to what gives us, uh, really, what finally gives us meaningful differences and makes life worth living. So here he's attacking that at the second paragraph, second sentence. Reason assumes for itself the planning, constructing, and making of the world. Now, I read that to you partly because that's what the age of the world picture is all about. We're going to, this whole paragraph predicts what we're going to read next, where I mean not quite next because we've got, because I, I like the way back into the ground as part of this sort of meta problem, but that is sort of this big view. But as soon as we plunge in and start looking at the stages of decline in the history of the West, then there's a lot about how reason becomes planning, constructing, and making of the world. Beings are no longer fusus in the Greek sense, but nature, that which is captured in the planning and projects of calculation and placed in the chains of anticipatory reckoning. Reason now becomes ever more rational, and all beings turn out to be contrivances. Uh, that's a funny word. Uh, you have, how do you translate that for us? I'll have to look it up. I don't know, but it's, it's, it means, so let's, I think devices would be uh, Borgman's word for it. Let's try devices. It's, it means technological thing, but contrivance is such a contrived word. We must have a simpler word. I think devices will do. Okay, it turned out to be devices. This word understood in the essential and not in a derogatory way. Well, that's fine. I mean, devices are not bad things. It's just that there's, there's more to the world than, than lots of... Uh, uh, electronic gadgets and so forth. Man becomes ever more inventive and clever, but at the same time more common and smaller. That's this constant thinking of the, about the leveling of the important differences. Nothing, nothing serious, nothing matters and as this process goes on. And it ends where we are. In, 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 did you notice this? It, it probably didn't because you're not looking for it. At the top of page four, in the current mood, if you're going to be doing philosophy, the mood that Heidegger's in is a mood which he calls, which gets translated restrained at the top of four, Per Haltenheit. I think that's an okay translation. In it, two elements originally belonging together and are, originally belong together are as one terror in the face of what is closest and most obtrusive, and namely that beings are, and awe in the face of what is remotest, namely that in beings, and therefore each being. Remotest, namely that in beings, and before each being, being holds sway. Okay, now, the terror is the interesting thing. I mean, the, that's, the Greeks didn't have that. That's what you have in the face of a world where there are no gods, where everything has become equally flat, and where all you've got is devices, and everybody's busy ordering and controlling everything. Heidegger thinks that's terrible. Terror is probably not a good word for it. We came up with a better word for it uh, when we were talking about it among the TAs. I think it's something like frantic disorientation is what he thinks people are in now. And thinkers are not only, but they've got one foot in frantic disorientation, the second, and, but thinkers also have one foot in awe where awe does not mean what, he's, what it means later in the book. I'll come back to that. Here, <coughs> awe means... It, it, they're two different German words. The translator is completely horrible in this respect. I mean, I don't know how often he does it. This is the only bad time I've noticed. 
I mean, awe turns out later to be a kind of very different than wonder. We'll get to that. Here, awe is very close to wonder. It is, uh, the German word is scheue. And it's, it's got to do with the kind of modesty and fear. But fear in the sense of God, it's what you feel in the face of God in the Old Testament. It, you feel, it, something so important with such power and authority that you feel uh, uh, what? Shy. Shy. Yeah, well, that's the literal translation. You feel shy in the face of it. That's the German. But, but what could that be? Uh, S H E U. How is it? S C H. S C H E U E. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Shy. Okay, that's shy. Okay. Did you feel uh, sort of a kind of amazing, ama uh, respectful fear in the face of it, something like that. Yeah, John. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of shy off from the reading you just gave this paragraph. Are you saying that he's here calling into question or saying that our current mode of understanding um, of philosophy that just traditional restraint? Or because it seems to be saying that the um, this basic disposition of futural philosophy will be, should be, and we have to affirm it, should be restrained. What well, you mean? Nobody's got that yet. You think. That. Oh, I think he's doing future philosophy, but yeah. I'm not sure. It's but certainly not anybody else but Heidegger. This paragraph, this is he calls, calling for the retreat, either the retrieval of this disposition, um, or attempting to, to make it possible. Right. Well, so yeah. we currently have restraint. Well, he, we don't, but I think Heidegger does. I think, I think, but it doesn't matter. I mean, so don't feel that we're, you know, I just want to tell everybody that it matters much whether Heidegger's already one of the future people and he's got it, or whether Heidegger sees that this is what he would like to have and what future thinkers will have. It's got certainly to do with what it would be to be a thinker in the face of the terrible situation that we're, the terrible in the sense of terrifying situation that we're in. And uh, certainly Heidegger has got something. He somehow, he thinks, back in touch with the pre-Socratics on the one hand and the mess we're and he's more in touch with the situation we're in on the other than any other philosopher or, or anything else, I think that he's the thinker who's going to go, I mean, I'll jump ahead to what was going to be a kind of punchline. Notice, I mean, Heidegger, I'm sure Heidegger thinks he's a thinker. Do you, 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 what, you, want, you question that? No, I, I think I just misunderstood. I thought you were saying that, that Heidegger thinks that what we currently have... Oh, I see. Oh, well, we're in the space oh of no, the I'm good, good. I'm very glad you, because maybe other people thought that too. No, we are in the terror part, only we don't know it. But we're already frantic and disoriented, but we don't sense it. And we certainly don't have this shy fear in the face of something great which is happening there too, that we and are unaware of it. We, only Heidegger senses that. In, in the jargon of later stuff, only Heidegger senses that technology is itself a mode of givenness and has a kind of fearful gratitude even for technology. That's far ahead of where we are. Okay. Uh, now, so our task is to go back, given this, and figure out or understand what the Greeks saw and what they left out uh, on 124. This is sort of connecting up now to about where we were. Um, the last paragraph. The primordial history of the essence of truth gives us gives rise to truth as the essence of beings themselves as unconcealedness. Remember, that's thesis. This primordial positing of the essence, which is the task assigned to the beginning of the beginning, that's the pre-Socratics, excludes an inquiry into Aletheia itself. It is now clear that this lack of questioning originated out of a necessity to present, to preserve, and to unfold once and for all beings in their beingness. So that was the Greeks' job. And our job is to ask about what was still concealed, the bottom of 123. 
five lines. If we now ask, underlined we, Heidegger, that is, and us if we can understand him, and perhaps must ask what this unconcealedness itself is, then our inquiry cannot see it. That's the question they didn't ask. If, if maybe by the end of today I'll get there, and if I don't, certainly beginning next time. But the, by the way, that's the best statement of that. I keep reminding you, he really is clear about this stuff on 178 and 179. That, that part in the appendix I can read. If we now, we now ask, and perhaps must ask, what this unconcealedness itself is, then our inquiry cannot be a mere making up for an omission. Then what must it be? if it is to be the preparation for the occurrence of something not yet to come, what must our question be at least and at first and indeed by necessity? It must again be a necessity and even again a beginning, but a different one. And there's one of those important hints that by coming back to the beginning and understanding what the Greeks, pre-Socratics understood and now understanding what they didn't question we can begin the whole history of the West all over again. 2,000 years of metaphysics, which got rid of gods, got rid of history, uh, uh, got rid of meaningful differences, ended in what he called nihilism, I'll read you a quote later, uh, can be ended, and we can start all over again and do it, get it right, if we will do what Heidegger wants us to do, understand him, and of course not just go around reciting what he says, he talks about that, but live it. Uh, and, that, that, that's, and that's what he, he's proposing, that all of this is in the service of a new beginning. I mean, this is so Im- important to him, and so sort of megalomaniac state that he's in, that he's going to save the West. That, and, it, but, and he's so scattered around that I just have to focus us on it. Uh, so, uh, whatever they were doing that made them able to see Aletheia in the sense of thesis, of beings coming into unconcealment, uh, that, w- while missing the, just parentheses, the clearing, which made it possible for there to be thesis. Uh, that's what we'll come back to. But we're focusing now on what they did see for the rest of today, probably. What, what made them able to do this was certainly not some conscious choice. This is exactly where we were last time. Remember that uh, you, it, it, what, it, what's necessary what is something that you can't have a grip on and stand back and decide about. It's like Earth. It's something that, that grabs you. And we're now going to talk about what grabbed them. Well, Earth is very much related to moods. Moods are something that you can't get hold of, you can't control. In being in time, Heidegger says you can't get behind your moods. You can't, uh, you can't understand what caused them, and you can't uh, change them. And uh, not only do people have moods, but cultures have basic moods. And what he wants to know now is what was the basic mood of the pre-Socratic Greeks which forced them, in effect, but not in a determinist way, but uh, drew them, let us say, drew them to ask this important question about the being of beings, which no culture had ever asked before. And that's the, that's the basic mood he's interested in. He talks about it on 122. No, I don't know why I say that. Never mind 122. Well, I better find out, though, somewhere around here that is the story of, I need a phrase about basic moods. Uh, it's probably all over the place, but where am I going to know? Well, I found something else that's interesting, which might have to do instead on 128. The, which it says what I was just saying, that top paragraph. The first task then was then to apprehend, be- that was for the pre-Socratics, what was their job? To apprehend beings as beings, to install the pure recognition of beings as such and nothing more. This was quite enough if we consider what was simultaneously grounded with it, the primordial determination of man as that being which in the midst of beings as a whole, that's the proof of it. All, all human beings are in the midst of beings but in the midst of beings, so to speak, as beings, 
lets beings hold sway in their unconcealedness. This letting hold sway is accomplished by exhibiting beings. Let's see if we want to read any more. Well, we might as well, because it's a summary of the origin of the work of art. This letting hold sway is accomplished by exhibiting beings in their forms and modes of presence and by preserving beings therein. Occurrences in which poetry as well as painting and sculpture, the act that founds the state, the worshiping of the gods, first attain their essence, bringing these essences into being historically and as history by their words and actions and so forth. Okay, now I wish I could still find this basic mood. It's in chapter 5, so we should get over there. Uh, it should be very near the beginning of chapter. Well, we're going to hear so much about it that the fact that I can't find it now doesn't matter. We'll come across it everywhere. So there is a basic mood in the culture. And now we have to stop and talk about mood for a while. Because there are all kinds of myths. And this is disposition, by the way. Don't be, I mean, one, you might have all been looking. The, well, let's talk about one place on, is 133. As soon as I call it disposition, I start seeing it. Uh, the na- na- name of section 36, the need of primordial mortal thinking and how this need compels man dispositionally into the basic disposition of wonder. So that's how it puts man moodily, so to speak, into the basic mood of wonder. That, now, so let's talk about moods. Well, he's, got, he's worried, and rightly, that people will just misunderstand the whole idea of dispositions or moods. By the way, I'm going to call them moods. They, they are the, the German word is Stimmung, which is mood. Disposition is the rather strange translation. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, um, what the market, would the market be difference between mood and mode? Mood and what? Mode. Mode. Well, it's interesting, you know, mode, in, in mode in the sense of mode in music, or mode in the sense of way of doing something? Mode in being. I see. There isn't, I don't know mode in being, I, but I know mode in music, and it's very close to that, because he, he in German, Stimmung, the word for mood, and, and Gestimmtheit, attunement, right? I don't know if anybody knows that. So, an attunement is all tied up with, with you know, the, the well-tempered clavier is the, is the, got the right, the, the correctly attuned, so, a mood is an attunement, and that's very important for him. And uh, there, it does have all kinds of musical overtones. Uh, but, and what is it? Well, to be in a mood is to have a certain coloring of your, uh, at least, local world. I think I may have said once, his only time I know where he gives an example is the mood at a party. And he says, well, a party has a certain mood, and it's not the mood of each individual in the party. The whole party has a mood, and anybody who comes into the party catches that mood. And uh, I, there's a recent book talking about the contagion of moods. It's apparently becoming suddenly a hot subject in philosophy. Which, uh, and uh, Contagion is a funny way to put it, but Heidegger wouldn't mind. And it's called Contagion of Emotions, this book. But uh, I think what it's really talking about, I haven't read it, I just saw the title, but I get the impression that people are beginning to realize that both for individuals and for situations and for maybe cultures, at least groups, that there is something like these basic moods or attunements and that they are Mm -hmm. contagious. Another place, another person who knows it, by the way, how many read The Possessed? I know two places, two people who thought about this, and so not very often. Dostoevsky talks every once in a while about the mood in the town, in the possessed. And, he, and so he, it's like the mood at the party, only bigger. And the town is all anxious at some point, and they're all relieved at another point, and then they're restless at another point. The whole town has these different moods. And another place that you never will have read it, I'm sure, is the book that was popular about maybe ten years ago called The Soul of the New Machine. Has anybody ever heard of it? It's about the making of a, of a uh, what do you call it, well, the, an operating system and the team that made the operating system. But it's very influenced by Heidegger. I don't, I don't know if uh, Tracy Kidd or the author whether they ever read Heidegger. But the guy who runs this team is constantly sort of sensitive to the mood in the room and doing things to control, try to control the mood in the room. I don't know whether, I mean, whether you, I mean, Heidegger would say you can't do much about it, but he does things like, if you could do anything about it, you could tell people stories of the history of their situation, which is what this guy does. 
tells them the narrative of their identity, tries to keep them from being discouraged and making them feel as if they are the special preservers of this way of making operating systems. So there is some sensitivity to this out in the world, but very little in our world. So on 134, Heidegger is talking about how it colors the whole world. Uh, in, in each case, in each different move, the world is brought to man in a different way. In each case, his self is differently opened up and resolved with regard to beings. And immediately he starts to say, but you don't want to understand this biologically or psychologically. I mean, biologically, you can, under, you can well believe, and he wouldn't have to deny, that if you take Zoloff, it'll change your mood. But the, what the Zoloff does to your uh, neural transmitters is not your mood. Your mood is that your world will look different to you. Uh, and does that mean then that you get a private experience when you take some uh, mood uh, controlling drug and then you project that on the world? Heidegger would say, no, no, that's very Cartesian. We have no experience of this inner thing called this mood, which we then project on everything. Our world just looks different, has a different coloring. It's, it's just it's neither good physiology, or what he calls biology, it's not good neurophysiology, and it's not good psychology, and it's bad phenomenology to think that moods are something in us which we then project on the world. Well, of course, if you think the world is just a kind of colorless universe, the way uh, you know, Galileo started and Descartes did, then you have to think that somehow moods are projected on it. But if you think... And, and, but if you think the world is this in which we live, like Heidegger does doing phenomenology, and he would say Descartes was talking about the universe. Moods, if, if the universe was colored, you'd have to project moods on it. But the universe doesn't have any color. And the world is colored by some mood, all right. But it's not a blank thing like the universe. It's, you're, already, you're always already in the world, and it's always already showing up with some uh, coloration looking bright, looking gray. There, I mean, he doesn't say coloration, but it, I need some word for the attunement. It, it, it always has, it's always tuned a certain way. And he's talking about this on 134. He's saying it's not psychological. Um, that, that is, to put it this, to put it, it's not the two things that he doesn't like, the Cartesian things. It's not what, he, what they keep calling a lived experience in here. They, it's a funny, I mean, they have a problem. That, and I don't know, maybe they, the only way to translate it is that they've got the word erlebnis, and they've got the word erfahrung. That is, Germans have. And we have only one word, experience. They want something like private, inner, something or other, and public <coughs> shared something or other. And we can say we're all having the experience of a the Heidegger lecture. That's this one. Oh, and we can also say when you, maybe you're also having pains and tickles and maybe your own private stuff. There's not much of this. Only philosophers, Cartesian philosophers, think there's all this air lateness going on. Heidegger thinks nothing interesting is inner except sort of garbage and, <laughs> and dreams. But, but, uh, but all, if you've only got two categories, subjective, which is private experience, and objective, which is this universe, then you think that moods are private experiences and that they are somehow projected on the universe. And he, he wants to say, no, that's not it at all. It's not a private lived experience. He's, that's, see if I want to read anything. No I, don't. no, I don't see where he says that right now, but he does. And, and then he says something a little harder to understand, which I do want to read you. I mean, you could say at least this much so far, though he doesn't, that moods aren't in us. We get in a mood. I mean, in a little bit of that, I mean, in ordinary English, it's still there. I mean, I mean they, this, if moods were our latenesses, they'd be in us. But if they color our whole world, then we're in a mood. But he has a much more interesting and stronger claim. He wants to say, we shouldn't even get, we're, we are transported into this or that mood. He says that's wrong on the middle of the first paragraph on 134. We sometimes say we've been transported into this or that mood. 
well, that sounds pretty good. Why not? Then we would be, once we've been transported into it, we'd be in it. That's good, not in us. Why is he complaining about that? In truth, that he says, understood on the basis of the original essence of being, it is rather the reverse. It is the disposition, that is the mood, that transports, transports us into this or that basic relation to beings as such. Okay, I think that has two components there that he's got. One, he wants to say, the mood is what draws us in. It isn't some third thing that transports us into the mood. It's the very nature of moods to draw us into them. Uh, and that's why it's a bit misleading to say that we got transported into them as if they were sort of sitting there and then something d dumped us into them. That's certainly good phenomenology. When you go to the party, it isn't as if you get sort of transferred into this mood. This mood grabs you and draws you in. But he wants to make an even stronger claim. For really interesting moods, they change you in your world when they draw you in. It's not quite the same you and the same world. When you So it isn't as if you're the same you, here you are, and then you're transported over here. It's that here you are, and you're, you are drawn in such a way that you get changed from, say, being a, a bored and unhappy person into being a hilarious person, let's say, if this is a lucky, if you're lucky at this party, and your world gets changed from a gray world to a bright world. All that happens. He says it's the, the mood that transports, transports us into this or that basic relation to beings as such. Well, at the party, your basic relation, let's say, is to find them all fun. More precisely, mood is what transports us in such a way that it co-founds the space-time of the transporting itself. I, I mean, I don't know exactly what that means, but I think that means it transports us in such a way that it determines the us and the world that it transports us into. If it doesn't mean that, I don't know what it does mean. Uh, so, it displaces us. And then we get that, 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 uh, that funny translation on, on 40 that Forrest rightly worries about. All this about how mood will displace us at the top of 140. Uh, we are just, the wrong view is the, the top, we are displaced into these or those dispositions by getting them. In truth, however, it's the disposition, the mood, that displaces us. He's come back to the same point. But now we've got to worry about displaces. Displaces us into such and such a relation to the world. Now, just instead of displaces, I think you should use transform. And then you'll get the point I've just been making. In truth, it's the disposition that transforms us transforms us into such and such a relation to the world, into this or that understanding of the world, into such and such a resolve or a collusion of ourself we're changing to, a self that is essentially being in the world. So I think that's what he's... Once you get... So mood isn't inner, and it isn't something that you have to be pushed into, it pulls you in, and it doesn't leave you and your world unchanged. It is precisely a change of you and a change of your world. Um, and the Greeks, the early Greeks, he says at one point, understood this, and they, because they, their gods were like moods. He says a lot about this in the Parmenides lecture. It's a different book. I mean, so when Aphrodite shows up, then everything is seen in the light of everything looks erotic or uninteresting. But and then people feel different and the world looks different and say and in Homer Helen runs off with this exciting stranger from from Troy and uh, because that's the that's the kind of person she becomes and that's the kind of world she's in when Aphrodite is there shining on them. And he says you can't understand the Greek gods if you don't understand a world in which people realize that moods were extremely unprivate, that is they they, they structured the situation and that they were extremely important, and that they had nothing to do with people choosing anything. Because when, when Helen finally comes back after 10 years at Troy to her hus former husband and child, they don't blame her. They just say, well, that's what happens when Aphrodite comes around. I mean, they're, so they're a, they're a kind of culture that has a tremendous appreciation, Heidegger thinks, of this mood. And in the, in the extremist sort of mood, which he's interested in, when the whole... Local, uh, the whole, I don't know what to say, culture, I guess it's culture, whatever you call this, this 
bunch of people, the free Socratics, when they get into a certain <coughs> mood, then everything changes in the culture. Uh, that, that you have this big displacement or transformation. This is the second sentence in article, third sentence in the section two on 139. By this displacement, this is uh, that now we're talking about the, this particular one, which is going to be the one that he's interested in, this very original, important, global one. And I'm going to read transportation, uh, transformation. But this transformation, however, man does not simply pass unchanged from a previous place to a new one. Remember, I'm saying that displacement really means now that the human beings are going to change and the world they're in is going to change. So by this transformation, man doesn't pass, simply pass unchanged from a previous place to a new one as if man were a thing that can be shifted from one place to another. That's why displacement is such a bad word. Instead, this transformation places man for the first time into the decision of the most decisive relations to beings and non-beings. Where decision, by the way, can't mean sort of standing outside and willfully making a decision. The decision gets made sort of for it, for the human beings, by drawing them into this way of looking at things. I think it's a decision in the sense that it was, a, it's one, it was one way and now it's another way. And in that sense, it's a decision. Something very different came about. Don't hear in decision the, the kind of, you stand outside and you look at the alternatives and you, you take, you had this, you chose this alternative and now you choose this alternative. Yeah. But isn't there also something about them taking it up? Yes. Um, rather than, I mean, so in that case, Right. They're not just pushed into it. That's right. They're drawn into it, but they accept it. It's sort of like the party again. You can either yeah. get into it or you can resist it and try to be glum and keep thinking the thoughts about how people are supposed to be home during their homework and what are they doing here, or, or you can really get into it. And they got into it. That much of it is the decision. Okay, yes. Let me see. Uh, so they got this new decision. Uh, that is, they, they, they let themselves be drawn into this new way of relating to beings and non-beings. And this, these relations bestow on him, that is, the pre-Socratic people, the foundation of a new essence. That's how transforming it is. This need transforms man into the beginning of the foundation of his essence. That is, interestingly enough, it's wonderful he corrects this. I mean, th that doesn't mean that human beings get their essence once and for all for all human beings. It doesn't even mean that human beings get their essence once and for all in the West. Although it's been our essence for 2,000 years, he says, I say advisedly a foundation but we can never say that it's the absolute one. Meaning, who knows? I mean, there are human beings in Bali and in Japan who've got different essences, and we have not, might get a different essence. And it might be for the good, and it might be for the bad, but what happened here in 500 B.C. defined the historical essence of human beings in the West from then to now. That much he, he's quite sure. So now, for the... Well, maybe we should stop and see if there are any questions, because now we're going to go into this weird and deep thing, which is lots of fun, though, as I said to Liz, I'm not sure what finally you get out of the fun, but I'm going to tell you his views about wonder, which are certainly interesting and difficult and, and, uh, un I mean, and unscrambleable, finally. Does anybody want to... Are you, are you with it so far? Yeah, John. Okay, go ahead over here. Yeah. Clarification. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about decision. Okay, well, we went fast, Liz and I sort of ping-ponged back and forth. I said it wasn't a decision where you just stood outside and chose between alternatives because you were pulled into it and you become different in the course of it. There isn't any you standing outside. It isn't like me deciding whether to have uh, a hot fudge sundae or banana split where I don't change and where that where I can... Okay, so I made it look as if yeah, there was nothing for you to do. You just got zapped into it. And then Liz said, no, no, you can either sort of swing with it and, and, and be open to it, or you can resist it. And the, the decision is that you are pulled into it and accept being pulled into it wholeheartedly, something like that. Is that what you think? Is that all right? I just wonder what hinges upon your acceptance or non-acceptance and why you use those kinds of intentional terms. Ah, well, Liz, now you'll see what you've got me into. Uh, 
What hinges on it? Uh, what hinges on there being any sort of role for right. the so self the, at all? <coughs> okay. And well, that's a great question. I mean, do you have an answer? I mean, why shouldn't we just say people are just zapped into it? Why should it be some role? Well, for us, yeah. Uh, we shouldn't have said that they, should, that they have any role about resisting well, they, it or the getting into it. Is, uh, the role is the suffering. That is the role. It's a suffering that comes from the Accepting it, acknowledging it, that's all right. Undergoing it. Undergoing it. Is a, and it's just, okay. it isn't so much decision as okay. it is decisive. Okay. That's right. It's decisive right. that you let it happen and undergo it. Don't resist it and deny it. Okay? That's all. Because you could try to sort of pull yourself away from it, but the Greeks were, they let it happen to them. But it they is suffered it. What? It is compelling. That's right. It's drawing them in. You haven't got any choice. You I mean. So maybe that maybe we should maybe I should have stuck with my let's sit, like drawing in story. Well, I, I mean there are two things I want to say. One, phenomenologically, it seems as if moods are not inevitable. I mean, uh, or that there is this kind of um, it, there needs to be this kind of acceptance. You can so resist them to some extent. Right. I think that's right. I think only that's by oh Heidegger says in being in time you you can resist them if at all only by conjuring up an, a, another mood yeah. that will go against yeah. it. So at the party, you can yeah. keep getting yourself into the mood yeah. of being scared of the like future exam or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. To, um, work of art in the sense of, I like the idea of decisiveness because if mood is what structures your very experience, what sets up a being or the essence of a being, it seems to be very related to the idea of the, the kind of essence of this kind of being, the Greek experience okay. versus the, Good. the modern. I, I like decisive too. That's what I was trying to get at. Very helpful. It's not a choice. This kind of decision, something decisive happens to you, and you are pretty much all you can do is either wholeheartedly suffer it or try to struggle out of it. But in fact, there's no, there's not really much choice there. Either you wholeheartedly suffer it, or you don't have. Well, there's not much. Not much leeway, I think. Let, me, let yeah. me say it this way. That becomes the mood that's, that you're in, right? And then the question is whether you accept that and take that up or whether you resist that. Okay, but, but you don't have much, yeah. In virtue of what can you accept or resist it, that's what I'm saying. Ah, well, that's a good point. I mean, you guys are really I mean, you pushing you're good. You're always already thrown into a mood. Yeah, yeah, and you can't get behind it. You can't get outside of it. Uh, and yet, I mean, I'm not sure it's important to Heidegger, but there is a Liz, Liz has a certain phenomenology behind her. I mean, there's a difference between sort of wholeheartedly plunging into the mood and dragging your feet. But it doesn't see, I mean, in virtual, what would you drag your feet, you're asking? I don't know. Go ahead. I guess, I guess what I'm interested in knowing is that, if, I mean, from my sense of the phenomenology, it doesn't make sense if you're not having any choice over, over Any choice. Well, particularly. But, but what I would like to explain is why we do get this. Okay, so say something. Right. Yeah, That's you want to. I think what I, I I'm going to back off it. I think when it's a global enough mood, and then we're talking here about such a global mood, there isn't any purchase for dragging in a different mood to, to counteract it. When you're a mood at the party, you have a chance of resisting it by thinking about the mood you're going to be in at the exam tomorrow next day. But when it's a mood that colors everything that you can imagine in the future, in the past, and in at home and at work, because it's a global mood, which this is supposed to be, when it, a being all what beings as such are in it, and every being, maybe you can't resist it, and maybe you just have to suffer it. Okay, then let me th first. Then it starts to sound like the mood is a thing. I mean, you know, we don't need to go over this other way of thinking, but it sounds like the mood is. Um, ha uh, I don't know, has a kind of force um, and uh, agency attached to it, mm -hmm. right? Whereas that doesn't seem right to me. I know we need to avoid that other. Explain, well, right? if we, in so yes, but I mean, you need to have some way of talking about the fact that the mood at the party does sort of grab you and and. and push you around, and yet it isn't a thing, and it yes, doesn't have no, a will, yeah, right. right. But uh, but otherwise, can we just, And then I also yeah. want to say, but something happened, right? It's right. not just that, I mean, and, 
this makes it look like as if the sort of mood was always all there already, and then you got pulled into it too. Um, well, no, that's completely mysterious. That it, well, there was, I mean, for a while there. I mean, in most cultures, and up to a certain point in the Greek culture, there wasn't this mood, and then there was. And it, and he says we can't give any causal story about that. That goes back to begin to being in time. A mood just hits you. Here you were all elated, and all of a sudden you're depressed. And there's no story about that. And uh, but that's not. Again, that's not up to you. I mean, again, I think I think the general sort of resistance to anything. I think in this case we should just say moods draw you in. You can suffer them. In some cases, you can resist them, like the party example. But when it's a, the global mood of the whole culture that comes around, I don't think you can. The Greeks seem to have been forced by the mood. But we, we should look at the text. Yeah. Keep your eyes open. And maybe there's a paper topic in there, but I doubt it. I think there's just I think an there's answer. Bigger issues there. Okay. Yeah. Well, what's so compelling is that these moods, these groovish that this gentleman is talking about, are uh, global in the sense that it refers to beings as a Oh, that's what I was saying. Not yes. just the party. I mean, right. I don't even think you get over to the party. You've got to go to the library. Yeah. Then there's a different... Okay, good. Yeah. So you get out of this by, by going somewhere else. Uh, this is what I was getting at, but Forrest is putting it through. Else. You can't go anywhere else if it's the mood for beings as such. And then you really just have to suffer it. I think, unless Liz isn't happy with that, but I'll leave you guys to fight it out. Well, I'll, everybody can look for themselves. Yeah, then. Ah, well, not much, not much, very sensible. By the way, let's keep get our vocabulary sort of, um, what, what in German it's Gleichschalter, I don't know why I'm thinking in German, coordinated or something. That is, uh, he, he, the, the thing that gets translated, basic disposition. You just said essential mood. We, we just need some, let's not say essential, because we've got enough loaded on that word. So, fundamental mood, is, I think, if I can, I'm going to stick to that. Is that what you say? Ground mood, fundamental mood. Yeah, Grundbestimmung in German, but ground mood is not too good in English. Yeah. So let's say fundamental mood. Okay, the, what's the difference between the fundamental mood and an understanding of being? Only this, and this fascinating good question. If the understanding of being is roughly, the, the, remember, the style of the culture, the way I understand it, then mood is, and I'm just drawing on being in time, there's going to be two aspects to this style. One is it's going to determine your way of dealing with things, coping with things. Uh, so uh, it's going to, uh, let's go back to when Aphrodite comes, I mean, then Helen is going to run off. That's a, a way of coping with the situation. And it's going to color everything and determine what matters. A style has both the mattering aspect and the coping aspect. And so we've been hearing a lot about the sort of what you... The, the overall way you behave if you're in a technological style or if you're in a medieval creative creature style. Now we're switching and we're thinking, and how, what is this overall mattering that you would have if you were in a technological, which turns out to be a dis, frantic disorientation. I mean, a feeling of frantic. Feeling is bad, a mood of frantic disorientation. And, and we both sides there, yeah. What, what would you make of my assertion that the middle Heidegger moods are more fundamental than uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Uh, it, it's interesting that in being in time, it's the reverse. Yes. And I wouldn't Except be. Except in division two, where. Well, even isn't. I mean, we can't go into this much. But, yeah. re but but remember, the future is always primary in, in in being in time. And it now looks like the past is primary in this book, in the sense that the mood that we that the culture was in from before the begin at the beginning is making this big difference all the way along and it looks like therefore the past which is in, in Heidegger associated with the mood side is the most <coughs> fundamental. I wouldn't be surprised. And yet this past is coming towards us from the future. Yes, in, but it's the, the past. It's the past that's coming toward us from the future, yeah, right. Yeah. And that means that this fundamental disposition is about as fundamental as you can get. And I think that's not surprising for, for this stage. Yeah, Beatrice. Um, I'm just puzzled by thinking, you said which time to me that moods are very much connected to earth. But all the examples that we've used uh, connect moods to world in part. And mm -hmm. in being in time, it's also an extension. 
So, <coughs> which links it to, uh, to world. So, what would the connect? How can we get out of that? What would the connection be between world and earth, which would be to statistics? Uh huh. Boris, you want to say something about that? Well, first, first of all, being in time, it's not that moods are an existential, it is having a mood is existential. It's the Vindicate that's the existential, not yeah. Stimmel. Okay, so that's for sure. And I think they are earthy in the sense that you, from my point, you can't get in them, you can't get out of them. Can't get behind them. You can't get mm -hmm. behind them, you can't rationalize them. You can't control them, you can't master them. If there's anything earthy, that's it. Yeah, I think the non master is a very important part of it. Yeah, I mean, and he talks about this in a footnote in The Essence of Reasons, where he brings together what he asks about, he talks about earthiness and he talks about mood there, and something, and this is just going to confuse you, but the mood comes in as something that is radically other at that point. Mm -hmm. Moods are, are more other than anything else in the sense of out of our control and out of our understanding. Then, and that, and that, though he hasn't got a notion of Earth in being in time, if he had, that's where it would go, I think. Yeah? But I'm a little bit worried that um, that makes it sound as if we can totally understand world in, in, in general. I okay. mean, oh, you mean that it is trans that, that it's a, Yeah, <coughs> I mean, it's an illusion where it's easy for us to fall into. Yeah. That world is transparent yeah, okay. to us. Well, world, no, world never gets to be transparent, but it, we move toward transparent. It's that function of trying to make it transparent, which brings out yes. the limits. Yes. Okay. I think that's all okay. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's go on. I mean, those are all, I, I'm so glad I stopped for questions, and the moral is, because I might have just gone on, and we never would have had this discussion, but we have had, and now that's good. Uh, so, where are we? We're ready to uh, the, go back to the first move. Okay, the fundamental move of wonder. I'm just funny, in, in, in answer to Dan's question, the next sentence in my lecture notes is, epochs in the history of the understanding of being not only have a style, but every style has a mood. And that's, uh, that's what we've just been talking about. Yeah. So what was, what was fundamental move? Okay, the, the fundamental mood we're talking about now is wonder. It's the mood that started our, uh, the history of the West. Well, how is it different from the understanding of being? Ah, it, it's more fundamental even than the understanding of being. This is what Forrest was pointing out. In the sense that it's because of this mood or sort of in the light of this mood or something that we got an understanding of being, namely that the being of all beings uh, became something that we were attuned to. Uh, it's so it's it's that fundamental. You'll see, but you're, you and th that's where we are. Uh, and so now we hear that that, that what the, the that somehow the pre-Socratic Greeks were in some kind of distress, which in a way. And this is very interesting and tricky. And, uh, was wonder, and in another way, the response to this distress was wonder. I think at first it's easier to think of it as a distress that isn't wonder, and then one can see that it's that it's already almost like wonder. So let's say they're in a distress, and 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 this distress is that there they are in the midst of being and they can't get out of it and they can't get into it. This weird phrase. Everything depends on making sense of this weird phrase. I now understand that, and you will too if you read it, that he uses such weird talk because he wants to describe with the same words what it's like before you sort of let yourself experience wonder or get pulled into wonder, suffer wonder, uh, is before that the distress that leads you to suffer wonder is that you can't get into beings and you can't get out of them and after that when you're in wonder you're still in a situation where you can't get into beings and you can't get out of them but I don't think it's distress anymore I think it's it's as if the it's a very funny gestalt switch where the same experience which is distress and you can't get into things and you can't get out of them, when you take it a certain way or when it takes you a certain way, then becomes 
something that you uh, can uh, that is positive you know, and, and uh, opens up a whole possibility of a history. Yeah. I don't think you can be in the midst of beings in his sense. Yeah. His sense. Apart from the mood. Okay, well then, then you're not quite in the midst of the. Well, yes, you can, but not qua beings. Well, that, that, that's exactly what I mean. Okay. Obviously, yeah. you're, obviously you're in the midst of beings, but they are not qua beings. Right. The mood gives you this. That's right. Now know. That's right. The yeah. mood gives you the beings qua beings. Yeah. So here you are, first anyway. You're just there. I'll start now on 132. And, and it's the, the, the very hard second paragraph. The need we have in mind arises from the distress of not knowing the way out or the way in. But that is by no means to be understood as a perplexity in some particular circumstance or other. What is it then? Not knowing the way out or the way in, that is to say, out of and into that which such knowing first opens up, see this is the funny part, as an untrodden and ungrounded space. This space, that means in a way the whole world, if we may so to speak of it here, is that between where it has not yet been determined what being is or what non-being is, though where by the same token a total confusion and undifferentiated, undifferentiated beings and non-beings does not sweep everything away either. Now, I'm going to give you a whole lot of strange descriptions like that, because he does, and then I'm going to try to tell you what I think the phenomenon is, but you have to decide for yourself whether this is the right thing. It turns out uh, now, at this point, there is still no understanding of beings as a whole, to jump to what Horace was saying, and, and that's right. The second, third paragraph on 134. This, does, this distress, the not knowing the way in and the way, the way out and the way in, does not simply compel us into already determined relations to beings ones already opened up and interpreted in their beingness. That would be beings as a whole. On the contrary, it compels us first of all into that between, that in the midst of, in which space and time, in whose space and time beings as a whole can be determined in their beingness. So there isn't yet being as a whole and being in their beingness, but this, this mood, this fundamental mood, gets us into this way of experiencing things. Now, how can this be? Well, wonder pushes us, he says, into the experience of being in their beingness, on 132, at the bottom. This distress explodes being, still veiled as such, in order to make the space of the in the midst of beings able to be occupied and founded as a possible standpoint of man. This distress, here barely intimated by speaking of it as a not knowing the way in and the way out, with the casting asunder of what will be determined forthwith as beings in their beingness over against non-being. Uh, now, I'm just giving you all the quotes where you have to, you have to make sense of all this. Um, it enables us to name being for the first time, he says next, skipping just a little in the middle of the next paragraph. Thinking means here to let beings emerge in the decisiveness of their being and to let them stand out before oneself to perceive them as such and to name than in their beingness for the first time. So they haven't done that yet. Wonder is what, wonder is this, this distress is going to, in a way, push them into doing all that. Wonder is the only way out of this distress. That's not, better not say way out, because there's no way out. But they're not going to have any distress unless they wonder. That I disagree with. I think that distress splits over into wonder, but that once you've got, you can't have wonder unless you have distress. But I don't, yes. I don't buy the biconditional. I do think you can have distress, but and then you get wonder, and wonder is a certain way of taking the distress. You, maybe we're disagreeing, and maybe we're not. Let's wait and see. Um, so I think wonder is the way out of the distress. Now, how is that? Well. The only way to figure out what to think about all this is to try to figure out what the phenomenon is. That's, that's sure. But boy, is this... I mean, that's a job I give myself all the time, and I'm happy to take this job, but this is the hardest job I could ever have. Because how do you figure out what the phenomenon is? Uh, you can't get back to it. We lost touch with it, he said. Uh, it, it was a leap into our history, which then we gradually 
not so pretty quickly by the time we got to Aristotle the culture had already lost it and then I could say well let's find it in the marginal practices I mean after all there's still moods at parties and stuff but the trouble is this mood is a global mood it's essentially a global mood you couldn't possibly find it in your marginal practices because you can't have marginal global practices so that it, it does all, it, it's a mood for all beings in all time space we don't have it how do we get any access to it um, well I think Heidegger is just trying to make up some story about what it must have been like and I'll tell you what I think his story is uh, and it, it's got it's the clue is this business of what he means by not being able to get out uh, and not being able to get in I take it the people are already in the midst of beings though they don't know this is what they're in and that is I think well people were already people insofar as they already had language so I think they were probably already in my account experiencing things as something not 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 all things as the same something but you'll see what I mean in a bit but I mean you can experience something as a house and something as a tree without experiencing them both as created so they were experiencing particular things as something but they didn't have any sense yet of beings as a whole uh, but they were in the midst of beings anyway uh, that's what I think is going on in 139 well I don't know and, and on the 139 passage might be more in the direction of forest. I don't know yet. Uh, let's see. The whence and whither. I'm at the bottom. On the whence and whither exists no less than the open between in which beings and non-beings stand forth as a whole, though still in their undifferentiatedness. See, that's the peculiar thing. But that's indecisiveness. Yes, I know. It has something hasn't been decided. All this undifferentiatedness in German is undecidedness. Since the between is the whole of these undecided beings, there is nothing outside to which an exit could be possible. And because it is a whole, it is undifferentiated, undecided, whatever is undecided about it. There is nothing... Uh, okay, so, what's, what's, what's happening here? I, I want... Undecided is the difference between beings and non-beings. Yeah, what, what's, well, yes, yeah, some general characteristic of it is undecided which gives us this general difference between beings and non-beings and okay now let's go on with Can that, that? what okay what's undecided is some general way of relating to all these beings that we're in the midst of which gives us a distinction between beings and non-beings which means what's undecided yet is what they are as a whole okay good we agree about that um, so that's the sense in which they are already in it. They're in it. They're in beings as a whole, but they don't know what they are as a whole. I think is not just and uh, so they have no standpoint yet. Uh, where does he say that on 138? And that's distressing. Yeah, that's distressing. All right, they have no standpoint from which to to understand these beings as a whole. They just there, and they and that's and that's distressing okay now what does that look like well okay here's my guess at the phenomenon try to feel it like this there was no way to get in tune with what was going on they had no unified sense of orientation they had no familiarity general familiarity that enabled them to find their way about in the world as if it was one world my code for this is that they were disoriented and overwhelmed what would that look like well maybe like this that things were showing up for them sometimes as familiar sometimes as mysterious sometimes threatening sometimes useful and then sacred and then marvelous and then admirable and then erotic gods were whooshing up and things were coming up and when, when Aphrodite whooshed up they, they looked uh, uh, erotic and then Aries looked up and everything looked whooshed up and everything looked aggressive and there was no you couldn't you wouldn't know what God was going to come up next and, and how everything was going to look next and that would be disorienting and overwhelming uh, and I think this is what it means to say that there wasn't 
a lack, but an unbearable excess or surplus. That is, there were just too many ways that everything was showing up as for them to get a grip on it. Maybe. I mean, I'll talk on, one, on, on 133. Uh, is that the act? That should be an excess place, is it? Or surplus? Yeah, it's the um, second paragraph above the new section. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, the distress, the not knowing one way about or the way into the, into the, in the midst of itself, the way into the, in the midst, itself ungrounded, of still undifferentiated beings and non-beings, that is, we don't know what everything is, and everything, is, so that we can tell what isn't, is not a lack and not a deprivation, but is the surplus of a gift which, however, is more difficult to bear than any loss. So, the distress, I take it, is that everything is, there are just too many ways everything is showing up. Uh, on 139, it comes back again, this surplus, excess, about 15 lines down. This distress of not knowing the way out or the way in, this need has an excess, which raises it above every lack, and lets something be which we have to express as the opposite of a lack, an abundance. And I'm trying to say how abundance could be distressing, and now I think it's because there's just too many ways everything can show up, and it's all so unstable as he says right next. This is the measurelessness of the undifferentiated, that is, undecidedness between what beings as beings are as a whole and what presses forth as inconstant, formless, and carrying away, which means here at the same time what immediately withdraws. So, there is... I take that to be... You don't know... You, you, you can't decide... You haven't decided yet between something that all beings have and this way that things whoosh up and, and withdraw. So, each time they encounter something, it looks different. And then, and this is the great aha, but go ahead before we have it. Ah, yes, oh, you, you just jumped ahead. Wonderful, you made the move. Suppose then you say, and this is the gestalt switch, yeah, but now I understand. Everything whooshes up. That's the fundamental characteristic of all beings. And suddenly, the very thing that was keeping you from getting a grip on it gives you a grip on it. You get attuned to what was so disorienting and overwhelming and distressing when you realize that the difference between beings and non-beings is that beings show up. That, I think, whoosh up. That, and thesis. Suddenly, thesis gives you the name for and a some attunement to and some grip on what was just disconcerting before. So, in now, it, and, and well, anyway, let me go on. That's my story. Uh, the aha is that they get attuned to the way things are. They understand that everything is welling up, drawing them in, overwhelming them. And then they can relate to everything in them, to themselves, as the beings for whom whoosh, things whoosh up and overwhelm and so forth. Uh, on 139. The, let's just, there's a very murky sentence because all the undifferentiated were really undecided and so forth. So we, let's get, just skip that sentence in two sentences and go to the third in section two on 139. By this displacement, however, man does not simply pass unchanged from a previous place to a new one. This is transformation. As if man were a thing that can be shifted from one place to another. This displaces man for the first time in the decision. Oh, I've read that. It gives him a new essence. I don't need to read that. Well, we want to know what this new essence is. Let's try 146. It's about five lines down. In this transition, that's the transformation, the most unusual first steps forth separately in its unusualness and in its, in its usualness and in its unusualness, such that these then appear precisely as such. In this way, wonder opens up that or up what alone is wondrous in it, namely the whole as a whole, and the whole as beings. Beings as a whole, that they are, and that they are, uh, sorry, and what they are, beings as beings, ends qua ends. What is meant here is the as, so forth, the between, that wonder separates out, the open of a free space, hardly surmised and heated, in which beings come into play as such, namely as beings, that are in play, in the play of their being. All of this is the 
new basic mood, a great description of it. I was going to read it, and I wasn't going to read it. I think I will read it. Because you can get a feeling, if you, if you read this one, it's in the Age of the World picture. You're going to read it soon. On page 131. It's a description of Thyrsus, which is better than any description in here. This is written three years later, two years later, anyway. Uh, which you could see as a disorienting and overwhelming sort of distress or as a kind of uh, challenge for which you should be grateful. And wonder is something like this. Ex- I mean, well, how do you, what, what is wonder? Well, I think it's a kind of gratitude in, a fa- in the face of what is an excess and surplus in such a way that you can, uh, uh, when you discover you can cope with it. Anyway, here's what Thesis is, he says. That which is, is that which arises and opens itself, which as what presences comes upon man is the one who presences. That which is does not come into being at all through the fact that man looks upon it. Rather, man is the one looked upon. He is the one who is gathered toward presencing. And now comes the crucial phrase, to be beheld by it, to be included and maintained within its openness, and in that way to be borne along by it, to be driven about by its oppositions and marked by its discord. So still the sort of orienting stuff, disorienting stuff is in there, the oppositions and the discord, but all of that is now part of an understanding of being, and that's, that's what thesis is, and that's, now they've got a job. So it gives them a new way of relating to everything and to themselves. Let's see if I have another way to put this. I've read that. Okay, a new basic mood, wonder. Um, now, the sense of being overwhelmed, that's what I just read. They're still overwhelmed, but they're not disoriented. My slogan is, the constant thing is they're overwhelmed. That's, their, that's what it is to be a pre-Socratic Greek. But instead of being overwhelmed in a way that is disorienting and distressing, they're now overwhelmed in a way that is uh, uh, not disorienting and distressing, but wonderful and for which they feel gratitude and they, 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 got a, they know their job. Uh, what happens is a sort here, I wrote, a wow with gratitude. And, and all, this, all this showing up. Uh, that everything is, that everything is presencing, isn't that great? Now we know what, where, what, we, what to do. And that means that wonder has opened up a new space for them. This is on 146 at G. Wonder is the casting asunder of this free space, such as at the same time it displaces the wonder into the midst of what was cast apart. Wondering man is the one, one moved by wonder, displaced that is transformed by this, basic, by this fundamental mood into an essence determined by it. Wonder uh, transforms man out of the confusing, irresolvability of the usual and the unusual into the first resolution of his essence. So what a confusing is what I've got is disoriented. They stop being confused. They stop being disoriented because they've got this new way of taking what's happening. Or, or I mean, it isn't as if they decided to take things in a new way. Things start showing up for them in this way where they can experience it as something that they can get in tune with. Uh, now, let's see. Uh, and I say sum it up on page 150. So let's try to sum it up on page 150. The bottom about 20 lines. Now, he's going to re- he's still going to say it doesn't give you a way in and a way out. That helps make it difficult. I'm going to have to stop with this. But wonder does not permit a way out. And what does that mean is... It's now you know you're in the midst of beings as beings and there's no way out. And nor a way in. Where it turns out that a way in means if you look a little above that, you can't explain it. Because of course no overall mood like Thesis is going to explain anything. Uh, that is, uh, you can't... How do I want to say? You can get in tune with it. And in that, in that sense you've got a way in. You, but you're always already in and now you're in tune with it but you can't give any, any you can't, it's not a problem that you can explain anything about it, it transforms us before and into the unusualness of everything and its usualness and so forth 
I think I'll stop there, but just, just give me a second. Okay, 145. That's what he says you can't explain. Uh, at, uh, that little middle paragraph. I'll stop with that on your deep. While wonder must venture out into the most extreme unusualness of everything. So everything has now become unusual. It is at the same time cast back wholly on itself, knowing that it is incapable of penetrating the unusualness by way of explanation. Now that's what it means not to be able to get into it. Before it meant, let me just sum it up this way, not being able to get into it when they were in distress meant not being able to get in tune with it. Now they are in tune with it. It's all thesis and they're glad. They're more than glad. 